It was just another normal walk. That's how it started anyway. A casual morning stroll on the forested trail that ran behind my parents' house. They own a home on a couple acres in the small town of Skyline, Alabama. At the time, I was in between jobs and had been living with them as I tried to get back on my feet. Their property crosses with the winding trail that ran for miles through some unkempt woods in the boonies. In the morning, the Appalachian Hills would come alive with the songs of birds and fluttering of insects. The crimson sunrise would paint a beautiful portrait as it filtered down through the bristling leaves of aspen and spruce trees. There was something about the place that just made me feel at peace. It was like all of the stress and anxiety of modern day worries just faded away. It was my zen place until the day it was shattered forever. The day it happened, I woke up a bit before dawn, had my morning coffee, and went out for an early morning walk. The sun had just begun to creep over the horizon when I left the house. I hadn't planned on being gone any longer than an hour, and had only been walking about 15 minutes when I noticed something strange. The path around me was oddly silent, with the only noise coming from the sounds of my own footsteps against the gravel. The unusual sounds of the woodland creatures or wind gently rustling the trees were absent. Everything was just completely silent. It didn't really bother me at first, but the longer it went on, the stranger it seemed. I finally stopped to try to determine whether it was some auditory illusion of some kind. I listened for any of the usual sounds. Cars on the highway, a few miles out, lawnmowers fired up by the neighbors, or just any noise at all. But there was nothing, just silence. All of the sudden, I began to feel lightheaded. My vision started swimming, and my knees grew wobbly beneath me. The hairs on my arms stood on end, and the cold sweat dampened my brow. I didn't understand what was happening, but in seconds I was struggling to remain standing. Panic struck hard, and I desperately reached for my phone, thinking I was having a medical emergency. I never managed to reach it, and I just seemed to lose all control of my body and fell face first onto the ground. I still don't exactly know what happened, but it must have been a fainting spell of some kind. What I do know is when I finally came to, I wasn't where I was before. The environment was pitch black and suddenly cold. Only when I struggled and felt my knee knock into something solid did I realize I was awake. The sudden jolt struck right on the funny bone, causing me to wince. I tried to reach my hand out to rub the aching nerve, but I couldn't. There was something restricting my movement, something cold and covered in a substance. My whole body was pinned vertically against the wall. Thankfully, the binds were not entirely restrictive, and I managed to get my cell phone out of my pocket. I flipped it open, and the light glowed in the dark. It wasn't much, but it was enough for me to see where I was. That's when the true dread set in. As far as I could tell, I was in some sort of underground tunnel. The binds that restricted me looked almost like roots of trees. They felt differently though, more like dried mud than plant. They were grayish in color and coated in random splotches of this greenish black goo. It was like tree sap and hung in globs of tendrils from all over that smelled truly foul. I almost had a panic attack at that moment as I realized I had absolutely no idea where I was or how I had gotten there. My initial thought was that there was some kind of weird cave-in or earthquake which somehow led me ending up to where I was. I shined my phone up at the ceiling, but saw only a rigid outline of the rocky walls. No fissure or gap I could have slid through, and thus my potential explanation went quick. My next thought was that I had been abducted by someone. I thought about yelling for help, but if that were true, then I doubted they would be likely to come to my aid. I realized an explanation in that moment was not nearly as important as getting out was. 
After wiggling back and forth a little bit, it was clear that it wasn't going to be enough to escape. I pinned the phone around the corridor, using what sparse lighting it provided to try to formulate a plan. I caught a break when the light gleamed off some shiny metallic object only a few feet to my right. It was too far for my hand to reach, and so I extended my right foot out as much as I could. After struggling for a few minutes, I finally managed to dig my heel down on top of it and drag it back towards me. I then managed to press it against the wall and move it vertical so I could reach it with my hand. It was some sort of bent iron rod. I didn't know how it had possibly gotten down there, but I was nonetheless happy it had. After slowly wedging it into one of the roots, I managed to push it outwards and cause it to crack. The roots, or whatever they were, crumbled with relative ease. A few of them broke away. Within a couple of moments, I managed to push my arm free. Soon after, I managed to slide my entire body up and out of the hole I had created. Somehow, it was only then I remembered my phone was good for something besides shining a crappy light. I dialed 911, but no surprise, the call didn't go through. That seemed another confirmation that I was somewhere underground, but had no way of telling how far. I realized then, in all likelihood, no one was coming to find me. The time on my phone read 11.48 a.m., meaning I had been out in the cold for nearly six hours. I had most of the same clothes on, a pair of tan cargo shorts, and my running shoes. The only thing that was missing was my crimson Alabama University hoodie. After looking around, I saw no sign of it. The air felt chilly and stagnant, and I shuddered as I rubbed the goosebumps on my exposed arms. Other than my thin layer of clothing, I also had my phone, Leatherman multi-tool, keys, a pack of gum, and chapstick. Not exactly a wilderness survival expert's emergency pack. The corridor was unnervingly silent, devoid of any cave ambience, no howling or wind leaking in the cracks or drips of water, just silence, intrusive and all-consuming. I started to walk, squinting to try and maximize my ocular reception under the minimal light of my cell phone. Each footstep I took, I did so with the utmost caution that I was capable of. It felt as though every sense in my body had been hypercharged from the onset of adrenaline and confusion. Before leaving the area, I had one last look at the root system that had formerly imprisoned me. A thought struck me as I observed it from further away. It almost looked like some sort of primitive cage. The tunnel stretched on for dozens of yards. Along the ground, I started finding tufts of what appeared to be dried grass and straw randomly strewn about. Beyond that, the tunnel came to a bend to the left, and the trail of grass continued towards it. Once around the corner, my eyes were met with the sight of an open cavern. In the waning light of the flip phone, it was difficult to tell, but it was clearly of much greater volume than the previous tunnel. In front of me was a large pile of sticks and dried grass similar to that I've seen earlier. Beyond that, the walls came to a sort of arc that briefly narrowed two dozen yards ahead of me before seeming to expand out again in the next chamber. On top of the stone arch was a structure almost resembling a natural limestone bridge that seemed to connect two separate ledges some thirty feet above me. Above that, there appeared to be another open space, but once again, my lack of proficient lighting made it difficult to tell. I tiptoed into the first section of the cave, keeping my head on a swivel. I reached the pile of debris and decided to dig within it to see if there was anything useful. After finding a long stick a moment later, an idea blossomed in my mind. I collected a few twigs and cut a long vertical strip off my belt with my pocket knife. I then removed both of my boots and socks. I fashioned the socks into a sort of pouch, stuffed them with grass and twigs, then slipped it over to the end of my stick. Once it seemed suitable enough, I took out a pack of gum and popped a piece in, 
while cutting the wrapper in a way to make it one long strand of foil. I bunched the foil into a cluster and popped the battery out of my cell phone. I placed the torch end in a pile of brush, then moved the foil cluster beneath it. Carefully, I took the two ends of the stripped foil and pressed one on each side of the battery's terminals. In seconds, the strand began to smoke and then burst into a small flame in the brush. The flame took to the dry grass quickly, and I watched the crimson hue dance along the pile. Don't know what I would have done without that little trick. A second later, my makeshift torch ignited. The flame grew stronger, shining further into the shadowy canopy around me. The panic in my mind diminished ever so slightly, as the orange glow of the torch painted an encouraging trail through the dark. As I turned to my left, my torch glinted off something upon the cave wall that caught my eye. I thought for sure that I had seen it wrong, but as I got closer, a series of distinct shapes came into view. On the porous gray rock, about four feet off the ground, were a series of cave paintings. They started low and spread out for at least a dozen feet up the side of the wall. There were all sorts of things depicted. Most were a little more than scrawny stick figure drawings of people, but there were a few animals as well. One scene that stood out from the others. Three tall figures were drawn above a horizontal line, and another three shorter ones drawn below it. The way the scene was centered on the wall made it seem significant, but I didn't understand why. The torch was burning quickly, so I maneuvered forward into the large open chamber beyond the archway. The fallen column above the arch appeared to bridge the gap between two rising ledges about 30 feet up. The way it was wedged made it look like it was done intentionally, like someone carved it out of the rock. The roof of the cavern beyond the structure appeared to curl upwards, and I wondered whether there was more to see. I stepped beyond it and felt my jaw nearly hit the floor as I got my answer. The room beyond the arch transitioned abruptly into an absolute colossal chamber that appeared to extend upwards for at least several hundred feet. Suddenly, it was bright enough to see without the torch, and I knew that light had been filling in from somewhere at the top. That realization provided hope, but also disbelief. How far underground was I? The chamber branched out at various points into countless winding passages and a piece of rock ran overhead as makeshift bridges, looking like enormous veins in a massive stone organ. In the center was a massive center spire of rock that seemed to stretch all the way to the top. Many of the veins were connected to it, making it seem like some sort of anchor. Something then suddenly moved a couple hundred feet up. I didn't see what it was, but I heard pebbles scuffle and plunge from above. They hit the ground with thunderous clacks, sounding like popcorn popping through a megaphone. Not knowing what caused it, and not exactly yearning to find out, I ducked underneath the arch. I waited there for a minute or so, but I didn't hear any further noise. It was clear then I wasn't alone down there. A metallic gleam shone then caught my attention from the brush pile in front of me. After looking closer, I recognized a distinct shape of a long barrel jutting from underneath the pile. Part of me couldn't believe what I was seeing, but as I got closer and pulled it out, things just got even stranger. It was a musket, old school. It was in poor condition and obviously wouldn't be suitable for self-defense, except maybe as a vulgar club. But that wasn't what held my attention. If it was authentic, and judging from the advanced rust on the hide, it seemed like it could have been. Then it had to have been nearly 200 years old. After digging around a few more moments, I quickly stumbled upon other treasures. An old leather belt, an Adidas sneaker, a broken machete, a knapsack, and finally, a bone. I dropped it as soon as I realized what I was holding, it looked like a large thigh bone from an animal, probably a horse or a moose. An extremely worrying thought then entered my head. 
one which sprouted goosebumps along my arms. I glanced around at the environment, seeing the large gathered pile of sticks and other things. The way the bundles were arranged made it look almost like it was some sort of nest. Even then, it seemed like a ridiculous notion. The pile was at least 30 feet in diameter. There's no creature on earth that makes a nest that big. At least, none that I know of. I couldn't calm my nerves after that though, and decided to just continue trying to move upwards and reach the top, and more importantly, the light. Once past the pile, I found myself faced with a series of three branching tunnels. One of them appeared to slope downward, and after a moment of contemplation, I decided to just take the one on the far left that veered up. My torch began to dim, and I did everything I could to maintain the flame for as long as possible. My pockets soon began to run dry of grass, and the cave once again grew dark. After a couple more seconds, it was a little more than smoldering ashes. Once again, I found myself alone in the dark. I grabbed the cell phone from my pocket and slightly debated whether or not to go back for more fuel. An awful stench then filled my nostrils, like the malaise of a polluted rolling tide. It smelled like sewage and rotten eggs. The scent became so overwhelming that I felt my eyes begin to water. Along with the noxious scent was an overwhelming sense of impending doom, like my olfactory senses had triggered some deep, primal fear hidden deep within my subconsciousness. I flipped open my phone and prayed my gut was wrong. The light from it barely made a difference, but it was enough to confirm my worst fear. I nearly dropped the phone as an outline of a decaying hand became visible further down the corridor. Out of instinct, I took a step back and covered my mouth as I retched. Unfortunately, there was no real choice aside from proceeding. I popped in a fresh piece of gum and prayed my eyes had deceived me as I stepped forward. It was even worse up close than my imagination had built it up to be partially skeletonized hands and legs dangling, attached to a rotting thing against the wall. The head was missing entirely, and there was no indication where it had gone. My instincts were all but begging me to flee. I had every intention of doing so too, until I saw a small knapsack on the ground beside the remains. On a hunch, it may provide something useful, and seeing how the person clearly no longer had any use for it, I decided to take it. Once I lunged it onto my back, I said a few parting words to the nameless and moved on. As if it wasn't obvious before, that moment was when I truly realized the severity of my situation. Before that, I almost assured myself that me waking up there was some sort of mistake or odd coincidence. But after seeing that, I abandoned that rationale. Anxiety constricted my mind as I wonder whether I had been kidnapped by some perverse serial killer. After putting a significant distance between myself and the nameless, I knelt down and popped open the knapsack. Inside, I struck gold with a flashlight, a box of matches, a half-full water bottle, a pack of granola bars, and a few magazines. Those were all welcome additions, but much to my surprise, there was nothing to identify who the person was or how they had gotten there. At least the flashlight still had some juice in it. I flicked the switch and then watched the flashlight sputter to life and blaze through the trails and blaze a trail through the passage. The tunnel was pretty unremarkable, appearing as just a long winding passage that led upward. Ever since the brush pile, I hadn't heard so much as a single decibel of sound. I never really realized how comforting background noise was until I was forced to go without it. After a couple more minutes of walking in utter silence, I reached another open chamber. Two more branching passages lay further ahead and seemed to stretch in nearly opposing directions. One branched out left and one right, with both seeming to lead upwards. As I approached the two passages, then noticed there was another directly above me on the ceiling. I looked up to see an extended chute, stretching for countless feet above me. 
Even the light of the flashlight was not enough to illuminate its entire length. Obviously, I had no means of traversing the vertical tunnel, but the discovery made things even more mystifying. I elected to take the left-handed tunnel in hopes it would lead to a higher level of the cavern. Before I could enter one of them though, my footsteps disrupted a pile of pebbles and sent them skittering outwards across the ground. I froze, cursing myself for the noise and hoping nothing had been alerted by it. My mind was flooded with a torrent of catastrophic thoughts. It felt like breaking the silence within that place was somehow a griven sin in and of itself. Luckily for me, there was no other noises. The further I went, the less likely it seemed like the caves was a natural formation. The walls had almost patterned groove marks in them, as if something had methodically yet boorishly dug them out. A worrying thought manifested as I remembered the apparent nest from earlier. Maybe this was the den of some massive, unknown creature. For some reason, I thought of the giant spider from Lord of the Rings. And obviously, that thought did not bring any comfort whatsoever. It seemed ridiculous, of course, but darkness and silence can play cruel tricks on the mind. I hope that's all it was, and I did my best to suppress them and continue on. I dropped a piece of gum at the entrance of the next tunnel and continued walking. The idea was to use the glint on the shiny wrapper from the flashlight as a rudimentary map to help me find my way back to where I started, if it came to that. The more I went though, the more I doubted and hoped I would not have to resort to that tactic. All sense of direction in that place was restricted to a bare minimum. As with even as short as I had traveled, I had no real sense of where I was in relation to where I started. The tunnel seemed to bend and twist like an enclosed spiral staircase on an endless incline. Finally, as I rounded yet another bend, I saw a dull light breaching the other end. I ventured forward, and once more the room elongated into a massive open chamber. There were some unusual items spread across the ground there as well. Splintered pieces of wood, along with a half-destroyed wooden chair. There was also scattering of copper-colored coins across the ground, but I didn't recognize the denomination. However, one item stood out right away, an old rusted sword. I made my way over and knelt to inspect it on the ground. The hilt was rounded and encrusted with bronze, and the metal blade had clearly seen better years. It looked authentic, like the rifle from earlier, but of course, that would lead to a quite elaborate conclusion that it had been there for a couple hundred years. I didn't think much about it in the moment though, I was just happy to have a weapon. Hello? A sudden voice froze me up like a breeze in the quiet of winter. I turned off the flashlights and ducked down. Hello? Anyone? The ethereal voice sounded like a young girl calling from somewhere within the cave. Her vocal inflection quite clearly conveyed her terror, and I felt my heart quiver. The thought of a girl alone in that place and terrified was haunting, and my instincts demanded I try to help. I crept onward from the room and found myself once more entering the massive chamber from earlier, this time on a higher level. The cavern loomed large like an ancient, empty tomb, and I felt as though I were a single ant in an alien, termite colony. Down below, I heard the sounds of the girl whimpering, and I approached the ledge to try to spot her. The area beneath me was shrouded in shadow, and I saw nothing upon first glance. I debated upon turning my flashlight back on and shining it down, but some part of me wouldn't comply with the thought, like I knew it was the right thing to do, but fear had constricted me, and wouldn't allow my hands to cooperate. I peeked over the ledge, waiting in the darkness to try to see her. Her hushed sobs and frantic breaths met my ear, but I couldn't determine exactly where they were coming from. I kept quiet and continued listening, but something strange then happened. Her muffled cries changed pitch and suddenly morphed into what I can only describe 
as a hooting, almost maniac animal screech. It was the weirdest thing I ever heard. Something then suddenly darted through the darkness below me. I couldn't tell what it was, but it was quick. It disappeared in a split second, and I was forced to entertain a ridiculous notion. Maybe those sounds were not meant to signal distress. Maybe it was a lure. I can't exactly say why that unnerving thought entered my mind, but I picked up the pace a bit from then on. I crossed a fallen column to reach a higher elevation of the ledge, sneaking glances down below to keep an eye out for whatever that thing was. Luckily, I managed to cross without incident, and kept maneuvering further into the convoluted cave system. Every path which seemed to incline upwards was the one I took. At every tunnel I took, I left another piece of wrapped gum at the entryway, and the pack continued to dwindle. Most corridors and rooms I came to held very little of interest, found a few sparse piles of animal bones, as well as various personal belongings scattered around. The items I felt in no particular order were an old briefcase, a torn pair of jeans, a solo winter boot, a Chicago club's baseball hat, and lunchbox with spoiled contents. All of it was rather pointless, but then I came to that room. It was tucked away behind a large room that split into several other paths. By this point, I was at least several hundred feet above where I had started. The room itself was a little more than a small, separate grotto, but the items inside I found truly interesting. Most were articles of clothing, shirts, jackets, pants, hats and shoes of all sorts numbering in the hundreds. I also saw a cane, a fishing pole, a baseball hat, a deflated football, and small drink cooler. All the items in that room seemingly had a thing in common. They were all either entirely or primarily red. It looked as though someone had been collecting all of them over the years, and some of the articles and items looked decades old at the very least. I kept my new saber clutched tightly as I waded my way through the debris. I was then struck by the epiphany that my suspiciously absent hoodie had also been red. I looked around for it, but I couldn't find it. It got me thinking though, maybe red was the reason I was there in the first place. Of course, I knew by then I was not alone in the cave, and likely had been abducted to arrive there by someone or something. Maybe whatever had taken me didn't like red, or maybe they were attracted to it. Back outside, I was once again met with another fallen column that led to another higher ledge. This one was different though, incredibly steep and worn. There appeared to be no easy way up, and no other real path to follow. I could see the light growing more luminous above, and knew the path was my only option to reach it. I stashed the sword on my back of my belt and began to climb. The rocks were slick, and parts of them crumbled as I grabbed. I moved slowly, trying to stay both alive and quiet as much as possible. The road was tough, but I pushed on. I was nearing the halfway point when something stopped me dead in my tracks. Somewhere far above, I heard the sounds of pebbles tumbling down the cavern slopes. I looked up and saw a dusty cloud of residue blossom off the cavern wall. My eyes rapidly scanned the area above, but I didn't see anything that could have caused it. I was just about to continue when I spotted something strange. The dull light was flickering in from above just barely illuminating the cavern. It was in that mythical twilight canopy that I saw it. On the far wall, there was a small spot where the light appeared to shimmer in an odd fashion. I didn't understand what I was seeing at first, and just stared at the odd image. It almost looked like something translucent was partially obscuring the light, like an impossible patch of water being held together by some unknown force. I must have blinked or something, because one moment it was there, and the next it was gone. Once I hauled myself up, I peered back to look over the ledge and saw the chamber plunge downward into obscurity. By that point, I was nearing the top where the light was coming from. 
I just hoped that all the effort to get there would be worth it. The room beyond the ledge was yet another empty space, or at least I thought it was. Once inside, my flashlight gleamed off the walls and was illuminated by several patterns on the rock. The entire thing appeared haphazardly scrawled in some sort of black ink. It was only when I backed further away from the wall that I realized what it was. At first, I saw only squiggled lines, bloated ovals and winding tubes. Then I saw the X carved into one side. The realization struck me then. It was a map. It was crudely made, but after further examination, I realized that the X section was similar to the cavern I was in. The paths drawn also seemed to vaguely reflect the ones I had taken to reach that point. My eyes grew wide as I made an undeniable discovery that if this map was in any way accurate, then I hadn't seen anything yet. The colossal chamber I was currently in was only a tiny fraction of the entire piece. I counted six or seven other sections that were at least double the size. The ends of the portrait seemed to fizzle away, as if whoever had drawn it had not yet completed the entire thing. That realization was staggering. Just how big was this place? I took a picture of the diagram with my cell phone and moved on. There were sudden noises and clangs far off in the distance, and I decided to move towards the light as quickly as I could. According to the crude map, the way out of the labyrinth was near. If it was anywhere near true proportions, then I was already about three-fourths of the way there. I just had a little bit higher to go, but the worst was yet to come. I advanced onto yet another tunnel and began the arduous climb upward. I could see the light getting nearer and just hope there was an actual means of getting out. Luckily, after rounding a few corners, I came face to face with just about the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. The exit. The ceiling there were several partially transparent films of unknown material stretched over the holes. The light was gently beaming from above, and I knew it had to be the way out. The only question was, how was I going to reach it, as the ceiling was well over 20 feet up? I made my approach into the open cavern and stared upwards at the patches of rock above me. There were grooves and indentations on the side of the wall, and I thought I may use them to climb up. It looked possible, but I didn't get the chance to try then. Out of the blue, I was suddenly struck in the back by something. The blow was sudden, completely unexpected and sharp. I crumbled to my knees and held where it had struck. I then heard the sudden pitter-patter of feet scampering by me. My eyes frantically darted around the room, but I did not see my assaulter anywhere. Even though they had passed right by me, it didn't make any sense. A plume of dust was then disturbed above me. I looked up and saw something I still cannot fully explain. It was the same odd, shimmering anomaly of light that I'd seen before. It was closer this time perched just above me on the ceiling. It was different than before though. There was a distinct shape to it, at least partially, like it looked differently than the area around it. For anyone who's played the Halo franchise, just picture the translucent silhouette of an active camo upgrade, and that's basically how it looked. Something that was either partially cloaked, or my eyes weren't capable of fully perceiving it. It then moved, and my heart dropped like a lead weight. There was definitely something up there, and I had no idea what it was. Its outline looked vaguely humanoid, but it was hard to tell for certain. The saber in my hand quivered as I held it towards the thing. The three separate wounds on my back stung like hornet's venom, and I realized then that the pattern of them almost looked like something inflicted by claws. We just stared at one another for the longest time, before it suddenly made this sort of hooting noise. I then watched as it leapt away several feet and then disappeared into the shadows. Things fell silently once more, and I seized my chance. Freedom was only a simple climb away, and with that in mind, I made a scramble for it. I began my climb up the wall. It was jagged and I felt the rocks puncture into my hands, but I didn't care. I just had to get out. 
I was nearing the halfway point when something suddenly slammed into my back, the impact causing me to lose my grip and plummet about 10 feet back to the cavern floor. I struck hard, my head bouncing off the dirt. The room wobbled around me and my head pulsed from the impact. Something then touched down ahead of me. I tried to stabilize my vision and clutched tightly onto the rusted saber as my only means of defense. As I rose to my feet, I felt the thing slam into me. The two of us fell and rolled onto the dirt, wrestling and flailing about. Its claws were like razors and the piranha-like teeth got my skin. I fought back and struggled, somehow managing to force that thing off of me. I could barely even see what I was fighting, but as we broke apart and it tried to slink back into the shadows, I saw red shining on its torso. I took a step forward, slashing horizontally with the saber. I felt the tip strike through its translucent hide. It only seemed like a small wound, but the thing went ballistic. I can't even possibly describe the multi-layered cacophony this thing produced. Voices and animals all blended into random blurps and vocalized pain. It flailed about, wailing in an awful tone as if suddenly driven to utter madness by what was honestly just a small wound. In sheer disbelief, I watched it suddenly leap, or perhaps stumble over the ledge and plummet to the chasm below. It struck with a hard squelch a second later, and the silence returned. It didn't last though, and before I could even ask myself what happened, I heard something below. It began as a chorus of hoots, grunts, and indistinct noises. I heard pebbles scuttling about, and the aggravated voices grew in volume. There were more of them. Many more of them. The only option I had was the holes above, and so once more I dashed toward the rock wall. I climbed up as quickly as I could, as the horde of camouflaged things climbed from the abyss below. I heard them right beneath me as I reached the hole on the ceiling. There was some sort of film material covering the hole, but luckily, I was able to push through it. Daylight seared into my eyes as I plunged upwards and burst out of the cave. The light accosted my retinas, and it took a moment to adjust after being locked in complete darkness for so long. There were boulders around me and trees in the distance illuminated by the setting sun. Just as I was about to lunge outward, something grabbed a hold of my legs. I kicked and fought back with all of the strength I had left, refusing to be dragged back into the cave without fighting. My fingernails cracked as I clung with all my might onto the ledge and kicked around wildly. By some miracle, I felt that thing's grip relinquish on my leg. I hobbled to my feet as the chorus of sounds wailed below. My leg was injured, but the pain barely registered. Adrenaline had taken full control and I galloped into a run. I didn't care where I was going, I just knew I had to get as far away from there as possible. I don't think I've ever ran for so long in my life. I heard them follow behind me, and I knew if I stopped even for a moment, I was done for. It was dark before I finally saw smoke wafting in the distance. With every last ounce of energy I possessed, I dashed towards it. The most beautiful sight I had ever seen came into view then, as a simple cabin. I yelled out, hoping someone would hear my pleas and help me. Exhaustion and loss of fluid struck me then, and I collapsed within a few dozen yards of the home. My vision began to fade, but blurry outlines emerged from the cabin. Things went dark once again. The next thing I remember was waking up in the hospital greeted by desperate expressions of family and friends. It was all so surreal. They wept tears of joy, thanking God and others that I had returned. Part of me wondered whether all of the things I've related here today were just nightmares or vivid hallucinations of some kind of coma. But as soon as I saw the extent of my injuries, I knew that that was impossible. I had apparently been gone for nearly 24 hours when I was found. I was covered in cuts, I had three broken ribs and a partially ruptured spleen. Many of my wounds had been stricken with infection, and it took weeks for me to heal. It was not a fun time, but at least I was alive. 
The doctors and police thought my injuries were the result of an animal attack. They questioned me profusely, but I took the coward's way out. I didn't tell them much, only that I was hiking and was suddenly attacked by something. Doesn't really explain the fact that I ended up in the cabin which was nearly 15 miles away from the trail I had started on, but that detail didn't come up. It felt wrong to lie to them, but I was paranoid that no one would believe me. I didn't even know if I could fully believe myself. Ever since that day, I've exhausted every possible rational explanation, but they always come up short. The memories are just too vivid. I still don't understand exactly how it all happened, but I've learned a few things. After I got out of the hospital, I started doing some research on all of this phenomenon to try and see whether anyone had been going through something similar. The Appalachians are known for cases of mysterious disappearances. Dozens of cases have been reported over the years, with many of them remaining unsolved. I don't know whether or not they were all victimized by the same thing I was, but I did notice one particular detail. Many of them were reported to have been wearing a red article clothing when they were declared missing. In nature, red is the color of danger. Many animals like bulls have an innate fear or dislike the color. It makes sense when you think about it too. Oftentimes, venomous snakes and insects will be partially or entirely red in color. Many poisonous mushrooms and berries also follow this pattern. I'm not positive, but I do believe red has something to do with this. For what those things were, I don't really know. I've considered everything from aliens to ghosts and interdimensional creatures, but I don't think anyone knows for sure. There's a local legend about beings that supposedly live deep in the woods, hidden away from people. Indigenous folklore in the area mentions them extensively, but sounds a bit ridiculous. Fairies. Nothing like the cutesy Tinkerbell or Cosmo and Wanda. According to legend, they are subterranean creatures that stalk and drag their prey back to their burrows. A lot of them claim that they live near rocks and boulders, something which reminded me of the location I arrived in after first exiting the cave. I didn't really buy into this explanation until a friend of mine who is a Native American mentioned one particular detail. Apparently, these beings are allergic to steel. That may explain what happened to the one that attacked me after I nicked it with that old saber. Maybe the steel of the blade caused it to have a reaction. As for the apparent ability to cloak themselves, well, no one who I've told this account to honestly has been able to explain that. My same friend who told me about the fairies admits that he never really believed in them. They were just stories that his grandfather used to tell him as a kid. Both of us don't really know what to think now. Some people say that all the myths and superstitions are rooted in something real, but the benign stories passed from generation and generation by word of mouth is spiced up and exaggerated upon, thus eventually leading to a folklore we tell each other around campfires. Maybe this time, the myth doesn't need to be exaggerated. Maybe the reason that the world scoffs at these stories is because the truth is very good at hiding. I know how all of this sounds, trust me. Every skeptical thought that has passed through your mind while reading this is probably something I myself have considered at one point or another. If you choose to write this off no more than fiction, then it's your decision. Please. Don't wear red in the Appalachian woods, or any other woods for that matter. You may not believe in or ever see the things I have, and honestly, I hope you never do. But remember, when you're out on a trail in the middle of the woods, they will see you. Don't provoke them, because even if you survive, you'll spend the rest of your life knowing a truth that no one will ever fully believe, just like me. It was almost 15 years ago now that I first met one of the most interesting people I know. True to that nature, I also met him in one of the most interesting and unexpected ways. I was out hiking on a trail in Washington State. It was a remote area, 
but one which I was fairly familiar with. On that particular day, I decided to venture far beyond the hiking trail I normally took, just for the sake of exploration. After some time, I entered a sunlit gully which led up to a local mountain, rife with blooming conifers and serene, glistening pines. I was also alone that day, and felt my soul rejuvenate a bit with every breath of fresh mountain air. After probably 20 minutes, I was well off the beaten trail, and I found something worrying. I was about to take another step when I paused mid-stride, seeing a circular, jagged metal ring laying just behind a small shrub. It was a good thing I didn't put my foot down, as the ring proved to be an improvised bear trap. What are you doing out here? A gruff male voice suddenly shouted from somewhere unseen. I looked around, trying to find the person who had spoken. When he chose to step forward and reveal himself, an older man sporting a long gray beard then emerged from the brush. He had amber skin, long grayish black dreadlocks, and a scar on his right cheek. He wore a raggedy brown coat that looked hand woven and old jeans patched in multiple spots by mismatched fabric. His eyes burned like campfires, and his hands clutched a bolt-action rifle while his lip cradled a sizable wad of chew. I asked you a question, son. What are you doing here? After fumbling on my words for a moment, I was finally able to piece together a response. I was just hiking, sorry. I didn't know anyone lived out here. The man seemed to silently inspect me for a moment. I felt my pulse soar in my chest as I wondered what he was intending on doing. We were, after all, completely alone out there. You see that bear trap, son? He pointed to the same trap that I had narrowly avoided stepping on a minute earlier. I nodded. He tilted to the side and spewed a mouthful of tobacco spit into the dirt. Guess that means I gotta hide him better. He stared at me completely emotionless, and I felt my heart plunge into the depths of my stomach. I thought he was some maniac hillbilly cannibal hellbent on having me for lunch, but then he burst into a fit of raspy laughter. I was left there confused and partially horrified as the man continued to cackle for several seconds. Oh, I'm just kidding, son. He wiped a tear from his eye and recomposed himself as I continued silently debating whether or not I should run. He slung the rifle over his shoulder and smiled at me. Apologies, buddy. My wife always says my sense of humor was a bit dark. I eyed the man over, and he suddenly seemed less sinister than he had a moment ago. There was this sense of jubilance in his gaze, like he was genuinely happy to see me. It's hard to explain, but it kept me from running. I forced a laugh myself. Good thing for the both of us, I guess. This hiking has given me a major case of swamp sweat. I can't imagine I'd taste too good. The man burst into laughter once more, and this time I joined in. In that moment, I knew I had found a new friend. The man formally introduced himself not long after as Mark Hastings. After conversing for a while, he told me that he had lived in that particular area for a couple of years at least, though admitted he didn't know exactly how long he'd been there. He said he left city life behind in 96, and seemed quite surprised when I told him the current year was 2020. Mark's accent was something which struck me as quite interesting, as it was one I couldn't quite pin down. He had a significant southern drawl, and yet, at times, also sounded as though he may have had a bit of British influence as well. He pronounced words like again as again, and had a strange vocal inflection. The best way I can really describe it as the way someone speaks in an old black and white movies. Proper, and yet somehow country. We got to talking, and he told me more about himself. He said he used to do construction back in the day, but when his wife got sick with cancer, it really changed things for him. He said she battled for almost three years, but eventually lost the fight. Afterwards, he was left alone with a mountain of medical bills to account for. Rather than pay them off and attempt to move forward, 
Mark chose a different path. It's funny, you know. You work your tail off for years. Begin building the life you want with the woman of your dreams. And then it all just falls apart for no good reason. Then when you, at your lowest, good old Uncle Sam comes in and slaps you with a bill, you ain't ever gonna pay back. So I say to hell with them. To hell with their taxes and debt. Out here, I'm truly free. There ain't nothing left for me in the real world anyways. There was a distinct glimmer of pain behind his gray eyes as he said it, and I felt myself feeling sorry for him. He wasn't all what I expected when we first met, just a normal guy whose life fell apart through no fault of his own. In a way, I found it sort of admirable. The system beat him down, and rather than just accept it and be a good little wage slave, he left it all behind with a big middle finger. I visited Mark pretty regularly after that, and tried to make the trek to see him at least once a month. He always seemed to have a smile on his face when I came to visit. Soon enough, he even invited me back to his cabin for a fresh meal and some drinks. I was a bit hesitant at first, but decided to accept. Part of me expected him to prepare a meal of squirrels and tree bark when he first offered, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Mark made us a fresh rabbit stew with some homegrown potatoes and bread that he had made from scratch. On top of that, he even had his own home-brewed ale to wash it all down. It was surprisingly delicious, and really made me admire Mark more for his resourcefulness. He wasn't just some wannabe camper, he was truly a man of the land. His cabin was reminiscent of one that would have been used by the early 18th century trappers. A handcrafted stone chimney was his only source of heat, while animal pelts covered the walls and stripes of meat were lying on his jerky rack. There were two couches in the main room, constructed of whittled wood and bearing hand-woven pillows stuffed with feathers. He had no electronics of any kind, claiming he didn't need those technological doohickeys anyways. Mark had two hounds, Rowley and Daisy, that lived there with him and were his only real companions. I eventually asked if he ever missed civilization or got lonely out there, but he immediately refuted the question. For a while, yeah, but not anymore. It's easy to forget about society when society already forgot about you. I really grew to admire Mark and even cherish our friendship. Over our many meetings, he would tell me stories about his life told me all about his business and wife before she passed. The way he spoke about her in particular truly broke my heart. He was a man who met his soulmate and built a life he loved with her, only to have it all ripped away by the cruel hands of fate. More than anything though, Mark was always ready to tell me how much he'd hated the government. I think that's what made me like him the most. One night, he and I were drinking some of his home-brewed honey ale and chilling around his campfire. He had just got done telling a story about a five-point buck that he had narrowly missed a few weeks earlier. He finished with admitting that he heard some weird, loud noise from the woods that scared it off before he could fire. That detail got me thinking, and since I've always been a fan of the paranormal and whatnot, I figured I'd go ahead and ask him. You ever see anything really creepy out here? Mark's eyes opened wide, and he immediately lowered his mug from his lips. He wiped the suds from his bushy beard and stared down at the campfire for a couple seconds. I could tell he knew exactly what I meant. He then chuckled and rocked back in his chair with a smug grin. Zack, I tell ya, you don't know creepy until you've spent some time out here. He then began to tell me a story of when he had first began living out there. He said it took him close to a year to finally assemble his cabin, at least partially. During that time, he and his dogs were living in a simple tent. Mark said that a couple weeks after living there, he started noticing something odd. Every once in a while, he'd awake to find deceased animals just outside the perimeter of his camp. Usually, it was just small creatures like rabbits, birds, and squirrels. But it didn't stay that way. 
Over time, Mark began finding more and more things left at his camp. He thought it was the work of a puma at first, despite the fact that the corpses seemed to retain most of the meat. He quickly rethought that through when he found an actual puma corpse one morning. He said most of the animals had marks along their sides and necks, and many had been turned inside out. He began thinking it was the work of some deranged person, but even that didn't last long. One night, as he was preparing to turn in for the evening, he heard a rustling sound coming from within the forest. He ducked down underneath some timber in hopes of catching a glimpse of the culprit. Both of his dogs were already chained up for the night, so he knew it couldn't have been one of them. A figure emerged deeper into the woods. Mark said he didn't see the entire thing, but he could tell that this thing was bipedal and scrawny. I asked if it could have been a bear with mange, but Mark claimed it was too skinny for that. He said he's seen sick bears before, and they looked and moved nothing like that thing. Mark initially planned on trying to shoot it, but after seeing that, he admitted that he didn't think that would have been a good idea. The creature dropped something on the perimeter, which Mark discovered the following morning was a raccoon. The thing's head then tilted and appeared to stare directly towards Mark. They just stared there in silence for several seconds, until the dogs began snarling ferociously from inside the tent. They must have caught its scent, and the thing suddenly crouched on all fours and dashed back off into the woods as the dogs went ballistic. Mark didn't know what he had seen that night, and apparently never saw it again. To me, it sounded like a wendigo or a skinwalker based on his description. I told him that, but he had no idea what those things were. He seemed to think that the thing was actually leaving him gifts, but I wasn't so sure about that. I asked him about the typical creatures seen in creepypastas and television lore. I mentioned the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, Slenderman, the Rake, Siren Head, and some of the well-known others, but Mark didn't seem to know anything about any of them. He did, however, know about something he called the Whistler. Apparently, ever since he had been out there, he had heard an odd whistling sound on occasion. It would start off as a little more than a dull, barely audible noise in the distance. He said at times it would come closer, and at others it seemed like it was further away. Mark thought it was a bird for the longest time, but one night he found the truth. He was chopping wood when suddenly the whistling noise emerged. This time it was different, and it was closer than ever before. Suddenly, there was a rustling noise from behind him. Mark spun back, but only saw a few branches bristling back and forth. He then heard the whistle again, louder than ever before. He looked up, and there it was. About 20 feet up in a large oak tree was some kind of figure. Mark described it as kind of human, with a head that looked like some messed up eel. He said he saw the thing stare down at him with beady black eyes. He just froze, and before he could do anything, the thing suddenly leapt from the tree. It crashed into another further away, and continued whistling and crashing as it blended into the depths of the woods. I didn't know what to say to that. I have heard legends about the whistlers out in the woods, but I've never heard about anyone actually having seen one of them. The way he described it sounded quite creative, and I wondered whether he was capable of an imagination so elaborate, or if he had actually seen what he claimed. I asked him whether he thought this whistler was the same creature that was leaving him items, but he just shook his head. Without being prompted, he told me another tale about hearing voices in the woods sometimes, sometimes that of a young girl and sometimes it didn't sound human at all. I wondered whether my new friend was perhaps schizophrenic or suffered some mental illness that caused him to hear these things. I obviously didn't tell him that, but his claims had to be met with some amount of skepticism. What do you think it was? Mark leaned back and his head swiveled on his shoulders. No clue, son, and part of me hopes I never find out.
he went on to explain that he continued to hear voices on occasion, but never saw who or what was making them. He seemed to think all of the voices were coming from the same entity though. Without being prompted, he took the conversation an entirely new accusatory direction. It's the dang government sack, messing with things they got no business messing with. He then delved into a conspiratorial rant about how the government, and specifically the guys in black trucks, that were up to some really shady antics. He said they knew about gates in the forest, and had been actively trying to open them. He didn't elaborate on exactly what he meant by that. You see them out here? You know, government? CIA? Mark looked confused. CIA? He asked. It was my turn to look confused then. Yeah, Central Intelligence Agency. You know, Men in Black? Mark still appeared slightly puzzled. I didn't understand how a guy like him who hated the government to such an extreme degree had apparently never heard of the mother of all conspiracy agencies like the CIA. He then seemed to have an epiphany and his eyes lit up in recognition. Oh yeah, I forgot about them. He then laughed and shook his head as he downed another swig of ale. My memory ain't what it used to be, I'm afraid. Dang, how could I forget them? Well, in my defense, they don't carry no badges out here, and their vehicles don't exactly advertise who they work for. He paused and rubbed the back of his neck. But you've seen them out here. Mark met my eyes and nodded, without a doubt. Mark told me that one time he had been tracking an elk through the woods in late autumn. He'd followed the trail for a few miles when suddenly he heard a noise coming from a grove up ahead. It sounded nothing like a bear though, and more like several people arguing. Mark crept slowly forward, taking care not to disturb the foliage and remain out of sight. After a couple of seconds, he saw the outlines of several people emerge in the grove. One man was on his knees in the center, while four men in black suits surrounded him. The man on his knees had wounds and bruises, and his clothing was torn and tattered. He was asking the others for mercy, but they didn't appear to be the forgiving type. Two of the men were speaking quietly to one another, while the other two stood over to watch their apparent captive. The man on his knees was dressed in white, with Mark describing his clothes as looking like a surgeon's uniform, or maybe the attire of someone from an insane asylum. He listened but couldn't make out what the two other men were talking about, but they were clearly arguing. The man on his knees appeared to be weeping softly. Mark said he didn't know what to do, and before he could do anything, one of the two men who had previously been arguing stepped away. Without a word, the man stepped behind the captive, lifted the weapon, and pulled the trigger. Mark described seeing a splash of red, but said the weapon made a lot less noise than he thought it would have. The man in white fell down onto the dirt. Holy crap, I said, mouth falling agape as Mark concluded his story. I eyed him closely, but didn't see any aura of boasting in his eyes. They didn't twinkle like that of a man who tried telling a fabricated story to simply amaze or impress an audience. He didn't look at me at all, as a matter of fact. He just clasped his hands in front of his mouth and stared at the campfire with a somber gaze. It was clear to me that he was either an accomplished actor, or what he had witnessed truly haunted him. Poor boy, couldn't have been much older than you. I wish I would have done something, but I just ran. He shook his head, and his eyes seemed to glaze over. I just stay quiet, as there's nothing I could think to say. After a couple moments of lingering silence, Mark finally spoke again. Zack, I gotta tell you a secret. He looked me in the eye. I don't particularly care for the government. I chuckled, and Mark let out a small laugh. I think you've mentioned that once or twice, I replied with a laugh. Yeah, I suppose I have. But it's not just because the IRS is after me. 
It's because of things like what I saw that day. It's because government corrupts by its very nature. It takes what it wants and destroys those who oppose it. Ain't no justice. No consideration and nothing you can do about it. Now I don't know the details of what they were discussing on that night, but I guarantee you, that boy didn't deserve what he got. I nodded, but wasn't entirely convinced that he witnessed what he thought he had. You sure it was government that did that? Could have been drug dealers or mafia. Mark hunched his shoulders and gave me a side chuckle. What's the difference? I chuckled, but didn't have a response. Well, I see why you think that, but that's because you ain't spent as much time out here as I have. But what you don't know, and what no one is supposed to know, is about the tunnels. I peeked an eyebrow at that comment. Tunnels? Mark grinned and nodded back. There are a series of tunnels that run deep below the earth. Gotta be a couple dozen of them within a few miles of us now. Government knows about them. Maybe even built them. But, well, I doubt that. I think they're just interested by what's inside. And that is? I asked, now on the edge of my seat. Mark scoffed and shook his head. I have no idea but it's gotta be something bad. I was a bit disappointed with that answer, but Mark immediately drew my curiosity back. You wanna see one of them? I nodded without really even thinking. Mark grinned. I figured you might. It's a bit late in the day to go now, so what do you say we head out of here first thing in the morning? I agreed without hesitance, and I promised to return the next morning to meet up with Mark. I walked back down the trail that day with my imagination running wild. As I mentioned, I liked Mark very much and enjoyed our conversations. To me, he was somewhat like a compassionate grandfather with a plethora of exuberant stories that may or may not have been slightly exaggerated. I thought about all he had told me, about the found animals and the whistling thing, the voices in the tunnels. I wanted to believe him but urban legends abound in our day and age. I was still well aware that perhaps he had just concocted these stories after his decades of isolation. I needed to see some proof for myself. Dew glistened on the leaves, illuminated by the crimson sun rising over the hills as I set off the next morning. It was a bit chilly as I walked, but thoughts of the unknown kept me warm as I went on. Before long, I arrived at Mark and I's usual meeting spot and found him already waiting there for me. He greeted me, and without hesitation, we began the trek out to his spot. We made small talk on the way, mostly about normal topics like family and work. After maybe 15 minutes of walking, we rounded a small bend tucked behind a small grove of trees. Mark stepped out in front of a tree to face me. He then grinned and outstretched his right hand. I followed his gesture and felt my jaw strike the floor. There was an opening in the side of the hill that was lined with smooth stone and bricks. It was quite enormous, with the perimeter having been at least 15 feet wide. The opening appeared collapsed and the entrance was filled with rubble and dirt looking as though someone had intentionally, yet clumsily sealed it. Is that the tunnel? I asked. Mark nodded. One of many. But it wasn't sealed up like this last time I was here. How long ago was that? Mark shrugged. Don't know. Maybe a year or two. I looked back at the collapsed tunnel. It was clear that someone had gone through a great deal of effort to construct it but the construction didn't look like a mining operation. I'm no expert in mining or anything, but I can't imagine they would spend the time laying brick and creating such a wide entrance. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but the more curious fact was why it had been sealed up. I thought maybe it was just vandals, but that explanation somehow didn't satisfy. What's inside? I asked. Mark paused for a moment and stared toward the wreckage. He then shook his head and spat into the dirt. 
bad things. I hoped he'd elaborate on that, but he didn't. I mean, it'd have to be for someone to seal it up like that, right? That's impressive. Would have taken a great deal of effort. He was right about that, but I still felt that there was information that he was withholding from me. You think this is the government's work? Mark nodded. Not a single doubt in my mind about it. Mark's head then suddenly flicked to the side, and he stared into the trees as if something had alerted him. I watched the color drain from his cheeks as his mouth pursed open. We shouldn't go. I don't like lingering here for too long. I didn't argue, as clearly something had spooked him. He and I trekked back to his cabin, checking his snares on the way back. Mark found a pair of rabbits in his traps, and after, swiftly slung them over his shoulder. We got back to his cabin, and Mark set to work on harvesting the meat from the rabbits for his stew. I sat around petting Daisy and Rally as they slobbered all over my knee and panted endlessly. I don't think I ever told you the scariest part about living out here, did I? Mark asked. I looked up from the two dogs and stared at him, heart now beating with excitement. Mark sauntered over, carrying the meat of the rabbits along with the clump of chopped vegetables. He dumped the plate into the simmering cauldron on the fire, then took a seat across the fire. I stayed silent as he stared down at the flickering flames deep in thought. There are things out there that people don't know about. Creatures, places, and things that would seem to defy all explanation. The advancement of society and technology has led people to believe they're safe. And for the most part, they're right. So as long as they stay out of the woods, those things can't get them. But there is something that can. Mark paused and looked me straight in the eye. I call it the silence. He paused, as if to allow the words to immaculate the dread he felt they deserved. I had an inkling of an idea where the conversation was headed, but just waited for him to explain. There's been rumors about it for a very long time, and it's something that has just been affecting humanity for centuries, if not millennia. People have only just begun to realize it, but if they knew the true extent of what's going on, well, no one would ever go into the woods ever again. He paused and leaned in to stir the pot a bit before sitting back. People disappear, Zack. No reason for it, no explanation, no bodies are ever found. The cases seem to defy all explanation, and it happens again and again. Mark then suddenly grunted and began rubbing his eye. Ugh, dang smoke. Sorry, where was I? The disappearances, I replied. Mark seemed suddenly hesitant, as if he didn't know whether or not he should continue. Yeah, the disappearances. I don't particularly like talking about this, if I'm being honest. It's not really my business, but you're a good kid, Zach. And I know you come out here a lot, and I'd be devastated if anything were to happen to you. Dread crept around me like dozens of little spiders scurrying on my skin. I couldn't help but raise my guard and wonder where exactly this conversation was headed. Mark went on to tell me about this silence he mentioned. He said that if I was ever walking through the woods and everything went completely silent, I was to drop to my knees and put my face to the dirt immediately. He said to stay that way until the sounds returned to normal. And what if sound doesn't come back? I asked. Spine tingling with anxiety, Mark looked me straight in the eye, and his words offered nothing of comfort. Then God help you. He said no more about the subject, and I didn't push him on it. It was clear he wasn't really comfortable discussing it beyond his initial warning. If he had any theories about what was responsible, he didn't voice them. The whole conversation had given me a strong, missing 411 vibes, and I wondered whether he was referring to the same phenomenon. Both of us just sort of lingered in silence for a while as the stew finished cooking. 
After a few minutes, Mark leaned in and scooped two servings into bowls, handing one of them to me. The stew was delicious, as usual, and I happily scarfed it down as Mark provided his hounds with their dinner as well, although didn't so much as nibble on his own serving. What do you know about mimics? I don't know why exactly I asked, but the thought had suddenly arisen in my mind. Mark seemed to perk up, but yet stared back with a look of confusion that seemed to contradict his reaction. I'm sorry, what? Mimics, I clarified. Some call them imposters or liars, things that look and try to act human but aren't. Mark stared back at me and a small grin slithered onto his face. Now what would make you ask a question like that? Mark's grin evaporated as he stared back with something akin to contempt. Truth is, some of the things I'd seen from him made me question who he claimed he was. There was just a subtle wrongness to him, in a way I've never felt the words to accurately describe. Just curious, I replied, staring back. Mark chuckled, but without any humor in his tone. Your kind always is. Ever since your brothers took up arms against one another in the war of gray and blue, your curiosity has been quite insatiable. You think this land belongs to you. Like this country is your own personal proving grounds to pillage and destroy as you please. His form seemed to shift as he spoke, his eyes shrinking in their sockets, and his skin seemed to twitch. His teeth bared like fangs of a cougar and his long black hair flowing like a clump of wild eels. He leaned forward in a look that no longer seemed entirely human. Zack, there are things out here that your world of science and logic will never understand, and these things are better left alone. He and I just stared at one another, and I felt my heart beating. I thought about his words, the war of gray and blue, could he have been referring to the American Civil War? Why reference that event specifically? What year did you say you moved out here? I asked. Mark grinned, now appearing more menacing than ever before. 96. 1896. I don't understand. I replied, shaking my head. Your kind never does. His voice has suddenly changed, becoming much more high-pitched like that of a young girl. His head moved to the side and his grin grew almost literally ear to ear as his mouth stretched impossibly wide. Your kind has conquered this world. Both beast and nature bow to your might. You live in comfort, convinced that there is nothing that can get you anymore. His voice began changing again. But you are wrong. Mark then stood, and his form extended, making him tower over me and the campsite. Even Daisy and Raleigh started altering their form, like they were also simply hiding their true form. I got up and backed away, no longer seeing Mark as the friendly hermit I had thought him to be. I thought that movement would be my end, and that the beast that hid itself in the form of Mark was prepared to devour me whole. Before he did, I had one final question I had to ask. What are you? Mark chuckled, his form continuing to grow grossly inhuman. He then shook his head. Wrong question. His words bellowed forth, spoken in a chorus of a thousand voices all in unison. I took another step back, wondering what he could have meant by that. Then it struck me. What do you want? The thing I had once known as Mark stared down at me with an entirely human gaze. To watch and protect. We stared at one another and I attempted to understand what was happening. After all he had told me and his time devoted to actually speaking with me, part of me almost wanted to believe his words were meant to reassure me, like he was conveying that it was me or more generally humanity as a whole he wished to protect. After ruminating on it for a while though, I don't think that's the case anymore. Why are you telling me all this? 
The thing I had once known as Mark grinned, as if that was the question he was waiting to hear. So you can tell the world. And so, I have. I left Mark and that trail behind, and I have not been back since. That's why I'm here now, to tell the world, as that thing I once knew as Mark instructed me to. I don't even know why, or what exactly I'm supposed to be telling. Maybe that Mark is not human, and that there are things in the woods that will never be fully understood. Or maybe that he is watching, and something has given him a great deal of power for some reason. I wish I had more answers, but I had to share this, regardless of whether anyone will believe it. And needless to say, I don't think I'll be visiting Mark again anytime soon. Let me start by saying that I've never been much of an outdoorsy person. I grew up in a city in the States, so there weren't a lot of opportunities for me to bask in the wonders of nature. Even if there were, I still wouldn't budge from the couch and Nintendo just to get a glimpse of some plants and a ray of sunlight. No, I'd rather stay inside and waste my youth away in front of the television, just like other teenagers my age. On the few occasions I would venture outside, it would just be a quick walk to the local park to meet up with some of my friends. You know, the usual teenage behavior. Naturally, my mother grew worried. She thought I wasn't getting the natural benefits a kid my age ought to have, but she was seldom vocal about it. She was a single mother and sole provider for me and my younger brother, as our father passed some time ago so she had to work most of the time to provide for us all. Therefore, she wasn't around very often to dictate what we were or weren't supposed to do, which suited me just fine. During the summer before my first year of high school, however, she arranged for me and my brother to visit some family in Oslo, Norway, because she thought this was the perfect time for us to get out for a bit. My mother's sister, Aunt Lucy, had lived there with her Norwegian husband and their son for the past two decades or so, so our mother thought it would be a good opportunity for me and my brother to get, as she called it, some quality time outside with family. Like all the opportunities I had gotten before, I was quick to decline this one as well, as I had no interest in going to Scandinavia to meet a family I barely called twice a year. However, my mother stomped her foot down against my refusal and was adamant that my brother and I went along with it. Despite my initial rejection of her idea, as well as my general lack of interest, I agreed after some amount of persuasion from my mother's side. She said that if I agreed, then she would buy me a new game console to waste time on. My Nintendo had grown rather old and didn't work like it used to before, so I eventually accepted her terms, albeit reluctantly. My brother and I left the following week. It took us a couple of flights to get to Oslo. When we finally arrived, my first impression of Norway was already established. Very cold. Even in the middle of summer, it felt like an ice house there in comparison to my home city. As we waited at the airport for our relatives to arrive and pick us up, I felt like an alien standing amongst humans. The people were talking in a language that I had little prior knowledge about, and while my brother and I were standing there in our thick layered clothes and scarves, the locals were dressed rather casually. I guess they were more accustomed to the temperature than we were, and even found it comfy enough if they dressed in thinly as they were, whereas we were chilled to the bone. When our aunt and her family finally arrived to the airport, they greeted us with open arms, and I admit the hospitality was welcoming. I didn't stand too close to my aunt and her family, not as much as I would have wanted to, and we seldom never saw each other. At most, we would exchange a few letters or phone calls over the year, but we rarely, if ever, met face to face. To spend a couple of weeks with them was a huge step, but even though I was hesitant, I tried my best to welcome the change. Besides, it wasn't like I could do anything about it. Our cousin's name was Jonas. 
He wasn't much older than me, and since we shared a couple of hobbies, such as gaming, it helped to break the ice knowing that there was someone I could relate to. All of us spent the first couple of days getting to know each other better than we had before. The family lived in a privileged two-story house on the outskirts of the city, which had been renovated only a few months prior. It was a good place to stay, and I found myself enjoying it there farther than I had initially anticipated. Our aunt and uncle were treating my brother and I as though we had known each other for far longer than we really had. But since my uncle was Norwegian, he occasionally struggled with a few English terms. Nonetheless, I appreciated the efforts. Our uncle was a wildlife biologist and was often absent from his family because of his work. During our stay there, however, we would all be going along with him out to the dense Norwegian forest a bit further from the city while he worked on some projects with his colleagues, which involved observing some animals there. We would be staying in the cabin that the family owned but seldom used, and he promised us that we would have the time of our life there. At first, I wasn't sure about this idea. After all, I wasn't too keen on the prospect of going into the wilderness as I would rather stay in the house and play games with my cousin. However, after Jonas too insisted that we would have a great time, and after my little brother became thrilled about it as well, I knew that I had lost against their argument. We left for the cabin a couple of days later. The drive there took us a few hours, and the view of the vast city gradually vanished into the distance. I was quick to take note of the Norwegian landscape, I had very rarely seen so many trees, plants, and fauna where I came from, and I had to admit it, it was rather beautiful to look at. The sound of the birds singing in the distance and the wind blowing the branches of the trees brought out a sense of serenity in me that I didn't know I had needed, nor yearned for, and the majority of my discomfort vanished like dust in the wind. By the time we arrived at the cabin, it was already dark outside. To my dismay, the place wasn't as renovated as the house back in Oslo. It was a one-story cabin with one of those dry toilets outside that you couldn't flush with water. The cabin itself seemed old-fashioned and ancient like it had been built several centuries earlier in a time period far less advanced than this one. Fortunately, it had electricity, but only to manage the lights, and there wasn't any signal there either so having our phones there was essentially useless. We were practically stranded in the middle of the forest with only trees stretching for miles, and had it not been for the car, it would have taken us days to reach civilization on foot. Despite its lack of modernity, the cabin was accommodating enough. It had a kitchen, a storage room, and what seemed to be a living room. They had ordinary commodities like a couch and a table, not to mention a fireplace that was used to regulate the temperature in the place. However, since the cabin had two bedrooms, the three of us boys had to share one of them, whereas our aunt and uncle shared the other. The room we slept in was barely large enough to house one person, much less three, and to make matters worse, Jonas was the only one with a bed. My brother and I had to lie in sleeping bags on the floor, and the lack of spaciousness as well as the sound of my brother nightly sleep-talking, didn't make it easy to doze off, so I spent the majority of my evenings lying awake in my bag next to my loud brother. We spent the first days making ourselves at home in the cabin. While it took some effort on my part, I eventually found some sense of appreciation for the solitude. While I wouldn't call it an immense fondness per se, I would still much prefer my Nintendo and warm bed over what I visibly had at my disposal, but given the circumstances, I was in no place or shape to make demands. We ate warm food on the stove, drank fresh water from the well close to the cabin, and spent the evenings playing cards or board games with one another before we called it a night. Our uncle would occasionally take us deeper into the forest to get a look at the animals there, and we would be lucky if we caught a glimpse of a moose or a fox. All in all, Things could have been considerably worse, but one thing I never grew accustomed to was the toilet. It reeked with a hideous stench, and going there was always an ordeal, especially in the middle of the night when it was pitch black outside. One night, after having failed to fall asleep once again because of my brother's consistent sleep talking, I felt the need to use the toilet, 
At first, I tried to hold it, but to no lasting success. I got up from my sleeping bag and headed out of the house with a flashlight. It was very quiet outside and the darkness shrouded the deep and dense forest in a way that only added to the eerie atmosphere. I was not used to that kind of silence, and quite frankly, it was unnerving to listen to. I felt watched in a way I couldn't describe, and I would occasionally hear a twig being snapped or branches brushing against each other. That alone made me feel separated from the rest of the world, and the longer I stared into the dark abyss, the more it seemed like the dark was staring back at me. Without wasting time, I quickly went to the dry toilet and shut the door behind me. The smell was ever so revolting, but I went ahead and did my business. When I was done, I was about to head back outside the cabin when I discovered my brother standing on the porch, looking out into the distance with this vague glimpse in his eyes. Initially thinking he was simply sleepwalking, again, I was about to nudge him back inside when I realized that he was fully awake. What are you doing out here? I asked him. I was just listening to music, he answered, not sounding like he was entirely there. The music, I asked, and looked back at the forest. I didn't hear anything but the unusual noises that the trees produced, so naturally, I thought he was just hearing things because he was still half asleep. However, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched through the tree line, and would rather not stick around to find out. My brother pointed at the forest and into the nothingness between the trees. She's playing her tune, and she wants me to follow her. I wanted to ask him what it was he meant, but I knew I wouldn't get any reliable answers from him, so I took him by the shoulder and led him back inside the cabin. Surprisingly, he let me do so without fighting back and simply faltered through the cabin door like a zombie, taking this as a sign that he had simply heard things. I was about to shut the door behind us when I heard what sounded like a violin playing in the distance of the trees. It was a beautiful tune, like something straight out of a musical. I glanced back at the darkness and thought I saw a pair of reflective orbs looking back at me, like those of a cat's eyes in the night. I wanted to follow them and figure out where they led to, but since I had to see my brother back to the room, I hesitantly shut the door and guided him in. Jonas was sleeping sound in his bed, and after putting my brother into his sleeping bag, I finally succeeded to fall asleep as well. The dream I had that night was strange and intoxicating. I was standing near a pond at what appeared to be an open clearing in the middle of the forest, yet everything around me seemed distorted. The water in front of me was dark and murky, seemingly bottomless. Then a figure emerged from the depths of the pool, and I froze as I laid my eyes on it. It was a beautiful woman in the middle of the pond, untouched by the cruelties of the world in a way that I couldn't even comprehend. Her skin looked pale and smooth, and she had unearthly long, dark hair that reached down to the black waters below, making it seem like her hair was one with it. Her eyes were equally as dark as though the night had swallowed them whole. And yet, they looked at me in a way that could make even a mother's gloving gaze pale in comparison. She reached one of her arms from the water and beckoned for me to come with her with a flick of a finger. She smiled in a way that was ambiguous, and yet, I still found myself complying with her silent demands, without any will to withstand her orders. I made my way into the water to join her. The pond felt cold against my skin but I didn't as much fidget as I began to swim where she was. It was all I wanted, it seemed. The closer I got, however, the more her facial features began to contort themselves into a monstrous creature. Her once beautiful neck developed gills that oozed some kind of tar-like substance. Her smooth skin became covered in fish-like scales, and her face, her beautiful face, shifted into that of an inhuman creation with razor-sharp, red-drenched teeth. She smiled at me so sinisterly that nothing could compare to it. Before I could turn back, she grabbed me and pulled me down beneath the dark waters. I kept thrashing and struggling in her grip, but her nails dug deep into my flesh like a pair of knives and kept me under until everything faded to complete darkness that matched the pond. I woke up with a startle 
gasping for air and feeling as though I had just spent all of my energy and breath on running a marathon. My clothes were soaked thoroughly with sweat, as though I had really been diving in cold water the night before. My neck ached painfully from where I had been grabbed in the dream. Needless to say, the sensation wasn't welcoming in the slightest. I spent a couple of minutes catching my breath there on the bedroom floor. Even though it was so early that the sun was barely up, I decided to get ready for the day. I was already awake and doubted that I would be able to fall back asleep again. So what was the point of lying about? As I got to my feet and onto the cold floor, I felt like I stepped on something wet. Looking down, I discovered a trail of wet footsteps that led from the foot of my sleeping bag out the front door of the cabin, which had been left wide open by whoever had entered. Being the logical individual I was, I initially assumed that I had just been sleepwalking, or maybe my brother again. Maybe it had been Jonas, or our aunt, or uncle. Either of those assumptions was plausible, but something in the back of my brain told me that none of those alternatives were correct. Besides, why would it be wet? When everyone gathered around in the kitchen table for breakfast that morning, I asked if anyone had left the front door wide open, or if they had gone to our room in the middle of the night. I knew that it was a stupid question, and just the way my aunt looked at me indicated that none of them knew what I was talking about. So I ignored the subject altogether and tried to turn to a more logical explanations for compensation. It was probably just my brother after all, and he had gone walking in and out of the house and asleep again. Nothing more than that, and nothing less. The ache in my neck, however, didn't lessen that morning, nor did the feeling that something wasn't quite right. That day, our uncle would be occupied with some colleagues in the area, so he suggested that the three of us boys went fishing in a pond that was located a little further up in the forest. The word pond was enough to send shivers down my spine, but I tried to ignore it and went along with the idea for the sake of getting my mind on something else for a change. After packing our equipment, me, my brother, and Jonas headed into the woods on our own while our Aunt Lucy stayed behind to prepare food for later. Being on our own made us feel like a grown-up, and soon enough, that horrible nightmare was washed off my mind like a stain of ketchup on my shirt. Though the pain of my neck served as a constant reminder of what I had dreamt of, the walk didn't take too long, maybe half an hour or so. As we went, I couldn't help but notice my brother was acting a little bit different. He was usually chirpy and always had something to say, but he was quiet and didn't as much as utter a sound as he walked. It was unnervingly uncharacteristic of him, and being the caring, albeit occasionally pushing brother I was, I was quick to put a question mark on it. What's up? I asked him as we neared our destination. Are you okay? He looked at me with those same empty eyes he had the night before. Then, he broke into a smile. I'm just focusing on the music, he said, and I was reminded of what he had told me the night before. The same music? I asked and stopped for a moment to listen, but didn't hear anything. The music she plays, she's good with the violin. Who's she? The lady by the pond, the same one that visited us last night. I halted in my steps as I heard this. Visited us? What are you talking about? She left you a kiss. He innocently poked at my neck. Don't you remember? I touched my neck as he said this. While there was no mark of any kind on my skin, I could still feel the ache there as vividly as I could in that dream. I wouldn't exactly call that a kiss, and I most certainly wouldn't go as far as to say that I fully believed a woman had given it to me in my sleep. No, I don't remember it, I said. My brother looked at me in a way that I didn't find comforting. His eyes remained hollow as the night, almost bottomless, like the pond from my dreams. He didn't say a single word, but that alone was enough to send shivers down my spine. After a few seconds, he resumed with walking, and I promptly followed behind. When we finally arrived, I noticed that the pond in front of us looked eerily familiar to the dream. The clearing of the forest seemed the same. The water was a little less murky, but still haunting to look at. And the feeling of isolation struck me like a slap to my face. I expected the creature from the depths to emerge and drown us all, but there was nothing there. Still, as much as I wanted to leave, 
I knew that I would put the brakes on Jonas's fun. After all, he seemed to be the most excited about going to the lake. At first, I thought this was because he wanted to fish, but then he started stripping down. I knew his intentions were to dive straight into the water instead. Isn't it cold? I asked as I tried to dissuade him from going in. Are you sure it's safe? Jonas laughed as he threw his clothes next to his bag. It's fine. There's nothing there, I promise. Come on, it'll be fun. I don't think you should go. I persisted and put my bag down on the grass. There could be something in the water. It's fresh, so I doubt it, Jonas added dismissively. If you're not going to do it, then I'm not going to force you. I ain't got those same reservations. And with that said, he jumped right into the water with a loud splash and disappeared beneath the murkiness until no trace of him could be seen from the surface. I wanted to go after him, but just as I was about to pull off my shoes, he re-emerged from the water with a grin on his face. Told you it was fine, he said as he began to swim further away on his back until the distance between us grew quite prominent. As I watched my cousin relax in the water, a wave of relief washed over me. Maybe I had just been overthinking things. Of course, it was just a nightmare, and everything would just turn out fine. I continued to try to put the image of the disfigured woman behind me, but as I turned to my brother and discovered that he too had stripped down, my alertness came back like a switch had been flicked. You're not going in there, I said and grabbed him by the arm, but he shook my hand off with ease. The lady is waiting for us, he said faintly and pointed to where Jonas was swimming in the water. There is no lady in the water, I insisted. It was just a dream. But she's waiting for us. No, she's not. I reached to grab him again, but before I could, he jumped into the water and made his way over to where Jonas was. My stomach plummeted to the bottom of my abdomen like a ten-pound brick as I watched him go, and a million thoughts rushed through my head. I didn't know why though. I mean, it was just a bad dream. As far as I could tell, the woman wasn't anywhere to be seen. She was just that, part of a dream, and I had nothing to worry about. I started to feel relaxed enough to take off my shoes and the rest of my stuff until I stood there. Just as I was done, I started to hear what sounded like a violin playing close by. The same beautiful tune I had heard from last night echoed through my eardrums, and I was starting to debate whether or not I had truly lost my mind. I listened closer and realized that it was coming from the pond, as though whoever was playing the instrument was trembling with it from beneath the depths of the water. Then I heard Jonas let out an ear-deafening scream from where he was, and upon snapping my attention to him, I saw her. The deformed woman from my dream stood there in the water, with her bony, scale-covered arms stretched toward Jonas in an effort to grab him. He quickly swam away out of her reach. But just as it seemed like he was out of immediate harm's way from the creature, my brother suddenly emerged from the water right next to him and proceeded to pull him under. Despite my brother being roughly 90 pounds or so and rather skinny for his age, he managed to pull our older cousin underneath with seemingly no difficulty. I watched in paralyzed horror as Jonas fell beneath the murky water whilst his arms waved above the surface in a futile effort to regain his breath. The woman or whatever it was, watched the spectacle in front of her with evident bemusement. Even though the waters were deep, she stood there completely still, like she didn't need to move in order to stay afloat. Her black eyes were aimed at the view, and then she tilted her head to look at me. I was completely frozen. Even as I watched my brother sink my cousin, I couldn't move a single muscle for the duration of it. The woman's lips parted, and her razor-like teeth shone like diamonds in the sun and she smiled a malevolent, vicious smile that not even the devil's grin can compare to. Jonas's arm stopped moving and gradually descended to the water. My brother still held him down and didn't seem moved by his act in the slightest. His face was void of any kind of remorse or emotion, and for a moment, I even doubted it was my brother. My brother couldn't as much as hurt a fly without bursting into tears, so this was something entirely otherworldly. He then looked at me, and I saw his eyes had turned completely dark like the pond he was in, just like the woman's eyes. He began to make his way over to her and embraced her like she was our mother, 
The creature enveloped her arms around him in return, and they both turned to look at me with those equally dark eyes. Then, each of them stretched an arm towards me without letting go of one another, and they called out to me. Come to us, they said in perfect unison, and I can only describe the sound of their voices as hollow and inhuman. While my Norwegian skills were questionable at best, I knew they were saying, come to us. At that moment, it felt like my body had gotten a mind of its own, because I no longer felt like I was the one in control. Like a puppet with strings, I began to walk towards the edge of the pond, with the intent of jumping in. I wanted to go with them. It was like being a child again, and being called to your mother for a hug. It was all I could focus on. I didn't seem to care about the fact that my cousin had just sunk in front of my very eyes, and the image of him floating around somewhere down in the water was erased from my mind like markings on a piece of paper. I can't describe how or why, but the second my toes made contact with the cold water, I snapped out of my trance and sprinted as far away from there as I could manage. I didn't even bother to get dressed or to bring my stuff with me. I just ran as fast as I could without stopping for a moment. My bare feet ached as I stepped over rocks and branches on the path back to the cabin, where I found my aunt preparing lunch on the porch. When she saw me, she instantly knew something was wrong. I tried to tell her what happened, but my lungs were completely empty of oxygen, and my body possessed barely enough energy to stand. In fact, I fainted right there on the porch, and I don't remember much of what happened after that. However, I recall seeing that hideous woman in the pond. I remember seeing my brother still there with her, and I remember hearing that beautiful but nightmare-inducing violin music ringing in my ears. Years have gone by, and nothing ever came out of the investigation that was launched. They never found my brother, or my cousin, or that deformed woman for that matter. No matter how many divers they sent into the pond, there was absolutely nothing there. My family had tried to have me mentally evaluated since what I told them had made no sense. In a way, I couldn't really blame them, but after I was deemed perfectly sane, my answer still couldn't provide them with any clues. They simply thought I was in shock, and because they didn't find them, my brother and cousin were simply reported as missing. My mom hasn't been the same since. Her once lively and energetic self was gone the moment she heard about what happened to my brother. I no longer see her smiling like she used to, and whenever I bring the subject up, she will shun me like a plague and lock herself inside of her room, or simply pretend like she didn't hear anything at all. I don't hear much from my aunt or uncle anymore either. I'm not going to go as far as to say they blame me for what happened to their son, but I can tell that simply talking to me over the phone brings them immeasurable pain. I'm also saddened by the loss of two valued members of my family, but what weighs me down, even more, is the fact that I'm the only one who's aware of what really happened to them, and I can't tell anyone. I guess that's why I'm posting this here. I'm trying to get some kind of closure, but I can't seem to get any closure to putting what happened to me behind me as much as I've tried. It doesn't really help that I still hear that grotesque melody in the back of my mind wherever I go, and I still see those pitch black, inhuman eyes in my sleep. I have nightmares about that event to this day, and when I wake up, I find my clothes are soaked with sweat and my floorboards are covered in puddles of water. The creature is still out there. I know it. It's some place back in Norway, taking people just like it had with my little brother and my cousin, and it still yearns for me, the one who got away. One day, I might go back there to bring this all to an end, but something tells me that I won't return. I hope I do. I sincerely do. But that thing wasn't, isn't, human. It has some kind of effect on people that makes them bend to its will. If I return, I doubt I'll be as lucky as I was back when I was a teenager. Hello everybody, my name is Denver Dark. I'm 19 years old, fresh out of high school, working as a park ranger at the Caledon State Park in Virginia. My job is pretty easy. I don't usually patrol the park. My job is to sit in the radio room and wait for people to call in if they need assistance. 
This can range from somebody needing the bathroom door unlocked to a drunken fight. A couple of months ago, I thought I had an encounter with a type of creature, or maybe even an alien. I'm not sure at this point. This forever scarred me, and I will always be paranoid of the forest. It was a normal evening at the park. I looked over at the clock on my desk as it clicked over to 6 p.m. Well, there goes another night by myself, I said aloud as all of the other park rangers packing up to leave. Another hour passed and I was eating my dinner. Static started coming through the radio. After a couple seconds of just the static, a girl's voice started to come through. Hello, hello, is anyone there? I paused for a second after chewing another bite of my food. I have never heard anything like that over the radio before, so I picked it up. Hello, this is Officer Dark here. Yes, she yelled before continuing her sentence. Please help me. Something is chasing me. I was dumbfounded. The creepy part was she didn't say someone. She said something. I quickly calmed myself before responding. Calm down, miss. Tell me where you are and I can send out help immediately. I'm at the old watchtower on the northeast side of the park. I ran here after it chased me out of my cabin. Please help. I think it's close. It's alright, miss. I'll send out help. I was cut off by her. Shh. I stopped talking, listening to the radio. Then I heard a very soft but aggressive growl come from the speaker. Oh no. It's here. As she finished her sentence, I heard a crash of a window and a large thud on the wood floor. The radio cut out. I was in complete shock. What did I hear? After about a minute of me being absolutely glued to my seat with terror, I started to gather a plan in my head. I spun around in my chair and grabbed the old park map off the desk next to me. I unfolded it frantically, scanning it to look for an old watch tower. It was on the northeast side of the park, just like she said. To the looks of it, it would take me about an hour to walk there. I got up from my chair and walked over to the gun cabinet, unlocking it with the keys I had in my pocket. I grabbed the first gun I saw, a 12 gauge shotgun, along with some extra shells. I also saw a flare gun on the top shelf and decided to take that too. Before leaving the station, I made sure I had everything I needed. Shotgun, flare gun, radio, flashlight, pocket knife, and map. I'm not gonna lie, I was scared to go out into the woods after that whole event. I hated the idea of being alone, but I knew I couldn't just sit there and do nothing. As I exited the station, I was greeted by a cool breeze and a beautiful sunset of a summer evening. All of the night bugs and animals started to come out. I could hear the calling of the cicadas in the trees while the crickets buzz below them on the ground. It's weird, because you wouldn't think such a breathtaking scene could hold such a horror that the lady experienced. Since it was a long walk, I started moving at a faster pace than I normally would. As I was about 10 minutes away from the tower, everything changed. Once an amazing sunset now turned the forest into a pitch black that no person can see into, along with the deafening sound of silence as the cicadas and crickets stopped chatting. This was extremely odd. I had been in the forest many times at night and nothing like this ever happened. A few more minutes of walking later and I saw the old watchtower. It was about 70 feet tall or so with a hut on top of it. The watchtower had seen better days. The wood looked very old with it being damp and cracked in many spots. At this point, I was at the base of the tower. Right before I was about to go up on my first step, I got the worst feeling I've ever felt. My head started to spin. I was very nauseous and started to see stars. As this continued, I thought I was going to pass out. As the darkness around my eyeballs started to grow, everything stopped. I was normal again, except for one feeling. It felt like someone was staring at me. I swear I could feel its eyes glaring to the back of my head. Its glare almost felt sharp. I spun around quickly as I could, holding the shotgun in front of me. Nothing. There's nothing, I thought. Until I scanned the tree line in front of me, about 50 or so feet out. 
Oh my gosh. I let out as I see deep in the forest, a pair of two vibrant yellow eyes staring at me. I was struck with fear, my eyes not being able to leave the sight, my feet almost cemented in the ground. After a minute of me staring at it, it winked at me. After this, the eyes disappeared and went back into the brush. I didn't know what to think. The only thing that I knew was to not stay in that spot. I ran up the old wooden stairs as fast as I could, but then I remembered the radio call I had gotten earlier. I prepared myself for a bad scene, but when I reached the top of the steps, the hut was empty. Nobody. No lady. The most disturbing thing of all, though, was it looked like this place hadn't been touched in years. The floors and the desk in the room were both completely covered in cobwebs and dust. A large radio sat on the desk. It must have been the one that came through to mine, but that was too engulfed by the webs. Something very strange is happening. I just couldn't figure it out. On the edge of a desk was a stack of very old newspapers. My curiosity took over and I picked one up. Date, 1978. Headline. Woman attacked and taken by the Wampus Cat, locals say. This didn't make any sense. This couldn't be the same lady I just contacted. I needed to find out more, so I kept on reading. The next thing I read sent shivers down my spine. The Wampus Cat resembles a very large black panther, most known for their very bright eyes. My skin ran cold. I needed to get out of this place right now. Right as I shoved the newspaper into my pocket and was ready to run, it was too late. Before I could turn around, I heard a sound. That same chilling growl I heard over the radio. I turned around as fast as I could, raising my shotgun. There it was, the beast itself, the wampus cat. This cat was massive, quite possibly the biggest mammal I had ever seen. It stood on all fours at a staggering height of at least eight feet tall. It had deep old scars all over its body, probably from people like me. Its paws were the size of small dinner plates. The lips were completely bared back, showing its fangs. And the most important thing of all, those eyes staring into my soul. I didn't waste any time and pulled the trigger, sending a slug at my target. I landed the shot, but it barely did anything. The cat staggered back when the slug hit him, but that's about it. How is this thing still going? The round had left a hole in its torso about the size of a dollar coin, but alas, the creature was pretty much unfazed. I decided to run for it, booking it to the exit, only to be stopped by the huge feline pouncing on my back and pinning me to the wood floor. The beast raked its claws across my back, leaving a painful wound. It felt like a hot iron. I could feel my shirt already being soaked. I managed to flip around on my back and face the beast, holding it away from my face. Although I was able to keep its head at bay, I wasn't with the paws. It started swiping at my face, leaving those claw marks on me again. I tried to reach for a shotgun on the ground next to me, but I wasn't able to. Liquid from the gashes started to seep into my eyes, stinging them, not allowing me to see. With nothing working and all of the strength I was losing, I started to give up. There was no point, I couldn't overpower this thing, and right then I was about to give in, thinking about all of my friends and family. An idea sparked into my head. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the knife I had forgotten about. I flipped it open and immediately got the cat in the neck. The beast reared back in pain, leaping off of me. This was my only chance to escape. I quickly got up and snatched the shotgun before sprinting down the stairs. I had a head start, but the cat was catching up. As I reached the bottom, it was already halfway down. I didn't have any time to spare. I ran immediately to the trails, not looking behind me. I could hear the big, heavy footsteps of the beast on my tail end. I knew eventually it was going to catch up, so I turned around, pumping two more slugs in it, staggering it again. I could tell it was hurt, because it was moving a lot slower. I fired again in its direction, landing another shot with a splat. Then the cat stopped running, turning around and slowly jogging the other direction. I finally gave up. This didn't stop me from sprinting back to the station. I used every bit of strength and willpower to make it back. 
As I busted through the door of the building, the biggest wave of relief came over me. I had won. I had beaten that thing. After attending to my wounds and grabbing a glass of water, I sat down in my desk chair, thankful to be alive. While reaching into my pocket to take out my phone, I felt paper. Ah, the newspaper. I pulled it out, scanned the article once again, realizing that I missed something before. The woman was found in the watchtower of the Caledon State Park. Even though she was taken, many of the people in the park say they can still hear her calling for help, just like that same night she disappeared. I was completely in shock. I didn't know what to think. Was it a ghost? Or maybe a spirit? And right as I put the newspaper down, the radio buzzed playing the same voice that started this all. Hello. It's been three days since I discovered the truth. Three days of isolation, paranoia, and hopelessness. Three days since I met it. I'm not sure how much time I have left. Anyone could be its puppet, lurking outside of this decrepit cabin. So please, if you're reading this, take my warning seriously. There is something out there. Like I said before, it all started three days ago. I recently found a new hobby, exploring the world. So far, I've been to around 40 states and 15 countries. Each place offered a variety of wonderful locations and people. I learned about different cultures, languages, and historical events. I would send pictures and videos to my family back home. I could tell by their messages that they were as intrigued as I was. Unfortunately, during my travels, I also witnessed a couple of battles occur. Those are the days I wish to forget, but nothing was as disturbing as what I just encountered. I was traveling through the forest in the northwestern United States. I was alone with my car and my back seat full of supplies. Eventually, I left my car in the parking lot and started walking down a trail. Every few minutes I would stop and admire the beauty of nature, the plants, the animals, the nice cool air. All of it was refreshing and calming. I thought I was going to have a pretty good day, but then the sun began to set. That's when I first saw him. First, I just heard the rustling of leaves and the crackling of sticks. I thought it was some large animal so I tried my best not to spook it. I was proven wrong when a humanoid figure stepped out of the forest. He was motioning for me to come closer, but I refused. He shook his head and before I could react, he charged at me. But instead of attacking me, he just looked at me once he got close. Now that I had a better view of him, I could see that he was an older man with a long, gray beard and ripped, dirt-stained clothes. His eyes stood out to me the most. The look in his eyes was that of a deranged, yet horrified person. I stared back up, but the old man shouted, Wait. I was growing more concerned as I asked, What do you want? Do you need help? The man smirked and he said, No, I'm fine. It's you who needs help, friend. Friend, I don't even know you, I thought. He continued, I saw something deep in that forest. A coffin. A flying one. Oh no, he's actually crazy, I said to myself. The man looked me straight in the eye and said, The coffin is home to the demon known as the... Before he could finish, I took off running, leaving him behind. Soon it was night. Only the stars and my flashlight illuminated my path. I was thinking about the strange old man. Why did he attack me? What was this demon that he was talking about? Whatever, I thought. I just hope I don't encounter any other insane people. Oh, I didn't. What I stumbled upon was far, far worse. I eventually exited the forest and found myself in an open field. The night breeze was especially soothing after that strange encounter. I took out my blanket and sat on the vast plain of grass. Looking at the stars always helped me sleep, and that night there were quite a few of them. As I felt myself falling asleep, I heard a particular noise. It was like a deep, reverberating hum coming from every direction. When I opened my eyes, 
I couldn't believe what I saw. It was a light brown coffin, covered with moss and dirt, and it was flying. Was that old man actually right? No, this is a dream, I said to the coffin in front of me. In response, an otherworldly voice boomed across the land. Oh, this is no dream, Jerry. In fact, I've been expecting you. I utterly refused to believe this was real. I did everything I could to convince myself that this was a dream. Come on, just wake up. I slapped myself several times, but the coffin was still there. Like I said, this is real. Now, I would like to show you something fascinating. I gave up. Whether this was a dream or not, it was clear that this thing would not let me leave. Who, who are you? I asked timidly. It answered, I have so many names. My true name would destroy your sentience, turning you into a mindless husk, so you can just call me the Void Lurker. Cruel laughter echoed through the field as it saw me get paler and paler every second. The longer I stood before it, the stronger its presence felt. I could tell that whatever this thing was, it was far from benevolent. I found the courage to ask it a second question. What do you want from me? It chuckled again as it said, Good question. Well, since you stumbled upon my prison, I would like to show you a vision that I find amusing. Before I could even blink, a flash of light seemed to engulf me. The vision it sent me was of a planet, one that clearly hadn't been discovered by humanity. I noticed the barren landscape full of green rocks and a bizarre purple sky. However, that's not what caught my attention. What I was focused on was the life. Yes, this planet had fully sentient organisms. A vaguely bird-like creature with seven beady eyes and beaks running down its back devoured a swarm of flying insects. What looked like a hybrid between a mutant crab and a rodent scampered into its burrow. I was so fascinated that I forgot about the monster that sent me this vision. At least, I did until I heard its horrible laughter echoing through my head. The Void Lurker chuckled. Why don't you stop looking at this pathetic patch of dirt? Look behind you. I hesitantly turned around, and that's when I saw it. It was an entire city with buildings that didn't look too odd. Suddenly, I was thrown into the center of the city, and I saw its inhabitants. They were humanoid beings with turquoise skin and yellow eyes. They were clearly interacting with each other, but they spoke a language I could not understand. The entity spoke again. Oh, here comes my favorite part, it exclaimed. Before I could question what it meant, the entire planet seemed to vibrate. The panicked and confused citizens looked up at the sky as what looked like a huge portal opened up. No, it wasn't a portal. It was like a tear in the very fabric of reality itself. A gaping hole of nothingness. The entire sky seemed to warp around it as it emitted a dreadful humming noise. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was what the Void Lurker said. So, do you like my true appearance? Because here it is. At least, that's as close as you can get to comprehending it. I was mortified. The being who was taunting me, sending me these visions. I barely managed to mutter. W what did you do? It replied with, What did I do to the planet? You're about to find out. The humming grew louder as a horde of abominations descended. Disgusting masses snaked through the city, consuming the terrified citizens. Draconic beasts raised countless villages. The depraved creature forced me to watch. Their faces will haunt me forever. The lurker's minions marched across the entire planet, destroying everything in their path. And then, it was over. I was back on Earth looking at the same floating coffin that housed the eldritch monstrosity that goes by the name of the Void Lurker. I was trying to register what I just saw, what those demons did to that poor world. I've seen wars break out, but I have never seen anything that scared me as much as this. And that makes sense. That level of devastation hasn't been seen by anyone on this planet. Right when I thought it couldn't get any worse, that sadistic entity just had to tell me one more thing. 
This stuck with me even more than that vision. You know, it said, I didn't just destroy that one planet. I wiped out every last world in the universe, except for your precious Earth. That's why you fools were never contacted by extraterrestrial life forms. They're all gone. I just stared at this thing in utter shock. I just felt like collapsing, like giving up and having that thing get me. But I found the strength to ask one last question. Well, why didn't you destroy Earth? The void lurker cackled again before saying, I was going to, of course, but unfortunately, I'm not the only cosmic force in existence. The others found my actions to be terrible. They didn't understand the beauty of the complete destruction, so they teamed up against me, and after a battle that lasted for eons, they imprisoned me on this coffin on the very planet I intended to annihilate in order to completely wipe out the universe. The funny thing is, I was just imprisoned just a few days ago. Which is why very few humans who came to this field ever met me. Anyway, I may never escape, but my influence will still spread. Oh no, I thought. Don't tell me. I knew what it meant. It was going to try to possess someone, maybe even a whole population. It wasn't going to stop until it saw the world burn. I've been thinking, the lurker continued. Since you know all about me now, why don't I make things a little more interesting? My body froze as I continued to stare at the coffin, dreading what it would do or say next. A tendril of smoke made its way out of the coffin and started wrapping around my body. Its icy form made its way to my face and to my eye. There was no pain, only the loss of hope. It was in there for what felt like hours, though it was probably only a few minutes. The unnerving tentacle flew out from me and back into the coffin. Ah, the void lurker said. Now I know about everyone you have ever interacted with. Your family, your friends, your enemies, even people you've talked to once. I know them all, and now I'm going to influence one, or two, or twenty, who knows. And once they finish you off, I'll have them begin a new reign of chaos. The age of humanity has ended. And with that, the coffin seemed to vanish. I left the field and walked out of the forest without a word. None of the sounds of night calmed me, nor did they frighten me. I was almost numb to my surroundings. Those images of aliens in agony continued to flash in my head. The void lurker's words never left my mind either. At this point, I didn't know what to do. If I didn't tell my family, that demon would easily corrupt them. But then, if I did tell them, they would think I was insane, and the void lurker would still be able to possess them. As I walked to my car, I saw the same old man standing there. I completely forgot about him. The man flashed a creepy smile before asking, Did you meet it, friend? I didn't answer him. I just walked past him with a blank look on my face as I opened the door. He said, So you did. Without another word, I drove off. As soon as I drove, I thought about my plan. I knew I had to warn someone. Anyone. I couldn't return home. For all I knew, my family was already possessed and waiting for me. I eventually stopped at an abandoned cabin. And that's where I remain until now. With nothing but food, water, this piece of paper, and my thoughts. So please, if you find this, Warn someone. They may not believe you, but just have them read my message so they can somewhat be prepared for whatever this thing was planning. Maybe we'll have the chance to prevent the largest disaster this planet has ever seen. I fear I'm running out of time. I hear high-pitched giggling, scratching on the windows, and I swear I see a few familiar faces staring at me from the darkness. Imagine your worst nightmare coming true. Scary, right? Well, for some people, it's a lot more terrifying. I live in a small town in the north. It's your cliche, everyone knows everyone. 
John's barbecue and grill is being held after church service on Sunday. Kids playing hopscotch with the other three kids their age. And of course, almost everyone is living the American dream. White picket fences surrounding a two-story home with their kids and dog. I say almost everyone, cause some of us aren't so lucky. Yeah, sure, you could say I had a rough childhood. It wasn't the worst though. I still had a roof over my head and food to eat and some friends. Well, behind my house, there are about 10 acres of land. Great for hunting, bad for getting lost. My parents, the kind souls they are, would let people hunt behind their house for free if they'd like to. Many people did. Of course, since it was free, the word went around town pretty quickly, and more and more people asked us to hunt. As more people asked, we obtained a reputation. Teens would say it's haunted, but the parents would make them hush up and be friendly. Of course, they were friendly. A town that is so worried about their own reputation, they get obsessed over every conversation. After working so hard, they wouldn't let their children soil it. The first Saturday night I returned home for winter break was easily the most horrifying experience I had ever witnessed. During my freshman year of college, I finally caught a break. A winter night, colder than an icebox. Well, that's expected. It's winter in the north. I was pretty bored and decided to call my friends to hang out. I called Sammy, Charles, and Alex. That was a mistake. Sammy, Charles, and Alex were all bored and thought, why not? They came over to my house, and after watching a few movies in the living room, we all were bored. We tried playing Monopoly, but Charles cheated and ruined the fun. Sammy jumped up like a kangaroo and asked, Do you want to go back into the forest back there? Explore a little? No way. First of all, it's way too cold out there. Secondly, we could get lost super easily. It's snowing, so we would probably lose our tracks and never find our way out. And what if there's ghosts? You know the reputation it has, Alex exclaimed. Relax, Alex. We don't know if there's any ghosts there or not. Besides, we can just take some string or something so we don't get lost, Charles replied. Well, it'll be fun, right? Just a few minutes in there, we'll be fine. We won't get lost. I tried to convince myself it would be fun, although I had always hated my backyard. I'm not a kid anymore. I can face my fears. Plus, the rumors were just immature teenagers trying to scare each other, right? Danny, are you serious right now? You hate that forest, Alex replied. I know, I'm not a kid anymore. I can handle it. Plus, those rumors must have been just rumors. To scare each other. The last time I went into that forest was two years ago. I didn't see anything noteworthy, I said. Okay, fine, I'll go. But if we see anything, I'm the first one out of there. Got it? Alex said. Great. Yep, got it, Charles replied. Okay, I said. I may be scared, but I'm not going alone. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be fun. I grabbed four spools of thick string, green, red, blue, and yellow, and four flashlights. We were walking outside when we realized how cold it was. I checked my phone. The weather app says it's only 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but it felt like maybe 12 degrees, if not less. The snow was up to our ankles. Luckily, we had boots. It felt as if we were standing in a thick slushy. Can we please hurry this up? I'm really cold, Alex said. Yeah, aren't we all? Sammy, Charles, and I replied. We continued walking until we got to the tree line. There were trees of all different sizes. Large, compact, lanky, narrow, overgrown. Any type of tree you could think of, it was there. The numerous branches had thick, fluffy snow on it. It was dark outside. In the forest, it was always dark though. The innumerable branches blocked any light from the moon and stars. 
today was no different. I don't know why, but it felt much more isolated tonight. If it wasn't for my friends, I wouldn't have even gone close to the tree line, let alone actually go into the forest. Well, time to get this over with. I gave everyone their respective string color. Sammy blue, Alex yellow, Charles red, and me. I had green. I tied the strings to a tree, then to the person. The strings would allow us to go about 3,000 feet into the forest. That was more than enough for us. As we all know, it's colder than an ice bath, I said. Yeah, it's an ice box out here. I can feel my bones forming ice flakes, Charles replied uncomfortably. Sammy snickers as Alex frowns. Well, which way are we going? Want to split up? Sammy suggests. Are you serious? I finally agree to come out here, and you're already joking? Alex replies, disapprovingly. Oh my, Alex, take a chill pill. It was a joke. I wouldn't want to lose you in this forsaken forest. We'll stick together, so let's hurry up and get walking, Sammy says excitedly. We start walking, but going very slow due to the abundant amount of snow. We're only about 20 feet from the tree line, and the amount of snow has doubled. It's now at our shins. Well, I hope there isn't any additional snow further in. It's pitch black, so I handed everyone a flashlight. We continued walking until we hit a shallow river. Must have only been a few inches. I've never been this far into the forest. I assume we're about 200 feet in by now. My nose and ears are freezing, and I could barely feel my hands through my leather gloves. What is that? Alex says shakily. She sounds as if she's on the brink of tears. What? What's wrong? What do you see? I turn around to try to find her, pointing my flashlight in her direction. I almost dropped my flashlight. Alex has already dropped hers. Charles and Sammy mutter under their breath. Oh no. A spindly, humanoid creature is crawling on the riverbank. It had penetrating yellow eyes, a mouth with teeth so sharp and decayed. The top of its head is caved in and appears to have some sharp teeth protruding out of it. The limbs were nothing but bones covered in pale white skin. Our flashlight stopped working. What is that? We dash toward the tree line. It's so hard to run shin deep in snow. Was I just imagining that? Nothing in the world looks that scary. Is the icy weather getting to my head and causing hallucinations? I felt my heart beginning to race and my head ached. My whole body felt uneasy and lightheaded. Alex, Sammy, Charles, where are you? I yelled. I could barely see. Danny, is that you? Charles came out, leaning against the tree for support while trying to catch his breath. Yeah, it's me. Did you see that thing? Are you okay? Where are the others? I felt like I was about to have a heart attack. Are they okay? Did that thing take them? I don't know what that was. We need to go back and search for Sammy and Alex. A voice came out of the forest. Don't worry, we're fine, Sammy replied. Both Sammy and Alex came out, holding each other's hands. Alex, just like Charles, was propped up against a tree for support. Let's get out of here. I ran as fast as I could in knee-high snow. I saw something in the corner of my eye. Is that a man in a cloak and a top hat? No. The weather got to my brain. I'm seeing things now. I arrived at the sliding glass back door. Hurry! I yelled to Sammy and Alex. Once they entered, I slammed it shut, locked it, and closed the curtains. I ran to turn on the heater and put the teapot on to boil. We were all in hysterics. That thing must have been a malnourished coyote. Nobody wants to talk about it. Yet, I guess that's understandable. I don't want to interrupt the silence. Everyone just needs to gather their thoughts and calm down. Well, don't just stand around here. What was that? Sammy cried. I, I don't know. 
Obviously, it was something like a ghost, Alex replied. I'm going home. Sorry, Danny. I can't stay here, Charles said. Yeah, I'm going too. Good night, Danny. Stay safe, Sammy declared. W wait please don't leave me here alone. They can't just leave me here alone with that thing, can they? I'm going with Sammy. I'm sorry. Bye, Alex said, sounding panicked. So, they're just going to leave me, just like that. How could they? Fine, I'll just stay here. It can't get me inside here. With the sounds of the door closing, the teapot whistles, sounding like a baby bird screeching for food. I poured myself a cup of water and put in tea and honey. I walk upstairs, sit on my bed, recounting what had just occurred. As I lay there, it feels more and more lonesome. I decide to visit my parents' old bedroom, expecting the dark hardwood floors with matching furniture, a paper white bedspread with floral laces on the edges, Pictures framing the walls with photographs of all the places they have traveled to. Man, I miss them. I miss their sweet vanilla scent. It's only been seven months since their passing, but I still think about them every day. When I'm about to open the door, it hits me. This intense feeling of dread is clogging my senses. As I look up, I see it. Crouching on the bedspread is that thing. The thing that we saw in the forest, its eyes still that soul-stealing yellow. My head feels like it's about to explode. I feel nauseous, but I can't move. Why can't I move? Someone, please help me. I need to get out of here. I try to lift my leg, but nothing comes of it. After what seems like an hour, I can finally move. I bolt to the bathroom, almost tripping my way there. It's here, too. This time, it's standing. A hungry look on its face while it reaches out its hand. Those fingers. I can still envision those long, skinny fingers. Attached to them were nails that were sharp as an ice pick. Its skin looked as if it was melting off. I could see the bones under its melting skin. Under the pale white skin, it was red. I ran to my room. Luckily, it's not in there. I hid in my closet. That's where I am now, writing this. I can hear it prowling around looking for me. I know it will eventually find me. This series of supernatural events I'm going to recollect to you has been kept extremely confidential and non-disclosed for a good 15 years. I was involved with this particular case back when I was a rookie, only being an officer for about a year and a half. All areas and people I were referred to in this story have had their names changed to protect their identity as well as my job. The first time I was introduced to this case was when my partner and I were called to investigate a missing person. The person who I will refer to as John was a camp host for one of the campgrounds in our local forest which was a part of our district. The person who reported him missing was a middle-aged woman who worked at a local lodge. We asked her a few basic questions, such as how long he had been missing, which were about two days, and how did she know he was missing. She told us that he would always come to the lodge for a pack of smokes each morning, and had been doing that for the past two months. So when he didn't show up for two days in a row, she became suspicious. I then asked her how he acted, and her response intrigued me at the time when she said, John was the quiet type, not saying much to anyone other than the occasional hello. He never brought food or supplies here, and I didn't find out why until one day I offered him a free gallon of milk that was about to expire the next day, and he gave me a disturbed look as if I was trying to give him poison. I soon figured out that he didn't trust food that he didn't make himself. He was extremely antisocial, and I wouldn't be surprised if he went off to live in the woods by himself. She answered a few more questions pertaining to the case, but nothing I need to inform you about. Soon after we finished questioning her, we went to go check out the campground he was in charge of, which was only about five miles from the lodge. 
but on a winding dirt road that went up the side of a mountain. When we first arrived to the campground that John was in charge of, we noticed that it had not been well kept and maintained. The fire pits were full of ashes, and the bathrooms looked as if they hadn't been cleaned for months, with many different substances and graffiti coating their walls. After we surveyed the other campsites and introduced ourselves to the families who were camping there, we went to visit the man's trailer, which was isolated at the end of the loop. Surprisingly, his campsite was clean and had been taken great care of. It was when we entered the man's trailer that the smell hit us. It stunk so bad that I expected to find him rotting away in there, but he was nowhere to be found. I tried to turn on the lights to see better, and they flashed on for a fragment of a second, but quickly went out. That's when I realized the smell must have been coming from the fridge. Everything inside must have spoiled due to the power being out. I went over to open it, but wish I never had. Because when I did, the gust of wind that came from within it literally caused my eyeballs to burn. Being blinded for a moment, I bent over and rubbed them frantically. My partner came over wondering what was wrong when his eye caught what was in the fridge. Oh man, that's disgusting. He muttered as I lifted my head to see what he was looking at through my red eyes. There in the fridge was a carcass of a squirrel, a few birds, and lastly, what looked like chopped up pieces of deer that still had fur attached to it. Everything was rotting away and the flies that lingered in the trailer swarmed the fridge with my partner, who I'll refer to as Daniel, quickly shut. We briefly looked around to see if there was any evidence that could give us a clue what happened to this man. Right before we were about to leave, I saw the edge of what looked to be a book poking through underneath the mattress. I grabbed it and walked out of the trailer to escape that dreadful smell that had my eyes still burning and watering. The book felt cold in my hand, even though the sun was blazing. Upon opening it, I felt the world around me seem to stop as the wind came to a halt. Even the birds stopped chirping. Do you feel that? Daniel asked me as he looked about. What? I replied, wondering if he felt the same silence that I did. Can't really explain it, but I feel as if something's watching us, he said as his head twisted about. I don't know if my mind was playing tricks on me, but I felt that same eerie feeling. Yeah, and did you hear everything go silent? I asked back, wondering what was going on. Uh-huh, let's report back to the chief and get out of here, he said while walking back to the vehicle. We then heard a raspy whistle cutting through the silence that caused us to quicken our pace trying to leave the area as fast as we could. Glancing at the book in my hand, I wondered what to do with it. I was supposed to turn it in as evidence, but decided to hold on to it for just a bit before turning it in. I was honestly curious to see what type of book this guy had because of how unusual he seemed to be. Looking back now, I wish I would have just turned it in as evidence because what I found inside was sickening to the very core. While my partner Daniel drove us back into town, I started to read the book, which I soon found out was actually the man's journal due to how everything was handwritten and some pages had illustrations. It was all unsettling and off the bat. I could tell this man had some demons lurking inside of his head. I will go more into depth with what was written and drawn in the journal later, but as of now, I need to state that the chief that's over my department ever found out that I stole this journal and then disclosed the details of the case online without prior consent, then I could risk losing my job so I hope no one recognizes this, because this case involved many people whose experiences and testimonies of what happened will be shown. Anyway, when we get back to the station, we had already reported everything we found out about this man over the radio, and they were able to properly ID him. The strange thing is that they didn't have much on him, since he'd been out in the woods for so long. He only had one living relative left, that was his mother. The only thing that we were able to pull up under his name was that when he was 13, he accidentally burned down his parents' house during the night due to unknown reasons. One account states that he said he was performing a ritual of some sort. Satanic or not, 
This missing person was unlike any person I had ever investigated since. Continuing to the main subject matter, this case involving the camp host has been by far the most mysterious case I had ever investigated. Everything that had happened up to the point of when I stole the journal was the only shallow part of the story, but little did I know that I would soon find myself in the deep end of the pool. What we found out there could cause any sane person to have a mental breakdown. This was only the beginning of a nightmare. To continue after the first part of this, I'm going to be showing you the account we received from one family in particular who were staying at the camp when the camp host supposedly went missing. This conversation was recorded and then transcribed and is shown below. Officer Daniel, did you notice anything strange before the camp host went missing, such as did you see anyone else roaming around his campsite or anything suspicious? The Mother, well, when we first got here, we tried to introduce ourselves to him, and he just ignored us until we left. He seemed mentally unstable and unfit to be maintaining this campground, and was often whistling with a raspy, uneven tone, which got annoying when we were trying to enjoy the sounds of nature. Also, one weird thing that was during one of the middle of the nights, we heard something that sounded like hammering coming from outside our tent. My husband went to investigate, and we found the camp host chopping firewood next to a roaring fire, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. That was the last time we saw him, and there were many other strange things that went on around the camp host's campsite. Officer Daniel, did he seem intoxicated at all during any of this? Maybe he was unstable. The father, we tried to avoid him the best we could so we aren't exactly sure if he was drunk or anything like that. Officer Daniel, is there anything else that you saw that we should be aware of? The teenage son, I don't know if this pertains to this case, but I went hiking with my younger sister up the side of the mountain over there, and while we were hiking, we found something. Officer Daniel, what did you find? The teenage son, well, you see, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but someone had definitely been doing something up there. Officer Daniel, describe it please. The teenage son, we found a patch of trees that had bones strung up in their branches as if someone had tied it to them. In the middle of the patch of trees were rocks that were placed in a strange circular type thing, and in there was a straight stick that held what looked to be some animal's skull. Around the circle posted on the trees were pictures of people. I'm going to stop at this point in the interview because he had many questions that were not essential to know, but what the teenage son had hiked in on was what we investigated next. By the time we were interviewing these people, search and rescue had gone out into the forest, but never found him. They did find some random cigarette butts mixed in the dirt which tied back to him buying a pack of them a day from the lodge, so they thought they were close to finding him. However, they still couldn't trace exactly where he went. While search and rescue were doing this, my partner and I were in charge of investigating the place that the teenager had described to us. When we finally found it, based on the description of how to get there from the boy, we took pictures of the area. It was a strange place, and the random pictures of people posted on the trees, all angled to where any of them could be seen if you stood in the middle of the rocks. I examined the photos, trying to see if I could recognize any of the people, when Daniel said, Isn't that the girl that went missing in the woods last summer? Walking over, I examined the picture, and it matched the photo of which our police department put in the newspaper, wondering if anyone had seen her around. Yeah, that's the girl. But why would someone put her picture here? It just doesn't make sense to me. You don't suppose that these are all pictures of people who have gone missing? Daniel asked as he looked around. Only one way to be sure. Let's take a picture of each one and send it back for analysis. Maybe this is some weird shrine someone created, or it could just be a trophy shelf of someone's victims. Who knows, we might just soon find a picture of the man we are looking for up in one of these trees. I responded while brushing my stubby beard. Daniel agreed and we photographed and documented the area. 
While we sent this information in, I decided to read some of what was written in the man's diary that I had taken from his trailer. It was a random disturbing segment in a page from it, and it goes as follows. I need to appease it somehow, but I can't. It's following me everywhere I go, and there's near nothing I can do about it. Every time I feel it get close behind me, I dart around, and nothing's there. I see people in camp smiling and having the time of their lives, not knowing of the evil I have just done. This is what I couldn't understand in the man's writing at the time, was that he seemed as if someone or something was trying to get him, but there was no evidence proving that this was true. There was no forced entry into the man's trailer, it was as if he just vanished without a trace. Later, Daniel and I were notified about who the pictures were of, and the answer was mind-boggling. Every single one of those people had gone missing in that forest area, ranging from 20 years ago all the way up to present day. Either someone was being insensitive and made this, or this could be a trophy case of someone's victims whose disappearances were all blamed on going missing in the woods. All I knew at the time was that this case was beginning to grow far past than just the simple missing person. Sometimes one person's perspective is completely different from the other, even if they are observing the same thing. That is one rule I learned while being an officer. Always be prepared to know that you aren't prepared at all. For this post in the series, I'm going to read another submission from the missing person's journal that at the time of when this occurred, gave me more insight to what truly happened to him, but still there lingers a mystery in the crevices. John's journal entry a month prior before going missing. My mind spins at the possibility of what I can do now that I have finally found the ingredients needed. I write this in here as my heart races with excitement of the powers I will soon possess, on the things I'll be able to do when I gain the strength of ten men. However, this ritual is still unclear and could backfire terribly, but I will obey the rules given and not cross my boundaries or lines. My life depends on it. Next entry was the night before he supposedly went missing. What I have done jumping into something so stupidly, having people around and to be caught off guard as I was. The ritual was going perfectly until that camper came to complain to me about chopping wood in the middle of the night for the fire. He slowed me down and I wasn't able to place the piece of wood in the fire at the exact time for everything to work properly and now I've unleashed a shadow beast into these woods. One made up of human misery, born from flames who can only go by the same. But as soon as it arose from the flames, it inhumanly darted into the woods, escaping the words I tried to mutter out to cease it from existing. But now there is nothing I can do to stop it. Its hunger for a host is unquenchable. I know that soon it will come for me, but I will be the first of many. If I do not write again, I bid this cruel world farewell. This was the last entry in the journal, but the last one I showed you in the previous post where he wrote about being followed. So furthermore, these are some of the last sentences he's ever written. That thing is trying to get me, but I have no idea what it wants. It wanders close to me at night, out of sight waiting for me to lay down my guard, but it could have got me many times already, but it hasn't and I truly don't know why. The only thing that I can imagine is this thing wants to take over me, possessing me and gaining complete control of my actions. Soon after, it would commit the most heinous crimes that anyone could imagine. If this would happen, it would probably destroy the shrine I made to pay respect to the ones who've gone missing, to the wandering spirit I unleashed into the same forest about 20 years ago. All of those people gone because of me, and I fear that if I don't maintain that shrine, they will come back to haunt me. I have dug myself a hole too deep to get out of, and now I pay the consequences. If someone finds this journal after I am gone, then you need to understand this. That thing won't rest no matter what, and can only be eliminated by fire. Torch the forest for all I care, if that's the only way you can eliminate it. Also, if I end up missing, whatever you do, don't go looking for me, because it won't be me. After reading that last sentence for the first time, my body ran cold, but my young instincts kept reminding me that most of the things that this guy wrote in his journal didn't make any sense. 
So, as one of the pages had nothing but gibberish scribbled on it with pictures of a human goat thing with a long, snake-like tongue. So I took everything he wrote with a grain of salt. In general, the book as a whole just gave me bad vibes every time I held it or dealt with it. After I finished reading through it and trying to understand everything this man was talking about, I slipped the journal in with the other evidence involved with the missing person's case. No one even noticed because this forest was known too often to have people go missing, which meant that cases like this one weren't a priority. However, all these people going missing made me think about when John wrote about releasing a wandering spirit into the woods, and he made that strange shrine that the teenager stumbled upon to try to appease the spirits of the people who were taken by it. In my entire life, I never would have thought that something this dark could occur in my hometown where I spent the majority of my youth playing in the same woods, because there's not much else to do in a small town like this one. Being involved in this case made me never want to do anything outdoors again, because who knows what's lurking out there, among the trees. All of this seemed so crazy to me at the time, and the time and effort put into the case was all meant to find some lunatic who believes conjuring spirits and gaining powers through rituals and other strange things like that. Again, I was a young rookie at the time, and now I fully understand that there's something in this world which are best left alone and untouched, because for all you know, you could be getting yourself into trouble with a much deeper force than you could possibly imagine, like John did. The next post will be my last of this personal story of mine, because I fear that my coworkers and other people I haven't told you about yet will catch on to this and know it was me who disclosed the information to the public. This will be the last post involving this personal story of mine, because I've already been hearing rumors at work about somebody who's leaking private information involving a case, but I'm not sure if they think it's me or someone else. The best thing for me to do is to end it here and lay low for a while, but I hope the chief from my department is not reading scary stories posted on the internet, so he won't find this. With that out of the way, I must tell you how everything went down those last fatal days when my partner and I were still working on the case. With the days passing by and no strong evidence showing what truly happened to this man being brought to the table, this case was going to become cold and even given up on, and he would just be another missing person ad in the newspaper. At the time, I was sick of dealing with this case, mainly because, after we first went into this man's trailer, I looked into his journal and there had been strange occurrences and sensations that I felt randomly. Some chilled me to the back of my spine. This whole case was going down a rabbit hole leading everywhere but nowhere all at once. We also had a cleanup crew go through and take down the shrine of the missing people's faces. They threw away the stuff in the trees and scattered the rocks formed into a circle, leaving the area in its original state. While they were doing this cleanup, there were reports of hearing voices mumbling to them, but so quietly they couldn't understand what was being said. However, there was one thing that every single one of them heard clear as day, and it was someone who was whistling in a raspy, uneven tone. It started with one of them supposedly saying something like, Hey, if you can't whistle right, then shut up. Everyone was thinking one of them was doing it, but during their lunch break, when everyone had food in their mouths, they heard it again. That's when they decided to cut their lunch break and clean the rest of the area up, because all of them felt uneasy being there. It was after hearing those accounts that the light bulb clicked in my head. The family we questioned when the man first went missing told me that he had an annoying whistle, but the hairs on my neck stood up when I remembered hearing the faint whistle when we were walking back to our vehicle after searching his trailer. This guy must have been playing tricks on us for his own amusement and probably enjoyed seeing us get all turned around while trying to figure out what happened to him. I told Daniel my story and he was skeptical at first but soon understood where I was coming from with my argument. We told the chief and he told us to investigate one last time during the night and watch the missing person's campsite to see if he's not sneaking back in the middle of the night. The deal was that if we found him, the case would be dismissed but if we didn't see anything, the case would become cold and all investigation involving it would be terminated. We agreed and drove back to the woods to stay the night patrolling the area. 
It was a night that would scar me for the rest of my life. While we were patrolling the area before the sun fully hid behind the mountains, we talked to a few of the campers staying on the campground, and they seemed distressed. We asked them what was wrong, and they said they kept hearing some whistling, but couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Even when they walked down to the lake, it seemed to follow them, and because of this, they planned to cut their vacation short and get out of here. It probably made them feel more paranoid after hearing about someone go missing here in the past week, especially when they were constantly seeing officers from search and rescue. I responded saying, if I were in your shoes, then that would be exactly what I would do too. We talked a little longer, but Daniel insisted that we needed to keep a better eye out for the man, just in case he returned. I understood, and we drove to where we could see the man's camp trailer, but were still well hidden. That's when the waiting begun until midnight. The full moon illuminated the ground, causing our visibility of the man's trailer to still work out without the need for a flashlight. As we were sitting there, we noticed a few pine cones falling from the trees nearby and bouncing off the ground below. You think that's either a squirrel or a chipmunk knocking those down? I asked while stretching and letting out a yawn. It could be. I've seen chipmunks knock them down quite often. Daniel responded as we gazed at where they were dropping. That's when we heard something snap and saw a large branch fall from the same tree the pine cones were coming from. That has to be a bear cub or something to break a branch that big. I stated, wondering what was up there. If that's the case, then we have to get it out of the campground so it won't hurt anyone. Daniel said as he opened his side door and grabbed his heavy duty flashlight, big enough to be considered as a weapon, and shined it at the tree. I couldn't see exactly where he was shining because I was still in the vehicle, but Daniel pulled out his weapon and started screaming, Sir, get out of the tree now. I wondered what was going on, so I got out and saw where Daniel steadily held his flashlight. How, how did he get up there? The words fell out of my mouth as we watched the man we were looking for at the top of the tree, clinging to the base. He didn't move at all, but his eyes were illuminated by the flashlight and reflected bright red. Sir, I won't tell you again. Climb down from the tree, or if you're incapable of doing so, please let us know. Daniel yelled with droplets of spit falling out. The man didn't respond, but just stayed put watching us intensely with those glaring eyes. Suddenly, the man jumps from one tree to another, and that's when we notice that all he's wearing is some tattered, dirty blue jeans. Daniel opened fire trying to get him down, but the man was so swift with his movements that Daniel wasn't able to land a shot. Let's follow him, Daniel screamed as he ran after the man. I followed closely behind with my weapon drawn, wondering what was wrong with the man. Briefly, we could see him jumping from tree to tree, and we continued after him slowly, going deeper into the woods. Where did he go? I said while breathing in gulps of air. I don't know. You hear that? Daniel asked as he glanced about. Listening closely, I could hear the faint sound of someone whistling. He's got to be close by, Daniel stated firmly while tightening his grip on his weapon. Closely listening to the raspy, uneven whistling, I said, It's getting louder. That must mean he's... Out of nowhere, the man pounced from one of the trees on top of me. He was trying to bite me, but I held him back the best I could, but his strength seemed inhuman. Daniel quickly shot the side of him, which caused him to dart off into the woods, and he was hunched over, grabbing his wound just running as if nothing happened. You okay? Daniel quickly asked as he helped me to my feet and said, Hurry, we can't lose him. I agreed and we followed his bare footprints in the dirt that led to an open field covered in dry yellow grass. In the middle of the pasture, we noticed a dark spot. Shining our lights at it, it was the back of the man, Slowly but swiftly, we made our way over to him. But when we got there, we saw that he was shaking, and I asked sternly, Sir, please restrain yourself. We aren't trying to hurt you. The man's eyes darted at me, and he muttered, Run. That thing left me to rot and is in search for a new host. Get out of here while you still can. We need to get you out of here. We're not leaving. Now please explain why you tried to attack us. Daniel asked sternly, not knowing everything that I knew about this man's dark past at this point. 
The man's eyes, who were staring me down slowly, started to move and stare at something just past me. Not looking behind me, I grabbed Daniel's arm and quickly yanked him towards where we came from. He restrained and pulled his arm from my grasp, saying, What are you doing? We can't just leave him here. Not knowing what to do, I looked back at Daniel and saw a dark figure standing about five feet behind him. There's something right behind you. I screamed, trying to pull my weapon that seemed stuck in its holster. Daniel then said, turning around, What do you mean there's something? As he looked behind him, the figure stayed still. Daniel drew his weapon and looked back at me, and I could sense fear in his eyes. The man on the ground began muttering nonsense words, which seemed to anger this thing, which suddenly disappeared. That's when the man on the ground started to kick his feet and scream. Daniel looked at me, and somehow read each other's mind as we both darted back to the vehicle, leaving the man there. As we ran, we heard the screaming stop, but not waiting for anything, we jumped into the car and drove back into town. We got on the radio and reported back to the station on everything that went down, and they seemed in disbelief. As we got back into the station, there were people I had never seen there before, dressed in dark suits, that interviewed us on what exactly happened. And once it was over, they made us promise not to tell anyone else about it. After posting this, I guess I just broke that promise, but it is what it is. Later, I found out they closed the campground down, saying that it needed to be refurbished. And soon after, there was a mysterious fire that swept the area, burning everything into ashes. In the newspaper, it was blamed on a butt of a cigarette that was tossed into a dry grass field. I knew that that was a lie and that there was an intentional burning. The fire was meant to eliminate that thing, but I don't think it worked because a week later, someone went missing in a part of the woods nearby that was untouched by the flames. We never solved this case because technically, the man is still missing, but I'm never going back into that area again. It's been 15 years since I was last there and I will go the rest of my life avoiding it. Some places need to be avoided the same way some things don't need to be understood. I will finish by saying that if you see a campsite closed and it says that there's maintenance going on, don't believe it. For all you know, there could be another beast lurking in the mist. Be safe out there. I'm a 17 year old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place around six months ago on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you post stuff on the internet. Whether it's a good trail, abandoned mine, ghosts, or whatever it may be, people come flocking and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. Anyway. This particular trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through a canyon, pretty simple in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but a last minute cancel on his part left me on my own. So with a packed bag and my car ready to go, I decided to go on my own. Not leaving the house on time and some trouble navigating rough forest roads, I didn't arrive at the trailhead until around 5.45. Which, for those of you who don't backpack, this is a very big no-no. I had about a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot. And it was getting dark fast, so I figured if I moved quick enough, I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own, with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary, especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually, it got so dark I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get my camp set up. Only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast, I ended up in a less than ideal spot. There was some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but definitely not recently. My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood and I got the fire going. 
I got my tarp set up and cracked open a can of chili mac I had brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good. My camp was set up and my food was on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike in had almost gone away, but it was still there. Side effect of camping alone in remote areas. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with the trail about 30 feet to my left. There was a small circle of light from my fire and everything past it was pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire eating my dinner when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock as I was positive I was the only person on the trail that night. I immediately turned my light and faced it toward the area where I had seen the rock come from. Due to the density of the pines and brush, I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned the tree line that surrounded me, searching for what or whoever had thrown the rock, not daring to stray too far from my fire. After sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to convince myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or it had fallen from a tree. That night, I awoke to the sound of rustling leaves, barely audible, but still there. I was still in a sleepy daze as I listened. The rustling of leaves got harder to hear and I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I had fallen asleep, but I soon came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of the tarp and looked around. I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight laying on the ground on a pile of leaves. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me, past the tree line. I quickly slipped my boots, clutched my knife in the other hand. And keeping my head on a swivel, I weighed my options. Stay here and wait out the night, or attempt the three mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured that whatever, or whoever was out there with me, was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was on the trail without a light. I decided to stay at the camp and waited out the night there. Eventually, it came back. I could hear it walking through the woods. It was far off, but I could hear it. It sounded like someone was leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes it would walk far away, and I would lose the sound of its steps. But then it would return, still faint as ever. This went on for about three or four hours, until the steps got closer and closer. Now, they were about seven feet from me. At this point, the fire had become very small, as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped and everything went totally silent. I sat there still for two hours, clutching my knife in my hand and praying I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. I packed my things and speed walked the three miles down the trail I had taken. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked I nearly sprinted to my Subaru as I unlocked it, jumped in and drove, not stopping until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I ended up in a gas station in Apache Junction to buy some Red Bull, but mostly just to see and or talk to another person. As I exited the store, I was able to read something that was written in the dust on the back window of my car. It said, Sleep well. This story happened during my teenage years, at 15 or 16 years old. I lived in a small town of 2,000 people, mainly surrounded by boreal forest, in a region of Quebec, Canada. This place was great, as we often saw deer, and it was usually a quiet and safe place. To give a bit of context, my house was located at the end of a dead-end street, and the only light source at night was my house's. There was a single street light at the end of the road, but it only lit up part of the street and the forest behind it. 
We were a dog family. I only had small dogs when I lived there. Every day, we needed to let them out to pee, as all dogs do. But at night, they were almost impossible to see because of the darkness. Our terrain was kind of big, and the light sources were weak. I was a gamer at the time, and I was often up late. So I was the one who needed to take the dog out to pee at 2 a.m. because it stayed with me while I was playing. One night, I opened the door and waited for my dog to do his thing. While trying to look at it, I was only able to see the reflection of the light in its eyes when it looked at me. I started to look around, because there was sometimes deer sleeping in the woods under the streetlight, or wild turkeys roaming around, when a little dark spot caught my attention. It looked like a human head coming out of the bushes, but I wasn't able to see it because it was a bit in the dark. I don't want my dog to run after whatever it was. It had a tendency to run after wild animals, so I called to it. It didn't listen to me, but the thing in the bushes started to crawl towards the street, slowly. It looked like a human, with thin limbs and a normal body and a slightly long neck. I started to freak out a bit and shook the treats cup so my dog would hurry. It came inside running and I shut the door as fast as I could. I turned off the lights in my house so I could have a view of what was outside. The strange animal crawled fast, almost running like a dog with every limb broken as an improvised crawling movement. The animal passed under the light where I saw it had no fur, like a shaved animal. It was disgusting. I was afraid and standing in the dark. The animal ran towards the light and continued on the street, where I wasn't able to see it because the houses in my neighborhood were surrounded by trees. I locked the door and went to sleep with my dog. I talked to nobody about it. A couple months later, I went to bed kinda early, 11 p.m., and went to watch some videos on my phone. They were gaming videos and I had earphones on. A sound on the video was recurring and I thought it was annoying, like a distant weird scream. After a couple minutes, the video finished and I went to see another, but during the loading, the sound occurred. I took my earphones off and waited for the sound. I heard it and immediately had tears in my eyes. It was coming from my window. My room was at the second floor, so I looked down in the forest to see if there was some movement. The only light near the forest entrance was the moonlight and an underwater light in our pool that emitted a small halo around it. I wasn't able to see anything, but the sound occurred again. It was like a mix between a distorted scream and a pig having its throat slit or a strong pain whining from a dog. I looked down and saw an animal that passed so fast that it was hard to really see. But I barely saw a human-sized animal with limbs crawling like a spider. It wasn't running after anything, but the sound occurred another time. It was the most horrible thing I ever heard. I closed my window to choke a bit by the sound of it. I heard it again three other times, and it stopped after that. I talked to my dad about the sound, and he told me it was probably a deer being attacked by a wild animal. I was so scared of it. I barely walked in the woods at night the three following years, before moving in a city to go out of university. Even to this day, I never heard of an animal like that, and it made me really doubt my mental health at the time, because I had PTSD from a dog attack mid-middle school, and I sometimes had light hallucinations when I gamed for too long, like a black shadow that disappears immediately, or things like that. There were barely any reports of wolves, coyotes, or bears in my area. And believe me, I made a lot of discoveries exploring the forest in this town. I am posting this because I am truly out of options. My employers refuse to take my reports and have even threatened termination of my contract if I bring these events back to the table again. The local authorities are dismissive, or even worse, accuse me of substance abuse and mental instability. I can't even tell my own family, lest they draw the same conclusions. I wouldn't want to drag them into this anyway. Hopefully some of you can help me, or at least help me understand what's going on. 
I have worked as a forester in the Appalachia for a logging company that will go unnamed for nearly a decade now. In that time, I have come to love my job, the woods, and the freedom that accompanies both. But things have started to change with my most recent assignment. The woods used to feel so safe, so clean. Now I can't stop my hands from shaking when I stand beneath the green canopy. So we're all on the same page. I'll walk you through the field work of my profession. First, the company assigns me to a tract of land they have recently acquired. I do some less exciting prep work in the office, satellite imaging, GIS, property analysis, etc. And then I head out into the field. Generally, the sites are pretty far from the office, requiring multiple hour drives and overnight camping. I bring along some simple gear, tape measures, manual colonometer and altimeter, bright neon orange marking spray paint, and my GPS transmitter and marker. All in all, a bunch of technical nonsense that lets me determine the value of trees, which should be logged, and which should be left behind to ensure no permanent damage is done to the forest. Simple enough. It was early morning on September 21st, 2019, when my office desktop pinged that I had an incoming email. Seeing that it was an assignment from corporate, I opened it up and nearly let out a cheer in my cubicle. The track that I had been assigned was a huge patch of old growth forest, located near the Mongahela National Forest in West Virginia. For those of you who don't know, an old growth forest is a wooded area that has not been disturbed for hundreds of years allowed to grow and develop in its natural state without intervention by farming, construction, or logging. Many old growth forests haven't been touched since the settlers arrived, and some even before then. In any case, this was cause for celebration. Old growth is increasingly rare and amazingly beautiful, and I was the one assigned to explore it. Of course, this was bittersweet seeing as I would be the last to see it in its undespoiled state before I gave the loggers the go-ahead. I spent the morning in my office packing my things and loading them into the tiny white Ford Ranger, lovingly nicknamed Piper, that the company had provided to me when I started working for them. She was a rugged little thing, having carried me through the mountains for almost a decade without protest. Of course, she wasn't without her quirks, crank-operated windows, a rattling tailgate, and an AC that hadn't functioned since 2011. But I love that tiny little truck. Piper and I set out around noon, making good time on the four-hour drive through the rugged depths of West Virginia. We arrived at the old trailhead that would deliver me to my tract late into the afternoon. As I strapped my heavy backpack on and locked Piper up for her stay at the edge of the woods, I breathed deeply, taking in the heavy scent of the forest earth and the sound of the wind and birdsong through the treetops. Giving my truck a pat on the hood, I turned and made my way off the country road and onto the narrow dirt track that wound into the woods. The hike to the old growth stand of trees took about an hour of brisk trekking, the path becoming more and more overgrown as I progressed. It was obvious this trail hadn't been consistently used for years, probably decades. Nearly to my destination, I happened across what should have been the first sign that something was not right. An ancient sycamore tree stood in the center of the path. Had it been any other species, I would have sidestepped and kept plugging ahead. But sycamores had always been my favorite trees, so I looked upwards to admire the old beauty. About 12 feet off the ground, twisted and woven through the tangle of white-barked branches, was a decomposing skeleton of a deer. Scraps of fur and mummified tendons the only things holding it together as it dangled from the tree. I gasped and stepped back from the initial shock, the staring skeletal visage of the old deer being the last thing I expected to see. My first thought was a mountain lion or a similar predator had hauled the animal up there to feast upon. Carnivores like that were pretty rare in the area, but I had guessed it wasn't entirely out of the question. But my confusion spiked and the rumblings of dread gestated in my gut when I looked a bit closer. 
It was difficult to tell due to the distance from the forest floor and the amount of time the deer had been up there. But as I squinted, I started to notice something haunting. The decrepit animal remains were not simply jumbled up in the tree branches. They were lashed into place by scraps of rope and cloth. Someone had hauled the deer 12 feet up in the sycamore tree and tied its limbs and joints so it would stay suspended up there. Directly beneath the nearly completely rotted animal, barely visible due to age, was carved a simple O, presumably put onto the bark by whoever took the time to create this macabre installation. I was understandably shocked and confused by this discovery, but the apparent age of the carving and carcass eased my worries a little. Whoever had done this obviously done their work months ago. I resolved that until I happen across fresher work, I was unlikely to run into anyone else out here in the woods. Having reassured myself for the moment and excited to lay eyes on the rare old growth, I carried on down the trail towards my destination. I reached the edge of my assigned stand around 6.30 at night. The old, ill-maintained trail terminating in a small clearing on the border of the forest I hiked through and the secluded acres of old growth that waited beyond. I gazed awestruck at what waited for me. Ancient tree trunks that soared stories high, capped with dense foliage that cast the groves beneath the placid twilight. One of the defining features of old growth is the lack of understory. Smaller plants robbed of the sunlight by the canopy above. This means that you can see much further than you could in a different forest, where brush and vines might block your view. In the old growth ahead of me, I could see deep into the canopy shaded woods, darkness enveloping the trees that grew and twisted in gnarled shapes. Ancient beings shaped by countless years into warped and beautiful lines. I was nearly overtaken by the sight, a view so few people are able to look upon in this modern age. Even though I was nearly shaking with excitement to explore the acre's large stand of forest ahead of me, I knew that daylight would not last much longer. I would have to push off starting my work until the next day, working quickly to pitch my tent and create a small stone ring to act as a fire pit, before nightfall overtook my new campsite. The first night on the edge of the old growth forest was so quiet. As I lay tightly wrapped in my sleeping bag, staring up through the vent net in the roof of my tent toward the stars above, I heard almost none of the sounds one might expect from camping deep in the woods. No night birds called, no insects buzzed. The only sounds were the rushing of the wind through the leaves, and once a mournful sound of an owl hooting somewhere within the ancient grove beyond the camp. I sat there awake in eerie silence for nearly the entire night, partially perturbed by the quiet but mostly entranced by the beauty of the starlit sky filled with excitement for the day to come. I eventually drifted off to sleep around 2 a.m. At 5.30 in the morning, I was awoken by the electronic chirping of my watch alarm, signaling the start of my day. Groggily sitting up, I immediately regretted not forcing myself to sleep earlier yanking the zipper of my tent flap and exposing myself to the chill morning air. I rose to a stoop and began to exit my tent. As my head left the tent, I stopped, frozen and staring. I was staring down the barrel of a pump-action shotgun, clutched in the hands of a middle-aged bearded man. He wore old flannel and denim, a stained old baseball cap over the mop of gray hair. His face was cracked and split by intricate wrinkles the telltale aging endured by a man who had spent his life outdoors. His gray eyes squinted as he met my shocked gaze, lowering the gun. Well, crap. I'm sorry, son. I didn't expect anybody. What do you mean you didn't expect anybody? I asked, anger boiling to the surface as the shock of surprise ebbed away. You walked into a campsite at five in the morning. Why wouldn't there be anybody here? His gnarled face didn't change from its stony demeanor. Look, boy, I said I was sorry. No harm, no foul, right? He shrugged nonchalantly, irritatingly dismissive of the fact that he had a loaded gun pointed between my eyes mere moments ago. He slung the weapon over his shoulder and extended a hand to help me out of my tent. Most tents you find up here are empty. It took a moment for what he had said to sink in. 
What do you mean? Like people come up here and dump their trashed old equipment? Disappointment began to brew as the thought of the old growth filled with trash entered my mind. Nah, son, nothing like that. Just exactly what I said. The tents you find up here are always empty. The name's Randy. Randy Davidson. This plot belonged to my grandpa and his grandpa before him. His West Virginia draw was thick and slow as he gestured toward the old growth stand. Before grandpa sold it to national forest folks, eminent domain and whatnot, I furrowed my brow. Not only had I had the shock of my life less than a minute ago, now I was listening to the family history of some Appalachian backwater dude. My patience grew thin. So is that why you go around poking in other people's stuff? Scaring them when they wake up? For old time's sake? Randy squinted again, unimpressed with my impatience. Look boy, all I'm gonna say is you better watch yourself out here in these woods. Grandpa used to tell stories. Was happy to have the feds take his land off his hands. Just pack up and leave is my advice. And with that, he turned and started walking away in the direction he came from. I stood there in uneasy silence and just watched him go. Was that a warning or a threat? And what could he have possibly meant about empty tents? His message had surprised and confused me as much as his sudden appearance in my camp. The early morning light grew brighter and the mist that clung to the ground burned away as I gathered my things and prepared for my first foyer into the old growth stand. I nearly inhaled my breakfast, excited to start my work. Then, pack filled and secured, I stepped beyond the edge of the grove. The old growth was breathtaking. Ancient trees surrounded me as I walked, dark twisting shapes disappearing into the shadowy canopy high above. No underbrush cluttered the ground, just stoic old boulders and thick sheets of soggy moss. The dense cover of leaves above cast the entire huge stand in the eerie pall of cool shade. The heavy earthy scent of loamy earth and wet woods filled my nose and lungs. Pristine silence filled the forest. I set to work immediately, invigorated by my utterly gorgeous surroundings. The noise I made was the only sound that echoed through the ancient woods around me, joining the quiet wind and leaves above. I identified species, measured trunk diameters, calculated height and slope, judged quality timber from trees best left standing. Dang, I thought to myself. Almost all of these trees were worth thousands of dollars in timber as individuals. This stand of old growth alone would likely net the company over a million dollars after harvest. How had this place not been logged yet? With a metallic rattle and aerosol hiss, I marked the trees that would be best harvested with my flagging paint. With the forest floor so clear of undergrowth, the bright orange X's I sprayed on the tree trunks could be seen in the distance in every direction looming out of the darkness in their obviously unnatural neon hue. It felt strange to be painting this place, so long left beyond the reach of humanity. It was after 4 p.m. when I was finishing up the last sections of the stand I decided to work on today. There was a small, low valley near the center of the growth, edged by mossy boulders and muddy slopes. I had nearly finished marking the chosen trees in the valley when I came across something hauntingly strange. As I rounded the massive trunk of an old beautiful red oak, I saw it, sitting in the middle of a tiny clearing, shaded by dark leaves above, was the rusted hulk of an old RV. The paint was chipped and peeled away, almost to the point of non-existence, though there was still enough to make out the classic script of Winnebago. The tires were flat, sacks of rubber draped over rusted hubcaps. Moss grew over the windows of the abandoned vehicle. At least the glass hadn't been shattered and dropped away. The side door hung open on failing hinges, revealing nothing but inky darkness inside. I slowly approached the derelict, wet moss and leaves squelching under my boots. How did this thing get down here? There's no way it could have driven down these slopes of the valley, and there weren't any signs that it had fallen or crashed down there besides the ravages of time. The old RV seemed undamaged. I stepped within a few feet of the Winnebago's open door. 
I fumbled through my backpack and produced my flashlight, noticing that the vehicle was ringed by a thick layer of heavy gray mud. Spurred by curiosity, I clicked my flashlight on and stepped on board the ruined RV through the broken door. As I did so, the eerie vehicle let out a wretched moan as a twisted spring shifted for the first time in what likely had been decades. I threw a glance back over my shoulder into the forest, suddenly feeling watched. All I noticed through the forest gloom were the neon orange X's I spray painted on the trees, pointed at haphazard angles and particularly hidden by gnarled trunks. The interior of the RV was dark as night, even with the gloomy daylight filtering through the small sections of broken windows. The stark white beam of my flashlight cut through the darkness, a circle of vision too small for comfort. Something felt off the moment I was inside. The cabin of the vehicle was almost empty. Driver and passenger seats devoured down to metal frames by generations of vermin. Crusty lichen encased the steering column. The cup holders held two metal thermoses. The words, number one dad and number one mom, just barely visible through the years of sylvan filth that had accumulated upon them. I turned my face to the main living space of the old wreck. Silence thick on the air, and only cut through by the creaks of the moldering floor beneath me. The built-in couch here had also suffered the same fate as the cabin seats, devoured by rats and insects searching for a nest. Cupboards hung open near the low ceiling, cardboard boxes of food within reduced to pulp and slurry by years of exposure. I shone my needle of light across the room, noticing the narrow door at the rear. It hung barely ajar, a crack of darkness presumably leading to the RV's bedroom. As I stepped closer, a stench of mildew and wet dirt grew almost overpowering. With a groan of rusty hinges, I pushed the door open. My body ran cold as my flashlight beam settled on what waited beyond the doorway. Shocked, my breaths came quick and shallow as I took in the sight. The room held a bed, mattress and blankets untouched by foraging pests, but stained a deep black brown by mold and who knows what else. Upon the bed was a heap of clothing, gathered from a suitcase haphazardly left to rot on the floor around the bed. The clothes were stained the same shade as the foul mattress. I could make out at least four distinct sizes of clothing in the pile. Two adults and two children. The stink of rotting vegetation was unimaginable. My hands shook, bobbing my light as they did so. As I gazed at the top of the pile, atop the wet heap of moldy old clothing was a dripping carcass of a deer, broken and twisted at unnatural angles to allow the decaying thing to be propped up in a pose like a man sitting cross-legged. Its head was bowed towards me, what was left of the meat blackened by rot. Its eyes had long since gone, leaving empty black sockets to stare into the dark. The cluster of mossy and scattered bones by the headboard revealed that this was merely the most recent animal left there, the next in a long line of deer propped up in this mess. Despite the dribbling animal wreckage before me, there was no smell of rotting, just the only wretched and overpowering odor of composting vegetation and decomposing fungus. Acrid vomit filled my sinuses and I bolted to the door behind me as I stuck my head and shoulders outside and prepared to retch. My eyes laid upon fresh horror. The bright orange of my marking paint sprayed at haphazard and dissonant angles as I had wandered the valley, all faced towards me in uniform stares. Every X I had painted down there looked towards me, neon color cutting through the forest gloom like electric eyes. The remainder of the food left my stomach, replaced by ice water as I lurched forward and vomited messily upon the mossy ground. Leaning from inside the RV, body shaking with confusion and terror, I wiped the tears from my eyes. The smell of rotting wood still clogged my nostrils. I stared at the splatter of fresh vomit below me attempting to comprehend what I was looking at. The steamy bile was collecting in a footprint of the sticky gray mud. My shaky breath rattled in my lungs as I stared. It was unmistakable. Fresh tracks in the mud that surrounded the RV, a complete circle that stalked around the vehicle. They were deep, pressed into the muck by something big and heavy. 
The tracks took on a shape of a half-human foot, the long toes and forefoot evident like the tracks of someone walking barefoot and tiptoeing. What? Even the partial footprints were bigger than the tracks I had left. How would something so large move so quietly around the RV? I hadn't heard a thing from inside. I rose to trembling feet and took a cautious step outside. The old growth was utterly silent beyond my nervous panting. The bright orange X's still stared in my direction, not one where I had originally placed it. Crap, I thought to myself. I stood, scanning the empty forest floor and listening for any sounds to pierce the quiet. Seconds passed, feeling like an eternity, and then I bolted. Fear pounded in my ears as I sprinted through the forest, never once slowing as I made for camp. The feeling of a cold, calculating look from unseen eyes never left my back as I ran. I skidded into my tiny camp on the edge of the stand as the sun began to dim in the darkening sky, nearly collapsing with exhaustion as the daylight that filtered through the trees above began to decay. As I panted and gasped with exertion, I surveyed my surroundings. My tent and fire ring appearing untouched since I left this morning. As dusk settled over the forest, my surroundings began to darken. It wouldn't be long until they were black as the old growth at my back. There was no way I could leave tonight. Even if I wasn't petrified to be out in the dark, there wasn't any chance I could find my way back to Piper through the dark and unfamiliar woods. My mind raced as daylight failed around me. Do I set a fire and hope light and flames keeps whatever is out there at bay? Or do I sit in the darkness and pray I stay hidden in the shadowy and silent camp? There was no good options. I tensed up as I fought panic from setting in. Eventually, the primal instincts of my cave-dwelling ancestors kicked in. Fire was the one tool that always served our kind against darkness and the things that lurked within it. I piled all of my firewood into the ring. I wouldn't need it for another night. And as the night fell, the glowing light of my bonfire lit the forest around me, faltering at the edge of the old growth, my camp surrounded in firelight. I climbed inside my tent and sealed the zipper shut. I sat silently inside the thin nylon shell for hours, listening as the wind made the only sound beyond the crackling of the fire which glowed through the walls of the tent. My hands shook and my spine prickled with nerves. My teeth chattered despite the humid heat that clung to me, sweat dripping from my brow. I moved slowly to check my watch. 3.30 a.m. Less than two hours until I could flee this place. I jolted as a sudden snap shattered the silence. The sharp cracking noise emanated not 20 feet from my tent and followed by staccato rustling before sudden silence. My eyes were wide. The quiet, nearly imperceptible rustling came again. Whatever was outside was still there. I slowly grasped the zipper and pulled it with my left hand, while fumbling about with my right hand until it came to rest upon my pocket knife. It was a feeble little thing, but as a gift from my dad, it has always found its way into my pack. With my little blade clutched tight, I opened the door of my tent, slowly to keep the zipper quiet. I crept out into the night, the chilled air shockingly cold as it connected with my overheated and clammy skin. The bonfire still burned, though it had run low as the night dragged on. Silently surveying the camp before me, I searched for the source of the hushed sound. Slowly, my eyes was drawn upwards toward the boughs of the trees. Two eyes reflected in the firelight staring back at me. Shock gripped my heart and it took all of my willpower not to exclaim with fear and surprise. The eyes went to the side, as if judging me. With more quiet rustles, the owl shifted on its branch, close enough to the firelight to reveal its identity. Relief flooded my body as I let out a quiet sigh. Then, true terror took over me as I noticed a huge shape in my peripheral vision. I slowly turned my head, tears welling up in my eyes. It sat waiting on its hunches, barely six feet away from me, dimly lit by the embers of the slowly dying fire. At first, I thought it was a huge man, a giant living in the woods. But this thing was no human, never could have been. It sat nearly curled in a fetal ball, 
Long arms clasped to scrawny legs and shoulders hunched. Its humanoid form was covered in greasy, pale skin stretched, taut over knobby bones and joints. The thing's elongated arms and legs were triple jointed, digital grade like the hind legs of a malnourished hairless goat. Its arms ended in hands, each bearing six long, twitching fingers, tipped with ragged and blackened nails. Its legs terminated in feet that may have been human, if they were not twisted and deformed, to allow the thing to walk its mud and filth-caked toes. It carried an unbearable stench of fungus and compost, but most horrible of all was its face. Atop its neck rested its gaunt head, oily and pale skin reflecting the guttering flames in the fire pit. Its nose and chin were hideously long and crooked, not unlike the jagged and pointed figures stereotypical of ancient witches. Its mouth was wide, pulled back to reveal black gums and long, blunt teeth that looked as if they had been taken from a human jaw and stretched cartoonishly to fit. Though it had no eyes, it stared intently at the owl in the tree. The twisted and hulking creature crouched beside me and slowly turned its head to face me. Barely visible, white orbs rolled and twitched in sunken eye sockets. The thing stared silently at me before raising a single finger to its drooling teeth. It let out a quiet, gurgling breath. Shh. Panic set my body ablaze. I scrambled to my feet, dropping my tiny pocket knife in the mud. The owl let out a shrieking protest as it took fight, spooked by the sudden movement. As I stumbled backwards, starting my sprint into the pitch black forest, the thing rose to its feet on its tri-jointed legs. The thing had to have been at least seven feet tall, but moved without making a sound. As I turned, it let out a hideous, gasping screech, a sound laden with ancient hate. I didn't look back, dashing through the underbrush, away from the old growth and leaving the empty tent to join the others Randy had found. I don't know if it followed me. It was so big, but it moved so silently. As I ran, I didn't see it, didn't hear it, but the feeling of its look never left me. I ran blindly in the dark, whipping branches and bramble thorns at my face and hands. Sweat drenched me, pooling in my hiking boots. I didn't know how long I ran. At some point, I must have collapsed with exhaustion, blacking out in the depths of the forest. I woke up in the glaring shine of daylight, filtering down onto my face through the trees. My face and hands were caked with dirt. Two of my fingers were at least dislocated. Rising on shaky legs, I began my blind trek into the unfamiliar woods around me, hopelessly lost. I walked for hours, likely wandering in circles. My face and hands ached with a dull, pulsing pain. My skin itched and burned underneath. Finally, I stumbled upon the forest trail, old and ill-maintained. I couldn't believe my luck. I had resigned myself to being lost, being alone and hunted deep in the unsettled Appalachia. Tears welled up as I hurriedly limped down the path, and I nearly shouted with elation when Piper came into view. Fumbling my keys, I managed to unlock her and climb inside, slamming and locking the door behind me. As I fired the ignition and the truck started up, the burning on my torso intensified, an awful itching sensation. Grimacing, I quickly set to see what the cause of my discomfort was. As I did so, a subtle stench of old vegetation began wafting into my truck. I felt cold eyes staring from the fringes of the woods. I pulled my jacket open, and the source of the itch, across my torso, Spray painted there with marker paint was a bright orange X. The day I had been dreading finally came. After months of denied reports, quiet but heated arguments behind my boss's closed door, and the most intense procrastination ever known to man, the company sent me back to the old growth. You have to believe me, I fought it. But in the end, my protests were less than useless. I would have quit this job if I could, but I have bills to pay, fees to keep my parents cared for at their old age. There was nowhere to hide. 
The neon orange marker paint that I had discovered sprayed onto the Forester's X upon my torso had washed away easily enough, but it had left behind an angry red rash of scaly skin. The doctor told me that it was likely an allergic reaction to a chemical propellant in the aerosol, or a component of the paint itself. The itching rash had faded over time, but never fully disappeared. The faintest ghost of the mark that haunted me just barely visible to those who cared to look close enough. I had completed one or two assignments since the experience I previously recounted for you all. Working in Pennsylvania and around DC to mark up and measure tiny stands of trees just outside the bustling suburban corridors. Even in those minuscule groves of adolescent trees and shrubs, the green grow of the canopy sent shivers down my spine. I was a wreck in nearly every sense of the word, and I don't think anyone who believed me could blame me. The problem was that no one actually did believe me, not truly. The email from the company heads came on March 2nd, 2020. When I saw it in my inbox, I sat silently staring in my cubicle for agonizing minutes before finally resigning myself to cold acceptance. I scanned the details with defeat. Return to parcel. Mono Nahela National Forest. Work imperative. Multi-million dollar stake. Depart immediately. The rest of that morning is just a foggy blur, dragging myself through duties in preparation to return to the place where I had encountered something I could not explain. Something I could not forget. It must have been just before noon when Piper and I were roaring down the interstate towards the dreaded grove. Acres of black woods and hidden things. I shouldn't have gone. I have no recollection of the four-hour drive into the depths of West Virginia. The next thing I knew, I was standing next to my truck, engine clicking and popping as it cooled and settled, with my heavy pack slung over my shoulders. Ahead of me loomed a narrow trailhead that led to a forest the world had forgotten. With a shuddering breath, I steeled myself and stepped into the woods. The sensation was so strange. My mind was caught in a vicious wrestling match between feelings of terror and the comfort of coming home. I absent-mindlessly pawned at the faded mark under my jacket as I tramped along the winding and undergrown path. Thoughts churned and changed with my aching mind. The things I had seen here, half remembered and half unforgettable. The splendor of the unspoiled forest around me, grinning, teeth, the endless awe of the old growth. I walked in a daze like man towards the gallows, or perhaps towards a holy relinquery. By the time I walked around the old sycamore tree, just a few scant bones left lashing in its branches, I had regained my senses. The sights and sounds of the woods returned to me as I made it towards the old campsite. I wiped away the watery stuff running from my nose. It was just cold out here. Only the first buds of the year starting to appear on the branches of the trees. This was about the time I began cursing to myself for coming back out here. But it was far too late now. Suddenly, I stepped out into the tiny clearing in which I had once made camp. On the far end of the break in the woods waited the boundary of old growth. Looming ancient trees cast in a shade of dark, old leaves that still clung to their storing branches in stark refusal to let the sunlight desecrate the floor of the grove. Even in the latest days of winter and the earliest days of spring, shadow ruled the old growth waiting ahead. As I stared, a chill wind whispered from between the tree trunks, stinging my face and whipping through the air. A grim thought crawled through my mind. Yeah, hello to you too. Pulling my gaze from the dark boundary ahead of me, I surveyed the small clearing. The ground was sodden and muddy with snowmelt. The detritus of water was fading away with the season. The shredded remnants of my old tent stood in half-hearted defiance of gravity. Poles bent and broken in angles, better suited to modern art. Slowly pulling open the door flap of the mostly collapsed tent, I saw that all of the original contents were missing. My sleeping bag and backpack I had carried out here previously, nowhere to be seen. I just let the tent flap fall back. There was no salvaging the nylon heap. Just as Randy, 
the local who had accosted me the last time I was here, had said, The tents you find here are always empty. I turn around to check the fire pit, less than a dozen feet behind me. The stones were still there, but not as I had left them. The rounded forest stones, now covered in crawling moss and flaking lichen, they were stacked in a perfect tower that came up to stomach height. One on top of the other, they were balanced immaculately. The slightest breeze should have been enough to upset the delicate cairn, but the stones did not fall. Atop of the tower of stones, untouched by vegetation, age, or weather, was my pocket knife, dropped in the shock of my previous encounter here. With a spiteful sniff, I snatched the knife and gave the stones a small kick, letting the tower crumble to a pile. I made camp in the clearing over the next hour or so, pitching my new tent and reconstructing the fire ring. I unfurled a large ball of twine I had brought with me, attached aluminum cans to it as I laid a trapwire perimeter around my little oasis. Setting an alarm like this would do little to help me, should anything go wrong during my stay here, but it eased my worry just the same. Just as night fell, I sat by my fire, listening to the silence of forest that I knew all too well. I awoke in my tent in the early morning rays of the sunlight to the buzzing sound of my watch, letting me know it was time to work. I went through my morning routine, had my breakfast, threw my backpack on, stepped over my trap wire, and marched as stoically as I could to muster across the clearing towards the waiting old growth. As I quietly stepped across the mossy floor of the darkened grove, I noticed one thing. My work was gone. All of the bright orange X's I had marked upon the trees that were meant to be harvested had disappeared like the mist in the wind. That paint was designed to last as long as the logging projects may drag on, sometimes years, and I had sprayed it here merely six months ago, and now it was all gone. The bark of the trees, barren of paint and gnarled and blackened by hundreds of years, mocked me. Gritting my teeth, I began to work. I toiled for hours that day in the chilly March weather, the ancient forest around me silent beyond the sounds of my work, measuring, mapping, marking. I went through my tasks quickly and robotically, never once shaking the undeniable sensation of cold eyes on my back. Maybe my fear made me more perceptive, or maybe the forest and what waited within, it simply chose to show me more than it ever had before. Whatever the case, I saw things. Rare sights that punctuated the hours within the stand. Animal bones lashed to and dangling from branches that towered over the muddy ground. A bright yellow hunter's cap, soaked with water and stuffed into a gap between boulders. The rusted lower frame and wheels of an old-fashioned baby carriage. A tangled pile of twine and aluminum cans, new and untouched by age or weather. There was less than an hour of daylight left as I finished my first day of work. I rounded the thick trunk of a massive honey locust. Stinging odor of the marker paint was still wafting from the fresh X I had marked there. Beyond the old tree was a steep forest pothole, perhaps a sinkhole that had collapsed thousands of years ago. It had dropped merely five feet down and maybe ten feet across. Drawn by some human curiosity, I peered over the edge. The sides of the shallow pit were choked thick with roots and sheets of moss creating a coiled mass of wet vegetation that stacked downwards, dangling into the murky foot and half rainwater and snowmelt that collected at the bottom of the wide hole. The smell of stagnant water and something far worse rose up to meet my nose, causing me to recoil at the stench. A shiver ran down my spine as I looked upon what floated in the pit below. Fur matted and oozing mud and rotting mold clung to bloated meat, the extremities revealed the darkened and spongy remnants, soaked through with the stinking and stagnant water that filled the pool. The horrid thing had at one point been a large dog, perhaps a German shepherd, judging by the patches of fur. Strapped across the dog was an old backpack I had left behind the first time I came to the old growth. The sharp sound of a snapping twig came from behind me, and I whirled to face the noise, sudden shock gripping my racing heart. The man stood there wrinkled and weather-beaten face below a stained old cap. I recognized Randy Davidson a split second before he spoke. 
Well, I'll be gone, he drawled, recognition sparking in his eyes, as gray as his hair. The remnants of the old rash on my torso twitched dully. It's you again. What are you doing back out? His question was suddenly cut short as a massive pale shape lunged from the growing shadows around us. The hulking white thing moved soundlessly as it took Randy into the muddy ground. He let out a gasp as the air was knocked out of him. With inhuman speed, it whipped around to face me, and my existence ran cold as I laid eyes on its all-too-familiar grin and greasy flesh. The stench of the rotting moss wafted over me. Pale orbs twitched in their membrane-covered sockets as the horror struck in me. A single, triple-jointed arm reaching out and bashing into my torso. The thing hit with the strength of a feral beast, bolts of pain shooting through my torso. The lightning-fast strike sent me skidding and stumbling backwards, the feeling of weightlessness overtaking me as I tumbled into the pit at my back. I was still attempting to get air in in response to the creature's strike when I hit water, stinking liquid rushing in. I had landed almost directly onto the dog. I lurched upwards out of the shallow pool, alternatively gasping for air. Adrenaline roared in my ears. I could hear the sounds of struggle above, crashing branches and spattering mud accompanied by Randy's voice of terror. I scabbed at the slick moss and roots around me, attempting to haul myself out the short distance of the sinking pit. Slipping on wet vegetation and collapsing mud, I managed to drag my shoulders above the edge of the sinkhole. I saw Randy struggling against the pale thing that stalked the old growth, pinned to the ground with its hooked nose mere inches from his face. I watched in horror as the thing craned its neck downwards with an almost serpentine sway, joints creaking as it did so. It parted its long, blunted teeth. His screams were muffled as the thing leaned in. They held their struggling as I hauled myself out of the pit. Then it craned backwards, turning its face to meet my terrified stare. Randy had a breath, its teeth clenched in a disgusting mockery of a grin. I sat up on all fours at the edge of the pit as it released Randy, spectral grace bellying its monstrous size as it rose to its full, towering height. Joints and tendons creaked within its gaunt self as it took slow and purposeful steps towards my prone form. A deep, cloaking click slowly emanated from the depths of it as it reached towards me with its black fingernails. When all of a sudden I was yanked to my feet and dragged to the side, it was Randy, coughing as he pulled my jacket collar. Come on and run, he gasped, not letting go of me as he began sprinting into the woods that surrounded us. I pumped my legs to keep up, the speed of terror propelling me. We dove through the old growth, ancient trees seeming to twist around us in the growing darkness. Mud clotted our boots and threatened to pull us into the ground with every step we took. I followed Randy, hoping he had a destination, and was not simply running into the woods in a panic. Looking over my shoulder, I could not see the thing following us, but I could hear it somewhere in the gloom as it laughed and called. Noises, like the hellish fusion of a squealing pig and a cackling lunatic. I don't know how long we fled into the darkening night. The sun had disappeared completely by the time we stopped, panting for breath and nervously eyeing the woods around us. Randy kneeled over with his hands on his knees and waved a finger past me. I turned to check what he was pointing at and saw a dark shape looming out of the darkness, the blocky bulk of a lightless cabin. I helped Randy towards the structure as he fumbled around in his pocket, producing and jangling a heavy laden key ring. He seemed sluggish, as if the run had taken a steep toll on him. We crossed the creaking porch with haste. The cabin was a plain thing of log timbers, beaten and drained by weather and age until they were desiccated and gray. I stared grimly at the wooden door, which bore a crude and obviously recent carving of an X. Randy put an old-fashioned iron key into the lock and pushed the door open, hurrying inside. I followed. Randy fumbled ahead of me in the darkness, rattling objects which I could not see. I heard the telltale sign of laughter followed by a flash of flint. Then, after a few seconds, the flickering glow of a tiny fire set dancing illumination to weakly fill the space around us. The cabin was tiny, one room of maybe 15 feet on each side. A small cast iron stove, 
caked beyond usefulness by thick layers of rust, with an old pile of firewood at its side stood to my right. Directly ahead was a square table on which rest an electric gathering of woodworking tools and dining utensils in a haphazard stacks, as well as the flickering candle that Randy had lit. Two stools waited tucked underneath the table's edge. At the back of the room was a simple bed, sheets stretched across the lumpy mattress, almost entirely eaten by moths and mice. Small glass-painted windows glinted in the candlelight. Everything was drenched in dust and a smell of mildew, obviously untouched for years. Randy lurched past me, slamming the door shut and ramming the lock closed. As he moved close to me, I could smell foul sweat rolling down his pores. Help me lock the shutters, he said. I moved to oblige him, pulling the heavy wooden shutters over the small windows and looping the hook locks closed. He talked quietly as he worked to close the windows on the other side of the cabin. Great Grandpa's hunting cabin. Came out here once or twice when I was a kid with my old man to check on the property after my grandpa sold it off. He paused to expel a hacking cough. Lucky I even remembered where it was. I glanced over my shoulder as I moved to the final window on my side of the room. Randy, what is this thing? Your guess is as good as mine. I ain't never seen anything like it before in my life. I heard him take a shaky breath. My granddad used to say something wasn't right about these woods. Would tell us things. My old man would spin them off for spinning ghost stories. Well, what do we do now? I never should have come back. The hinges creaked as I forced the shutters against the window. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't have. Randy trailed off as he struggled with his own window behind me. Randy? I probed as silence began to grow. As I slowly turned to see the cause of the quiet, a foul sound and stench got to my senses. A wet, rumbling expulsion of gas and a vicious spattering upon the ground, and the burning odor of sickness, sulfur, brought stinging tears to my eyes. What? Randy? Are you kidding me? The angry words stopped as I whirled around to face him. Randy stood facing me, shivering in place. His face, gaunt and pale, streamed with sweat and tears, which ran down and pooled in his deep wrinkles of his skin. Dark circles, the deep purple of an old bruise, had formed under his eyes, which stared blankly ahead. His nose dribbled with spit and mucus. Randy whispered in a quiet, Well, dang. Before going to the ground, sliding down the old timbers to lay against the cabin wall. Fighting back panic, I rushed to his side, he rolled his head weakly to face me. Oh my, Randy, what's happening? I took his sweat-drenched hand in my own. Granddad got sick like this. Came back from the woods one night. Came back like this. Randy let out a slow cough. Nobody ever knew what happened. He didn't even make it through the night. That it had got him. Nobody knew what he was talking about. Help me. As he spoke, the boards of the cabin porch let out a creak. Randy let out a noise. Oh no, please. He stared at me with begging eyes toward me. Please, get me. The X-shaped rash on my torso felt as if it were on fire. Slow taunting scratching rattled along the floor. With his free hand, Randy at my side. His face was a shattered mosaic of pain and strenuous effort drenched in sweat of sickness. With a weak sound, he brought his head up, clutched his pale and shaking fingers with my pocket knife, the one my dad had given me long ago. He pressed and folded the blade into my hand. Please don't let me go like my grandpa did, he softly begged. The door at my back groaned as slow, even pressure was applied. Randy's sorrowful cloudy eyes stared at me. My torso was a stinging matrix of pain. I held my breath as I stared at the little implement in my hand, then back at Randy. There was a sharp pop and a clatter as the lock snapped and fell to the floor behind me. He gasped for a final moment before falling silent, further slumping soundlessly. I kneeled there sobbing as the floorboards behind me creaked with a heavy weight. A click emanated directly from above me. I closed my eyes. A heavy hand came to rest on top of my head inhumanly long fingers stroking my face. 
I sat immobile as creaking joints moved above me. More deep chittering. The sound of dragging and a heavy thump. The hand left my head. The sounds and creaking floorboards retreated towards the door and then were replaced by the cracking of something dragging across the forest floor deeper into the old growth. I sat in the cabin, eyes tightly shut, until weak rays of sunlight warmed my back through the open doorway. I opened my aching eyelids. Randy was gone. He was pulled away, leaving behind a dark trail which disappeared into the woods. I rose to shaking feet. Mindlessly, I wandered the old growth, I trudged, unfeeling and unthinking. I must have stumbled circles around the forest for hours. In the end, I found myself staring at my truck, my fateful old piper, through bleary eyes. On the stark white paint of her hood, smeared, was a huge forester's X. A squealing cackle echoed somewhere in the distance of the woods. Where the lines crossed in the center of the hood rest my pocket knife, clean and folded. The world has all but forgotten the old growth, but I never will. So I've never really told anyone about this, and I don't really know how to properly explain what I saw. So this is my first and best attempt. My name is Zach, and I moved to a northwestern city in Washington state in early 2018 and I didn't really know much about the area. I had recently gotten out of a pretty bad relationship, which actually led to me moving to this new city. Best decision of my life, by the way. I lived with my mom and her roommate for a while until I could get my own place, and everything was going pretty well. I had a nice job, made some good money, and I had little to no rent. Plus, I was making a lot of new friends. One night, about two weeks into my new move, my buddy, let's call him Jay, invites me to go play some pool and have a few drinks. It wasn't too late, maybe 9.30, so I happily accepted the challenge, grabbed my phone, which I had unfortunately forgotten to plug in when I got home from work, searched for my keys, and got in my car. Ten minutes later, after blasting Blink-182 and some screamo music, I pull up to the bar. My buddy is already outside and waiting for me, and I sat in my car for a minute before I went to say what's up. We played pool for a while that night, won a few games, lost a few games, before I felt like going home around 11.50pm. My buddy said he's gonna stay and hang out with some people he knew there, and so I left to go get my car and readied my phone for Google Maps to find my way home, and no power. It had run down while I was at the bar, and I didn't know these streets very well, but I didn't want to face the shame of walking back inside to tell my friend that I didn't know how to get home, so I decided to chance it. I mean, it wasn't even a 15 minute drive. It was pretty close by, right? Wrong. I got lost. About 10 minutes later, I realize I've taken a few too many wrong turns and ended up in this residential area with unfamiliar houses and streets. I kept driving on and on down these streets, trying to find a familiar landmark or familiar street name so I could find my way home. But all I found was more and more of these strange residential houses. But then, this weird fog started rolling in now, fog isn't that uncommon in the Pacific Northwest, and I know that, but this fog felt off. It felt heavy. It was this light gray color with a hint of tan, and it was swirling. It also stayed close to the ground and never really went above the tops of the houses. What really freaked me out was when I swear I kept seeing these small bipedal creatures running along the houses through people's yards following my car. I could never get a close look at them to get perfect detail, but they were about two to three feet tall, gray, oily skin, and had what looked like white hair on their heads. These things were fast too, and there were about six or seven of them. They were just running through this fog. And the further I went down these roads with them, the thicker the fog was. 
no matter how slow or fast I was going, they kept following me. Or was I following them? I could have been following them. I mean, they were always at my side and in front of me. I never saw them behind me. Were they leading me somewhere? They were so mesmerizing. I just wanted to keep following them, just to see where they were going. But I knew better than that. Something felt wrong. I had to get out of there. I got that weird, sixth sense feeling of, I shouldn't be here right now, right before something bad happens. All of a sudden, this dark gray and white wolf came running out of the fog right in front of my car. I quickly slammed on my brakes, nearly crashing into one of the parked cars along the street. This wolf just stood there in the middle of the street, looking at me. And I swear we locked eyes for what felt like hours. But then, bam, the wolf bolts down the street and I instinctively follow. I slam the car in drive, peeling out, and began to follow this wolf down side street after side street. This wolf stayed right in the middle of the street the entire time. It was crazy. I had never seen anything like this in my life. I didn't even think there were wolves in this area this close to the city. It wasn't long before I noticed that the fog had gotten lighter and eventually disappeared. That was when I realized that I'm on the road that I recognize that actually leads me to the direction of my house. With a confused, amazed look on my face, I glance back to where the wolf was at, just to see it dart off into the forest, never to be seen again. I got home safely that night, and to this day, I still have no idea what I experienced that night. My two buddies and I went on a hunting trip for bull elk last November and were having a great time, to say the least. That, however, would soon change after what we saw on the third day. Now, I'm not one for superstition, and I don't believe in ghosts and all that, but what we saw out there really changed my view about those sort of things. The trip started out normally after we parked our trailers at camp. We got there a day before the hunt officially started so we could settle in and get some scouting done. Only Eric and I had licenses because Brian didn't draw this year, but he wanted to come along with us anyway. Brian also brought along his German Shepherd named Lucy, which stayed back at camp with a leash that was connected to a metal spike. The spike was so deep in the ground that I wondered if he would be able to get it out. I asked Brian, and he just told me that his dog was so strong that it had to be that deep. I enjoyed playing with Lucy. She was always excited to see me and would greet me by jumping up on her two legs and trying to lick my face. Eric, however, was not amused by her and would constantly yell at her to leave him alone. Anyway, the first two days we saw so many cow elk in the valleys and on the sides of the mountains that I thought for sure we would see some bulls out there, but there were none among them. It wasn't until the third day of the hunt that we saw a bull elk, but it was too far away to take a shot at, and even if we were able to hit it, it would take hours trying to pack that thing out. So that evening, we decided to hunker down to some fallen trees and were able to watch the hillside. While we were surveying the area, Brian spotted a coyote about 250 yards walking to a small pond of water. Eric took out his binoculars to take a closer look and he started to describe it saying, that coyote, it ain't right looking. It has a hunch on its back like a bear and its jaw. Oh man, its jaw seems like it's broken, and now it's just drooping there like a fish. Let me see those binoculars, I asked curiously with an outreached hand. Eric handed them to me. I took them and looked at the animal and said, You're right, that thing's jaw is just hanging there. Also, did you happen to notice its hair? It's so long and unevenly dispersed. I then handed the binoculars to Brian and he looked at the coyote for a second and screamed. Shh, Brian, shut up. We're hunting, Eric whispered harshly. What did you see? I asked as I looked at his shocked facial expression. Brian looked at his feet as he muttered. I, I saw my dog, Lucy, but it wasn't her. 
I don't know what that was. It couldn't have been your dog. When I looked at it, it didn't have a large black spot on its back or your dog's strawberry red sides and underbelly. I said in a plain, yet confused manner. Well, since we ain't gonna see anything out here because you scream like a baby, I'm gonna go put that coyote out of its misery. A large shot followed, and we saw the animal drop soon after. It was a clean takedown, and Eric was curious about seeing what was wrong with the animal up close. So he started getting ready to hike out. As he got his stuff together, he said, You probably just didn't get a good look at it, Brian. Your dog is fine. Brian stood up and he brushed the dirt off himself and replied, I swear, I saw my dog, but an evil, demented version of it with human eyes. But you guys are probably right. There's no way she could have had the strength to yank the metal spike holding her back at camp. Well, let's go find the truth about this animal, I said somewhat excitedly as I started walking toward the animal. It took us about a half an hour to hike over to it, and we lost sight of the animal's corpse as we passed through some trees. Once we finally got to the spot where the animal had dropped, there was nothing, just a puddle of red. However, the red was blackish and very dense. Eric observed the scene and started to scratch his head as he said, there's no way it could have just gotten back up and walked off. I had an eerie feeling about the whole situation and Brian was still afraid that it might have been his dog. Eric, however, noticed a trail leading to the dark tree line. Without asking, he started to follow it. As he did, Brian and I were both freaked out and just watched Eric as he ran into the forest. He soon went out of sight, and Brian and I could not leave him there, so we waited. I passed the time by taking a skinny stick and poking it through the puddle of red. It smelled terrible, so much so that my stomach convulsed and I threw up. You okay? Brian asked as he put his hand on my back. Before I could answer, there was a loud shot that echoed through the trees and we both looked at the direction it came from. Must have found the animal, I said as I spit into the grass. As soon as I said this, we could now see Eric and he was full on sprinting. Run! He screamed as he ran at us. I was able to ask him what happened, but Brian grabbed my arm and yanked me towards where we had parked the truck. Without hesitation, I ran. We soon made it back to the truck. I looked back at Eric, who slowed down for nothing. I soon looked behind him and saw nothing chasing us. So I opened the truck and got in without worry. Eric then climbed in and told me to hit the gas and go. I was so perplexed on what Eric saw out there, and I knew that he hardly ever got scared of anything, so this started to freak me out. I started driving fast back to camp. I don't know, man. That was no animal. I followed the trail and it stopped at the base of the tree, and I was wondering how a coyote was able to climb a tree. But when I looked up, I saw this hairy humanoid creature there. It smelled so bad. Eric went on about how scary that thing was and how he was done with this hunting trip and wanted to go home. We soon pulled into camp and mutually decided that we were going home. I started to pack my things, then felt like something was missing. I then thought to myself, Lucy? Where's Brian's dog? She usually is always excited to see us back at camp. She can't stop whining and barking to be set free. As soon as I thought this, Brian started screaming and crying. I ran over to where he was, and his dog was gone. However, on further inspection, I noticed what Brian was looking at. Something had pulled out the metal stake in the ground. Brian just could not stop crying, and Eric ran over to see what was wrong, and just stood there, jaw dropped and frozen. Skinwalker, Eric said in a low tone of voice as he looked in the distance. He then screamed, It's a skinwalker. I followed his gaze and saw an animal that looked like Lucy, but it had human eyes and a sickly green glaze looking coat of fur. Brian stopped crying and just stood there, eyes locked on the beast. Eric whispered with his voice quivering, We all run to the truck on the count of three. Just leave everything else. Brian and I slowly nodded and agreed to the plan. 
Okay. Three, two, one. Eric whispered sharply and we took off like a pack of gazelles for the truck. We hopped in and as soon as we did, we saw the skinwalker lunge at us and struck the truck on the right door with such a powerful blow that it nearly tipped over the whole truck. It didn't stop me whatsoever and I drove out of there faster than I ever have before. After that, none of us ever went hunting again in that area. We never even went back to claim our camping trailers and supplies. It was too terrifying to think that what happened to Brian's dog could happen to us and that thing would walk around in our skin. Since that experience, I am now a superstitious person. There are places in the Rocky Mountains that are known by word of mouth as forbidden areas. This is not because they are private property or owned by the government, but rather because of what lurks in their mists. Anyone stupid enough to wander into these areas, even unknowingly, will be haunted, cursed, or most likely never heard from again. Many cases of missing people in the wilderness are people who have wandered into these territories and who have never come back. These restricted areas can be found all across the world in diverse places. I heard of some of these stories, and one mountain area in particular caught my eye. The stories about it all varied in their description of the creature that lived in there, but they all described the red eyes and sounded admitted exactly the same. And some older people explained that that was all you could see of the creature in the darkness. However, the main thing that they focused on was the sound that it made. Supposedly, it was like a deep clicking sound. It supposedly sent nerves chilling up and down your spine. I was young, immature at this point in my life, and so after hearing these stories, I was very intrigued because I was always fascinated with the supernatural my entire life. I had binge watched all of the TV shows that involved ghost hunting, so I wanted to do some exploring for myself and act like I was some famous ghost hunter. And so I also took a camera with me into this supposedly forbidden mountain area among other simple hiking supplies. I started in the early morning light on the trail. I was not quite yet into the forbidden area when I saw an old man with an antique looking cane off the side of the trail, sitting on a decaying log. I nodded at him while keeping a steady pace, trying to avoid conversation with the man. But he asked me in an old scratchy voice, Where are you headed, young man? You seem awfully eager to be on your way. I stopped and replied, staring at the man's wrinkled face. Nowhere in particular, just out for a hike, that's all, really. The man sat there staring me down for a while, straightening his back and said, I feel an evil presence stirring within you. Your true intentions are not what you have told me. I stood there, perplexed by what he said. I then thought to myself, what is this man talking about? I have no evil intentions. The man then spoke before I was able to ask him a question, saying, The path you choose is your choice, but I'm warning you that whatever it is that you are pursuing on this trail, I beg of you, may you please rethink it. Look here, man, I have no evil intentions, and there's no darkness inside me. I'm just going for a hike, I replied with a weirded out tone. He who seeks after the forbidden land seeks after darkness, and he who seeks after darkness will surely become it. The man stated firmly as he used his cane to stand on his feet. My insides began to twist because this man actually knew what I was doing up here. But how? I have told no one about this trip. So I asked, Who are you and how do you know where I'm going? Young man, this is not important. Listen to me when I tell you to turn around, for there is only demise where you are headed, the man said as he began to shuffle down the trail. What are you talking about? I asked hesitantly, wondering what the man's background story was. However, he did not reply and continued down the trail. 
I looked down at my watch to see how much time I lost by talking to the man. Dang, was that really 10 minutes? I said to myself as I quickly looked back to where the man was walking and saw that he was gone. He was far too slow to have gotten back to the tree line, but there was no other explanation of where he went so fast. I shrugged it off as some crazy old guy in the forest, trying to keep people from going on his land that he's squatting on. He is probably growing some illegal plants out here and is trying to scare people away from finding it. It reminded me of some Scooby-Doo story plot. I tapped my camera that I had in my bag pocket and thought to myself how fun it would be to expose this man and prove all the people scared by this so-called forbidden land wrong. It would be a pleasure to yank the mask off this old wrinkly man's face. Time continued to pass, and soon I was in the heart of the restricted land that fell between the two mountains and was mainly a rocky valley hidden under large ponderosa pines. The sun began to sink behind one of the mountains, and I prepared my camera to take the video of the man dressed as a monster. I was so eager I could hardly maintain my composure, and I even let out shivers of excitement. It was at this time I thought I felt a cold chill tickle my spine, and a feeling of uneasiness came upon me. The wind spun with darkness entwined with its every twist and turn. My heart began to pound with every pump. I quickly looked up from the camera on the rock and gazed around me. I saw nothing out of the ordinary until I saw a dark, glowing red dot hidden behind a tree. It looked bright red and it reminded me of the description of the monster. I shook off my nervous feelings and got back to business. So I quickly turned the camera on and faced it toward the tree. I last saw the red eye. There was nothing there now. Huh? Where did you go? I whispered to myself as I zoomed in on the tree. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a dash of blurred light and I turned swiftly and started recording. I now saw two red eyes peering at me from a rock that was about 50 meters away. I once again zoomed in the camera on the rock the creature was on and there was no red dots on the camera's view, but strangely, I could see them clear as day with my eyes. Come on, pick this up. I silently screamed at the camera while doing all the adjusting I could on it, trying to get it to pick up the eyes. After a few moments, I looked up and the eyes were gone, but a faint sound began to echo through the trees. Now I knew for sure that this was no animal, but had to be the creature or the man dressed like one. The sound began to become more clear and less faint. It started to scare me with every clicking type sound that cut through the already quiet breeze. I made sure the camera was recording just in case I was able to pick up the sound. I grabbed a stick that was lying nearby and wielded it. The sound grew louder with every aching moment and my heart rate grew as it did. Then, straight ahead of me, the figure with its red eyes with black pupils was crawling towards me. It was a humanoid figure with patches of fur covering parts of its body, but the rest was a sickly pale skin with splotches. My stomach shot up and I was frozen in fear. I knew for sure that there was no crazy man dressed up as a monster by how it moved so inhumanly. As I stood there, the thing's clicking sounds grew louder and more aggressive and slowly crawled toward me. The only thing that I could think of was run. So I threw the stick at the beast and sprinted back into the trail, leaving all my gear but the headlamp I had on. At this point, the sun had gone down and no remnants of it remained. I just ran, not looking back for any reason. A loose rock rolled out from under my foot, which sent me barreling down the side of the rocky hill. My sleeveless legs and arms were all cut up now. Behind me, I heard rocks being knocked down and branches snapping, and that awful sound it makes grew louder. I thought about getting up and running, but my ankle ached too much, so I swiftly looked around for any cover, but the only thing I could find that was close enough was a bush with dried up leaves. I had no choice, so I curled up inside of it and turned off my headlamp. My heart began to calm down as I heard the creature become quiet. However, the thing's deformed human face with holes for ears and a mouth large enough to swallow a whole animal caught my gaze. 
Its eyes glowed in the dark, and I felt sick to my stomach looking at it. So I closed my eyes and prayed it wouldn't find me. After a few minutes of silence, I chose to open them, and the humanoid creature was there, just staring at me. I met its eyes, and as I did, I felt dread. All my nightmares popped into my head at once. The only thing I could do was scream. It then lunged at me, and my world went dark. The sun was shining bright in the clear blue sky. I slowly opened my eyes and remembered what had happened, and I jumped to my feet. I looked around me and thought I had gone to heaven. There were beautiful trees, soft looking grass, and a cabin with smoke coming out of it. I headed toward it and knocked on the door. The old man answered with a smile on his old wrinkly face. So, how'd you sleep? You've been out there for two days now. The man asked while brushing his hair on his chin. I replied in a confused tone and then asked, What happened to that creature? Well, I knew you'd be stupid enough to not listen to me, so I followed you to make sure you'd make it out safe. Well, at least most of you would make it out safe. What do you mean by most of me? I asked hesitantly. The man's smile went away as he grabbed his cane and tapped my right leg. I could see his cane hit my leg, but I felt nothing. The old man cleared his throat and said, Your leg is gone, if you haven't noticed. It's the price you had to pay for going into that land. Oh, and you're one of the lucky ones, young man. Many people go missing in these parts and are never heard from again. I stood there shocked as I rolled up my pants to see a wooden leg up to my knee. I was amazed that I haven't noticed until now. I then asked as I saw that he had all of his limbs. How do you go on that land and not get attacked? The same way I was able to get to you. That thing hates light, but only natural light, such as a fire, not artificial light. Flashlights do nothing but edge on its curiosity, the old man said while opening up a plastic cooler. So I guess my leg was eaten by the time you were able to save me? I asked as I examined my fake limb. The man took something out of the cooler and turned toward me. He was holding a leg when he said, No, my pet out there gets the scraps. I get the tender parts. As a child, growing up in a heavily wooded area, we of course played in the trees and explored around us. There was only one place that was off limits, and even as an adult, I don't think most would step foot in there. We called it the Thin Forest. It was a section of wooded area off past an abandoned house at the end of the dirt road. For some reason, the woods that surrounded it were sparse and appeared decayed. Growing up, we heard all of the rumors, so much so that it became an urban legend around our small town. Apparently, an old man and his wife had lived in the home until his wife passed away from unknown causes. The thing is, no one knew she passed away for at least three months, or that's how the story goes. She was discovered by a neighbor dropping by to sell some eggs and milk from her farm. From the way I heard it, the old man wasn't home and the neighbor left to get her husband so they could search for him. She must have figured if the wife was left deceased for such a long period of time, something must have happened to the old man. As she was returning with her husband and the two other neighbors, the old man returned. He was enraged by their presence and couldn't be calmed down. He locked himself in the home and by the time they gained entry, he and his wife's corpse were gone. Everyone figured in the time that it took to get in, he must have dragged her into the woods. Shortly after that, it's said that the trees began to wither. No one moved into the home, but one couple did attempt to renovate it about 25 years ago. I guess I was six at the time. I don't remember much, and my parents didn't speak about it around me. I heard from Jason though that his parents said the couple went missing. Mary said her grandmother thought it was the spirit of a bitter old man that took them away. Either way, we did not play in the thin forest. 
We were a small community of neighbors, as there were only seven homes along many acres of woods and our little dirt road. As kids, we all roamed all over freely. About six months after Mrs. Green was moved into the nursing home, a nice family moved into her old house. I was 11 then. They had a son named Michael. He was a goofy looking boy with a narrow frame, a head a little too large for his body, and ears too large for his head. Despite being the smaller of us, he was the bravest. He always climbed higher than we did and always went deeper into the woods than any of us dared. He even liked to play with snakes. Michael and I became friends and spent much of our time together. A lot of nights, we would go out and catch worms together. Sometimes we used soap water to lure them out, and others we just waited for a good rain. Mr. Miller would pay us a nickel for each worm that he would go on to use as bait. Sometimes we'd stay out until right before sunup. We'd chat about getting out of the small town and being somebodies when we grew up. Michael had big dreams to live in a city, have a fancy apartment, and nobody to answer to but himself. One night, after we concluded that we'd caught enough worms that we could for the night, Michael looked at me with a particular glow in his eye. Want to do something crazy? He asked me. I shrugged. Like what? I asked. There's nothing really crazy to do around here, I said matter-of-factly. He grinned widely. There's one thing, he said, trailing off. I watched his head turn in the direction of the thin forest. Before I understood his meaning, he spoke again. I've heard the little stories you guys tell me, but I think they're just that. Stories. Don't you want to go in there and prove that there's nothing to be afraid of? We could scare the others. I didn't have a chance to answer before he started again. Think about this. We go in. Nothing happens. We say something happened, like we saw the old man or something. Mary and Jason would flip and basically bow down to us. I could hear him getting more excited as he went on. I know it's not the craziest of things to do, but if we tell the story right, the other kids will seriously think it was. I swear I could hear my heart rate raising as I could feel my hands starting to sweat. Michael, no one goes in there, and for good reason. Something isn't right. He laughed. How do you know, Daniel? The last time something happened, you were six. It probably didn't happen like you heard it anyhow. Deep in my gut, I knew he was wrong, but what if he wasn't? It would be cool to lord it over the other kids, especially Mary. She'd really think I was cool. So, stupidly, I agreed. I wanted to be brave like Michael, and I figured if you're going into the thin forest, he's the person you want to go with. The following weekend, we met up in Mr. Miller's yard near the tree line. Mr. Miller lived the closest to the thin forest, and his family had lived there far longer than any of ours. I felt sick and wanted to go back out. I could feel my stomach turning, and I remember feeling a little dizzy. I did my best to not let on, though. I didn't want to appear chicken in front of Michael. He didn't look like I felt. In fact, he was positively glowing with excitement. Thinking back on it, I swear, he probably could have lit the way through the thin forest with sheer excitement alone. He pulled a flashlight out of his backpack. You ready, Daniel? He asked with a big grin on his face. I nodded, though I didn't feel ready. I stirred through my bag and grabbed my flashlight as well, and we started toward the old man's property, cutting through the woods on Mr. Miller's land. Looking back, I can still remember how I felt as we neared the thin forest. I almost want to say it was just dread or anxiety, but it was something else. It was though invisible forces were carefully pulling me closer, while others tugged at me to go back. I need you to understand, this wasn't just a feeling in my head. I felt it on my body, invisible hands carefully pulling at my shirt. I looked at Michael to see if he felt the same. 
I don't know what he felt as far as invisible forces, but he was smiling like a lunatic. Have you thought of a good tale to spin to the others? He asked me. I tried to answer him, but before I could open my mouth, I felt something else. The front half of my body was flushed with a sudden chill. I could feel it in my eyes, in my toes. The back of me felt warm and I wanted to bolt away. Wow, it's cold, Michael said. I almost felt a relief that he was feeling it too. That's when I realized that we were standing on the edge of the thin forest. It's now or never, he said. I wanted to scream never and race home to be warm again, and I wish I had. Instead, I just nodded and mumbled a quiet, yeah. As we started forward, the chill encompassed my entire body. I did my best to ignore it. Yeah, I've been thinking. What if we saw the old man? Michael asked. We could say he chased us out. Michael was getting louder as he went on. What if we find the wife's body, Daniel? Oh man, what if we did that? We'd be included in the stories then. He trailed off. Maybe because he was the braver of the two of us but it didn't seem like he was affected by the changes as we went deeper into the thin forest. After the cold came a whisper. It was faint at first, but it began to get louder as we walked. Leave, it said. I could feel it as it made its way into my ears, like a warm breath sticking to my neck. I wanted to leave, and I spoke up for the first time that night. Michael, we've been in the thin forest now. Let's go home. We'll think of a story tomorrow. I'm cold. He laughed at me. Are you scared, Daniel? He turned to me and pointed his light under his chin, emphasizing his fantastical grin. Scared of the old man? He asked, laughing. He kept walking forward before I heard it again. Leave now, it said. Michael froze. I froze. He'd heard it too. It seemed as though he was about to turn back to speak to me until something else happened. The decayed trees began to creak. It started lowly and got louder and louder until I felt like that might be the only sound I'd ever hear again. He's here, came the whisper. I felt the whisper more so than before. The breath, I suppose you would say, was hot on my neck that it hurt against my cold skin. It was like sticking your frozen hands under hot water. The pain was all it took to shock my system enough to start running through the thin forest back to the direction of Mr. Miller's. Growing up, the trees were sparse in a certain degree, and you really should be able to see your way back clearly for the most part. As I was running to get out of the forest though, I couldn't tell which direction was the right one. The trees creaked louder as I ran. This time I knew I wasn't imagining the invisible hands because I could feel them as they brushed up against me, reaching desperately for a firm grasp. I'd like to say that I knew Michael wasn't far behind me, but it wasn't until one of the hands latched onto my shoelace and I fell that I actually looked back. I didn't see Michael. I wanted to call out for him. I waited to hear him call out for me. I listened for footsteps, but I could only hear the trees. I felt the invisible hand sliding across my body, reaching for my face. As the hand touched my mouth, my mouth went dry. So dry that my tongue could just shrivel up and roll down my throat if it also wasn't so dry. I closed my eyes, fighting back tears. The thin forest went quiet. The cold faded and I shivered as warmth entered into my body once again. I laid there on the ground for what felt like hours, listening. All was silent. Eventually, I stood up to begin to walk again. This time I could see which direction I needed to go. I went back for my flashlight that rolled away after I'd been knocked to the ground. I pointed it in every direction, flashing it like Morse code. I was too afraid to call for Michael, but I hoped he would see my flashes and make his way to me. He didn't. I stood stuck in that spot for two hours before I relented and made my way back home. As I reached my house, I started hoping this was some sort of cruel prank played by Michael. I knew whatever had happened wasn't his doing, but I hoped he was home. 
He didn't answer me because he wanted me to be more afraid. Crawling into bed, I almost made myself believe it was a prank, and tomorrow, Michael would come over howling in laughter. I thought about what to tell him once he revealed the prank. I even thought of hitting him for it. I didn't fall asleep quickly though, because I think I knew deep down that tomorrow, Michael wouldn't be there. He never came back. I never told anyone what we had done. His parents split up eight months later after his disappearance. His mom never left the house though. I heard my mom say that it was because she hoped that Michael would come home one day. Mary and Jason always seemed to know that I knew more than I let on, but they never pushed me for information. We grew up, and I since left that small town. I have a nice apartment in the city, and I've worked my way into a position where I almost only have to answer to just myself. Michael would have been proud, even though this is where he was meant to be instead. I never told anyone about what happened that night. I never planned to. I don't even know what happened myself. The only reason I'm sharing my story now is because I've heard from Jason recently. He and Mary, they got married. Apparently, they've been living a life of thrills, adrenaline rushes, and traveling since they moved away. Anyway, Jason told me that he and Mary decided they were going to go camping this weekend. They're going to set up in the thin forest and wondered if I wanted to come. I wanted to say no. I wanted to warn them not to. How could I? It's not like I told them what happened that night. It's not like I can convince two adults who regularly seek out thrills to avoid our childhood's scariest story. So for the second time in my life, I have stupidly agreed to set foot in the thin forest. I don't think I'm really ready to protect them because I know there's nothing I can do. I think I really agreed because I've always wondered if maybe Michael is still there, wondering if maybe he's lost and waiting on me to find him. In any case, I'll find out this weekend. When I was a kid, my family spent our school breaks at a cabin that sat on Lake Anacoco in Louisiana. The building was a modest, open-style house that barely held all 11 of our extended family members on various sofa beds and cots that were strewn about the space. The place had air conditioning, but the heating was controlled by a wood-burning stove that sat in the middle of the living room. The house stands as a strange blend of modern and ancient in my mind, though I haven't been there in years. The house had nothing to fear on the inside, it was packed to the gills with goofy and sometimes profane cow-themed decorations, an old typewriter that probably weighed more than a hundred pounds, and various country records that my grandmother would put on to dance with my grandfather. Nights where we weren't outside by the bonfires we'd stack at least five feet high were spent indoors playing Uno or dominoes while eating my grandmother's home-cooked meals. We'd dance and laugh along with silly songs or my uncle's colorful stories. And on special occasions, we'd fire up the Nintendo 64 on the big screen when my grandfather decided that he didn't want to watch his bass fishing specials. The entire lake house was a representation of my childhood, and woods that surrounded it were my playground. My brother, three cousins, and I would patrol the woods fish off the decrepit pier, and swim in the swampy lake that shared a side with the military base, Fort Polk. Unfortunately, our merriment came to an abrupt halt when I was about 13. I remember the day I got the bad news. I was at my grandma's house back in Texas where I lived, and my mom walked through the door at her usual time. However, her unusual sunny disposition was replaced with a grim, red-faced sadness. Her eyes were swollen and puffy, and I remember distinctly a hoarse whisper that replaced her usual greeting. My dad has cancer. I was young, but the C word sent a bolt of anxiety straight into my gut. I had been to enough funerals of elderly church members to know what it meant for my beloved relative. My brother was five years younger than I, 
and even his eyes welled with tears as we received the news. My mother announced that her parents would be moving to a camp in Louisiana permanently to enjoy their last few years of life somewhere quiet and peaceful. This meant that we would be spending a much larger amount of time there than we typically did. The bad news wouldn't stop coming through. We found out shortly after my grandparents moved that my grandmother was also suffering from cancer. She already had diabetes, heart problems, and was having issues seeing. She had been through a quadruple bypass the day my younger brother was born, so she had been failing in health for many years. The health issues of both of my grandparents meant that my family spent nearly every other weekend in Louisiana visiting my ailing grandparents and squeezing every ounce of time that we could with them. Watching them deteriorate was hard for us. We spent more time than ever outdoors so as to not smell the scents of sickness, chemo, and hospital supplies that permeated the lake house regularly. We explored the woods even more frequently traveling the miles-long trails that surrounded the lake. We happened upon abandoned fishing cleaning huts and duck stands, but the most exceptional thing that we found was during a hike at dusk, a track. Animal tracks were so incredibly common in these woods that we barely even noticed the bobcat, deer, and duck prints that populated the dense trees anymore. This track was different. For starters, it wasn't one any of us recognized. It was like the bobcat tracks we'd seen a thousand times. Four toe pads connected to a larger pad. But it was different in one distinct way. It was massive. A single print was the size of our faces. The groove marks from its claws on these apparent paws dug at least four inches into the dirt. I examined the tracks of the animal using some of the survival training my uncle had taught me. The space between each step and the broken branches nearby meant that it had to be as tall as I was at the time. A paltry four and a half feet for a teenage boy, but massive for an animal. There was this smell in the air I couldn't put my finger on. Something like a blend of pennies and wet dog. Just when I decided it was time to go tell my parents about these strange tracks, my youngest cousin let out a screeching, curling sound. I spun quickly to look at her, my heart beating out of control at this point. She was pointing up in the trees. I took a step back, slowly moving my eyes in the direction of her finger. In the tree she was pointing at, there was a deer carcass. It was ripped to shreds and draped over a branch half eaten. The deer's residue dripped onto the ground, creating a pool of crimson that was so large that I could smell it where I stood. I walked to the pool and felt the warmth emanate from it immediately. It was fresh, really fresh. I whispered to my cousins to run back to camp immediately. They followed without hesitation, and I brought up the deer, glancing back as often as I could in the dense forest. I half expected to feel the beast was after me at any moment. It had to be close by. It had to hear us. Just as we reached the cusp of the woods where the open space of our camp started, I heard a noise that sent a chill through my body. It was a sound that I could only describe as a screaming woman combined with the roar of a lion. It pierced the trees and shattered the silence of the woods. My cousins didn't stop like I did when the shriek got to them. They kept running up onto the porch and into the house, slamming the door behind them. I stopped at the fire pit surrounded by chairs that my grandparents built and watched the area that we came from intently. Slumping through the woods was a mound of black fur, just far enough away that it looked like a black blot of ink on green paper. Just as a flash of the animal appeared, it was gone. The sun was going down. Over the next few weeks, my cousins refused to go outside for too long. Trips to fish were relegated to boat-only excursions, and sitting by the fire during the nights roasting hot dogs and marshmallows were all but unheard of. We explained what happened to our parents and grandparents but they seemed to think it was just another bobcat that we'd conflated into something much more sinister in the creepiness of the woods. Nothing happened for a few more visits, 
until the temperatures began to drop in November. During the week off for Thanksgiving, the temperatures began to drop drastically in the Louisiana swamps, creating a dense fog that blanketed the entire area. When it was foggy and chilly, the wind would spill through the trees like waves of mercury. It would bite through most jackets and cover up the lake so thickly that we couldn't see the ends of our fishing poles when sitting on the pier. My uncle and I would venture onto the lake on foggy days and go bait the trot lines that we had at various points in the lake to catch catfish. Most fishers hated trying to navigate the stump-ridden lake in limited visibility. So we had a good chance of catching something with the lake so quiet. My uncle turned on his trolling motor and the boat crept along the water, barely making a ripple. It was around 5 a.m. and we were feeding the line back into the water after baiting it with some perch that we had caught earlier in the week. We had on more than a few layers of clothing, but my uncle and I were still shivering. When we dropped the last bit of line into the water, I heard the noise again. The sound of the beast. A woman's scream combined with the roar of a large cat, but this time it was accompanied by the shrill, dying brays of some animal in the woods. I swore I could hear crunching as that thing tore into its prey. I locked eyes with my uncle. He was as white as a sheet, and his eyes were wide as I had ever seen them. The man was a trained army sniper and did mercenary work in Afghanistan. This was the first time I had ever seen fear in his eyes in the years I had known him. I don't know what frightened me more, my uncle's newfound fear, or the fact that he didn't crank the engine, but instead elected to paddle quietly back to camp, like the thing would hear us and come running. My uncle had some strong ties to the higher-ups at Fort Polk, where he used to work. When we arrived back at the camp, he immediately tied off the boat and escorted me inside. He rushed over to the phone when he was inside, furiously dialing someone. I only heard pieces of the exchange because he was whispering, but I did catch a few distinct words. Containment, escape, dangerous, and untested. I knew he must have been talking to someone at the base on the other side of the lake. When he was done, he said that he wasn't sure what it was that he had heard, but we had some friends from the base working on figuring it out. That night, the fog rolled out, and it was starry, clear, and spectacularly chilly. The night was so crisp and clear that even my ailing grandparents elected to go outside and roast food by the bonfire. We found out, however, that we weren't quite stocked enough for everyone. So, my grandfather elected to drive the golf cart we owned up the hill and down the road from the camp to a local corner store. My two cousins and I went with him, so he wouldn't be lonely. We got to the store within a half an hour or so of leaving the camp and pulled into the fully lit corner store. The owner, Michael, was a 30-something man with a missing leg who was a veteran and former trainer at the military base. When we walked in, he was sitting on the counter with a half smirk on his face, eating a bag of sour cream and onion chips, smoking. He greeted us and helped us get what we asked for. Some hot dogs, marshmallows, and extra buns, and some fishing line. After he rang us up, my grandfather and he discussed a few grown-up things we weren't interested in, until a banging noise came from behind the back door of the corner shop. Michael said something about the dumb new kid he hired and stepped out from behind the counter to go inspect what was going on behind the store. When he opened the back door and looked out, he managed to choke out. Oh no. As we glanced in his direction, whatever he saw pulled him away from the door in an inhumanly fast jerking motion. He screamed and begged for the thing to let him go, for someone to help him. A few sickening crunches stopped his pleading. A red color pushed its way under the half-closed door of the shop and leaked out onto the white tile floor of the corner store. My cancer-stricken grandfather moved at a speed and strength of a much younger man. He scooped up the three of us, rushing to the cart. He pushed us in and floored it, spinning the tires before the golf cart lurched forward and screamed down the road at its top, way above factory recommended speed of 45 miles an hour. I screamed over the panic of my other two cousins, 
that it was the thing in the woods that attacked Michael. While we tore down the roads that led to our lake house, my grandfather ignored me, gripping the steering wheel so hard that his knuckles were white. I grabbed his sleeve and begged him to talk to me about what we were running from. He kept looking forward, occasionally glancing in the rearview mirror. I don't know why he bothered. The lack of lights on these dirt roads made the view behind us a pitch black void. He didn't even bother to slow down heading down the hill, and when he slammed his foot down on the top of the brake, the car slid several feet. He commanded we get inside immediately. When we were inside, he loaded four guns and passed them out to my dad, my uncle, and me, keeping one for himself. The camp had four simple walls, but most of them were covered with windows. We couldn't see out of the camp on all four sides without fear of a blind spot and it was well lit around the edges of the tree line, thanks to lights we had fixed to the trees a few years before. My grandfather put us all in different corners of the building, watching for the thing. No matter how many times I asked, nobody would explain to me exactly what that thing was. About an hour into our watch, we saw the thing coming down the hill, a lurking predator with yellow eyes, but indistinguishable otherwise. A blob moving in the darkness, then, it did something I'd never seen a bobcat do before. Just as it arrived to the edge of where the lights lit the camp, it stopped, so that it remained nothing more than an inky spot, just out of view. It was only a few hundred feet away from it at this point, so I decided to take action. I slid the window open just an inch and prepped my shot when I felt my uncle's hand on my shoulder. He pulled the gun away from me and slid the window back down. Don't antagonize it. When my uncle spoke, the thing looked in our direction. We held our breath for several seconds, until it went back to pacing along the light's edge. Something about my uncle calling the creature it made the beast feel even more sinister in my mind. It also bothered me that he said antagonize, like the shot would do nothing to it. It stared at the building for several more minutes, as if it were deciding what to do. Then, just as soon as I thought it was going to step into the light, the beast turned and walked back into the deeper darkness. We watched as it limbered back into the woods and out of sight. That night, I fell asleep in the chair. When I woke up the next morning, my uncle was by me on the couch, snoring lightly. Everyone else but my grandfather was asleep. He stood leaning on the countertop with a cup of coffee in his hand, which quivered slightly. Though from weakness or fear, I couldn't tell. He looked older than he normally did. He was holding a paper that was delivered earlier that morning. Detailed in that paper was a report of how the military base had allowed a live panther to escape after being subjected to heavy testing, making it extremely aggressive and stronger than cats usually were. It got two people and several pets and livestock that lived around the base before being sedated in the night and brought back to the base. I believe the report initially, but the longer time went on, the more it seemed that the initial news report was fiction. When the story hit national news, I truly no longer believed the reports of the paper. Gone were the stories of it being a panther, now it was a Bengal tiger and there was no mention of Michael and his horrible fate or any of the other people for that matter. The worst revelation of it all was the beast was never captured in this particular report. I haven't been back to the camp in many years, but my cousins still visit it from time to time. They remember the sound of the woman screeching combined with the roar of the beast in the night well because now and again they are reminded of it as it pierces the trees. It wakes them from their sleep. They use those nights to sit around the table and eat marshmallows toasted on the wood stove, playing Uno or maybe dominoes until dawn. You know that moment when you're hiking up through the woods because you're mad and you left the house without your jacket and it's the middle of winter in New England and yesterday was like 70, but today's like 30, and you severely misinterpreted the jerk behavior of the weather, and you want to go back, but you don't, because then you'll see the gloating in your family's eyes. Like, yeah, we knew you couldn't do it. You always come back. And so you're just fuming and fuming until wham. 
you trip over a buried mannequin in the middle of a gray, shadow-eating trees. Yeah, that was me yesterday. A mannequin, I guess. I mean, it was. But the whole thing. Not just some stumpy half-body with a chest and torso, but no legs. It was dirty and covered in pine needles, carpeting, and leafy decay. But it was a head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Like, what mannequin has toes? My own toes curled up in my shoes, just looking at it there. And it looking back. You know what's freakier than a mannequin? A mannequin with a face. The display window figure was unclothed and I hesitantly peered closer. I could tell that it wasn't just dirty, it was scrawled on. Weird, backwards looking letters in thick sharpie. Like some crazy witch's intern had been practicing a sacrifice and then dumped it like you might crumble up a piece of paper with bad math and chuck it in a bucket. This mannequin had been chucked in the bucket of my woods. Honestly, I'm surprised the swarms of dirt bikers and quads didn't cartwheel over it already. It lay there helplessly, graffitied, and cold. One arm had been flung up like it had been turned to stone and knocked backwards, like it had been real. Those eyes were too real. I blinked and looked away. Really, I should have kept walking, but I was still mad. I grabbed a stick from the layers of mold and detrius, leveled it up under the mannequin's back and flipped it over. There was another arm coming out of its back. A whole nother arm. Like another mannequin deep in the ground had reached up through the earth and roots and plunged its fist through the first body to wrench out its non-existent heart then got stuck. The hell? I said, because I felt it was appropriate. The stick slid from my hands, and I hissed as a jutting splinter sliced inside my thumb. Someone either had to have a weird installation art hobby that happened to have a gallery in my backyard, or all the stress in my life was finally pushing its way through my eyes in hallucinations. I hastily sucked my thumb, then flipped the first mannequins back over so I didn't have to look at the other one attached to its back. The plastic was cold and clammy, almost like skin. Why would a mannequin have skin? But why would there be a chain of mannequins buried in the woods anyway? I seriously thought about going back. I could just make out the shape of my house through the dry rustle of dead leaves. Stupid leaves, still hanging on. Still thought they were alive, even though winter had got them months ago. Clearly. I was still angry, so after scuffing a clump of leaves and grass over the mannequins, I walked on. I was hiking through my woods, and it's starting to get dark. The shadows are growing, and the branches seem to be growing too. The sky is bending down the drain, and the light that comes through is sticky and stained, and gives you a little bit of a hiccup in your heartbeat. I kept walking, walking off the fields, off the mad and was finally beginning to really feel like all of the spiky emotional stuff was leaving me. Leaving me pretty cold, too. The temperatures had gone down even further, and I was shivering in my shoes. After another minute, I flicked a glance back, startled to find out how far up the hill I'd come. Trees spilled away behind me, the curve of the incline seeming steeper in the dusk, hunched trunks and tangled branches creating a sort of looming arch. That was the only thing I saw. Something was there, not too far behind me. A silhouette glimpse between blinks. An odd, sort of creaking, reaching my ears. Just the wind in the woods, I thought. Just these trees complaining about the cold. But there was no wind. Nothing moved. If you're ever not sure about anything in your life, if you ever feel uncertainty, creeping like a cold-bellied snake up your back, then you know, the dark doesn't usually make it better. I wanted to go back now, but there was something out there behind me. And to go home, I had to go past it. An animal, I told myself. Surely an animal. There are coyotes in these woods, after all. But that silhouette had not been an animal. Not animal-shaped, anyway. It had a human shape. Maybe a little crooked. Maybe a little stilted and leaning. But human human-ish. Did I regret my choices? I was going home. Just walk with purpose. Just don't look. I swiveled my heel, listening to the leaves crunch in the too quiet air. 
My knees scuffed against each other, my breath plumed white. My hands were tight with shivers in their pockets, nothing but trees and rocks and fallen logs. An owl hooted, and I had to clap my frozen hands to my chest to keep my heart from exploding out. After that though, it was better. I felt a little ridiculous, which made me both a little more warm and a little more confident. I walked faster down the hill, heels sliding on the damp moss and buried stones, slick as ice. Just about halfway down I stumbled, hit the dirt, elbows and knees catching me with bruises. Dang shoelace. I knew it had to be. The one on my right shoe always came undone, slithering out whenever I needed it to behave the most. Only, my shoe was still tied. There was just a hand around my ankle. No, I tried to scream, but it came out as a heavily garbled surprise instead. It wasn't a hand. It was just a root, gnarled and weird. I felt back along my leg and tried to pry it off. Wood that felt like freezing skin, knots and whorls that felt like knuckles. It was definitely a hand. Hissing fear sharply through my teeth, my head and my heart both drumming. I yanked my leg toward my chest, not caring if I bled, not caring what I tore. I had to get out of here, but the hand held on. I pulled my own hand away. It smeared with black, runny, with that heady, pungent, sharpie smell. I hate that smell. And that hand, I knew, I knew with every troubling cell, was the hand of the mannequin buried in the ground. And just as I thought, the hand began to drag. I slid back along the leaves, uphill, feet scrabbling, for something to dig into. But everything was slick and soft and caving away. Stop. Just stop. I think I was shouting. I'm not sure. My ears were ringing too loud and my own voice sounded muffled, packaged and boxed, like I was already underground, part of that not human chain. Reaching up, who knew how far through the layers of years and leaves. I reached out wildly, hands sliding through the leaves and dirt until I grabbed something. It might have been the same stick I found earlier, I don't know. I just lifted it and started wailing it away at the thing that gripped me tight. Something cracked. A shot in the terrible quiet. My involuntary movement ceased. For a few seconds, I just sat there and breathed, and then carefully detached the hand from my leg. When I lifted it to my eyes, just enough to see, the hand was just a root, snaggly and twisted, but just a root. Just wood. It had split seams from weather and water and the lines of some inky black substance leaked out, carrying with it that faint but unmistakable sharpie smell. I lobbed the hand root away from me and staggered to my feet. It was hard to see in the swift fall of dark, but just a few feet in the hill, there were shouldery lumps, the form of a body reaching, attached to another body and another, making a chain down the hill. But maybe it was just dark, and who would bury a mannequin in the woods? I went home and threw out all the sharpies in my house. I had recently moved to my childhood home, which had been left as an inheritance by my now deceased mother. I was opposed to the idea of doing any renovations. However, I did purchase new furniture. In life, my mother enjoyed gardening a great deal. For her, it was a passion, not just a hobby. As I thought back, I felt nostalgic, envisioning her watering her flowers while telling me plants, just like people, needed care, compassion, and protection. In the backyard were these two cherubs, which I remember were a gift given to my mom. They were not a yard decoration that I would have chosen, as I never was fond of cherubs. I placed them inside a box to be donated to a local charity. The next day, after running errands, I dropped the two angels off at a local Goodwill. I must confess, I was somewhat relieved about not seeing those two cherubs. Later, during the night, I heard footsteps. However, it sounded like heavy thumps. I was about to step outside to investigate when the noise suddenly stopped. 
The next morning, when I awoke, I had a big surprise. I walked into my garden. The two angels sat in my garden in the very same spot they were before. I removed them. I could not believe it. A few weeks later, a neighbor moved in across the street. I figured I'd introduce myself and talk to her. Then again, my true intention was to give these two angels as welcoming gifts. She was a sweet little old lady, and I thought she would use them in her garden. As I thought, she was delighted with the present, and I was just as delighted that she was, for they were no longer in my garden. The next day, my neighbor called me over to her property and said that thieves had stolen the angels from her yard. She confided me that she heard footsteps around her backyard. She was not sure, but she was under the impression that there were two people in her yard. I offered my assistance and gave her my phone number if she ever needed help. As I walked back to my house, I thought, who would want to steal those? I almost fainted when I returned home. I was speechless as I approached my own yard. There, in my garden, the angels lay in the same spot I removed them. I did not know what to think anymore. At this point, I even considered if my mind fell victim to cognitive distortion and fallacy. I was aghast and didn't dare to rid myself of the two angels again. I thought, how on earth did these two cherubs make it back home? Was I a victim of my overactive imagination? Either way, I decided it was best to leave them alone. The next few weeks were spent in painting, cleaning the driveway, and working around the house. In a way, I tried to keep myself busy to avoid thinking about the cherubs. Little by little, I somehow got confused to having them in my garden. I placed some red mulch around my tree and sat the cherubs under the elm's shade. One night, when the moon was full, I returned home early from work, and something incredible happened. I was done cooking dinner and heard some ado in the back of my house. I panicked and called the local police. They told me to stay indoors and the officer would be heading my way. I continued to hear more noises and whispers in the back. It sounded like a male speaking in a very low voice. I grabbed my cat and held him against my chest, covered my mouth with my hand to keep myself from screaming. I was shaking and praying that the police would arrive quickly. I was alone and had no means to protect myself from trespassers. My cat kept on hissing as the lock on my back door was twisting. The assailant started banging on my door. I started to sob while trying not to scream. Suddenly, a moment of total silence ensued. I was breathing hard, wondering if the intruder was still out there. A loud male voice shattered the still. I heard a loud voice. What do you want from me, you two? Oh Lord, please have mercy on me. I heard a thump and more screaming. I later heard someone running away and screaming like a maniac. I rushed to the window and saw a figure of a man quickly disappearing into the darkness. The police arrived minutes later and they took my statement. After searching the neighborhood, they found an old man who was speaking of winged angels coming after him. The officer said the old man was running and gasping for air. His face was pale and he could not speak coherently. He was apprehended without resistance. The officers blamed his unusual story on alcohol present in his body. I must admit, I have never been a devoted Christian, but I believe there is a benign presence in my home. What scared that man out of his wits? I think I know, but choose not to say. This house is hollow ground. It is my family's place. I am now a mother, and I better understand my mom. I was never superstitious, but now I do not disregard things that cannot be easily explained. I now live in a house with my young son. I do believe my mother left a guardian angels to watch over me and my child. I always had a dream of going to Paris, not to see the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, or any of the typical tourist hotspots, but actually to see the Paris catacombs. I had been urban exploring in abandoned buildings and cemeteries in my hometown in New Orleans since I was 10, and even traveled to a couple of other states just to document my findings. 
Normally, the scariest thing I would see would be a homeless person or a creepy statue in a graveyard. Nothing to feel that threatened by. But in 2014, when my older sister told me that she would be traveling to Europe for vacation over the summer, I begged to come along. I was 18 then, and desperate to get away from the humdrum of everyday life, and finally fulfill my childhood dream of going to the catacombs to explore. I had been planning it out for years. I would enter through the tunnel that I had seen YouTubers enter through online, bring a fishing reel with hundreds of yards of fishing line, and attach the end of the line to the entrance. I would let out slack, attach the reel from my backpack, and basically get lost. When I was done, I would simply reel my way back. It had made perfect sense to my narrow-minded teenage self. I wanted to go to areas of the catacomb that people hadn't seen in hundreds of years. To go where no one else had been before was my dream as an urban explorer. And to me, there was nothing more exciting than going where you knew nobody else would be. There would be no more ruining the moment by bumping into a fellow explorer. So after weeks of convincing, my college-age sister agreed to take me with her. It took a lot of talking to get her to agree to bring her little brother along. But with the help of my parents, she decided she would make the best of it. First, we went to Dublin, then London, which to me was pretty boring. Then across the English Channel to our first trip in mainland Europe, Paris. I tried to get her to come with me, but she noped right out of it, insisting on seeing the beautiful city instead. And who could blame her? While she went to see the Eiffel Tower and all that other good stuff, I stayed in the hotel and waited for the evening when the weather cooled off a bit and made my way to the entrance by myself, first by cab, then by foot. As I made my way towards the crevice that led into the infamous Paris catacombs, I felt eager, almost energized. I stood at the entrance and looked into the pitch black and almost immediately crawled in. Once inside, I took the end of my fishing line and tied it to a big stone. No way I was getting lost. I turned on my dollar store LED flashlight. Cheap, right? Let out some reel and started my journey. At first, I snaked my way through what seemed like dozens of rooms, covered with graffiti and evidence of teenage parties that famously took place there. After what seemed like an hour of reading what were most likely French curse words all over the cave system and ghoulish figures spray painted on the ancient walls, there seemed to be what I was looking for. On the other side of a large room I was entering, I could see a bare wall with no sign of human disturbance. Great, I thought to myself, now the work really begins. As I drew closer, there was a shallow tunnel to my left that seemed to go on for only 20 yards before a dead end rubble strewn about. So, I looked to my right and saw a narrow tunnel leading directly away from the dusty room. It was so small that I would have to crouch just to walk through it, and somehow, no matter how much I shine my flashlight down it, I couldn't see anything in the darkness, a total absence of light. It was the first time I doubted the journey. Up until then, it seemed like fun and games, but now, the feeling of aloneness dawned on me. If I encountered trouble, there would be no one to help, but I felt drawn to complete my lifelong quest, and with a gulp, I cautiously made my way in. Within ten feet inside, I noticed the bottom of the medieval passage had begun to fill with water. At first, I thought my waterproof shoes would do the trick, but I soon found myself crouched over, drenched and drudging my way through the tunnel with the water to my knees. The tunnel aimed gradually downwards even further into the underworld beneath the city of Paris. Too late to turn back now, though. I kept going, and after a minute, there was a fork in the passage. One got smaller, narrowing to four feet tall, and the other one got bigger, I'd say about seven. Not too hard to guess which one I took. I heard that the catacombs originally served as a mining system in the Middle Ages, but as I made my way further, the place seemed anything but an innocent miner's workplace. After about a hundred feet further, the walls on either side widened into what seemed almost like a lobby, and small rooms lined either side of me. I was beginning to feel very uneasy at this point. I had seemed so brave at the entrance to the teenage party's paradise just over an hour earlier, but now I could not help but feel 
watched. I didn't want to know what was in these rooms, though I had a strong suspicion. My footsteps grew slower as they continued to kick up centuries-old dust. I knew I had to leave. I took the fishing reel I thought I brought with me into my hand and started to turn the crank, but there was no tension. After a couple of minutes of praying that the line would pull tight once again, the end of the line slipped through my hand. I took the flashlight and examined it. It looked gnawed through, like a dog had sharply chewed through it like a play toy. I'm screwed, I said to myself in desperation. All of the sudden, I heard a splash from the way I entered. At first, I thought maybe a rock had fallen into the water. I waited and turned off my flashlight. Almost the second I turned off the flashlight, I heard what sounded like a sharp, clunky footsteps furiously running at me, and I bolted to my left toward a network of increasingly smaller rooms. Each room I entered, I staggered over jagged items all over the floor. I have no clue how I didn't trip, especially with my flashlight still off, but I traversed my way into room after room, the pile of objects becoming more difficult to manage each time before a mountain of these things prevented me from going any further. In the pitch black, I could hear heavy, unnatural breathing about two rooms away. I bit my tongue and begrudgingly took my flashlight out and hit the button. Before stood a pile of human bones, femurs, ribs, and all stuff you learned about in school, just stacked in front of me like Jenga blocks. I looked to my right and there was a three foot tall tunnel I got on all fours and furiously crawled my way through the murky, foul-smelling water, flashlight clenched between my teeth. Finally, my stalker seemed to be gone. I couldn't hear anything anymore, but I knew I couldn't go back the way I came. I was going to have to find another way out. With hundreds of miles of tunnels and passageways running below Paris, I knew this was a tall task, but I was not about to be caught by an unknown creature. Sometimes the tunnel would open up and I could walk. Other times it would narrow down again and I would even have to crawl, laying on my belly just to make it through the other end. I was getting desperately lost. I was unable to remember which way I came and the tunnels would often fork away and split, forcing me to make a gut instinct decision on which way to go. It was frigid now. My teeth clattered as I brought my soaking wet self slowly through the catacombs now feeling as though these were my last minutes on earth. My limbs felt as though they were made of lead. It's hard to believe that once was my dream had turned into a person's worst nightmare, lost underground in the world's biggest cemetery. But I dragged my beaten self through the maze for hours, my flashlight starting to flicker. I would turn it off for minutes at a time to try to conserve the cheap, small battery inside, feeling my way through with my hands. I tried many times to see if I could get cell service, but of course, there was none. The last time I checked it, it said 4.17 AM. I had started at around 9 o'clock. I decided it was over. I plopped down in the water, sitting crisscross. I turned off the flashlight and closed my eyes. In my mind, I said goodbye to everyone I knew, all my family members, friends, and even acquaintances. I decided to look at a picture of my family on my phone. I clicked it on and found the best picture of my parents, my sister and I, and stared at it. My sister was smiling in it, and I found my eyes welling up with tears. It made me feel worse that she would never know what happened, that her wonderful vacation would end up being a depressing disaster. My mind went quiet, and my limbs went numb, and I accepted this was the end. How fitting for an urban explorer right? I just leaned back against the wall behind me. I heard a familiar splash from about 50 feet away. I jumped up, grabbed my flashlight, and ran away like the roadrunner from the cartoon. With no bones to trample on, I was running at what seemed like an Olympic runner's pace, and I felt hopeful as soon as those same clunky footsteps started to fade. I was starting to grin when, boom, I collided headfirst with a wall. Dead end. Through my throbbing headache, I could hear the dreadful pitter-patter growing louder. Finally, it seemed to stop about ten feet away, and that horrid breathing echoed in the passage around me. It stepped closer, and hands trembling, I decided to turn on the flashlight. 
If this was really the end, I was going to at least know what finished me off and take it like a man. It flicked on, and the sight before me nearly scared me to death before it could even lay a finger on me. It was dark gray, withered, ancient, void of emotion. What I saw before me was a disgustingly hunched, yet still six foot tall skeleton, jawbone hanging down as though it was panting. Its empty sockets peered down at me, and though it had no eyes, I found myself in a staring contest with it. Soon, it started convulsing, and I could hear a small whimper emitting from its bones. It grew louder into a chuckle, and finally, all out hysterical laughing, the shriek echoing throughout the lonely catacombs. Its bones shook and rattled with every painful laugh. It didn't seem to come from its mouth. Rather, it seemed to be vibrating from the skeleton itself. It sounded almost like a demonic joker, until it grew silent. It bent down from its already stooped position. Unnaturally long arms stretched towards me and sprinted at me at full speed. I was still collapsed on the ground with my throbbing head, and I did the only thing I knew to do. I leapt up, waited until it was a foot in front of me, and grabbed at its bony arm with my left hand, flashlight dropping into the water. I immediately took my right fist and slammed it with as much might as my tired body had straight into the skull. Screaming like a middle school girl, I closed my eyes and heard a big crack. I was prepared to be attacked back in revenge, but silence followed. I slowly reopened them and picked my flashlight back up and pointed it around, arriving at the ground below. The skeleton had lost all life, now just a pile of bones, front first in the puddle by my feet. Its skull had been bent severely from its neck, now almost perpendicular to the spine. Had I just killed a skeleton? What was it even doing alive to begin with? I stared down at my hand, which was surprisingly unharmed. What? I thought to myself in amazement. How did I not have a nasty gash where the aching knuckles made contact with bare bone? I decided to power walk away from the scene, in case that thing could still come back to the afterlife and approach me again. I cautiously waited until I was about 40 paces away and turned back around with the light. It was gone. There was nothing in the water, not a single rib anywhere. If anything, it scared me even worse. I kept walking back the way I came. All of the sudden, I felt my confidence return to me, like how it was when I entered the catacomb several hours earlier. I felt strangely good, like something was urging me, telling me that I could find my way back. Deciding to attempt a miracle and retrace my steps, I conserved my flashlight as well as I could. And after more hours of dragging myself through tunnels, after a combination of walking, limping, and crawling, I started to recognize where I was. Before I knew it, I was slithering my way back through the muddy passage into the endless rooms of bones. I turned on my flashlight to see the same pile from earlier, and even had the gall to laugh at it. That's nothing compared to what I saw earlier, I thought to myself. I made my way through the rooms, through the hall, and back through the pitch black tunnel into the large room. Now I looked at the far side and felt I won the lottery when I saw a crudely spray painted Spongebob on the wall. Civilization, kind of. I knew my flashlight was about to go off, but in its last moments of life, I somehow found the end of the fishing line. Of all things, it had gotten snagged and broken on a wooden chair that some person had brought to the room. I turned the light off and felt my way back to the entrance, only using my hands in the fishing line through pitch dark. Not gonna lie, I tripped a couple times and walked into a couple walls, but I wasn't about to let that stop me now. Before I knew it, I could hear and smell fresh air. As I reached the end of the line, I looked up to see the tunnel entrance. And with the last of my strength, I lifted my cold, achy body through the crevice and into the entrance above. As I made my way into the morning light, I winced, my ears relishing in the sounds of the morning traffic and bustle of the city. I slowly walked through the streets of Paris back to the hotel. I had lost my phone in the process of being pursued and couldn't order a cab to pick me up, but I was just happy to be alive at this point. When I finally got back to the hotel room, I knocked on the door. My sister opened it. 
She had tears in her eyes, and she looked as though she had been crying the whole night. She instantly threw her arms around me and kissed me on the cheek, saying, I thought I'd never see you again. I was so worried. So, we ended up enjoying the rest of our European vacation, making sure not to lose sight of each other after that. I told her, and everyone else for that matter, that I had gotten lost, but I never mentioned the skeleton that attacked me. Sometimes I wonder if it was real. Maybe my mind was playing tricks on me in hysteria and tiredness. I don't know, and that's probably a good thing. My urban exploration days are over now, but this experience has always nagged at my conscience. I came here because of the memory and the whole ordeal just haunt me. Sometimes I wake up at night screaming, having nightmares about being lost underground or being chased once again. Maybe, by finally telling my story, I can finally put this whole thing to rest. The story I'm about to share is a very personal one. After my family being terrified for four years on a daily basis, my view on the afterlife has changed forever. For context, I'm female, age 23. Sam, my boyfriend, is 27. And our little boy Toby is age 5. And we all live in the Southwest UK. For a bit of backstory, five years ago, myself, Sam, and Toby, who was three months old back then, moved into our first family home. Because of certain situations in 2014, we were kind of forced into taking this property. Now, this building was decades old. Our landlord bought a huge Victorian house and converted each one of the three floors into units. While we lived in this property, there were no other tenants residing in the building at this time. To be honest, our unit was a little rough looking, but after a month of some serious TLC, our little place felt like a home. Now, on to the main story. After moving in, Sam wanted to buy a baby camera monitoring system. Toby had been diagnosed with autism at three months old due to being severely delayed in all developmental areas. Because of this, Toby never cried, and he didn't even cry when he was hungry in the middle of the night. After we bought it, we ended up hanging the camera right above Toby's cot, giving us a good view of his whole room. After a few weeks of settling in, getting used to the house's sounds and Toby sleeping throughout the night, Sam felt comfortable with going back to work. After a long day of looking after Toby, doing chores around the house, and doing some work, I was more than ready to have a peaceful night doing some R&R. Around 8 p.m., Sam had to leave for his night shift, and we said our goodbyes for the night, and he left. While on my own, I noticed how deathly quiet our home was with Sam gone and Toby sleeping. The house's dynamic changed. It just felt off, but I just put it down to being in a new home and being left by myself for the first time. After looking up and checking if Toby was still sleeping, I took a deep breath and flopped on the sofa. It was around 10 p.m. when I checked the monitor to see how Toby was doing. He was still sleeping soundly. So, smiling to myself, I went back to watching TV. No longer than an hour had passed, when in the corner of my eye, I noticed the monitor lights flickering red and green, back and forth like a mini radar. I didn't hear any noise coming through, so I picked it up to get a better look. Everything seemed normal. After 20 seconds of staring at the uneventful screen, I went to put the monitor back down. While putting the monitor down, I was looking at the screen. I noticed a perfectly shaped circle of light, no bigger than a tennis ball, floating around Toby's room. Amused, wondering what it was, I kept watching. It went over towards the built-in cupboard to the left, and back to Toby's cot in the middle of the room. I thought it was just a moth or a fly just buzzing around, so I put the monitor down and ignored it. Unbeknown to me, this was the start of our paranormal experiences. I do believe in the supernatural and have for many years. I always remember thinking, 
what it would be like to actually live with a ghost. I actually used to think that it would be fun, but never in my life did I expect it to be so terrifying. A few weeks went by, and Sam finally had a night off work, so we decided we should spend it, snuggled up on the sofa, watching some movies while the little man was sleeping. We ended up watching How to Train Your Dragon 2, a guilty pleasure of mine. I was so engrossed in the film that I didn't hear Sam asking me a question. Finally, a nudge to the side caught my attention. What is that? Confused, I asked him. What are you talking about? Looking over towards Sam, I notice he's holding the monitor. Look at the screen. So, peeling my eyes away from the TV, I looked at the screen and saw what Sam was on about. A large, human-shaped fog hovering over Toby's cot. Feeling a little wary, we kept watching. The fog moved around slowly, bobbing up and down. Then suddenly, it leaned over to Toby, as if a person would. Parental instincts kicked in. Sam and I sprang off the sofa to check what it was. We opened Toby's bedroom door. His bedroom was freezing cold. I checked the window for a draft, but it was shut tight. We made sure Toby wasn't cold. He was warm underneath his blanket. We had to put the heating on to warm up his room due to how frosty the air was. After fussing over Toby, we got comfy on the sofa again. Looking back at the monitor screen, the fog was gone, so we shrugged it off, putting it down to something on the camera lens. Around 1 a.m., we were both tired. Picking up the monitor, we both headed off to bed. The next thing I know, the two of us were suddenly woken up. But by what exactly, we didn't know. Dazed and our hearts racing, I checked the time, 3.45 a.m. Then, a loud crackling sound bellowed through the monitor. Crapping ourselves, we glanced at the monitor and saw the same dense, dark smog as before. In the space of a few seconds, the fog moved toward Toby's cot. As it did, we both heard another loud crack. It sounded as if it were solid. Freaking out, we ran into Toby's room. Toby was awake and visibly stressed. I swept him up into my arms, letting him know we were there, while Sam was inspecting the bedroom, trying to figure out what the cracking sound was, and where on earth this fog was coming from. There wasn't anything in Toby's room that could have possibly made the dense fog that we saw on the camera. No dust, cobwebs. The camera lens was clean, and the window was shut, so there wasn't a draft to blow anything around. Feeding Toby a bottle and making sure he was clean, I rocked him in my arms and sang him to sleep. Sam wanted Toby to spend the night in our bedroom, so after moving the rooms around to fit Toby's cot, it was now 5.30 a.m. We quickly passed out in bed after the night's events. Four months went by, and those weird occurrences happened every other night, each episode getting progressively worse. Sam and I was thinking that this could be paranormal, but didn't want to say anything to one another. It sounds bizarre if you're not the one going through it. Days passed and we eventually sat down and talked it out. We spoke about getting a paranormal investigator to check things out, but decided not to, because the ones in our area seemed to be scammers. So Sam and I made up our minds and to just deal with whatever was in our home until we had the funds to move out. A few months had passed and we are getting ready for Christmas. Toby is still very physically delayed. He was almost two years old, but unable to sit up on his own. So we focused on Toby's speech. He could say small generic words like hello, mom, or dad. It was the middle of the day and I was spending time with Toby. I had him propped up on my knee bouncing him up and down and singing him nursery rhymes. Out of nowhere, Toby's eyes fixated on something behind me. He stopped singing and abruptly said hello. It caught me off guard. Usually, we had to encourage Toby to speak. Thinking it was Sam, I turned around. Nobody was there. Hello, he said again, even doing a waving gesture. Now feeling uneasy, I asked Toby who he was talking to. 
A quiet few seconds later, Toby looked back at me, wanting to sing again. Things happened every single day. Whether it was something small or big, it was still scary. With Sam working during the nights, being left alone with the paranormal experiences really made me anxious. Sam and I almost always felt like someone was behind us. No matter where you were in the house, the feeling of something peering over your shoulder or standing right behind you never went away. We would always notice a tall figure in our peripheral vision for it to just disappear when trying to see it. One morning, I remember being gradually woken up by this itching noise. I sat up to listen where it was coming from. I got up quietly and tiptoed around my room. I ended up standing next to the bedroom door. Everything went silent. Then, I heard a ferocious scratching on the other side of the door, just below the handle, as if something was trying to get in. I leapt back and scrambled onto my bed. It sounded like sharp nails. The sound went faster and faster. Then, nothing but silence. This morning event would occur three times throughout each week of being there. It would happen so often that I got used to it. I would still be frightened, but ended up staying firmly wrapped in my duvet on my bed and waiting for the scratching to be over. If the scratching wasn't bad enough, I would hear heavy footsteps walking up and down the hallway. The floorboards would creak and groan under pressure. At first, I thought it was Sam, because the footsteps would creep up and down the hallway, thumble around in one spot, go into the bedroom, and turn on the light. Our bedroom has a pull cord for the light switch. When pulled, the light and bathroom AC would switch on at the same time, creating a buzzing sound due to the fan being so old. I only realized it wasn't him when he came home at 7.30 a.m. looking really tired. So, after getting really confused, I asked him, Where have you been? I already heard you come in because you left the light on in the bathroom. Sam looked at me as if I was crazy. It wasn't me. I have just finished work. After the new year, we installed security to the inside and outside of our home. At the end of each week, we would review the footage. If there wasn't anything to report, then we would delete the tape. Being curious, I would watch our in-home footage to see if anything would appear on the camera while we were out of the house. And there was. A black fog that roamed around our home. It moved around like it lived there, going from room to room, fading in and out. It was even appearing while we were there. We didn't notice it at the time. I was terrified. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. While we were asleep, Toby's toys would be set off throughout the night. His football would roll across the floor, then halt to a stop. The TV would flick on and off, and the lights in the other rooms would be switched on. We used to take so many photos of Toby while in the unit, but soon decided to stop because of the orbs and the dark figure that would appear on screen. Every time we spoke out loud about the experiences we had, more serious things would happen. The worst thing that I remember from our time there is hearing Toby scream out loud, absolutely terrified. Toby had never cried up until this night. I still to this day feel so guilty. Toby still couldn't walk and was barely crawling around. We were asleep in bed and we were suddenly awoken to hear Toby screaming his poor lungs out. Terrified myself and Sam sprinted into his room. All I remember seeing is Toby sitting up in the corner of his bed, just absolutely screeching. He was pointing and his eyes was pinned over to the corner of his room, absolutely terrified. Sam and I couldn't see anything. I went to go pick Toby up and give him some reassurance, and he pressed his face into my arm, really not wanting to look back at the corner of his room. As Sam walked over to see if anything was there, Toby screeched again, pointing toward his bed. I have never seen that look of fear in his eyes before that night. He was in absolute panic from what he was seeing. After calming him down in our bedroom, I felt terrible for our little man. He wasn't able to run away because he was so delayed, so he was forced to sit there in fear, in fear of something that actually made him cry for the first time in his life. The guilt I felt for him breaks my heart. 
Just imagine being pinned down to a chair, not being able to get away from your worst nightmare. After this, I really had enough. I moved Toby into our room with us. I was tired of him being harassed by this monster that we couldn't even see. Even with Toby in our room, we could still hear things moving around his bedroom. The cupboard door would creak open and shut. The lights would flick on and off, and Toby's toys would start randomly talking in the middle of the night. To stop this, I made sure all of the batteries and every single one of the toys would be taken out. I bagged up all of the balls from his ball pit and made sure the footballs were in boxes and finally put the chest of drawers in front of the cupboard. I did this every night. The nights I forgot, we would be awoken up to hear all the commotion going on in Toby's room again. After a few nights with Toby in our room and the toys being bagged up, we actually were able to sleep for about one week, every night. I thought things were finally getting better. Toby's grandmother wanted to spend some time with him, so we arranged for him to stay the night at her house and then pick him up after lunch the next day. Getting back from dropping Toby off, I wanted to have a long shower while Sam was messing with his car. I had my phone playing music quietly. My shower was relaxing at first when I heard a faint tapping, then crash. I turned the shower off because I just wanted to get out of there. Slowly, I peeked around the shower curtain. Everything that was in our mirror cabinet was on the floor everywhere. The door was wide opened. It looked like someone stuck their hand in the cupboard and just wiped everything off the shelves onto the floor. Spooked, I hurried and got dressed and got out of there. I wrapped my hair in a towel and ran to get Sam. When he came back in to check out the mess, he was angry. He told me to get sorted out and he would clean up. I hugged him and said thank you. Later in the afternoon, we decided to go out for dinner. We actually had a lovely time, able to properly relax and enjoy the peace. We loved Toby dearly, but having some time to ourselves, knowing he was in safe hands, was really nice. It was a shame that our lovely evening shattered as soon as we got home. Unlocking the door, we immediately noticed a heavy burning smell. Our oven was switched on, Every single one of the cooker hobs was turned to six, and the door was open with heat bailing out. Thankfully, it was electric because the house would have exploded. Running over, I flipped off the main switch. Sam made sure that nothing was near the oven had melted. It was so hot in our kitchen that we ended up opening the windows to let the heat out. Nothing was damaged, safety restored. The cooker switch is really hard to push down so I usually just turned off the cooker instead. But after this, I made sure I pushed it off when I was finished using the cooker. Sam and I were going to have a relaxing night together. But after all this, and Toby being at his grandma's, we came to the agreement that we both were too tired. So Sam strolled off to bed, and I stayed up binging on missed TV shows. It was just after 2 a.m. when I heard Sam make a noise. Wrapped in the quilt, he waddled out with the color drained from his face. I asked him if he was okay, and he replied. The bed started shaking. I couldn't sleep. It felt like someone was watching me. So I pulled the quilt over my head and laid there with my eyes shut. Then the bed started shaking. It was as if someone put both hands on the mattress and was pushing on it. I got so annoyed that I kicked my leg out, and it stopped but it felt like someone sat down on the bed right next to me. I thought screw it and rushed out here. I'm not sleeping in there again tonight. So after a night on the sofa, we ate some breakfast and went to go get Toby. We had mentioned some things to Sam's mom before about the ghost, but when we mentioned the cooker and the bed shaking incident, she looked worried. She said to not speak to it and open up the windows during the day to refresh the energy in our house. Sam was getting angry, and understandably so. We were always getting woken up. Toby was getting harassed while sleeping. Things would go missing, and we would end up with scratches during the day in odd places. After another night of no sleep, Sam, after three years of being stressed, had hit his breaking point. He shouted out loud, leave my family alone and get out of my house. I took Toby into the kitchen while Sam was shouting so Toby wasn't frightened. 
Two minutes later, Sam came walking through the archway into our kitchen, and out of nowhere, I see something red and hear the sound of impact. A can of air freshener was launched at the back of Sam's head. It flew so fast, and it was clearly thrown with force. After this, even more things started to happen on a daily basis. Doors would slam shut, Toby's toys would be broken from being tossed about, and we ended up hearing strange noises that wasn't human in the middle of the night. We decided that we had to leave our unit. We were tired, stressed, and always on edge when being at home. With the last six months of staying at the place, I actually come face to face with our visitor. It was after 5 p.m. because Toby had just eaten our dinner, and I started cleaning up while Sam was taking care of Toby. In the kitchen, we had an old boiler cupboard that was built in next to the sink. The doors to the boiler didn't have a clasp to keep it shut, but it would jam close because of the paintwork on the door. There I was, doing the dishes, when I heard the all too familiar sound of the sticking doors being opened. I looked over, and there it was. A huge, totally pitch black figure with no face, peeking out of the cupboard. It was leaning to one side with its opaque hand wrapped around the door. The intense feeling of this thing glaring at me chilled me to my core. It was pitch black. I froze. I never knew what Toby was seeing up until now. Dropping the dishes where I stood, I ran past the figure to go find Sam. I screamed while running. It was there. I just seen that thing. Sam said my face was gray in color and comforted me until I was able to breathe again. Sam got a lock for the boiler door the next day, so it wouldn't open up unless you had the key. I still remember very clearly the day I finally called it quits in that house. It was around summertime, because at 5 a.m., the mornings were bright outside. I actually fell asleep on the sofa. After months of needing sleep, I just passed out. I was awoken up gradually because I could hear an alarm going off. Remembering what the beeping actually was, I bent down and grabbed the baby monitor. It was disconnected. The alarm was letting me know the camera was turned off in Toby's room. I thought the power had gone, but soon realized it wasn't after noticing the front room light was on. Walking into Toby's bedroom, I was just confused. Toby was fine, still sleeping peacefully, so I unhooked the camera above Toby's bed and fiddled around with the buttons. I was still in a sleepy state and couldn't for the life of me figure out why it disconnected and couldn't figure out for the life of me why it was disconnected. Then I followed the cable, feeling for any breaks with my fingers, all the way down to the plug. The outlet was switched on, but I put my hand out to the plug of the camera and it was hot. Turning the light on and wrapping my hand in my jumper sleeve, I yanked it out. It was burnt. The strange thing was, though, the actual outlet itself was fine. It was still bright white, but the plug was burnt and some of the wall black from heat. But there wasn't any fire. There was no electrical smell either. I was awake now and shaken up. If the monitor had not started beeping and woken me up, how far would this burning go? It was right next to Toby's bed. Waking up Toby, I picked him up and went into our room to wake Sam. He couldn't believe it either, so he called his mom and just told her everything. Thirty minutes later, we packed up what we needed and left. We didn't spend another night sleeping in that unit again. After getting settled at Sam's mom's house, we called the landlord and broke our lease, losing out on our $650 deposit. Sam and I returned to the unit a few more times to grab our stuff. We left Toby with his grandma, so it would be faster. Upon returning, the unit just felt off. There was this really hateful aura about the place. Every move you made, it felt like someone was behind you, and they were really angry. Going into Toby's room was worse. As soon as you stepped a foot past the doorway, you felt like your life was in danger. We couldn't stay in there long, because you would start getting dizzy and shaky. And when you would walk out, your whole body would be buzzing like static was running through your veins. Since moving out of there, our lives have gotten back on track. Our moods have improved, and we can finally sleep in peace. Toby is still delayed, but is improving massively. 
He can now walk, but with a little limp, and can speak really well. I'm glad to be out of that place, and grateful Toby won't remember any of the trauma he endured while being there as he gets older. And I am so grateful for Sam's mom for letting the three of us stay at hers until we get up on our feet again. The message that I learned from all of this, I will never think that living with a ghost is fun, nor will I ever underestimate the power of the supernatural. I am a Native American in the eastern part of the United States. This happened while I was in a reservation in the beginning of winter. I was visiting family for a three-day vacation, and my family is very cultural. My cousins and I had to sleep in the tent outside. This will be very important later in the story. Once it was around maybe 5 p.m., it was dark outside. My mom, stepdad, and brother were going back home while I stayed. My brother had been very jealous that he could not go, threw a fit and ran inside. My aunt's house is very small, with a big property, but there was an old car, large truck, and her car outside in the driveway next to her house. I don't know if my brother had actually seen something, but later, he ran inside crying. We tried to ask him why, but he wouldn't answer. Later, my mom and stepdad took him and left. I laid down in the tent with my older cousin. He's a few months older than me. My little cousin was in there too, along with his dog. His dog isn't big at all, maybe 20 pounds and very old, so he wouldn't really do anything to help in a situation. While we were on our phones and playing, we grew tired. I was the only one awake at this point before realizing I had to go. I slowly got out of the tent with the dog trailing behind me. At this time, I was really small and barely making it to 5 foot 8. I went to the tree by my tent before I saw it. It was a large man with his back facing towards me. He was very thin and tall. The tallest I could say he was is maybe 7 feet at the most. He slowly turned as I approached thinking it was my cousin. Since he was very tall and I could only see the shoulders, I froze once it turned towards me. My cousin's dog was going crazy at this point, barking and growling at the being. I was just staring up at its cold and dog-like eyes. My mind went blank as I stared at it. We weren't even near the house. The tent had to be maybe a 10 minute walk from the road and a 20 minute walk from the house. And all I could think of to do was run. While I was running and had the dog, this thing was running in front of me. It suddenly stopped and jerked its head. I heard the sickening cracks of bones as it seemed to shrink into a coyote. The eyes shone as I turned to run back to the tent. It chased after me, as I was never the athletic type. Suddenly, I just stopped and turned to face the thing. It stared back as I just let out a growl I never knew I could do. The thing just stared at me, just standing there as I yelled at it to go away. It just sat there until it ran off. I was so confused, just sitting there until I ran back to my tent and sighed. I questioned if it was the thing that my brother had seen. This was a sleepless night and I stayed up until my cousins awoke. I had told them everything, but they brushed it off. Everyone seemed to have taken it as a joke until my aunt called my mom and sent me back home in fear it would come back. But no, she never saw or heard anything. Neither have I. I am currently living farther away from that place, but I lived with my uncle when I was closer. I now live with my mom. I still don't know if this thing is looking for me, but I don't want to see it again. When I was a kid, before they put in the Cumberland Gap Tunnel, there was a horrible winding road that went over the mountains from Kentucky into Tennessee. Pretty much a straight shot through the Cumberland Gap National Historic Park. I can barely remember it because I was so young when the tunnel officially opened. Six or seven, I forget. But there's one stretch of the old road that my brain won't let me forget. Overshadowed by the trees and built into the jut of a rock that caused a kink in the road. There was a door, a normal, average, 
you'd see it on a house door with a little brass knob. It always irked me because I was, and still am, very much the type of person who doesn't like to not know things. And that door became a mystery to end all mysteries. One of the most vivid memories I have about it is the first time I asked exactly what it was and where it went to. Sitting in the back seat of my mom's car, while stuck in standstill traffic, while mom was more concerned about the bumper-to-bumper -bumper crunch of cars that couldn't get past the wreck up the way, I was tiredly asking about the door, repeatedly. Like her initial answer of, I don't know, didn't count. Other people thought they knew. Everyone had an idea, or a theory, or they heard somebody talk about knowing somebody who knew somebody who'd been in there. I heard a dozen different stories from a dozen different people over the course of my childhood. It was where they hid munitions for World War II. It was where soldiers hid during the Revolutionary War. It was where bootleggers had once hid their stash. It was where Native Americans had lived before they were driven out of the area. It was an entrance into a cave system that was in the park. Or where they kept controls for things like lights and cameras. I personally liked my own theory, that there were Neanderthals inside who stayed up late making cave paintings of horses, which made as much sense as anything else anyone told me. In time though, the tunnel was finished and the old road was destroyed. The door was forgotten, like so many other childhood memories, and I became convinced that I dreamt up the whole thing. It happens. Kids having vivid imaginations and false memories are pretty common. That was until my best friend decided we were going to have a day of fun at the park. Kayla was my polar opposite, the definition of an early 2000s popular preteen girl. She liked makeup, boys, and Britney Spears, and wasn't much of an outdoorsy type. Meanwhile, I was obsessed with Digimon and Dirt. We were an unlikely duo whose childhood was spent compromising in weird ways, and the trip to the park was her way of making it up to me for a marathon of teen chick flicks. She knew I wasn't thrilled about Mary-Kate and Ashley, so she'd take the drive and go catch tadpoles with me as sort of a concession. It was a double concession since, having hit the age where looks, friends, and social etiquette suddenly began to matter. It was pretty obvious that she was becoming more and more hesitant to be seen in public with me. This was probably the reason why, when we got to the park, she specifically asked to be dropped off at the not-so-popular entrance to the trail, rather than my favorite starting point on the Iron Furnace Trail. There was less of a chance that one of her crushes or school buddies would catch wind of us, not that they'd be hanging out in the woods anyway. Her grandpa wasn't the keenest on this since he didn't like the idea of us being so far away from people, but she managed to convince him by citing that civilization was literally down the hill from us if something happened. A big hill, sure, but you could technically see the roofs of the houses from the road, just off of the parking lot. It was close enough. He hesitantly agreed and drove away with a sigh leaving us standing there with a couple of jars for tadpoles and some well wishes. No sooner than his car disappeared back onto the road did Kayla turn to me, sigh, and say, What are we doing now? I had some ideas. I wasn't as familiar with this stretch of trail than the tried and true route of the Iron Furnace, but I imagined myself as some kind of intrepid explorer and figured that, so long we stayed on the path, there wasn't anything that could go wrong. I also decided against heading in the direction that would have likely led me to familiar territory, based solely on the fact that I'd never been in the opposite direction and was curious what I'd find. I didn't say anything about this, of course, and just let Kayla think I knew where I was going since she didn't seem too invested in our adventure or concerned about where we ended up. So, off we went. I think it was about 15 minutes in that Kayla started to get the case of heebie-jeebies. The woods were denser on the mystery trail I decided to take, and even in the bright spring sun, 
Everything was dark and dreary. If you looked up, it was almost like walking in twilight. You could only barely make out the blue sky if the wind caught the trees in just the right way. She nervously tapped her nails together and shuffled after me, biting her lip occasionally, saying something snarky to mask the fact that she was terrified of every creak, crunch, and crash we heard. I was oblivious. I was just excited about a chipmunk I saw. 30 minutes in, and I started to get braver, while Kayla sat on the benches pockmarking the trail. I'd leave our jars with her and merrily go skipping off the beaten path. She'd nervously watch as I disappeared into the shrubs to look for anything interesting. Bird feathers, snail shells, cool rocks, and other things that I wasn't legally allowed to take, but would stuff in my pockets anyway. With every new venture into the woods, I gained more and more confidence and would venture further and further out. If I got too far, Kayla would yell for me, insults, usually about how I was a loser, I was crazy, she hated this, and she wanted to go home. I'd usually follow the sound back to where I began, and given how far I was wandering, sometimes the sound of her voice was the only thing that guided me safely. It wasn't a perfect system, but it worked, and it worked right up until it didn't. To this day, I don't know what it was. Did Kayla stop calling because she was mad at me? Did I mosey too far out to hear her? Was something else at play? I just know that at an interesting bend in the trail, I dropped off my jars and treasures with Kayla, pressed out into the bushes, and began to walk downhill further and further into the woods in search of interesting things. Part of me knew I was going too far, but I felt this strange compulsion to keep going, like something was calling me from farther ahead. So, ahead I went, like an idiot, stumbling over rocks and getting slapped in the face with branches. When I hit the bottom of the hill, I realized I was standing at the top of a sharp drop down, a rocky jut about the height of a single-story house that was shrouded in darkness from the sheer volume of the surrounding trees. If I squinted, though, I could make out what rested at the bottom of the fall, and my eyes widened when I saw fading yellow dashes and darkened asphalt. It was a road. Not just any road, but a pretty pristine road that, aside from some cracks in the cement, was still completely drivable but only for a stretch. I awkwardly climbed down the rocky drop to investigate, and you could only walk along it for about the length of a football field before it gave way to greenery on the other side. It was just some bizarre slice of modern age plopped right in the middle of the mountains, somehow immune to nature and time. I marveled for a bit before I finally saw the glint of something metallic in the fleeting moment of the sunlight. In a typical dumb kid fashion, my magpie brain took over, and off I went to see what it was that was so shiny. Imagine my surprise when I realized that some yards away, that it was a doorknob, just like the one you'd find on a door in your house. Apparently, by some fluke, I'd come out on top of the mystery door from my childhood. I hadn't even noticed it while climbing down the road even though it'd been right next to me while I scaled slash fell down the rocks. My anxiety spiked as I stared it down. Even with my limited knowledge of direction, I knew I should not have been anywhere near this part of the park. I hadn't been on the Cumberland Gap Road since I was very young, but my gut told me that this should have been miles away from where we started, and definitely too far for a girl to walk on her own in an afternoon. I stood and stared at the door for a good long while before I decided that I'd had enough adventuring for the day. Despite the childhood curiosity I had about what was inside, the whole situation reeked of fish and my stomach turned at the thought of trying to open it. Inhaling deeply, I opted instead to scramble back from where I came and play Marco Polo with myself until I heard Kayla respond. If I headed directly left, of the outcropping over the door and just walk straight, then I was bound to find my way back. Knock, knock, knock. My thoughts froze no sooner than I found a foothold in the stone. Three slow, 
Steady knocks thundered on the other side of the door. My heart found its way to my throat, but my eyes couldn't find their way to the door. My brain was torn as to whether I should look or not. Tap, knock, knock, tap. There was a rhyme to it, like a song, or I'm going to feel dumb admitting this. The telegraph scene from Balto. I know it sounds absolutely stupid. As a kid, that was the only real exposure to the idea of Morse code or anything similar. In a moment of panic, I stood there, frozen, trying to see if my exposure to a 90s cartoon movie had turned me into an expert. Heck, I didn't even know if it was Morse code. The more I stood there, the more it started sounding like someone was just trying to get out of a room after they'd locked themselves in. Knock. Tap. I stumbled at the force of the knock and let out a yelp. Everything fell silent, even the birds in the trees. Frozen on the road, in the middle of the woods, I gawked at the door. Tears began to well in my eyes. This was some scary stories to tell in the dark crap, and I wasn't having it. Hello. A voice, small and familiar, warbled from the other side. Rapid tapping accompanied it, like dog claws scratching across a linoleum floor. Standing up and brushing myself off, I started trying to clamber up the rocks again. Hello, Aaron. The voice knew my name, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, that the reason it sounded familiar is that it sounded like Kayla. The cadence was all wrong though, like listening to a parrot talk. The door, or whatever was on the other side, mastered the sound, but not the method. Aaron, where did you go? You went so far, I looked for you. Foothold found, I hoisted myself up, using the tree roots and rocks and anything that would support my weight. A part of me was hurt to leave Kayla behind but I couldn't get over the weird rhythm of its speech. Besides, there was no way she could have gotten ahead of me, right? There's no way she'd even come out into the woods, right? She was scared of the actual trail, let alone the wilderness beyond it. Aaron, you left. You went so far. Aaron, where did you go? Aaron, I'm scared. It's dark. Aaron. I hit the top of the incline and pulled myself up, panting and dirty, with sore palms and mud in my mouth. Every muscle in my body trembled from a mixture of exhaustion and fear, and I lingered a bit too long, overlooking the door. It took a moment for me to realize the door had stopped talking, and it took me an even longer moment to realize the tapping had stopped. However, it took me no time at all to realize that the sound of the creaking hinges was probably a bad sign. Air in. Are you there? Air in. The voice was clearer now. When I squinted down onto the dark road, I saw the vaguest hint of a silhouette slinking out of a crack behind the door. It was humanoid, I guess, but not human. There were too many odd angles and thin extremities for it to count as human. Granted, I also didn't take too much time to try to figure out what it was, since I'd seen enough horror movies to know that she who gawks the longest dies first. I did catch a glimpse of it, whooping around to look at me, oversized eyes watching as I vanished into the woods, first quietly, and then with increasing volume as I heard it scampering after me. Screeching like a banshee, I ripped through the underbrush and screamed Kayla's name at the top of my lungs. I waited for her to yell back at me, but I only heard her voice coming from behind me, desperate and broken. Aaron, it's dark. I'm scared. Aaron, you went so far. I can't see you. Want to go home? Aaron. My lungs burned as I pushed myself uphill, faster and harder than any kid should ever have to go. My heart thumped against my eardrums, and my legs felt like jelly underneath me. Every time I stumbled, I imagined that thing gaining on me, and barely stopped to gauge how hurt I was before scrabbling off again. Sometimes, I made it a good ways on all fours, hunched over, trying to use my arms to pull myself ahead with my legs threatening to give out. And the whole time, the chorus of, Aaron, 
Aaron chimed behind me, besides me, above me. I kept screaming out for Kayla, hoping that she'd hear my panic and answer back. In my heart, I knew I could tell the difference between her and that thing, since she'd actually sound like a human being. At least, that's what I told myself as I recklessly tore my way ahead. As I crested the hill, I found myself going downhill again, and I let gravity carry me the rest of the way. The voice behind me became more distant the faster I moved, quieter and quieter, as if it was fading from existence itself. And I thought I would too, when my feet finally went completely numb and I fell, hard, over a tree root. I felt my nose pop and the world spin as I tumbled down, finally coming to rest with a grunt on soft dirt that was strangely devoid of leaves. I opened one eye and saw the edge of a wooden bench. On the top of it was a couple of jars of snail shells and bird feathers. Standing next to it, staring at me in horror, was Kayla. She immediately fell down next to me in a fury of, are you okay? I was pretty sure God had abandoned me and I was far from okay. So I numbly stared at her until I realized I hadn't broken any bones and could probably get up. She shakily hoisted me to my feet and began to fuss over my nose. It was bloody. My clothes, they were a mess. And my hair, it was full of leaves. She pointed at fresh bruises and cuts and asked what I'd done. And I was too shell-shocked to answer, aside from some paranoid glances over my shoulder. Wow, Aaron, you went so far out and I couldn't see you anymore. It was dark, I was scared. I must have been yelling for you this whole time. How did you end up coming from uphill? Are you okay? I wanted to look for you, but what if we both got lost? I just want to go home. This is stupid. We left the jars. She led the way back. The half hour hike felt like an eternity, but not nearly as long as the amount of time we sat on the benches in the parking lot waiting for our ride to come get us. We didn't really talk. If we did, I don't remember what was said. I could easily imagine her ranting to the side of my head out of worry and anger because that's how she was and it would have been completely justified. But my mind was too fixated on the door, the thing, my pulse, how much I didn't want to sit with my back to the woods. But at the same time, I didn't want to worry Kayla by making her think there was something more wrong than I'm an idiot who fell down a hill I just stared ahead until I saw her grandpa pull up. Of course, he wasn't happy with either of us. We should have taken the Iron Furnace Trail. I shouldn't have gone wandering into the woods. My mom was going to get him for not watching us. I ignored most of it because I had more important things to worry about, and it was a relatively quiet ride back home. But right as I got out of the car, right in front of my house, Kayla grabbed my wrist to keep me from wandering too far. Out of earshot of her grandpa, whispering like a town gossip, she asked me why I'd been messing with her while I was in the woods. I told her I hadn't. Her face went pale. Oh, she said, because it sounded like you, sort of. She was saying she had something neat to show me down the hill. She said she found a door in the mountain. I used to live in the Outbacks in Cecilia, Kentucky. There's a lot of woods around and many wild animals, which gives me a pretty good feeling every day. Well, almost every day. Before I get into it, let me give you some pointers of my property so you can better understand this situation. Where I live is rather secluded. The closest town is a good 30 minute drive away, making my old bus rides over an hour long in the mornings and our neighboring houses are rather spaced out. The property is pretty nice, considering we built the house ourselves. We have a small garden, a chicken coop area, rabbit hutches, and a pig pen. My family's two dogs protected these animals, while mine stayed with the pigs since one of them was pregnant at the time. We only have about six acres of backwoods land before we reach a no hunting, private property sign with barbed wire fencing. 
Though it does no good, as I later found out, a tree had fallen and broken part of it. Now, although we hear coyotes all the time, we never actually see signs of them. Just raccoons, rabbits, squirrels, and possum prints, and a lot of deer tracks. Going out there during late fall, all winter, and beginning of spring, was something I genuinely enjoyed doing. Though my family had restrictions, as I wasn't allowed out there at nighttime. Now, while most would find it disturbing maybe, whenever an animal of ours died, I was required to take it out back and dump it near the fence to make sure no predators got too close to our property. The walk through the woods was usually fun, but I sometimes feel like I was being watched. Of course, Karma, my male German Shepherd mix, was always with me whenever I did the task. I never had him on a leash, something I deeply regret after that night. I brought him because I trust his senses more than my own. Whenever I get a sense I'm being watched, Karma would just stop walking. When I see the fur on his back rise, I'll toss the animal as far as possible and head back home. Can never be too careful, right? Now that I have explained some things, I'll get on to the point of the story. One of our prize roosters had died suddenly, and we hadn't noticed it in the chicken coop floor until it was time to put the chickens up for the night. When my older brother opened the back, we saw it. We assumed this explained why Cookie, one of my family's Pyrenees dogs, was acting odd. Even though it was around 7 p.m., and I didn't want to go into the woods since it was still early fall, which meant big spider webs still. My mother demanded that I go take it out to where it's supposed to go. I got on my boots and sweater to prevent mosquito bites and headed out to get my dog. His pen with the pigs was only a few feet away from my back steps, so it was really easy to get him if there was an emergency, like our neighbor's dogs chasing our cats. Once I opened the pen, he shot out, excited to run around as I held the Walmart bag with the dead rooster inside. Making my way to the woods, he knew where we were going and followed quickly at my side before getting in front of me. He did that often, going off and stopping to wait for me. As a 17-year-old with no friends, besides internet ones, I found this to be rather sweet of him and would smile at the fact that he'd wait as if he didn't want me to be left alone. I'm on my way, I chuckled, as I saw him standing at the bottom of the small hill, just staring at me in anticipation. Once down, I kept walking, keeping an eye on him. Once I got closer to the drop-off area, I noticed that he was straying farther and farther away and wasn't stopping. So I let out a high-pitched whistle sound. Usually, he comes when I whistle, but this time, he didn't. He raised his head up, ears perked up, and his attention was elsewhere. The fur on his back had raised slightly. Before I had the chance to yell no, he bolted. He was never really a barker unless a stranger was in our yard or our neighbor's dogs ran over. So it surprised me when he barked before suddenly taking off into the woods. It was then I noticed the tree had fallen when he jumped onto the tree and over the fence onto private property, chasing whatever he had seen. Karma, karma, no, I yelled as I dropped the bag and chased after him, only stopping when I reached the fence, but he was nowhere to be seen and his barking stopped. This scared me as it was getting dark out and the day animals were falling silent, being replaced by crickets and frogs. I knew I wasn't allowed on the private property, so I stood at the fence and repeatedly called for him. Here boy, I called out, feeling frustrated. Come here, now, come back. I yelled in hopes he would return as tears began forming in my eyes, only for him not to return. I'm naturally a rational thinker and assumed he had gotten too far away to hear me. So I bolted back towards home, feeling out of breath by the time I got to the small but steep hill. Mother, I called as I rushed inside. He took off and I don't know where he is. He jumped the fence back there. I told you to keep a leash on him when you're out there. She yelled as she got ready to help me find him, only to see the sun was basically down. It sets in our backyard meaning it would be dark in the woods, since the trees would be blocking the sun. I'm sure he'll come back, 
she assured me while looking out the back door. Since it was too dark out back, I decided to walk down the street and call for him. My neighbor had noticed and asked if I was looking for someone, so I told him my dog had ran off into the woods. He nodded and seemed to glance around before disappearing in his backyard. I wasn't really sure if he was going to keep an eye out or not. It had been about two hours since he ran off, and he still wasn't back. I mentally cursed myself for not having him on a leash as I went outside to feed the livestock dogs. When scooping their food, I thought I heard a high-pitched whistle. My mind was too focused on the fact that Karma was still missing to really think about it as I walked around to the backyard. When I got to Cookie, I heard the faint sound of what sounded like someone in our backyard saying, Here, boy. Very quietly, like he was far away or something. I glanced over, but saw nothing besides what the moon showed. Our back porch light wasn't working currently, so it wasn't much I could see. We had just got new wood siding up in the backyard, so we had to remove the light. Deciding to ignore it, I walked over to Sarge and gave her her food when I heard it again. Only, it was louder this time. I looked over to the woods again, feeling uneasy before heading inside. I had two thoughts running through my mind, aside from karma, of course. One, there was someone in our woods, potentially a neighbor. And two, he seemed to have lost a dog, like I did. Although a stranger, I still felt the urge to help, as I just lost my dog in those woods too. Mom, I said as I went inside. There's someone in the woods, I told her, ushering her to listen. She stopped doing the dishes and went out to listen as well, hearing it too. The man never called the dog's name, something I didn't notice at the time, and just proceeded to say, Here boy, come back, and come here, now. My mom gave me a wide-eyed look, as she looked just as scared as I did when I first heard it. I think we should go help, I said as I grabbed my Winchester BB gun. The actual guns were in a locker I had no access to, so this would have to do for protection. Should we? She asked, before we heard a dog. My heart lifted as I hoped it was karma, but it was a hound dog, it sounded like, and it was getting farther away. Mother's instincts seemed to kick in as she went out there with me. We both knew the dangers of the woods at night, and she began calling out for the dog. I also called out, but I was calling out for karma, really. As we headed into the tree line, not wanting to go down too far, we noticed as we stopped just before the hill that things were way too quiet. Sure, we heard some nighttime insects, but as we heard the man call out again, he sounded closer. Even though the dog's barking was faint and clearly far away, the leaves on the ground were basically dead. Yet there were no crunching noises, as whoever was out there was getting closer and closer. There was no flashlight shining either. When our neighbor lost their cat, we saw their flashlights in the woods, so we became skeptical at the fact that the strange man we heard didn't have one, and we stopped calling out. Turning around, we headed back to the small path and into the safety of the yard. Our dogs wagged their tails at the sight of us, but it wasn't the same without my dog. We walked along the tree line, staying a few feet back as we looked for some form of light, but found none. It was then we heard it. Come here, boy. In a deep, angry voice. It sounded like it was down some, to our right. I felt the hair raise on the back of my neck and rushed into the back of our house as our dogs began barking like crazy their snarled growls being the only noise as everything else went silent. Mother wasn't far behind as we got inside and closed the door, staring out as we turned out the lights inside, so if the man entered our yard, he couldn't see us as we stayed at the glass door. As I thought of how weird this all was, I realized something. He never said the name of what he was looking for. In fact, he said the same words I had earlier when Karma had run off. Was he copying me? My thoughts were interrupted as I heard my mother grasp and cover her mouth before she closed the curtains to the door. Her tan complexion had gone pale. Without thinking, I took a peek 
as I could hear one of our dogs going crazy. I saw her lunging and growling, so I looked to where she was looking. What I saw was not human. I, I don't even know what it was. Its skin was white. The moon wasn't even needed to see. It was so pale, I was sure it was a ghost at first. Its eyes sunken into its face. It didn't seem to have a nose, and it looked like it was upside down, crawling on its hands and feet, as if it was doing a crab walk, sort of. But its head was upright, back arched so its stomach was pointing up to the sky as it slowly made its way from the tree line. Its teeth didn't even fit its mouth, and its jaw hung open, a long, slimy tongue hanging out as its dark, beady eyes looked around. Here, boy. It spoke. Come here, boy. It just kept saying, its head twitching as it turned halfway, shakily, before snapping back upright. It didn't even seem to care about the dogs barking at it. Then, it looked at the house, and I swear for a second that we made eye contact. I couldn't move for the fear it would see the curtain movements. For what seemed like an eternity, we were just staring at one another until it twisted its body slowly, bones seeming to crack and pop as it began standing on its legs. Whatever it is, was tall, tall, bony, and its skin tied around its frame, showing every bone in its disgustingly lanky body. Some hair hung from its elbows, patches splotted around its chest. Its arms were long and almost seemed to drag on the ground. Long, sharp nails were seen. They were black, but the moonlight made them seem to shine slightly. Its body proportions were just so off. It had regular leg size, a bent torso, like its spine grew crooked, and those long arms. It stood at least eight feet tall, and I was petrified. How was it able to twist its body like that? How was a creature like this even alive? I thought I was going to crap myself at the sight of this thing. Is this what karma went after? Did this get him? My thoughts stopped when it began walking towards our house, taking slow strides as its body seemed to sway with each small step it took. Here, boy. Its voice croaked, though it was hard to hear through the glass. My hand that held lightly to the curtain was shaking as I felt unable to look away as I felt those eyes were staring back at me. A flash suddenly gone around our backyard. Our neighbor was heading over, I assumed, based on the direction it was coming from. He must have heard the dogs going ballistic and came to check it out. I thought he was going to get attacked, but the creature screeched and ran back into the trees. Even after it left, I was stuck just staring at the trees until the dogs turned their attention to the front yard. Did it circle around? Slowly, I finally stepped away as I looked to the door and heard a knock. My knees felt so weak as I released a breath I wasn't aware I was holding. My mom had answered the door, and it was our neighbor explaining that he had heard our dog going crazy. Just like I thought, I didn't hear much of the conversation as I felt sick and ran to the bathroom, emptying the contents of food I had just eaten hours before. Mother questioned me later that night before bed about what I saw but I couldn't answer. She saw it too, but only a glimpse. She didn't see the way it moved, the way it stared at me. Later that night, around 2 a.m., our neighbor gave us a call, saying he saw our dog in his backyard. I ran out back, hoping it really was him, and there he was, strutting over to us with his tail between his legs as he knew he was in trouble for running off. Yet, I couldn't be mad at him. I was just glad that whatever that thing was hadn't gotten to him. I moved shortly after that experience and now live in the city. I guess I thought that by writing this out, the nightmares would stop. But they haven't. I can't get the image of those eyes burning into my mind out. I've also written this as a warning. If you lose your dog in the woods and hear some unfamiliar voice calling for it when you thought you were alone, run. Even if you have a group of friends or family, run, go home, and stay away from the windows. There's no telling what it might do if it actually catches you. I have lived in Inverness, Scotland all of my life. 
The house which I live is essentially in the middle of nowhere and is surrounded by woods which go on for ages. The trail to get onto the main road is through the woods. There is no escaping them. I have gone into these woods every day since I was a little girl. And as I got older, started taking my dog in there for long walks and sometimes even a night out in the park. Never any reports of a dangerous animal in there, except your average fox, and one time a female wolf and her pups, but they were taken to an animal sanctuary. The fact is, it's never been a dangerous place. Not until recently. I live in the same house I lived in when I was a little girl, but now it's my fiancé and I that live there. My parents moved to a petite neighborhood in the town as they're getting older and it's more manageable, and I decided to keep the house for Josh and I. Recently, I've been getting home from work later than usual, so it's been well past dark, especially this time of year. When I get back, it's usually 7.30 p.m. When I get in, my dog is always antsy for a walk in the woods, as he hasn't been getting them regularly since I've been working later and Josh is always working late. He's a police officer. Anyway, it was Monday the 25th of November when I started noticing something in the woods. I got home around 7.30, and when I got in, my dog was ready to go out for a run in the woods. He was hysterical. I quickly changed and got my dog's leash and opened the door, and he took off running out the garden gate and straight into the woods. I followed him, slower though, he knows where he's going and knows my pace and where to find me, so I take my time and leisurely stroll through the woods, and just as I was starting to get into the heart of the woods, I hear a sharp cracking sound, like something big has just stood up on a large stick and snapped it in half. I don't worry though, because I'm used to hearing these sorts of sounds, as I'm always in the woods. I carried on, and around 10 minutes after the large crack, which came from up ahead, I hear another one. This one was closer, more violent. I'm not going to lie, it made me jump. At this point, Potato, my dog, must have been a bit rattled as well, because he came skirting through the woods faster than I've seen him run before. Potato is a small dog, just a short-haired furball with stubby legs, which restricts him from running too fast. This time though, He's running too fast that he's tripping over his small legs and the woodland ground. I stop walking fast enough to reach down and grab him and I scoop him up to calm him down. Once he stopped panting so hard and his little heart stopped hammering against my arm, I put him down on the floor and we carry on our walk. Potato doesn't run off like he usually does after he comes back to make sure I'm still following. He stays by my side and doesn't stay too far behind or in front. I strike this as unusual, because nothing really scares him. Like me, he is used to the sounds we encounter in the woods, because he has been with me since I was 18. We walk down to the end of the woods, to where there is a short river, which is usually where we stop on our nighttime walks. He gets a small drink from the river, before he's ready to start back off through the woods, into the house. I notice that he doesn't spend as much time messing around by the river like he usually does, and he's more on edge and jumps when he hears a crack. I figure the large crack we heard before must have scared him, so I quickly get myself sorted and walk through the woods home, because I don't want him to feel on edge about being in the woods. When we reach home, I open the doors and he charges through, straight into the laundry room, where it's warm and he has a little bed with his favorite blanket that came with him when we bought him. I was worried, but didn't think too much of it, and I knock off my boots at the door and scrape the frozen mud off of them so I could take them into the house, and that's when I seen something move in my line of sight. I quickly turn and see black fur shoot behind a group of large trees. I put my boots back on and start off down the path and out of the garden gate, and I see something moving behind the trees again. I start forward, and I think it might be one of the dogs from the house just a little down the road from mine. As I went forward, Potato comes out and follows me. He walks just ahead of me before he notices movement and tenses up. He starts growling and baring his teeth, which he never does, not even when he sees a fox in the woods. The thing behind the trees starts moving forward, 
and when I first glance at it, I don't know what I was looking at. It looked like a big, deformed wolf, but wasn't walking like a wolf. It was walking on its hind legs, with its front legs in front of him for support. It moved like a gorilla. I was too stunned to move, and Potato was growling and snarling even worse now. When I realize it's staring at us, also bearing its large set of teeth, I notice its large, yellow, glowing eyes. The sense comes back into me, and I slowly grab Potato and run straight back into the house as quickly as I can. All the while, this thing was growling loudly at me, but didn't move. I slammed the door and took Potato into his little room and gave him some food to calm him down. I walk through the living room and close the curtains and do the same in the kitchen. Then I phone Josh and tell him what I just witnessed, and he reassures me and tells me that when he gets home at 11, he will make sure everything is okay. Until then, I just sat and watched TV with Potato and had some dinner and tried to take my mind off whatever it was I seen. Just a little after 11, I see Josh's headlights shine through the curtain, and Potato starts getting excited and goes and waits by the door. I stand up to look out the curtains, and sure enough, Josh is shining his torch into the woods and looking about. About 15 minutes later, he comes in and says there was nothing there, but there is a deer carcass just a little into the woods. That unnerves me, but I don't think anything of it, and we go to bed, and that's that. Over the next few days, I don't think much about what I saw, and Josh doesn't mention it again either. Josh and I had been working a lot, so Potato was staying with my parents for a few days, until Josh and I were off for a week for our seven year anniversary. Yesterday I finished work early, and that was me off for a week, so I went to my parents' house and picked up Potato, who was quite a few pounds heavier than when I left him, all thanks to my mom. She's always had a soft spot for my dog. I spend about a half hour at my parents before going home and changing before getting Potato ready to go out for a short walk because it's getting colder and it's too cold to stay out for too long. I put on my coat, scarf, hat, and gloves and my walking boots and I put on Potato's winter jacket and we set off on our walk. We get a small bit into the woods and it's apparent that Potato hasn't forgotten about our encounter we had last time we were in there. So he doesn't run off and sticks to my side for the whole walk. Nothing happened until we were walking back to the house. We were nearing the edge of the forest and I could see the gate to my house and I could see that Josh was now home because his patrol car was parked next to my car. Potato sees this too, starts walking a bit faster towards the house and Josh comes out of the front door to greet Potato. But just as Potato walked out of the forest, he gets knocked to the floor by something that's large with black fur, and the rest is a blur. I don't know what to do, but my adrenaline starts kicking in when I realize my little Potato is getting attacked by a massive beast. Josh apparently feels the same because he runs back into the house and comes back out with a rifle. I run up to the creature, which wasn't a wise choice now that I look back, and kick it with as much force as I could and it growls and I do it again because I see that there are red spots all over the ground and I knew it must have been potatoes because the beast didn't have a single scratch. I'm trying to get it off a of potato, but it's massive. He turned to look at me with its piercing yellow eyes and I was shocked at the sight of it. It had the face of a wolf, but it was so much bigger and fiercer and didn't have fur in some places, but was just skin. It stood up on its hind legs and towered over me it was bigger than I anticipated. I moved back from it because I realized it was off of Potato and it followed me and just as it was about to swipe at me, a shot rang through the air and the beast-like creature howled so loud I had to cover my ears. I heard it running off and I opened my eyes and stood in shock but the sight of Josh running and the sound of whimpering beside me brought me back to reality and ran to Potato who was bleeding a lot so much that I couldn't tell where it was coming from. Josh picked him up and we ran to the house and I followed close behind, not looking back into the woods because I was too frightened with the idea of what I might see. I lock the door behind us and Josh takes Potato into the laundry room and places him on top of the clean worktop and grabs one of his t-shirts that was folded in a pile on top of the washing machine. I stood stroking Potato's head and crying 
because I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to do. Potato was whimpering and twitching, so I tried to comfort him as much as possible. Josh started wiping the mess away, and that's when I noticed something that made my heart stop. Potato had two deep gashes, one on his neck and one close to his stomach. I remember crying out and Josh runs and grabs the phone, not before telling me to keep pressure on both of the wounds to hold it. I placed both my hands on the wounds and pressed down until Josh came back and told me that he was going to take Potato down the road to the nearest vet and told me to stay home. I wasn't happy, but I didn't argue because Potato was injured and I could hear it in his breathing and his little eyes. Josh left and I sat crying in the living room for hours until 3 a.m. Josh came into the house, and when I see he didn't have Potato, I cried harder. But anyway, I worry about Potato. He has to stay at the vet's for a few days, as they gave him stitches, but they had to see whether he would make it through the night, as the gashes were very deep, and they weren't sure whether or not he would succumb to the wounds. Just past 11 this morning, we got a call from the vet's telling us that Potato made it through the night and is awake looking for me and Josh. So we took his blanket and we sat with him for a few hours. He will be home on Wednesday if everything is okay, and I will visit him at the vet's. I haven't seen anything in the woods, but we never usually did after dark, and I'm not going in there hunting until I'm sure that my potato is back home safe and sound. I know yesterday wasn't the last time I will see it. I was 11 years old when a fire started spreading in the Smokies. I remember watching the news and my parents getting more worried as parks closed and rental cabins were burned to their foundations, like matchsticks in the neighboring town. I remember mom saying that the coal seam has burned for 40 years. Everyone said it would never reach the surface, that we were safe. No one seemed to know how it had reached the surface. Airtight water barriers, constant patrolling, and even dynamite in riverbeds to help flood the mines had kept the underground fire at bay all this time. And in recent years, it was almost extinguished. Sabotage was suspected, but no one could get near the mines. They and the woods around them burned with a heat and fury never before seen in our normally humid climate. We may have to take the girls and evacuate, Mom said. Nighttime in the living room felt different lately. I started to notice that the same huge white curtains behind and above the sofa that poured sunlight in during the daytime became a two-way mirror at night. With the lights on in the house and darkness outside, anyone could see through the curtains to us and what we were doing, but we couldn't see out. We only saw the curtains looming and ghostly. The scene was around 10 p.m. on the third night of the fire, was familiar enough, if a bit more tense. Mom and Dad were watching the news and tracking the path of the fire before bed, and my seven-year-old sister Emma and I were in the living room working on a puzzle in the middle of the dark brown carpet that stretched wall to wall on that level. All the lights were on around us, but the house still seemed dim somehow. I cracked a window to let in some fresh air now that the breeze had shifted. Emma finished the edge pieces before I could and was gloating about it. And I was pulling all of the inside pieces away from her and laughing about it. When suddenly, a heavy gust blew the curtains in further towards us and knocked a picture of me off of the end table. Emma and I were both startled, but laughed when we realized what had happened. My mood shifted after that moment. I wondered about the fire if it would reach us. The darkness outside seemed infinite now, but I'd seen the unnatural red glow on the horizon. My heart pounded afterwards longer than I felt it should have, and I couldn't stop looking over at the window. Before long, I was starting to imagine I saw a shadow and heard sounds on the other side of the immense white curtain, and the night seemed to press around the room more closely than before. I got up and turned on the dining room and kitchen lights, trying to chase away that gloom that seemed to be trying to swallow us. When I sat back down, I was able to draw my attention away from the moonless night outside, but I kept hearing something. 
sort of an arrhythmic tapping on the window panes. I knew I had to be imagining the sound, but if I ignored it, it grew louder, as though trying to pull my attention away from the safety of the light. Then, Emma looked up and listened. Is somebody out there? She asked, as though I might know the answer. I looked back at the curtains, which were still now. Suddenly, fear washed over me like a cold sweat, and I grabbed her hand and bolted up the stairs. Out of breath, I told our parents there was something outside. Emma stayed with mom, while dad held my hand and went down the stairs. He leaned over the couch, before I could ask him not to, and yanked open the curtain. Dimly visible outside were the neighbor's houses, a road to the left, and the woods to the right. All of it was dimly lit by a few streetlights and the eerie red glow. The night air under a new moon was thick and swirling, and the woods beyond were invisible and silent, but seemed endless. I moved closer to my dad. Moths flicked against the window, leaving dull spots of dust from their wings behind on the glass. Every time they hit, I heard the tapping that had sent Emma and I running up the stairs. Louder now that I could see them. They must have been attracted to the lights in the house, Dad explained. Maybe we should turn off some of them. He turned off the dining room, kitchen, and overhead lights. I felt relieved, but the night was closing in again. Will you stay down here and watch some TV with me? I asked him. I don't feel like I'm ready to go to bed yet. Sure, for a while, Dad agreed. I curled up on the couch, uncertainly, as he sat in the only chair, but eventually felt safer with him flipping through the channels nearby. Hours later, I woke up to the sound of rain. It was dark, and I was alone. I had once been happy to sleep down here with Emma, until she started sleepwalking, that is. I usually prefer having her with me, but when I woke up to find her one night, staring at me next to my bed, empty-eyed and whispering incoherently, it seemed like she wasn't there. It felt as though some part of the inexplainable fear I sometimes felt at night had possessed her body and was sending her drifting through the quiet house like a visiting spirit. Eventually, I started locking my bedroom door at night. 3.02 was the time I saw in green digital numbers on a clock across the room when I was stirred awake by the rising sound of rain. Rain, I thought. Thank goodness. I was in complete darkness, except for a dim glow from a distant streetlight refracting through the fog. All the lights in the house were off, and Dad had gone to bed. I thought I smelled smoke again, even though the windows were shut. I looked around and all was quiet, except for the rain outside, but I had the distinct feeling of being in a situation I needed to get out of immediately. Panic was already creeping up my chest. When I looked up and saw the shadow behind the curtain above me, I blinked hard and froze. It was tall and still, and had the rough shape of a human figure, but much too tall. It was right up against the window. Sleep paralysis had taught me long ago to question my senses. I slowed my breathing and closed my eyes, waiting for the waking dream to end and wishing my dad had taken me with him when he turned out the lights and went to bed. I couldn't blame him because he knew I normally loved sleeping here on the couch. My eyes had been closed no more than a second when a noise in front of the fireplace behind me sent me bolting upright. It almost sounded like a mechanical scream. Soon as I recognized the sound as Emma's toy horse, that whined when you squeezed its sides, I looked and saw the horse, blue with a green mane and saddle, on top of her other toys in the basket, but the room was empty. I was fully awake now, and all I could think about was how to get upstairs to my room without hurting myself in fright. I sat up more and looked back up at the window, the shadow remained. The fear that moved through me now was so swift and sickening, I couldn't move at all, even though I had flailed from the sounds behind me only seconds ago. I tried to run away or scream, but my body was going numb, and I couldn't make a sound. I looked helplessly up towards my parents' bedroom. I couldn't stand to lie still anymore. I had to shake free of this nightmare somehow. 
I decided that the only thing left to do was weakly reach behind me and pull the cord. I yanked open the curtains with all of my remaining strength. The window stood before me, and what I saw were moths. Hundreds of them, pelting the glass in a furious swarm, causing the sound I had awoken to and had mistaken for pouring rain. Two streetlights flickered in the distance. In the middle of the swarm was a form that looked only vaguely human, but in much greater detail now. Its long hair hung black and gray in matted clumps, and its skin was the same two colors, shrunken stiffly against a hollow skull. Torn and filthy garments hung loosely around its body, exposing the hardened skin and bone. The thing looked as though it had been burnt alive and buried, and then crawled up out of the ground. The dull brown wings of the insects rolled in and out of the faint light around the black silhouette, like thick clusters of dust from an open tomb. The eyes on the figure were black and sunken in, with a dark red rim, like that distant glow on the horizon. But the pupils were somehow darker than the rest of it, and darker than night itself. I could still see them, glimmering like black sapphires, even after the streetlights flickered out. I realized suddenly that the moths were drawn to the darkness of this ghastly figure as though it were light, and were endlessly spiraling towards it as though being pulled towards the center of a black hole. My head swarmed and I fell dizzy off of the couch, hitting my head on the coffee table. The eyes followed. I closed my eyes, but could still see those two onyx points piercing their gaze through my eyelids. I opened them again and couldn't bring myself to look away. I could only crawl backwards into the dining room until I hit a short wall in front of the kitchen counter. The eyes followed. I tried to believe it was a dream, but even as I was sinking into unconsciousness, I knew it was not. I was brought sharply back to reality by a loud squeak of the window being opened. A charred and blackened hand crept inside through the crack it had made and tried to open the window further, but to my horror, the hand appeared to start crumbling and disintegrating in the effort. As the char and ashes fell away, bright cinders were exposed, which fell to the carpet, catching on fire. The smell that entered the room was now both smoky and acidic. It had an aged earthiness that I only smelled hints of in the most long abandoned and moldy cellars. A sweet but foul note floated on the air with it. I was backed against the wall of the counter now, and my left hand was sliding down it behind me. It was then that my hand sunk down onto two deeply sharp nails beneath the visible surface of the carpet, puncturing it so deeply that my mom would have to worry about tetanus, and the scars would never disappear. I found my voice then to scream. It was a weak, hoarse scream, but once I started, I couldn't stop. Then I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I tore my eyes away from the locked gaze of the specter to see Emma walking out of the kitchen into the dining room where I was. She was in her nightgown, holding the same toy horse that had gone off behind me earlier and was staring out into the room at nothing with an impossibly dilated eyes that appeared black and uncomprehending. I was once afraid of her and for her. Emma, I managed to say. Shh, she replied, approaching me. She put an icy hand on my shoulder. Stay here, she whispered. Emma walked towards the figure outside, whose gaze had now shifted up towards my mother's window. She picked up a small blanket and dropped it on the small patch of cinders and small fires that had formed on the carpet. Then Emma put her hand on the window and began speaking through the glass in sounds and syllables that I still have never been able to identify as an actual language. Emma gently touched the glass. The figure outside began to slowly disappear, as though it were disappearing into the night. It fell apart like it was made of only ashes and had been hit by a strong wind. Its gaze still fixed towards the room where my parents slept. The moths disappeared as well, a few falling dead on the windowsill. As the apparition faded, so did my consciousness, away into nothing. When I awoke again, it was morning, and I was in my own bed upstairs. I heard my parents talking excitedly about the news, that the fire was receding, despite all predictions to the contrary. 
and we wouldn't have to evacuate. I didn't need to feel the pain in my palm of my hand to know I had not dreamt what had happened, but I was startled nonetheless when I looked down at it. What I saw there were two black puncture wounds, red rimmed and staring at me like two black eyes. Mom wanted to know why there were so many dead moths downstairs and where all the dirt and ashes in the windowsill came from and what happened to the carpet. I don't remember what I said, but it wasn't the truth. Emma remembers none of it, except stories of the damage all around us, and also a dream that Tina, her toy horse, was calling out to her on that awful night. I heard that horse go off in the early morning hours a few times after that, and Emma's shuffling footsteps not long after. All I could do was pull the covers over my head, shiver, and try to sleep. I could really use some help here, as I'm starting to get really worried. Last night, I was followed by a very creepy lady while out hiking in my local trails at state land. I've hiked and hunted these trails my whole life, and not once have I encountered anything quite like this. Don't get me wrong, I've had my fair share of spooky things happen while out solo camping, but this, this chilled me right to the bone and now I think I'm being stalked. Let me explain what's going on, and hopefully, one of you may be able to help me out here. Christmas Eve, I had nothing to do, as I have no wife, no kids, and my parents live three hours away. So to get rid of my boredom, I had this genius idea of going on a solo hike through our local trails. Like I said, I've hiked these trails multiple times. This time, however, I'll never forget. I got out to the trailhead about 5 p.m. I had my headlamp on, and I knew these trails like the back of my hand, so I wasn't too concerned with the sunlight quickly fading. I don't know if any of you are from Michigan, but we are having a surprisingly sunny and warm December. However, it still gets dark around 5 to 5.30. The weather was beautiful and perfect for a nighttime walk. We don't have too many nice winter days like this, so I wanted to take full advantage and enjoy the warm night air. So I got out of my truck and started up the trailhead. This particular trail I was on started out in dense pine trees and after a mile or so opened up to these awesome valleys and huge fields. Most of the time, if I was quiet enough and looked around, I could see some deer grazing and other wildlife. This time though, nothing. I was honestly quite surprised there wasn't a single animal, considering how beautiful of a night it was. Now that I think about it, I didn't see or hear even a squirrel in those pines, which is very uncommon. They are plentiful in these parts, and no matter the time, I can always hear them running and playing in the trees. This time, it was completely silent. I kept on walking though, and just enjoyed the peace and quiet. Once I exited the pines and entered the first field, I started to get this nagging feeling in the pit of my stomach, like something was watching me. I chalked it up to me being paranoid due to the lack of wildlife and continued on. I wish I would have turned back right then and there, but if I did, well, I wouldn't be posting here now would I? Anyway, I continued on, and the feeling just intensified as I progressed. At this point, I was a good mile and a half in, and it dawned on me, if there was something out here with me, I was screwed. Not a single person knew that I was out here, and I never had cell reception when I was in the area. If a predator was stalking me, I would just be done for. I was kicking myself for not bringing my handgun with me, honestly. We don't have a whole lot of dangerous game here in central Michigan, so I didn't think twice about it when leaving. I was nearing the end of the first field, and before I stepped into the next little section of pines, I decided to take a quick look around, just to satisfy that nagging feeling in the back of my mind. At first, I didn't see anything, but just as I was about to turn back around, something caught my eyes. There was a slight movement back about a hundred yards behind me. What? I whispered as I squinted to get a better look. I wasn't sure, but it looked like a figure half hidden behind a bush. I stared closely, 
and when I saw it shift slightly, my heart leapt into my throat. The figure was definitely humanoid, and it appeared to be staring straight at me. Hello? I foolishly called out, hoping whoever it was would simply identify itself. As soon as I hollered, the figure quickly ducked behind the bush, disappearing from my view. My heart was racing pretty good at this point. A million worst-case scenarios running through my mind. I couldn't help but think it was a serial killer, ready to pounce and stab me, stashing my body in these woods. I turned around, started walking a little faster, trying to distance myself from whoever was out here with me. To my horror, I heard twigs and sticks snapping a little ways behind me as the person started following me. I have a gun, I shouted, trying to scare them into leaving me alone. Looked over my shoulder to see where they were at, and when I did, my heart hammered in my chest. I swear I thought I was going to pass out. The person was now maybe 20 feet behind me, and I could tell it was a woman, only her jaw hung open, as if in complete shock, her eyes extremely wide, staring directly at me. When I first turned around, she was still walking, and the way she moved scared me so bad it sent me into a sprint upon looking at her. I know it sounds kind of funny, but believe me, it wasn't. She was tiptoeing as quiet as she could, in the same way a cartoon character would, trying to be sneaky her legs taking these huge, lanky steps. Everything about the way she looked and moved just sent me these shivers down my spine. Leave me alone, lady, I shouted as I ran as fast as I could. As I ran, I heard her start to laugh hysterically as she chased me. She was no longer trying to be quiet, as I could hear her crashing through the woods. Catching up to me rather quickly, I decided to turn and run off the trail once I rounded a bend where I knew she couldn't see me for a moment. As soon as I stepped off, I quickly hid behind a tree and turned off my headlamp. After a couple seconds, I heard the sound of her heavy, odd footsteps as she got closer and closer. I held my breath and slammed my eyes shut, sending a quick prayer to let her pass. Her horrible laughter echoed through the woods as, thankfully, she ran past me. As soon as her footsteps sounded a little further down the trail, I jumped out from behind the tree and took off running back the way I came. I hadn't got 20 feet when I heard a curdling scream bellow through the woods. I ran faster than I ever had in my life, running on pure adrenaline and the will to live. I just knew if she caught me, I wouldn't make it. The sound of her footsteps once again got louder and louder as she got closer. How could she run so fast? I felt a huge wave of relief as I saw the entrance of the trailhead, maybe a hundred feet. Somehow, I ran even faster as I knew my truck would be right there. I reached into my pockets and fished for my keys. She let out another hideous scream as she got even closer, maybe fifty feet behind me now. I got into my truck and jumped in, putting the keys in the ignition and starting it in record time. I backed up and peeled out of there as fast as I could without losing control. After one final scream of frustration, I looked in my rearview mirror to watch the woods disappear in my rearview mirror. The whole drive home, I kept checking behind me, afraid I'd see her chasing after me, even though I knew it would be impossible at 60 miles an hour. Five minutes later, I pulled into my driveway and jumped out of my truck once parked, running full blast inside. I slammed the door behind me and locked it. I ran around my house, locking every window and door, not feeling safer until I knew I was locked up and safe. I walked upstairs to my bedroom and laid in my bed, catching my breath. After a while, I must have passed out from exhaustion. I woke up to the pitch black room and quiet house. My heart started racing as I remember the lady from the woods, and I jumped up to look out my window. No. I quietly whispered as I looked to my backyard. The lady from the woods was standing in my backyard, slack-jawed and staring right at me. My heart once again pounded so hard I thought I would faint. As soon as she noticed me, she smiled this huge, impossibly wide, ear-to-ear -ear grin. She then shrieked that awful scream again and ran back into the woods. Needless to say, I didn't sleep after that.
So I'll start this off by saying, I love camping. It's my hobby that I do every weekend to clear my mind. But the thing is that I'm not your usual camper. Like, I don't go to spots that everyone knows about. I go to the deepest, most secluded parts of the forest that most people consider not reachable. And I'm usually going alone. This time was not very different than most of my camping trips. I hopped in my old Ford Ranger, which usually had some trouble starting up. Traveled a couple of hours into the pine forest until I reached a very suspicious looking dirt road. The thing is, I like suspicious looking dirt roads. They usually take me to the best camping spots. I got onto it. It was very unkept. Looked like a car hadn't driven on it in the last year. But my old truck didn't have any trouble driving on it. I drove for what seemed like an hour until the road ended on a small clearing. I parked my truck and got out and looked around. I realized I'm in the middle of nowhere, which, oddly enough, was a good thing for me. I got all my gear with me and started walking towards the woods. When I reached the tree line, an odd feeling of uneasiness descended upon me. Like when you're alone in the house and all of a sudden the power to the whole neighborhood cuts off and you feel like something is about to come and rip you to pieces. Or is it just me? Anyway, I thought a little, but ignored it as the unusual forest creepiness. I started walking deep into the forest. And when I say deep, I mean deep. Like walking a couple of hours through fallen trees, big rocks, hills and everything related. Finally, I found a small stream. And by small, I mean like nine feet wide and five feet deep at most. It had a small clearing on the edge, and I decided that this was my home for the next three days. I set up my tent and got a small fire going. By this time, it was 4.30 p.m. and the sun was starting to set, but it was quite dark since the trees covered most of the sunlight anyway. I decided it was the perfect time to sit down, crack a beer, that I left to cool in the river, and relax. By 8 p.m., I was starting to get very sleepy. I gathered all of my stuff, collected all of the trash and leftovers, put them in the bag and hung them on some tree to keep the bears away from my camp. I got in my tent and quickly fell asleep. I had a dream that night. I was at the tree line where I parked my car. I felt that feeling of uneasiness again, but this time it was different. It was stronger. As I was about to start walking into the forest, I heard a strange noise, like a stick breaking from a heavy weight, but hollower. I turned to the source of the sound to see a tall, skinny shadow standing a hundred feet away on the other side of the clearing, just at the tree line behind some bushes, which it was towering by at least 12 feet. Of course, I got scared, turned around and tried to run, but you know how dreams are. My feet just couldn't get any grip on the ground, like some invisible force was holding me back. I turned around to see the shadow was now slowly walking towards me and making a crack with every step. When I saw that, sheer terror descended upon me. I closed my eyes and when I opened them, I was in my tent again, sitting and breathing heavily. Weird, I thought, as I didn't remember waking up. My rationality got the better of me. After all, it was just a dream, right? People sometimes don't remember waking up from terrible dreams. Anyway, it was around 9 a.m. and I proceeded with my daily duties, which consisted of looking around the camp for any trails from wild animals, gather some wood for the night, and checking the trash bag that I hung from the tree. I started by collecting some wood from the surrounding forest, then checked for any trails and didn't find any until I headed for the trash bag. When I got to the tree, it should have been hanging from nothing. And by that I mean absolutely nothing. No bag, no trash. My first thought was bears, but no. As far as I'm aware, bears don't eat cans inside of plastic bags, right? I looked around for signs from any wildlife, but nothing except some weird small holes in the ground they looked like someone took a big sharp stick and stabbed it into the ground. 
The weirder thing is, they were spaced out like footsteps. My first thought was, maybe another camper, but that didn't seem rational. Like who would come this far into the forest, in the middle of the night, just to steal my trash bag? Anyway, I just followed the footsteps. They circled a couple times around my camp, which was creepy enough, but then they headed straight into the river. These footsteps, if you could call them that, didn't resemble the trails of any animal that I know of. I got creeped out, and I didn't want to follow them any further. Some time passed. It was now 2 p.m., and I decided that a short swim in the cold stream wasn't a bad idea. I smelled like sweat anyway. I got my bathing suit on and headed straight toward the river. I jumped in the cold water and immediately felt refreshed and cleansed. I swam around and jumped in the water for a little. Then it hit me. The footsteps. Maybe I should go back and try to follow them again. I got to where they entered the river, checked around for where they should have exited the water, and after about 15 minutes of searching in the cold water, I started to feel quite cold, and right as I was about to head back from my camp, I saw them. There they were, the same weird holes in the ground, on the other side of the riverbed. I got out of the river and started following them again. About 50 feet in, I noticed that the footsteps suddenly come to a complete stop. I look around to find more, but no luck. It's like the person, or I should say, thing, that left them, suddenly disappeared into thin air. I got creeped out, and decided to leave whatever left those weird holes alone. I got back to my camp, dried myself off, ate some canned beans, got a decent fire going, and drank some beer while relaxing around a campfire. By this time, it was around 5 p.m., and the sun had already set, covered by the thick pine forest. Time for relaxation, I thought. Two hours in, and I started feeling sleepy again, until I heard it. The hollow noise of a stick being broken that I heard in my dream last night. Shivers ran down my spine, and a sudden feeling of dread filled my whole body. A bear? I thought. But no. There was no trash bag that could attract him this time, and the sound was coming from the total opposite way from where those footsteps ended. And then, crack, like someone was walking in a big hallway with cheaply made wooden heels that broke with every step. I turned around, and there it was, on the other side of the riverbed, that skinny and tall shadow illuminated by only the moonlight. It was just standing there, observing me. I just stared at it with horror as my mind was racing with thoughts of what it would do. Then it hit me. I always carry a gun on my camping trips. I jumped out of my resting spot, running straight from my tent to get my Winchester bolt-action rifle. As I reached the tent, I unzipped it, opened the little door, and the second I entered, everything got black for a part of a second. It was like when you suddenly stand up and your peripheral vision goes dark. And there I was, laying next to the campfire, which had already stopped burning. I noticed it was starting to get bright outside. I checked my clock and... 7 a.m.? How was that possible? I was just in front of the tent. Did I fall asleep and not notice? Was I that sleepy last night? I had so many thoughts running through my head at that moment. A couple of minutes passed, and I shook it off as another dream. Weird, but very realistic and scary dream. But still just a dream, right? I started going for my daily duties, just like the previous day. I checked wildlife trails, gathered wood, checked the trash bag, and then... What? The trash bag. I didn't leave the trash bag last night, didn't I? But there it was, hanging from the same tree. Was I going crazy, losing my mind, or is there someone that's playing tricks on me? I stood there for a second and thought about it. A sudden blast of courage got over me. I got my gun from my tent, loaded it, and headed to where I saw the creature last night. I crossed the river, looked around for the footsteps. It wasn't hard to find them. They were right where I last saw the creature last night. I followed them. 
pointing my gun at every sound I heard, walking around 10 minutes until I came across another clearing in the middle of the forest. I looked around for more footsteps, but there weren't any, and then it hit me. The last two footsteps were a bit deeper than the previous ones. That means, the creature didn't vanish, it jumped. I immediately looked up in the trees above me. Nothing. I looked around the clearing. Still nothing. Then I checked to the top of the trees, and there it was. On the other side of the clearing, right in front of me, some 250 feet away. It was standing there, at the very top of one of the pine trees, staring at me, observing. I pointed my gun at the side of it, then squeezed the trigger, and right as my gun fired, the thing, it just jumped off the top of the tree, before the bullet could even hit it. Then another tree, and another, still making that stupid cracking sound with every jump. It was getting closer to me, and then, I just ran, straight to my camp. When I was in front of my tent, I couldn't hear the cracking anymore, but still, pure fear was all over me. I grabbed the most important things from my camp, like my phone, wallet, and some more ammo for the gun, in case I needed it later. I then ran straight for my car, but deep inside me, I knew that my car was at least a three hour walk from my camp, but that didn't stop me. I ran as fast as I could, and as far as I could. Of course, my body couldn't keep up with all of that running, but my mind was stronger. When I couldn't run, I sped walked. I just, I couldn't stop moving. I was so scared, even when I hadn't heard a sound in over an hour, which was kind of eerie on its own, but I didn't care. I just had to move as fast as I could. About three fourths of the whole distance, I just couldn't run or even walk for that matter. I needed to rest, even if my mind didn't want to. My body couldn't keep up with it. I stopped behind a fallen tree and sat down for a second. I was sitting there for no more than three minutes. Then I heard it, that cracking sound. I was filled with terror and immediately started running again, even if my body wasn't ready for it. Finally, after what felt like days of running, I saw the clearing where my car was parked in the distance. I felt relieved, but not for long. As I got closer to the car, I heard the cracking sound again. This time it was very close. I really thought this was the end for me. That thing, whatever it was, was about to get me. And just as I accepted my fate, I slammed into my car's door. I was so buried in thoughts that I didn't even realize I was right in front of my car. Immediately, I unlocked my car and entered it. I tried to breathe for a second, but immediately got shoved back to reality. That thing was still cracking its way towards me. I put my keys into the ignition, then turned them, and nothing, not even a click. Battery, it used to disconnect very easily on bumpy roads, but that meant I had to get back out there, open the hood, and connect the battery. After a minute, I had barely gathered the courage, but I pulled the knob, got out, and opened the door, fidgeted around with the battery, and finally got it connected. I ran straight back to the car, locked all of the doors, and tried to start it again. I turned the key. This time, the starter rotated, but the car didn't start. I tried it again, and still the same. Just when I was about to lose all hope, I turned the key a third time, and bam, the old truck started right up. I peeled out of there all the hours back to my house, while still hearing those cracking noises echoing through my mind, never to be forgotten. Since then, I hadn't gotten that far into the woods, and certainly don't go camping alone. Was that thing trying to make me go mad by moving the trash bag, appearing right in front of me and making it seem like I dreamt it, so it can take me easily? Those are the questions that will probably never get an answer. No one believes me. I don't even know if I believe myself anymore. Maybe I'm just really going crazy. If you have any idea what this thing was, please inform me. And remember, never go too far out into the woods, especially alone.
I think every town has urban legends that float around. Although, even as a kid, I never believed them. I always saw them as just silly stories that locals had made up to scare the children. The stories of the creatures at Needlepoint Creek seemed ludicrous to me. I learned later on that I was horribly mistaken. Needlepoint Creek is located deep in the woods of Indiana. In fact, it wasn't too far from my childhood home. I lived on the edge of town, right about where the woods began. My friends and I would always play in the woods, building forts and climbing trees. We would never go far enough to reach the creek, though. My mother was never the overprotective type, but she forbid that I go deep into the woods with my friends. It's not safe, she said. I remember always asking why, but she would never tell me. My father once told me the stories about Needlepoint Creek. Creatures dark as night, with claws sharp as knives, wreak havoc upon lost souls near Needlepoint Creek. Don't ever go there, you understand? He would always tell me. I never believed him. I thought he was only trying to reinforce Mom's rule. As we got older, my friends and I got more and more curious about what the deep woods actually contained. It was the summer of senior year. I was sitting in my room with my friends when Ricky brought up the idea that we travel deep into the woods and camp for one night near the creek. Are you crazy? Ben asked. Our parents warned us never to go there. You just want to have a sleep over there? Like it's no big deal? Oh, come on, Ben. I blurted out. This could be our last summer here. Don't you want to find out if the rumors are true? Besides, maybe you'll finally find a girlfriend there. I teased. Haha, you're so funny, he shot back. Fine, but for one night only, and you have to do my homework for a week. Deal. I smirked and shook his hand. June 15th, around 3 p.m., we set off into the woods, armed only with camping gear and determination. At about two miles in, the trail ended abruptly into thick brush and woodland. Looks like we're going to have to rough it from here, Ricky said. Let's do this, I said, determined. It was hard to maneuver over the uneven ground covered with decaying leaves and tree roots. We reached a river that had been dried out long ago, leaving a deep hole in its path that extended for miles. I spotted a fallen tree that fit perfectly over the edge. Not to worry, boys. I think I just found our way across. Ricky made it across just fine. Come on, guys. It's not so bad. Ben began to panic. No, guys, I don't have good balance. I don't think I should. Listen, man, the log is wide enough. If you're careful, you won't even have to worry. You can do this, okay? I reassured him. Okay, he hesitated. He began to cross nervously. He reached about halfway, and then I watched in horror as his body shifted in a way that looked like he was being pushed by an invisible force. He lost his footing and fell into the ravine. His body hit the rocky ground below with a sharp thud. I screamed, Ben, are you okay? I found a way to lower myself to the bottom. When I reached him, his body was curled into a ball and he was holding his leg and crying. I just broke my leg, he choked. Ricky muttered, we have to go back. How do you suppose we do that? I questioned. Ben can't exactly walk at the moment, and we can't just leave him here. Okay, maybe we could carry him. You know, like on our backs or something, Ricky said, panicked. Okay, but how would we even get him out of this ravine? I have a rope in my bag, Ben groaned. You could tie it around my waist and pull me out that way. The process of getting Ben out of there was excruciating. Ricky and I tied a makeshift harness around his body. Ricky climbed up the rock wall and began pulling up the rope. I stayed behind to guide him. I told you we shouldn't have done this. Ben cried out in pain as his limb hit the rock wall. I'm sorry, Ben. I promise, but we're going to get you out of this. I felt awful. Once we got Ben to the surface, Ricky and I threw each of his arms over our shoulders. With the inevitable darkness of night looming over us, we began heading to the direction we came from. Ben yelped in pain with every step. 
We walked about a mile and then came across a stretch of bushes. I'll go see what's on the other side before we drag Ben through there, Ricky said. He disappeared into the bushes for a moment. It went silent. Ricky? I called out. No response. Come on, man, this isn't fun. You guys aren't going to believe this, he said as he appeared from the bushes. What are you talking about? We must have circled back around or something, he said. What do you mean? I asked, alarmed. I don't know. We're back at the ravine. That's impossible. We went straight through, I almost shouted. If you don't believe me, you can take a look for yourself. I pushed through the bushes, and sure enough, we were back at the ravine. Suddenly, everything was quiet. Hey guys, are you back there? No response. Guys. Suddenly, I heard giggling, but there was something off about it. It almost didn't sound human. Ben, Ricky, is that you? The laughing turned to a low growl. I ran back through the other side. Why do you look so scared? Ben asked. Yeah, why do you look so scared, Isaac? Ricky smirked. I don't know. I guess there's an animal back there or something. I think you're just imagining things. I didn't hear anything, Ricky said as he stared past me. We headed through the brush, yet again, trying to find our way out. About a half a mile later, we came into the same patch of bushes. Okay, I know for sure we didn't circle around. This isn't possible, Ben yelled. I don't know what's happening. I began to panic. Ricky said something. Stay here. I'm going to find a way out of here, I told them. I ran through the woodland, trying not to trip. I found myself back in front of the bushes. What? I shouted. I ran in a different direction. Back at the bushes. I ran again and again and found myself in those same bushes each time. Guys, I think we're somehow stuck in a loop. I tried to catch my breath. That's not possible, Ben said in disbelief. I don't know, okay? All I know is I tried every direction, and every direction led me back here. I don't know what's going on, but for right now, there's no way out. I tried to come to terms with it, as the words left my mouth. What are we going to do? He cried. I don't know, but for right now, our best bet is to try to stay calm and set up camp while we figure this out. Ricky and I set up the tent that we brought with us. I built a fire then tried my best to stabilize Ben's wound with a first aid kit that I had taken from my parents' closet. Hey Isaac, Ben said as I was wrapping his legs in gauze. Yeah? What if our parents were right? He said. What do you mean? I asked. About the creatures. What if that's what's happening right now? That's not possible. Those are just silly kid stories. I tried to reassure him. But I had a feeling in the pit of my gut that I was wrong. Night fell over us in a blanket of darkness. We all sat around a fire to keep warm. Ricky stared off into the darkness. We should just accept it, he said in a trance-like state. Um, accept what? I said, concerned. We're never getting out of here. They're coming for us. They're going to take us, and we should accept it. Who's they? I asked, frightened. Them, he replied as he pointed into the darkness. You know something, Isaac? He continued, reaching into his bag. What are you talking about? I said, on edge. The creatures really aren't that bad, in fact. He said calmly as he began to pull a fishing knife out of his bag. Ricky, what are you doing with that? I panicked. I think we should embrace them. He laughed and I watched in shock as he lurched forward and got Ben in the stomach. I heard Ben scream. No, I screamed. The next few seconds passed by in slow motion. I ran toward him and tried to tackle him. With almost inhuman strength, Ricky threw me into a tree. I felt my skull hit the base of the tree and everything went black. I woke up slumped against the tree. My eyes fluttered open as I saw Ricky crying next to Ben's body. What have I done? He sobbed. They made me do this, he screamed. Who made you do what? 
I choked. The creatures. I never wanted to hurt anyone, but they made me. His face was smeared with blood. I tried to sit up. It's okay. We can fix this. I tried to calm him. No, we can't. Ben is gone. They made me kill him. And now, he stood up. They're going to make me get you, too. He cried as he headed towards me. Ricky, we can talk through this. I'm your friend, I pleaded. I'm sorry, Isaac. He sobbed as he raised the blade above me. In a split second, I saw a large, black, mist-like creature swoop over Ricky. With claws sharp as knives, the creature tore at Ricky. The creature took one final swoop. I began screaming, and he was gone. I vomited and began sobbing. I heard the creature let out a shrill screech as it disappeared into the darkness of the night. Take me too, I cried, not wanting to live with what I just witnessed. Eventually, I decided to try to walk back home. The way back was difficult because of my concussion, but I was no longer stuck in a loop. I reached my house. My mother screamed when she saw that I was covered in blood. She cried as she held me. You went into the woods, didn't you? I just stared at the wall, in shock, trying to process everything. No one except for my mother believes me about the horrors of that day. I write this from prison. I'm being held on two counts of first degree murder. I don't know why the creature decided to let me live. It would have been kinder to take me too. I guess I'll never know. I'm an innocent man. You, dear reader, may not believe me, or maybe you do, whatever you choose to believe. I ask that you please beware the creatures of Needlepoint Creek. When I was a young kid, around the age of my earliest memories, so probably four or five, I had trouble sleeping. I don't have a great memory about most things, but I remember my sleep troubles probably better than anything else I do from that age. I was an only child, I'm adopted, and I lived in a small, older home with my parents. Living room, tiny kitchen, two small bedrooms, and one bathroom to share. Not exactly a mansion, but one of the upsides for a little kid of not being well off is that it meant my parents were never more than 10 feet away in our tiny little house. One of my first memories is running into my parents' room and telling them about the faces I saw while I was laying in bed. I still remember cuddling up with my favorite stuffed animal, a Care Bear of all things, for what felt like hours every night trying and failing to go to sleep. I would just stare up at the ceiling, and while I did, it was like a parade of faces would slide in and out of my vision. The faces were a mix of contorted but normal people, and the typical scary things a kid might see in movies. Vampires, werewolves, creepy old women. They would just start at the top of my field of vision and go sliding to the bottom, sort of like a weird 3D movie without the funny glasses. Obviously, this was terrifying to a little kid. Most of the time, I would hide under the blankets and hope to eventually fall asleep. But some nights were harder than the rest. The night I went running into their room, clutching my Care Bear, the first time I really fought the fear, I tried to desperately explain to them what was happening. Of course, they told me I was having a bad dream and that I would be fine, and they tucked me back in my bed and my mom sat with me for a little while. I slept with the TV static on that night, and before long, that was the only way I could go to bed at night. But even as a little kid, I knew I wasn't dreaming, I hadn't been asleep, and I hadn't woken up. It was happening to me while I was awake, and it continued. Sometimes better, or sometimes worse, for months, or even years. I'm 31 now, with a family of my own. Looking back, I know I was going through night terrors, and probably sleep paralysis. I'm a very critical, science-driven person, and I'm not particularly religious. I don't think it was anything more than that, and I know my parents did the best they could. They probably have never even heard of the term night terrors or sleep paralysis. 
It got somewhat better with time, but I will never be able to forget how it felt. It feels, I should say. I've struggled with them on and off in my adult life, and unfortunately, it's become more and more common over the last few years. It's really hard to explain the differences between a night terror and a normal nightmare if you haven't experienced it. But you know how nightmares can be scary, and then you wake up and need a few seconds to settle yourself? I've had plenty of nightmares. Frankly, they don't bother me that much, and I feel fine as soon as I wake up from them. But night terrors are completely different. I would wake up screaming, but not at anything in particular. My body was completely pumped full of adrenaline, the fight or flight mode engaged in the only way that it could be when your body knows you're facing imminent danger. But the worst part is what it does to your mind. There's no rational thought for a solid minute or two upon waking up. I wish I was better with the words to describe it, but it's pure terror. I can't reason myself out of it. I can't take deep breaths to calm down. I can't do anything but grasp and try to slowly stop the screaming or the whimpering it turns into after a few seconds. My muscles on fire like I've just finished a marathon. Anyway, I would suggest never having night terrors. For better or worse, I've gotten as used to it as possible. Like I said, I struggled with it a lot as a kid, but it's becoming much more rare as an adult. Until the last few years, when it's become a little more frequent, I would only have one or two episodes a year. I'm sorry if I'm giving too many details, but I feel like it's important context to understand the reason why I'm posting this here. I don't remember exactly when it started, but my trouble when I was a kid didn't stop when I would finally fall asleep. I don't usually remember my dreams or even my nightmares after a few minutes, but there's one or two dreams I'll never forget, much as I wish I could or try to convince myself I have. Because I had the same nightmare almost every single night for months, it always began the exact same way. I'd be sitting on the back porch of our little house. Like I said, the house was tiny, one of many small, some run down, houses in the neighborhood. Our back door had three wood steps leading down into the yard. Turned to the left, and a few feet away was the side of a house where my parents kept the trash cans, and where you could turn and walk back toward the front gate. To the right from the door was the driveway that came into the backyard and the outside garage. And if you looked straight out from the porch, there was maybe 10 feet of backyard. Then a chain link fence with a gate that ran from my neighbor's wooden fence on one side to the edge of the garage on the other, gating off the rest of the yard that went 50 feet or so back. This is where I would begin my dream, the only dream that ever mattered every single time. I'd be on the back porch and it was 12.03, Dark, but with enough pale light to see the gray shape of my yard around me, almost like the light of the moon I never saw. I'll never know how I knew, or if it took many iterations of the dream for me to learn. But what I remember now is that I knew that at 12.07, they would come for me. As a kid, I always thought of them as werewolves, but I know that I never actually saw them nor do I even remember them having a defined form from what I can recall. They would come from the left side of the house, and they would grab me. It felt like my entire body would be grabbed at once, and I would wake up screaming, sweating, and crying for my mom. Normal night terror stuff, right? I always tried to rationalize it that way, at least. But like I said, this wasn't like any other nightmare, because every few nights, the dream would begin again. The back porch, 1203, screen door locked behind me, the trash cans to the side of the house, the driveway where during the day I'd shoot hockey pucks at the garage door, and the red curtain. It's the red curtain that made all the difference in the world. Remember I said there was a fence that blocked off half of the backyard? In the dream, that fence was gone. In its place was a bright red curtain the kind you'd find on stage or at a movie theater. 
The world around me shines silvery in a pale light of the moon. I now realize I never looked up to find, but the curtain was bright red. It had a slight part at the top, a few feet to my left if I was looking out from the porch. Through the few feet of open space at the top, but not at the bottom, I could see what looked like daylight and the branches of the tree we had behind where the fence slash curtain stood. Staring at dark, scary images was my nightly ritual, followed by waking up on the back porch. That sliver of daylight felt familiar. It felt like home. I desperately wanted to reach it, but I never could. Because when I walked to that curtain to try to find the seam that went to that part at the top, it didn't exist. Or maybe it did, and I just never found it. Instead, I would pull on the curtain and try to open it at the split. It would just keep billowing out. I'd pull and pull, and there was always more red curtain. It would eventually envelop me. In a panic, trying to reach that sliver of daylight that felt like home. I would always fail, and then they would be there. Grabbing me and sending me back to my bed, screaming, clutching my bear. Reoccurring dreams are a known phenomenon, and if every night I woke up fighting the curtain, I could rationalize this a lot better as an adult, but I didn't have the same dream every night. I mean, I did. The porch, the light, the curtain, but it never felt the same, because every night when I'd go back, that sliver of light at the top of the curtain would just be a little narrower, a little more unreachable, and eventually, I knew where I was. I don't know that I ever recognized I was in a dream. After all, I could have chosen to fly or whatever, had I been truly lucid. But I always knew I was back in the same place, at the same time, and I knew what would happen to me. I tried a hundred different ways to go through the red curtain. I tried climbing it. I tried going at it from the other side. I tried going around only to find myself thoroughly blocked by a wall of a fence on my left and the garage on my right. And every time I failed, that sliver of hope at the top would grow smaller, inch by inch. I couldn't tell you how long this lasted. For all I know, it was a couple of months or a few dozen times, becoming aware of myself on the porch at 12.03. Or it could have been years. The dreams were more spaced out, like I said. I don't have a great memory of when I was that young, but I remember when the dreams finally stopped. I don't remember how many times I tried that curtain, but I know it wasn't every time I entered that dream. Other times I would try to escape in a different direction, or even out the side where they came from. Nothing ever worked, and they all ended up the same way, with the sensation of being squeezed from all around and waking up in my bed in terror. I wish I had some heroic story of how I made it end, of how I stood up to the fear and declared it had no power of me. That's what always worked in the movies, but that's not what happened. Instead, I hid. Of course, I had tried before by cowering under the boards of the porch, where by day I would dig up worms, and by night I would hunker down wishing I could live under the dirt the way they did. But hiding there never worked. 12.07 would come. I'd hear footsteps coming from the side of the house, and a few seconds later, it would be over. It ended the night I threw myself into the trash can. I don't know if it was a coincidence, me finding something to overcome the mental hurdle or something else, but I threw myself into the metal trash can and covered myself with all of the boxes inside. I remember staring up at the now tiny sliver of light at the top of the curtain as I pulled the lid over my head, and I remember the footsteps passing me by for the first time ever. I never had that dream again after that night, not once in my life. Most of the time I can pretend it never happened, and avoid the chill I have now from recalling all of it again. But as I said, earlier tonight it all came rushing back. I had a normal night with my family, and I tucked my son to sleep at 7.30, as usual. Unfortunately, night terrors seem to have a genetic component to them, and my son may have inherited something I never wanted to give to him. He's almost four now, 
and has had a hard time sleeping his entire life. He wakes up at night in a sweat, screaming. When he was younger, he could never articulate what it was that scared him, and we chalked it up to nightmares, or possibly even night terrors. When my son was old enough to talk, he would say he doesn't like to sleep because it's scary, which is what he always says to try to get out of doing something he doesn't want to do. Anyway, we brought this up to the doctor, who said there aren't really any answers to what causes night terrors, nor are there really any treatments. So when my son woke up crying tonight, a few hours after going to sleep, as he does on way too many nights, I went in to soothe him back to sleep, feeling guilty as always, that it's probably due to me in some way he inherited this, but tonight was different. As I set him down, he said something that chilled me to the bone and brought back a wave of memories I wish I didn't have. Dad, I'm scared of the red curtain. Sometimes, when I've had a really rough day and I'm having troubles relaxing, I go for a drive to clear my mind. There's something about driving down the back gravel roads that soothes me. I admit, it can be a little creepy at times. It can be spooky driving in the middle of nowhere, only able to see as far as your headlights allow. The trees hiding whatever could be lurking just beyond your line of vision. What's even scarier is hearing something in the car with you when you know you're alone. Last night, I was looking for a way to calm down after working a stressful 12-hour shift. I got home around 7.30 p.m., made and ate some dinner, then watched TV in bed trying to get some sleep to do it all over again the next day. I tried to sleep for over four hours, tossing and turning, unable to sleep. Sometime past midnight, frustrated, I got out of bed and grabbed my car keys. I stormed out the front door and hopped in my beat-up jeep, speeding out of the driveway. I was angrily muttering to myself about how I can't just roll over and sleep like a normal person. After ten minutes of driving, I found myself down one of my go-to back roads. It's more of a two-track, surrounded by dense pine trees. I like this road because it's spooky. The trees are dense. You can't see 10 feet into the woods, letting my imagination run wild. I had to slow down to around 25 miles an hour to safely navigate without hitting anything. I turned the radio all the way down, turning my full attention to the thin road in front of me. Just as I started to get that eerie feeling, my car radio blared as loud as it could. A talk radio station had somehow popped on, even though I was listening to 80s rock before. I jumped, scrambling to turn the volume down. Before my hand found the volume knob, the radio cut out completely. I scrunched my eyebrows in confusion, looking at the radio as if it had a mind of its own. All of the sudden, a wave of dread hit me like a ton of bricks. The hair on my arms and neck stood on end my heart beginning to race uncontrollably. It got so quiet I could hear my heartbeat thumping in my ears. After a few seconds of that eerie silence, I started hearing something behind me, in the back seat. It sounded like someone was pushing down into the back seat, like suddenly a lot of weight pushed it down. A loud pop made me jump a little, grabbing the steering wheel so tightly my knuckles hurt. I started to feel a presence like someone or something was in the car with me. I could feel it get closer, like it was leaning in to whisper something in my ear. I noticed movement in my rearview mirror as well. Something was definitely in my back seat. A deep breath exhaled, blowing its breath right in my ear. I was completely paralyzed in fear, not knowing how to react. I was still driving down the road, but maybe at five miles an hour. I was too afraid to turn around and see what was behind me. I had this gut feeling that if I turned around, something bad would happen. Hello. A muffled voice called in my ear. Its voice sent shivers down my spine. It sounded like an old woman, if she were trying to speak while covering her mouth. 
It started to breathe deep, raspy breaths in my ear, as if it was out of breath and struggling to breathe. Its breath smelt like rotting eggs, making me almost gag. Every now and then, I could see movement in my rearview mirror as it shifted around. Look at me, please. The muffled voice said after a few seconds of breathing down my neck. I ignored it, kept my eyes straight forward. Finally, I could see the driveway about 20 feet ahead to my left. Once I got to it, I pulled in and turned the car around as calmly as I could. Look at me, it growled. My muscles tensed as it spoke. It was even scarier sounding when angry. I managed not to jerk the steering wheel and successfully turned around. I noticed I was driving a little too quickly for the road I was on, but I couldn't help it. I wanted to get back to the main road where there were other people, if I was lucky enough to make it that far. I felt pressure on my shoulder as it must have grabbed me. Its fingers felt incredibly bony and shaky. I stayed driving straight and tried not to let it affect me. There was now jerky movements that I could see in the reflection of the mirror, like it was having a seizure or something. The fingers dug into my shoulder, making me wince in pain. Look at me. It growled in my ear again, taking deep breaths in between each word. I noticed my foot consistently pressing the gas pedal harder. I glanced at the speedometer and saw now I was going 50 miles an hour, speeding as I went around turns. I have never wanted out of the backwoods so badly in my life. Somehow, I was able to keep the car in control, avoiding the trees that were just feet from my front end. At one point, my tail end clipped a tree as I slid. I kept driving as fast as I could. Its fingers were digging so hard in my shoulder that it was getting harder to make the turns. Up ahead, I saw the stop sign and I almost cried out in joy. The same cracking noise from earlier rang through the car. I could hear the pressure of my back seat leave, as well as the heavy feeling of dread that hung in the air. I didn't even notice I was holding my breath until then, taking a huge breath as I blew through the stop sign. I noticed a tear was rolling down my cheek as well. I could tell by the atmosphere in the air that whatever was in my back seat was now gone. I sped the whole way home not stopping at any stop signs on the way. I'd never felt so much relief in my life as I did in that moment I pulled in my driveway. I slammed the shifter in park and bolted inside, panting heavily. I checked the doors and windows twice before retreating to my room, making sure the whole house was locked up. Needless to say, I didn't get much sleep after that. I sat wondering what that was all night. The next day was a long, horrible 12-hour shift. I was more than thrilled when 7.30 came and I could clock out. I knew I'd struggle sleeping again, but one thing is for sure, I won't be taking a nighttime drive to help me relax. I don't know what that was, but I pray I never encounter it again. I live in the western suburbs of Boston. I realize I'm not exactly in the middle of nowhere, but sometimes it sort of feels like I am. My street is even located between two relatively major roads. However, there's also a lot of farmland in the area, and it's a pretty wooded area too. In fact, my backyard is right on the edge of the woods. There's some trails back there that I've explored, as well as a few other trails nearby. There's a few stone walls and old direction markers back there, but other than that, not a whole lot. Due to the fact that I basically live in the woods, I see a lot of animals in my neighborhood. Aside from the standard squirrels, chipmunks, and birds, I tend to see a lot of rabbits, deer, wild turkey, raccoons, and a few possums, and even the occasional fox. However, I've started seeing coyotes in the area and I'm worried that there might be more to them than they appear. On the other side of the woods from me, there's a house. It's not part of my neighborhood, and I actually think it's another town since I'm right on the line. During the fall and winter, when the leaves are down, it's very easy to see through the woods to that house, 
and I notice they tend to keep weird and inconsistent hours. Sometimes the house has every light off as soon as the sun goes down, and sometimes they're up until about 3 a.m. Sometimes I'm just getting up in the morning, someone is leaving for work, and sometimes there's no sign of any movement from there in the mornings. They also have a light on their roof that I later found out is one of those old chicken-shaped weather vanes that for some reason lights up at night. Nothing too unusual about that, except sometimes I see it flashing on and off all night, and sometimes multiple nights in a row. I've never actually spoken to any of the people that live there, and I barely even speak to anyone in my own neighborhood. However, one person who I have spoken to a bit is my next door neighbor, Roger. He's an elderly man, probably in his 70s, and I think he's a widower. He has too much time on his hands, as I often see him doing lots of yard work, even though the neighborhood has a service that does that for us. He's also known to take on projects in other people's yards as well, and do work in communal areas. This includes simple stuff, like taking people's trash cans to the curb, to their garage after the trash pickup has occurred, to larger stuff, such as trimming tree branches. I've joked that he's the unofficial caretaker of the neighborhood. I don't really talk to Roger often, but one time he told me that the people who live in the house on the other side of the woods are Native American. For some reason, I thought that might explain some stuff I've seen in the woods. See, I neglect to mention this before, but there's this crudely made teepee out of branches right off the trail. It's not really big enough for anyone to go into, but it's kind of cool. I have no idea who built it, but it's been back there for at least five years I've lived here. There's some rocks in front of it in a fire pit style, but they seem to change position sometimes. And I've also seen what looked like beer cans from the 1970s in the vicinity. I wonder if that's when the TP was built. I'm not saying the Native Americans that live in the house are definitely behind the TP, but it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibilities. Some of the old trail stone markers have what could be Native American drawings on them too, but again, anyone could have done that. I don't know whether the Native Americans are responsible for the stuff in the woods or not, but I think they might have something to do with the increased presence of coyotes. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there's a thing called a skinwalker in Native American folklore, in case anyone isn't familiar with them. Supposedly, certain Native Americans can take on the form of an animal by wearing the pelt of their fur. I've typically seen them portrayed as taking the form of wolves or coyotes, but I'm not sure if they're able to take on the form of other mammals too. When I first saw the coyotes, I didn't immediately make the connection. It was late August and I was driving home one evening, just as the sun was starting to set. As I rounded the corner towards my street, I saw what were two coyotes walking down the road. They definitely weren't foxes, and I'm pretty sure wolves don't live around here. So they must have been coyotes. I had never seen a coyote around my house in the five years I've lived here, but I've always suspected they were around. I used to live a few towns over, and I'd occasionally see one there, and more often than not, I'd hear them howling. I actually thought it was kind of cool at first, as I love seeing animals. A few nights later, I was chilling on my back patio when I heard rustling coming from the woods. This wouldn't be the first time an animal in the woods scared me at night time. One time I was in my backyard in October, no doubt having just watched a slasher movie, when I heard what sounded like heavy footsteps in the woods. It ended up just being a deer, but as you can imagine, the whole thing was a bit freaky, if only for a little while. This time though, it was a coyote that walked out of the woods. I have no idea if it was one of the ones I had seen earlier in the day or a different one, but it walked towards my patio and just stood there for a second. I tried to take a picture, but all of a sudden it ran off back into the woods. As I went back inside, I noticed an outline of Roger standing at his back door. I wondered if he was watching the coyote too. I didn't realize this until later but the outdoor lights of the Native American house had been on the whole time. It was at this point that I made the connection between the coyote and the Native Americans, and I started talking to my friend about the possibility of skinwalkers being in the area. Of course, my friend didn't really take me very seriously. 
and frankly, I wasn't sure if I took myself seriously. We both like to entertain the possibility of certain aspects of paranormal, including the existence of cryptozoology creatures, like skinwalkers, and related creatures such as flesh gates or the goat man, but lack any concrete evidence. The next day, I saw Roger working in his garden, and I asked him if he had ever seen coyotes in the area. He said not for several years, but he was noticing them coming back. He also warned me to be careful if I saw them, and not to get too close as they're prone to attacking. He seemed almost worried as he told me this. That night, I was back on my patio when I started to hear rustling from the woods again. The sounds were coming from various spots in the woods, but I wasn't able to see anything. I then started to hear howling, some sort of noise that sounded like it was very close to me, while others sounded further away. I noticed every single light on at the Native American house on the other side of the woods too, and was wondering if they were behind this after all. Suddenly, I heard what sounded like a loud bang, almost like a gunshot, and the howling stopped, followed by every single light at the house going off at once. I sat there for a few seconds when I noticed Roger standing in his backyard. Get back inside, he told me. What's going on? I asked him. Get back inside, he repeated, offering no explanation. I gathered my things and went back in. I watched out the window for a while and saw Roger standing at the edge of the woods. I realized that he was staring down a coyote. After what felt like hours, but was probably only a few minutes, the coyote turned around and left. Roger stayed there a while longer before going back inside his house. The next day, I tried to get answers, but Roger wouldn't acknowledge what had happened. Several weeks had passed, and I hadn't seen any coyotes or any other odd things going on. By this point, it was early October, and the events in that night in August had become a distant memory. I was coming home from work one evening when I saw Roger out in his garden, like I often did. I waved hello to him, and noticed him waving me over. I won't be able to take care of this neighborhood much longer, he told me. I didn't understand what Roger meant, but he went on to explain that he was planning on moving closer to his children and he just didn't have the strength to take care of the neighborhood anymore. I told him that he could always take it easy, and he didn't have to always be out and doing stuff on the street. But he said that's not what he meant. Roger stuck around for the rest of the fall, but one day in early December, he was gone. I didn't even see any moving trucks. It was as if he had just packed up and left overnight. I did, however, find a note he left taped to my door. The note read, I'm sorry for leaving so abruptly, but it's time for me to go now. I felt myself getting weaker this past summer, and I can't stay here much longer. If you see a coyote, don't engage it. If you can, get indoors immediately. Otherwise, remain perfectly still until it has walked away. Good luck. I thought back to the night in August when the coyotes were coming out of the woods and Roger seemingly scared them off. I know I had always joked about Roger being the unofficial caretaker of the neighborhood, but what if he was actually responsible for protecting it? What if the Native Americans that live in the house on the other side of the woods have some connection to the skinwalkers? Or are skinwalkers themselves? They seem to have some sort of ancient connection to the woods. What if they have the same sort of connection to the land beyond the woods that is my street? What if Roger's physical presence was able to keep the skinwalkers out of the neighborhood? He mentioned he hadn't seen the coyotes in the area in years, and seemed worried when he told me about them showing up again. It was almost as if his power to keep the skinwalkers away was somehow weakening, which is why they were able to show up in the area again. I know he was still able to keep them away that night in August, but the fact that they were able to get so close was a bad sign. That must have been what he meant when he said he didn't have enough strength to take care of the neighborhood anymore and that he's getting weaker. Maybe he knew that he'd soon be powerless to stop the skinwalkers and left for his own safety. I've been tossing this theory around for over a month now, but this is the first time I had written it down and read it back to myself. I know it sounds really weird, but the more I think about it, the more I believe it. As much as I like to entertain the existence of the paranormal, I do tend to look for logical explanations for everything. But for this, 
I have none. The coyotes are getting closer, too. I hadn't seen any for a few weeks since Roger left, but on January 10th, it was a full moon. They call that one the wolf moon, because supposedly, wolves tend to howl more at the moon that time of year than others. I didn't hear any wolves, but I heard something howling that night, and it sent shivers down my spine. This past Tuesday, I was driving home from work when I saw a coyote cross the road on the street right before mine. It seemed to be looking directly at me as it walked by. On Friday night, I was coming home from work when I saw a coyote standing right in my driveway. I honked my horn and flashed my lights at it, but it just stood there, staring right at me and growling. There was no way I was getting out of my car and I sat there for about 10 minutes and even contemplated driving away. But eventually, the coyote walked off. Then last night, it was snowing a bit. I turned on the light in my backyard to see how much snow had fallen and how heavy it was snowing when I saw a coyote standing in my backyard. I was able to see the outdoor lights were on at the Native American's house and their weather vane was blinking like crazy again. I quickly turned off the lights and closed the shades. I took a look in my backyard this morning and saw there were paw prints in the snow leading towards the woods. The prints, however, stopped just in front of the entrance of the woods, and sets of human-looking footprints appeared ahead of them. I didn't dare follow them. With Roger, the neighborhood guardian, no longer living here, it seemed like there's nothing that will keep the skinwalkers out. I don't know what will happen, but it's dark out and I hear howling coming from the woods again. I want to start this off by stating that I'm a 25-year-old female, and I don't really consider myself to be an expert camper, if that's even a proper term. I'm somewhat of a novice, at least when compared to my boyfriend, who's been on countless of outings all over the country since he was a teen. I would never make it on my own, while he would probably find a way to send a smoke signal even on a rainy day. I think that should paint a clear enough picture of where we both stand on the subject. But if there's one thing we share in common, it's the fact that we've read and heard about all kinds of strange, creepy, and downright unexplainable things happening in remote locations. Of course, when it comes to the internet, you'll just have to take it all with a grain of salt. But even when it comes to some fellow campers that we've met on the road, you just never know. Sure, they don't really have a reason to lie, but then again, what's the harm? They tell some random nobodies a weird story that they came up with just for kicks. And in the process, they might even get them to scare themselves later on by overthinking it. Like I said, I'm not an experienced camper, but I'm no stranger to it either. Anyone that's ever gone camping will likely tell you that it's only natural to hear something weird every now and then. But hey, that's just nature for you. You eventually get over it, as my boyfriend said, but I'm pretty sure there's no getting over what happened to us. It happened on the second night of what was supposed to be a four-day trip. The first thing I recall is suddenly waking up in the middle of the night with the weirdest sensation, almost as if I hadn't been sleeping at all before that, which is just weird to me. I heard some noise right outside our tent, and upon realizing my boyfriend wasn't next to me, I quickly came to the conclusion that the leaking sound outside was, well, him taking a leak. No big mystery there. No reason to freak out. He had gotten up to take a leak, and likely tried his best to make as little noise as possible, but because I have yet to get used to this sort of environment, I guess I can't help waking up due to the slightest thing, whether it's a sound, an itch, or whatever. It wasn't his fault, I thought, just as I was about to roll over and go back to sleep, but I couldn't roll over. I couldn't move. It didn't make sense to me which was a good enough reason for me to start freaking out, if only fear hadn't gotten to me first. Just as soon as the words sleep paralysis popped in my head, I realized what was really going on. It's not that I couldn't literally move because my body wasn't responding, because I could tell that it was with what little sensation I had left before the chills took over. 
but rather something was keeping me in place with the strangest but firmest grip. I could clearly feel the pressure-like sensation mostly on my arms, wrist and shoulders, and legs, occurring almost instantly whenever I tried to shift my position in any way I could and prevented me from doing so. Just as I was about to call out to my boyfriend, however, a pressure manifested itself right in the back of my neck, almost as if a weight had been dropped on it. What's more, another familiar yet eerily distinct sensation appeared to cover my mouth. It felt cold, bony, and dry, like a branch or something like that. But even in that near darkness, my boyfriend had lit up a small lamp outside. I could see that there wasn't anything on me, and yet I couldn't bring myself to utter a single word. I could barely make a sound in my desperate state, and the more I tried to fend off this invisible force, the harder its grasp got. I did whatever I could, but it wasn't until I heard the voice that I stopped completely, out of fear more than anything else. Thank you, it said, almost like a raspy whisper traveling along with the night breeze. My eyes quickly shifted to where my boyfriend was, right outside the tent. It couldn't have been him. I knew it couldn't have been him. The voice didn't belong to him, but whose could it be? Even in my current state, I was able to tell there wasn't anyone else inside the tent with me, but all signs seemed to indicate the very different reality than the one I was experiencing. Warm. So warm. It continued. It took me a moment, but once I added the voice on top of all of the other weird things that happened since I woke up, I instantly realized that those pressure-like sensations that were keeping me put felt a lot like hands and fingers holding me down, same as the ones over my neck and mouth. Thank you for being warm. By this point, tears were already streaming down my face as hundreds of thoughts flashed before my mind, each one darker than the last. My boyfriend eventually walked back inside the tent, completely oblivious to what I was going through. I tried to get his attention, but sadly, eyes looking out of their sockets due to absolute terror isn't something that makes a whole lot of noise. He just lay down next to me, unaware of it all. I can't blame him. I mean, from his perspective, he had gotten up to take a leak and had no reason to believe he had woke me up in the process. I feared he was just going to fall asleep and leave me alone with whatever was happening, but then he mumbled something. I waited. Not that there was much else for me to do. Yeah? He asked. After another brief pause, he continued. Babe, what is it? Stop nudging me. But I wasn't. I wasn't doing anything. Because I couldn't. And if it wasn't me... He finally turned to face me. But as soon as our eyes met, and he had saw the terror that had taken a hold of me, I saw him fall victim to the exact same thing. Unable to move and unable to speak, just like me. All I could do was lock eyes with his gaze as it gradually showed confusion, frustration, and finally, fear. All so warm, the voice spoke again, and judging my boyfriend's reaction, I could tell that he heard it too. I wasn't crazy. Something was really going on, and whatever it was, we were completely powerless against it. I don't know exactly how long we stayed there just like that, completely motionless, staring into each other's eyes with tears rolling down our cheeks, unable to comfort one another when we were so certain that our lives were about to end. I lost track of time. It had become meaningless, especially with the voice constantly spewing crazy nonsense right into our ears throughout our entire ordeal, as if someone else was right in between the two of us. Thank you. Thank you for being so warm. So, so warm. My boyfriend and I eventually snapped back into reality almost at the exact same time. By then, it was already morning, but we could tell that we hadn't gotten a second of sleep. Just by looking at each other's faces, we knew we both had experienced the same thing for real. It hadn't been a nightmare or a shared delusion of any kind. We quickly packed up our things and got out of there while barely exchanging any words. On our way back, we came across an officer from the US Forest Service who was able to tell almost instantly that something bad had happened to us. 
my boyfriend tried to shrug it off. He just wanted to get out of there and go home. But I couldn't help myself and blurted out some things about what had happened. I didn't even think. It probably all sounded like gibberish from a crazy lady, talking about a mysterious presence that got inside her tent. But the officer kept a calm, respectful, yet somehow somber, face throughout the entire exchange. First, he made sure that we weren't in need of any urgent medical attention, and then he called for a vehicle to come and pick us up, before dropping us off at one of their small offices, located nearby. He told us that we didn't have to do it if we didn't want to, but that he would greatly appreciate it if we could each provide a separate statement in regards to what happened that night. My boyfriend declined and insisted for me to do the same, but I didn't listen to him. After what we'd been through, it felt good having other people around you, ready to hear you out and not dismiss you right away. What's more, I could tell from my boyfriend's behavior that this is the sort of thing that he would just put a lid on and never bring up again. So, if I was ever going to talk openly about it and hope to get some kind of an explanation in return, it was now or never. Plus, the whole thing was relatively fresh in my mind, for better or worse, so I just had to do it. The officer was really cool and respectful, and I hope I'm not getting anyone in trouble by saying this, but I recorded most of our conversation with my phone without his knowledge or consent. I know it's probably against the law, but the reason I did it is because I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget any of the things he told me. You'll have to forgive me for that, but please do take into consideration my state of mind at the time. I was still somewhat out of it, not to mention the fact that we hadn't gotten any sleep or rest the night before, either. So I was just making sure that I kept a proper record of it all, for posterity. Since I couldn't trust my brain to take note of all of the things he said, and remember them down the line. I'm leaving out names, dates, and actual locations for that purpose alone, to avoid getting anyone in trouble. Once I finished telling him the whole thing, from beginning to end, he asked me to mark the location of our map as accurately as possible on one of his maps. I gave him the precise location, and right after doing so, he drew a circular radius around it, which perplexed me a little. The more I studied his pensive expression, the more convinced I became that this wasn't anything new to him. In fact, not only was this not new, it was also something that required some actual on-the-field work from him, which left me somewhat distraught. After all, if you tell most people a similar story to what happened to us, they would just shrug it off as it being your imagination's fault, I think. When I politely asked him what the deal was, he apologized, said it was nothing, and that they would take over from there and comb over the area to see if they'd find anything. I didn't believe him and called him out on it before I even realized it, much to my shame. But he was very understandable, and this is where I'll quote some of the things he said to me. Look, I've been doing this for quite a while, and I've heard and seen all sorts of things. I can't tell you anything more than that, because it wouldn't be right, you understand? It wouldn't be fair to you. You just experienced something you can't quite logically, rationally explain, and now you want answers. I get that, but I'm not in a position to give those to you. Maybe it was all in your head. Maybe it wasn't. What I'm trying to say is, it's part of our job to shoulder that burden. It's not yours to carry. Many campers lose their lives each year, most in unfortunate but preventable accidents, while others and then there's those who happen to experience some things that just make them come out of the woods all shell-shocked and the like, but certain that they'll never set foot in a similar setting ever again for as long as they breathe. You're all right, miss. A little shaken, a little dehydrated, but you're all right. You're going to be okay, you and your partner, and that really is the only thing that matters. You're alive, you're okay. And the only thing that I wish for you is for you to forget about what happened, no matter how hard or impossible the idea may seem to you at this time. No, it's not worth it. Trust me on this one. If you try to figure things out on your own, not that I'm saying that there are things that need figuring out, mind you, you'll keep on spiraling down an endless rabbit hole. It's not worth it. What happened to you could have happened to anyone else. You just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's not about you, and it has nothing to do with you. 
That much I can assure you, but you best be certain that we'll take care of it. It's what we do. When I asked him if he had ever seen or heard similar reports of what I had described, he made a little grimace, clearly trying to fight off the urge to tell me more than he should. He had waved his hand, declining to answer, but knowing as well as I did that he had answered me in the process. Finally, when I asked him if I could leave my contact number for him to call me at a later time, maybe once the issue was resolved and he could tell me about it, his response was very swift and pointless to contest. No, I'm sorry, but no. You've done more than enough. In fact, you've helped us out tremendously. Thank you for your time. Afterwards, they drove us all the way out of the area and dropped us near the city from where we eventually made our way back home. It's been a little weird ever since, with my boyfriend not wanting to discuss these events, as if he's pretending that nothing happened at all. I can't tell if this whole thing just scared him to his core, or if there's something more to it. Either way, it helps being back in the city and being surrounded by all of this noise and people, but I don't know what's next for me. Part of me wants to follow the officer's advice. I'll admit that I'm still as curious as ever, cautiously so, but I know the man was not only speaking truthfully, but from experience as well. I really want to let it go, because that's probably for the best. But it's not that easy, especially with the internet at your disposal just a couple of swipes away and a whole world of information and people out there ready to share their stories and knowledge with you. This incident might have put my boyfriend off from camping for a little while, maybe permanently for all I know, but I can't say the same for me, I think. Maybe someday I'll go back, on my own. I really don't know why I would, but that's just the me talking right now. Who knows, in time, I might just find a good enough reason. I'm a private guard in a European country. My job is mainly at night, as I usually patrol the streets with my car. Here, the law about guns are quite restricted compared to the US. Our job is to prevent and report crimes to the actual police. We carry guns, but in fact we can't use them, as they are a mere dissuader to hostile subjects. My nights are made of me driving around, checking the outside of commercial buildings and answering alarms when needed. Usually in isolated places where cars don't usually pass by. My area is quite cold and humid, and it is not uncommon during the winter nights that a strong fog covers the streets buildings, and entire villages, like in Silent Hill, a fog that would make you think everything is possible in those dark, isolated places. That night, I was doing my usual routine. I've almost finished my patrol. I was driving on an isolated road to reach one of the last clients, a warehouse for I don't know what kind of stuff. It was a secondary road running in the fields, nothing but grass and bushes on the sides of the street. As usual this time of year, the strong fog didn't let me see the road in front of me for more than several feet. Slowly, I was driving to the building, nothing but fog and the distant light of the warehouse in front of me. I was tired, the last coffee I had was consumed more than two hours before, and staying focused wasn't easy. Suddenly, a figure just a bit smaller than a human being crossed the road in front of me. The fog didn't let me see details. It was very fast, running like a dog. But for sure, that unnatural pose and dimensions weren't like any animal I'd ever seen in my career. And I've seen deer, cats, once even a small bear crossing my path. Nothing like that, something vaguely similar to a human. I stopped the car immediately. I didn't know what I saw, but it for sure wasn't normal. My job was to repeat irregular detail during the patrol. But what should I say to the station? I saw something for a few seconds in front of my car's light? Really? Something very vivid, but that could be influenced by my tired brain? They probably would laugh at me in the best case scenario, suggest me to stop drinking on the job and the worse. I decided to go on and reach to the isolated building. As always, I left my car open, took my flashlight out with me in the shadows, I recognized with my hand the correct key to put in the gate of the building and started my search. I didn't turn on the light inside the car. 
I know every part of it just by memory. I made my patrol by foot around the warehouse, checked every door, and after almost five minutes, I got in my car. I put away the key without using the light. I got on the road again, same fog, but this time nothing unusual on the road. The air in the car was oddly cold. The heater was pumping warm air in the vehicle and the windows were closed, but I really couldn't understand why it was that cold. And then a noise seemed to come from the car. I've never been a mechanic guy. I don't understand anything about cars or engines. I just drive them. But that noise didn't sound like anything I've ever heard from a car before. Like a slow, not too heavy scratching. The car seemed to drive just fine, so I would just report the problem once I finished my shift. After five minutes of this, I got a call from my colleague. An alarm went off near my position, so he asked if I could check it out. Lately, that alarm went off every night, as a technical problem, so it wasn't anything serious. I arrived to the place a bit later, left my car running outside, and checked inside the building. Everything was normal, as usual, just the alarm going crazy. I got in the car, finally ready to finish my shift. The strange noise finally stopped, no need to report the problem. I arrived at the station where I worked and found my colleague waiting for me outside to get in the car and start his shift. I took my stuff and got out of the car. He got in and turned on the light to search for something. I was already walking away when he called me. Dude, what the heck? You took a dog in the car? What is this? And then with horror, I saw it. In the back of the vehicle, just behind my seat, there was mud everywhere and footprints, big ones, of some animal I cannot explain. Like a big, dirty dog opened up the car door, got inside behind me, and closed it without making any noise. And then it made sense, the strange noise. All that time, it was behind me, watching, grinning. I was in shock and couldn't even speak. My colleague was confused and staring at me, and if I just turned the light on, I would have seen it, staring at me in the rearview mirror. Pretty sure last night has ruined hunting for me for good. I don't know if I'll ever feel comfortable out in the woods after last night. You see, I have no family here in central Michigan, so I figured I might as well try to bag a buck. Well, I didn't see one. Just a very creepy guy, dressed as an officer. I got out to my stand around 3 p.m. Perfect timing for me, as I like to spend around three hours out in the quiet backwoods. It really doesn't matter to me if I get a deer. It's just a bonus. The real treat is escaping reality for a few hours and enjoying nature's beauty. I didn't see much. A couple squirrels and a small doe, which of course I passed up. It was getting to be around 5.30 p.m. when the sun was quickly fading. I knew I had roughly 20 minutes of enough light before I knew the evening hunt would be over. Just as I was about to quietly gather my gear and get ready to leave my ground blind, a twig snapped to my left. My heart began to beat a little quicker as I envisioned an eight-pointer strolling out just before nightfall, offering me a clear shot. I slowly leaned my head forward so I could try to get a better look of the animal that was approaching. Something stopped me though. The forest was unusually quiet. The air began to fill with a very odd smell of what I could only describe as iron. I'd smelled it many times before, as I've shot plenty of deer throughout my 29 years of life. A bleat rang through the woods. Instantly I froze, and my heart was beating for a whole different reason. Fear. This was no ordinary deer bleat. It sounded like a person was trying to mimic a deer. I sat as still as a stone as the crunching of my unwanted guest slowly walked closer and closer. It was almost pitch black now, and I was left feeling more terrified than ever. Something felt extremely off about the whole situation. Most people that called for deer used a deer call, which would have been hard to tell apart from an actual deer. This, however, sounded painfully obvious that it was someone using their own voice. It blasted through the forest again, this time maybe 10 feet away. My heart was beating uncontrollably at this point. Whoever was out here had to know I was there. 
It is rifle season, and it's incredibly stupid to be out here wandering in the woods, let alone trying to make yourself sound like a deer. The smell of iron was getting to be unbearable, as whatever was out here was getting closer. I decided to bring my 3030 to my shoulder and prepare to defend myself if need be. That's when I finally saw movement through the flap of my blind. It was a tall, lanky man wearing an officer's uniform. For a second, relief washed over me as the feeling of not being alone was much better than being by myself in the dark woods. Then, as he took another step, I noticed how off everything was about him. His arms were too long in contrast to his short legs. Now that he was within 10 to 15 feet of me, I could see just how tall he was. He had to be close to seven feet tall. He stopped directly in front of me and threw his head back, making that awful bleeding noise again. That was when I got a good look at his face and almost threw up from the amount of fear that I was feeling. His mouth didn't move as he bleated, but I could see his cheekbones moving. His mouth drooped in a sad looking expression. Blood dripped down the corner of his mouth. He bellowed again. Seeing it a second time, was when I noticed what was wrong about him. His face wasn't his. He had the skin of someone's face pulled over his head, most likely the officer's face. My heart started to beat so loud, I actually feared he would hear it. I don't know how, but he still didn't notice me, only about 15 feet away, sitting in my blind. I prayed he wouldn't. I watched in horror as he took slow, staggered steps until he walked out of view. The sound of his footsteps slowly got quieter as it walked further and further away. The smell of rot. I heard one more final bleat ring through the woods before his footsteps were all out of range together. I waited another 20 minutes before slowly exiting my blind, too afraid he would hear me and come back. I moved as quickly and as quietly as I could back to my truck. Once I was about 30 yards away from my truck, I heard the bleat again, followed by heavy footsteps. He spotted me. I took off running full blast, knowing that I had a short distance to cover. Hearing him get closer with crazy speed, I made the mistake of glancing back as I reached back to my truck, and what I saw will still stick with me forever. He was running on all fours, making these huge, galloping strides. He moved way faster than he should have been able to in that position. I jumped in my truck and started it with my shaky hands. Just as I started to pull away, I saw a flash, then a huge banging noise as it slammed into the side of my truck. I floored it and raced out of there as fast as I could without ditching it. He gave chase for a short while, but fell behind pretty quickly. I drove the 15 minutes home in silence, looking in my rearview mirror every five seconds expecting to see him chasing me. He never did though, thank goodness. Once I got home, I grabbed my stuff and raced inside locking the door behind me. I tried to make sense of what I saw, but I just couldn't. I have no idea what that thing was. I was pretty exhausted after running and having my heart racing for such a long time, so I went straight to bed. I had a hard time falling asleep, as the memory of his scratched out, stolen face was burned into my brain. Just as I finally started to doze off, I froze again as I heard the same strange bleat out of my window in my backyard somewhere. This thing followed me home. It made sounds out there all night, and I could hear its odd footsteps as it circled around the house. I made it through the night somehow, so I'm posting this in hopes that one of you might be able to help me identify what this thing is, maybe how to get rid of it. I don't want to call the police, because I know they will think I'm insane. So if anyone has any suggestions, I'd gladly take the advice. We all have those calls that haunt us. There's not a 911 dispatcher alive who doesn't have at least one of those that sticks with them for the rest of their life. To be honest, most of us have too many to count. I always thought I was above that. I'd never let this job or these calls get to me. I was tough, but then September 12th happened. I worked the night shift in a very secluded county sheriff's office, a little over 1,200 square miles with the population of 31,000. Not a lot in the way of heinous crimes happened. 
There were those out-of-the-ordinary UFO calls every now and then, but most of the time it was loose cows and car-slash-deer accidents. We sure do have our share of crazies. And that night, my caller was one of them. It was about 3.01 in the morning. My partner Tasha and I were watching reruns of 90 Day Fiancé when the 911 call tones went off. Totally routine. I try to answer the phone faster than Tasha because she's the quickest hands in the West when it comes to taking calls. And unfortunately, this time, I got it. County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Silence. Hello, County 911? More silence. I look at my call screen where the coordinates are. Updating the call, it finally phrases the correct coordinates to the map, roughly where the caller is. Hello, County 911, what's your emergency? I repeat again, entering the coordinates in. It maps to a residence in our second largest city, and immediately I know who the caller is. Marjorie Cannonberry. Don't let her name fool you. She's not a sweet old lady, but rather a 32-year-old drug user. Extensive history in our in-house records, and I don't even need to look her up. In my three years of dispatching here, I can't recall just one week where I didn't have a call with Marjorie. Hello? Marge? Do you have an emergency? I ask again. We're on a first name basis. Yes. I finally hear her whisper. Okay, what, what's going on? There's... She pauses, her breathing trembling slightly. There's something in my closet. There's something in your closet? I asked, quickly typing into my call narrative. How do you know there's someone there? Do you see them? No, not someone, she whispered again. I could tell she was truly terrified. Something. I, I don't know what it is. At this point, I'm convinced Marge is having another drug-induced hallucination. It wouldn't be the first time. Describe for me what it looks like. In the background, Tasha is dispatching our area deputy. Please send someone, Marge whispered. Yes, I have a deputy on the way, Marge, but I need you to tell me what you're seeing, I said. When you said something, what did you mean? It's tall, she said. It has to bend over to fit, and it has long claws. She paused, and I could hear her sniffling. She was definitely crying. It's tapping them on the floor. Can you hear them? She paused, and I listened carefully to see if I could actually hear anything. Maybe it was my imagination, but I thought, just barely, I could hear a rhythmic tapping. Do you hear them? She asked, almost desperately, like she was begging me to believe her. I ignored her question. What else, Marge? What else do you see? Um, her voice trembled. It's all black, and it has really big teeth. It keeps licking its teeth. So it knows you're there? Yes. She said shakily, it's staring right at me, glowing yellow eyes. For the first time in my life, a shiver went down my spine from her words. Every horror movie I've ever seen came to mind. Though I knew better, my supernatural bone was piqued. Could there really be a demon in her closet? Are you able to leave the room, Marge? I asked, typing all of this into our dispatch narrative. Can you go outside until my deputy gets there to see what's in there? I don't think so, she sobbed. If I move, it'll get me. Have you been drinking tonight, Marjorie? I know how incriminating it sounded, but it was a legitimate clarifying question. Call me heartless if you want. No, she sobbed again. Please believe me. I know I've done stupid things before, but this is real. I haven't been drinking, and I haven't taken anything recently. I don't know what it is. But I'm so scared. It keeps tapping. It's claws. You have to hear them, don't you? The phone crackled as she held it out at an arm's length. There was no mistaking this time. I could hear something tapping. A pit formed in my stomach. What? It was like the sound of long acrylic fingernails. Okay, Marge. I'm going to stay on the phone with you until the deputy gets there. I look at our mapping software. He's not super far out and shouldn't be too much longer. Okay, thank you, she whispered. It's just staring at me. 
Does it have a face? I asked, against my better judgment. Did I actually believe that there was something there? Yeah, but it's all teeth, like it's smiling. And it hasn't moved since you saw it? No, it's just there, staring and tapping its claws. How long has it been there? I don't know. I woke up to the tapping noise and just saw it there, so I called you right away, Marge said. You don't believe me, do you? It's not that I don't believe you, Marge, I answered. I've never heard of this sort of thing before. What you're describing sounds like a demon from a scary film. I think it is. Another shiver. Her voice sounded so convinced. Real or not, she was legitimately seeing something, whether it was an actual demon or a hallucination. Part of me felt bad for her, being absolutely convinced something like what she was describing was staring at her. It would be terrifying. Marge suddenly gasped, and the phone rustled as it fell from her hands. What's going on, Marge? I asked quickly, my tone dropping in seriousness. It's coming towards me, she screamed. Oh no, it's claws. My deputy is almost there, Marge, I said loudly, over her screams, but I doubt she heard me. If I hadn't freaked out by then, I was now. Those screams were ones of pure and unfiltered terror. My pulse was flying as I was trying to type everything I heard into the call. Next to me, Tasha was relaying the info to our deputy. Come on, I thought. Get there already. The problem with a secluded country was that we didn't have as many deputies on as others, so our response time was significantly longer. This particular night, the city's officer had called in sick, so it was the county's job to cover if there were any calls. 333, be advised. She's screaming and not answering us anymore, Tasha said to our responding deputy. 333, 10-4, two minutes out. 332, to dispatch. It'll be 1076 as well. Our other unit in the area piped up. I had seen him making his way towards the area before, but now he was going emergent. I repeatedly tried to get Marge to come back on the phone, but all I could hear were her screams. I could also hear things being thrown around, like she was smashing into them with her body. And suddenly, as quick as it happened, everything went silent. Marge, I shouted. Marge, are you there? The phone crackled. He's going to get to me, Marge said monotonously. He knows who you are now. You're next. And then the line went silent. If I had a handset phone, it would have fallen out of my hand. How could anyone not get unnerved by something like that? The movie lover in me was terrified. You're next. 333 Dispatch, I'm 1023. The first responding deputy advised he was on the scene. His name was Jason, our youngest deputy on the department. He's a super nice kid who was probably the best person that could have responded to help Marge. Tasha held radio traffic just for that call, and we waited for what seemed like an eternity as Jason went into the house. 333 Dispatch, it nearly made me jump up out of my seat and my nerves on end. Get a med rolling, she tore up her arms pretty bad. Within five minutes, our med unit was rolling. Jason and Travis, his backup, ended up capturing Marge. They came up before Jason transferred her to the mental hospital. After getting medical clearance and explaining everything that had happened, apparently Marge was tripping out on drugs, my first suspicion, and decided to tear at her arms. She also trashed her apartment with her drug stupor, which would explain the crashing around I heard. But what about the tapping, I asked. I heard the tapping she was talking about. I don't know anything about that, Jason said with a shrug, but it was probably something she was doing that she didn't realize she was doing. Yeah, you're probably right, I said, but I still couldn't shake the bad feeling. It's sad, honestly, Jason said, retrieving the papers off the printer that was printing. She's so fried from the drugs, she's just crazy now. I glanced out the dispatch window to the lobby, where Travis was sitting with Marge. She sat with her head hanging down and her arms in bandages. Seeing someone hopped up on drugs was always a little disturbing to me. As if she knew I was looking at her, she lifted her head up and her eyes met mine. They grew wide, and she pointed at me, letting out another piercing cry. 
Travis stood up as she did, putting himself between her and me, inadvertently. I couldn't shake the feeling that she wasn't pointing at me, but rather, behind me. I told myself it was dumb, but why was it I couldn't look over my shoulder? Jason flew out the door with the paperwork he needed, and both struggled down to the front with her to load her up into the squad. In two days, hospital staff would find Marge deceased in her room, her head somehow twisted unnaturally around. It would never have a full explanation. Finally, after taking a deep breath, I turned around. There was nothing there. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding and laughed at myself. Of course, there was nothing there. The rest of my shift went by smoothly, the whole 20 minutes we had left. When we finally left that night, I couldn't wait to go home and go to bed. That call had really rattled me and left me with a headache. I got back to my little apartment, greeted by my little white cat. After giving her more food, I took off my uniform and hung it up in the closet, making sure to close the doors. Hurrying back to my bed, I jumped in and turned on the TV for some background noise. That night, I slept with all the lights on. Maybe it was just my imagination running wild, or the stress of a long week, but as I closed the door to my closet, I could have sworn I saw a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back at me. This happened a while ago, but my then girlfriend, now wife, Mary, has finally given me permission to share this. It happened in the mid 80s. We were 18 and we had just started going around together. It was the middle of summer and we had just finished school. I held down a job as an apprentice mechanic while she worked as a receptionist at her father's company. This meant that we didn't get to spend as much spare time together as we would have liked. However, the perfect opportunity for a weekend getaway arose with a long weekend federal holiday and I was able to convince her with only minimal pestering that we should go for the weekend to camp in a popular national park. When that weekend arrived, I packed my truck with all of the supplies we would need and drove around to hers. I waited patiently on her front porch for her to be ready, while her father stood with arms crossed and a hard glare. When she was finally ready, at least four eternities later, she said goodbye to her father, and he gave me a stern handshake with a gruff. You look after her, to which I agreed that I would. Being the father of two now adult women myself, I understand his concerns, but I would be lying if I said he didn't scare the crap out of me then, and still a little bit now. However, once we hit the open road, we were gone without a care in the world. Making our way through picturesque countrysides, we sang along to the radio with our windows down until we were good and windbeat played monotonous travel games until we ran out of items to guess, and I let her nap when she fell asleep leaning against the passenger side window. While she slept, I got a little turned around. There were no turns on the road where I thought there should have been, and we ended up going straight for a long time where there weren't any familiar landmarks. As the car began to run low on gas, I decided I would need to pull into the next gas station I saw, which as it turned out, wasn't too much further down the road. Its neon lights drew me in like a beacon in the night, but as I approached, I saw that it was quite run down. There was a layer of grimy dust over everything. The fuel prices were outrageous. The neon light was missing a couple letters, and a single moth flew repeatedly into the light above the service attendant. Suffice to say, if my car wasn't dying for a drink, we wouldn't have stopped. I left Mary asleep in the car while I filled it up and locked the car out of paranoia when I went to pay and ask for directions. Inside, the attendant looked just as washed up as the gas station did. It was a guy around my age with an absent expression on his face, and our conversation went to something like this. Pump 3, pack of Skittles. And can you tell me which direction the national park is? I asked direct, though not rudely. That'll be $50.90. He spoke in a heavy droll of a country accent and just pointed down the road in response to my question. Okay, uh, thanks. Good evening to you. I said uncertainly, 
but decided to just go with it and reconsult my map if necessary. There was a long pause for a moment, and I was almost out of the store before he spoke up again. You be careful out there, in so-and-so forest. The way he said it was unsettling, and I hesitated a moment, unsure of how to respond. In the end, I gave him an awkward nod of thanks, and left a little quicker while reflecting on the strange conversation and crazy prices. However, when I came out and looked to the car, my heart leapt into my throat. The passenger door was open, and Mary wasn't in the car. Mary! I called with a wave of concern raising in my stomach as I jogged back to the car at a considerable pace. What? She answered almost immediately, and sounding just as panicked as she picked up on the strain of my voice. I whirled around confused to see her behind me, coming from the direction of the bathrooms. You... I... Why did you leave the car door open? I demanded, worry giving way to hot embarrassment and uncertainty. She apologized for scaring me, and then explained that she hadn't left the door open. My initial thought at the time was that we had just been robbed, but upon searching the vehicle, saw nothing was out of place or otherwise missing. We assumed that she may have in fact just not closed the door as firmly as she thought, and that it had swung open after her. This was really the only rational explanation that would calm our nerves enough to get back on the road and keep driving. We traveled down the dark road until the asphalt gave way to gravel, and we passed signs pointing to our intended destination. The camp itself was actually pretty easy to find once we had an idea of where we were going, though setting up in the dark was a little spooky. Mary held the light while I pitched the tent and lit a fire. Overall. I'd say the first night ended up being pretty romantic. The mild state of fear put her into a clingy mood, and I was only happy to oblige. The only thing I could say might have been some indication of what was going to come is when I went to get the tent out of the back of my truck, the tarp canopy over the tray was loose, not entirely undone or anything, and there was obviously nothing in the back other than our supplies, but it's something that I look back on now and wonder about. It could have come loose from the travel, sure. Then again, I didn't check it at the gas station, so who really knows? The following day, we woke up early to welcoming sounds of morning songbirds, and we ate breakfast, which was a gourmet assortment of beans and toast, in the company of a field mouse. As it turned out, we'd chosen a pretty good campsite in the dark. Situated near the edge of a clearing, there was a decent patch around us, with a clear view across the river to the hillside with deer grazing and thick woods behind us. Activities for the day included frolicking in the river and hiking. We settled into the evening drinking around a campfire with neighboring campers and exchanged stories. Our new friends, a couple of guys named Joe and Patrick, were excited to share stories about their experiences the day prior. They had encountered the odd fellow at the gas station as well, but Joe told us in a more hushed tone that other strange things had happened to them since arriving. They had heard the footsteps crunching the leaves around their caravan late at night and seen unidentifiable shapes moving between the trees at dusk. This was about the time that Mary added in that while we were out on our hike, she felt watched or like we were being followed and kept glancing behind just to make sure. As she spoke, I could tell she was genuinely spooked though she kept her voice jovial. Patrick noticed too, and was quick to interject that it was probably nothing more than wildlife. Joe, however, was equally as eager to inform us that he had grown up in the area and that this forest had a reputation for missing campers. Of the campers that had been found, their bodies were always discovered beyond recognition. Some were found seemingly skewered at the top of impossibly tall trees, while others had been strung up by their feet and torn apart. All circumstances were mysterious, and while each case had an official explanation, many locals suspected the police department was covering something up, since most explanations were a stretch at best. The conversation died off pretty quickly with that information, and Mary and I returned to our campsite. She was understandably unsettled, and even suggested that maybe we should leave. I reassured her the best I could, promising that if anything unusual started to happen, that we would leave, 
and my drunken charm somehow managed to convince her, since it was only one more night anyway. Under the guise of watching the stars, I laid down blankets and pillows in the back of the truck, and we lay down together to snuggle. Naturally, things went the way I hoped, and before long, we were getting pretty heated, when we heard a soft snap from the forest. At hearing the twig break, she stopped and started to sit up. I did my very best to convince her that it was nothing, but the sounds of bushes rustling was undeniable. There was something moving toward us from the brush. At this point, I sat up and gently pushed her to the side and half behind me. I was assuming that it was maybe Joe or Patrick drunkenly wandering over to us, so I hurried and found the flashlight while she struggled to find her stuff. However, once I turned on the light and pointed it in the direction of the sound, the noises stopped. It was then that we realized it was dead silent. Not a single insect, bird, or otherwise mammalian creature dared to make a peep. This is what truly terrified me. One of the most basic human instincts we have is that utter silence is bad. I scanned the trees and bushes with the light slowly. I could hear Mary barely breathing behind me and realized that I myself was holding my breath as a beam of light shone over empty leaves and branches. The moment it landed on something in the darkness is the moment I'll never forget. Set back between the trees was a pair of round eyes reflecting back at us. They were maybe 100 yards away, if that, and approximately the height you would expect a deer to be standing. Both Mary and I froze as we stared down this thing in the darkness, trying to determine what we thought it was. Then, it stood up. We saw the eyes elevate from deer height to what are we seeing height. This thing stood tall, seven or eight feet by my best estimation in the dark at a distance. Then it screamed. Now when I say it screamed, I mean it let out the most unholy screech I had ever heard. It was simultaneously high pitched and reverberatingly deep. It shook me to my core. And to this day, neither of us had heard anything even remotely similar or have been able to accurately describe the harrowing sound it made. Mary and I sat terrified for a moment before we realized the creature was now running headlong at us, crashing through the undergrowth with fury. I only caught a glimpse of what it looked like. It was a mixture of bare skin and tattered patches of fur, gaping wide, loose hanging jaw of a mouth, and sunken in, oblong shaped eyes with distinctive cheekbones. Sometimes at night, I still wake up in a cold sweat, imagining it coming for me, or sitting in the dark of my room just beyond the light of my phone screen. At the time, however, we scrambled ourselves out of the back of the truck and into the front. I fumbled frantically with the keys and pedals, trying not to stall the thing, while Mary, chattering frantically about the impending creature getting closer, she told me later that it almost reached the tail of the truck before I put it into gear and we tore off down the road at a dangerous speed. It was really a miracle we made it out in one piece, considering how inebriated I was, and how many times I felt the back end slide out on the gravel as we drifted around bends of the road. I didn't stop driving that night until we were more than halfway home. We passed by the creepy gas station in favor of another more populated and well-lit one in town. I'm pretty sure we looked ridiculous, Two shell-shocked people staggering out of a dirty, scratched-up car, and wide-eyed. When I tried to have a smoke to calm my nerves, my hands were shaking so bad I could hardly get it to my lips, and when the clerk asked us what happened, neither of us made any sense in our explanations. We checked into a hotel for the night, and made it home earlier than planned the next day. Neither of us mentioned anything to her parents. In fact, she forbid me from mentioning this story until now out of a combination of embarrassment and fear. I was only able to convince her to allow this now because recently, a group of high school kids disappeared in that forest. According to the news report, four went in and only one came out. The surviving teen was institutionalized for babbling incoherently about a monster in the forest. My wife and I know that we're not crazy we also know that this means that whatever we saw is still out there, somewhere. Before I begin, there's something you have to understand about the woods. 
And I'm talking about the deep backcountry, 50 plus miles out from any station or any signs of civilization. After a certain point, everything begins to blend. The longer you spend out there, the smaller and smaller you become, till you're just another part of the environment, a movement through valleys and peaks. It's depersonalizing and ego-killing. You forget things about yourself, and instincts guide you. It becomes natural, but it also makes you look like a lunatic. That's why we never spend more than eight days alone in the back country at a time. That said, my first few months on the job were everything I wanted. Plenty of time outdoors, mostly upkeep on trails in the back country, along with checking up on some old stands that the Forest Service had acquired in the 50s. The pine beetle epidemic was especially bad in my region this year, so I had a lot of time marking the mortality rate in the area, amongst other details. For the most part, I loved my job. I'm a bit of an introvert, so time alone outdoors working is perfect for me. But there have been a few moments that still make me uncomfortable to think about. A couple weeks after I started, I woke up early and drove down a pretty rough, forested section of backcountry with lots of elevation. I was trying to check on a site that some backpackers, who had just returned from a week-long trek, had reported seeing bonfires a few nights ago. They said the fire seemed to be a few hundred yards off the trail, and that it looked like there were people around the flames. An aerial team couldn't find any signs of the fires, like the backpackers were describing, so they assumed it was falsely reported. Even so, we had a serious burn ban in effect, and I was sent out to double check and make sure. I got about 20 miles in before I found the section of trail I needed to go down covered in earth, destroyed in some sort of landslide. It must have been recent. Neither the backpackers nor the aerial team noticed it, and someone would have. I definitely couldn't drive through, but I was only two miles from the site, so I grabbed my pack, checked my water, and radioed to the forest station from my ATV to let them know I was hiking the rest of the way in. I probably should have waited for a crew to come out and clear the road, but we were all really concerned about the fire, and I won't lie, I was mad at the thought of backpackers being so careless. You couldn't miss the signs coming into the forest, warning about forest fires and announcing the burn ban. There was no reason to be reckless. And so, I hiked out there. It was only about 10.30 a.m. when I set out. I expected it to take about two hours to get to the area where the fires were reported. The elevation increase was drastic, so I had to pause every so often to catch my breath. After hiking for a while, I paused for a moment and realized I wasn't on the trail anymore. This isn't that unusual. If you've ever backpacked or even gone on long hikes before, you know that it's easier than you think to stumble off the trail, even for someone experienced. I'm one of the newest and youngest rangers, but I've spent a lot of time outdoors backpacking and hiking, and normally would have a great sense of direction, so I wasn't too alarmed not to know exactly where I was. You get used to being lost. The thing that alarmed me was noticing a pink hue lighting up the forest. The sun was about to disappear behind the tree line that covered the mountain to the west. I didn't think I'd been hiking that long. I had gone maybe a mile and a half in an hour, or so I thought. Nonetheless, it appeared to be almost 7 p.m. now. I quickly decided the safest thing would be to head back south towards my ATV, which stored all of my overnight gear and come back tomorrow. It would be embarrassing to explain to the other rangers that I lost track of time, but it would be worse to get stuck out here all night. Without the right equipment, I might freeze. Besides, they'd start wondering why I hadn't checked back after so long. I grabbed some loose stones off the ground and left a sign to indicate I had been there and set off in the direction I thought I wandered off from the trail. I quickly found it, but it was a section I hadn't been through earlier. Somehow, I had found my way farther north, and funnily enough, I saw a yellow trail marker not too far up the mountain. I realized it was the marker for the next 10 mile section, the area the fire reports had mentioned. The sun was almost touching the mountains now, but I decided to hike up to the marker at least, stay for a few minutes, and then quickly head back before it got completely dark. I realized this wasn't ideal. But at the time, it seemed better than going back with nothing to report. 
I hiked a few dozen yards to the marker and looked out over the valley to the east. It seemed empty, nothing unusual. I took a sip from my water bottle and waited another five minutes. I still didn't see anything, so I decided to head out. I hadn't gone a mile before I smelled smoke coming from down the mountain. I looked around but couldn't see any smoke columns. It was kind of unsettling. The sunset was so red, everywhere I looked seemed to glow. Getting worried, I stumbled the last mile back and immediately called it in. The night was darker now, and without any trace of the fire in the valley. Despite smelling the smoke earlier, I decided to spend the night on the trail, in case whatever caused it caught up again. I set up a temporary camp, with my one-man tent, and waited the night out. Nights in the backcountry are different than camping in other places. In the back of your head, you recognize that you are completely alone for dozens of miles. You end up listening to the night differently. Everything you hear suddenly becomes important, because now you're just another part of the forest, vulnerable. At some point, I woke up from a dream, I can't remember now, but I recall feeling unsettled. I poked my head out of the tent and crawled out to take a leak and look around for a minute. I didn't see anything, but it's hard to explain exactly how I felt. It was almost like I was being observed, but very lightly, as a part of the background. It was kind of discerning, so I went back to sleep pretty quickly. Aerial recon flew over the next morning and still found nothing. About midday, the team arrived to clear the landslide, and the other rangers and I began searching the back country. At the end of the second day, we found it. A chunk of the forest had completely burned down. It was tucked into a valley in the northeast, only a few hundred yards away from where I camped the first night, but I missed it then. It was maybe 200 yards across and 300 running down the mountainside. You think this would be too large to escape notice, but it took us almost two days to find it. Even then, the aerial team missed it altogether. This was a strange fire, too. It burned in an almost clean line down the mountain's ridge, forming a recognizable rhombus. And normally, forest fires around here aren't intense enough to completely take out fully grown pine trees. But this fire had been hot. Everything was scorched, total mortality. It almost seemed unnatural, but we couldn't find anything in the ashes to explain it. I wondered if I had missed something a few days after we left. But eventually, after talking to the veteran rangers, I decided it was just one of those things that can't be explained. Apparently, it's not all that uncommon from what they've said. According to them, if you spend enough time in the wilderness, you start to see things seeing you. I didn't know what they meant by that, but we didn't have time to talk more and I haven't seen them much since. A week after that, I found a couple of idiots trying to start a cooking fire at one of the trailheads. I yelled at them probably harsher than I should have. They seemed to genuinely feel bad about it. Apparently, they missed all of the signs. I decided to let it go and began to leave. But before I drove out, I saw the spark and catch of a fire in the rearview mirror. Infuriated, I drove back and got out. The campers were just as confused as me. The fire pit was completely cold. It looked the same just as I had seen it. Empty and unused. After making them clean out the twigs and leaves they tried to use. Confused, I walked around the entire trailhead, but didn't see any sign of a fire. I figured it was a trick of light in the rearview mirror and left. I convinced myself over the next couple months not to worry about the wildfire stuff and nothing else out of the ordinary happened, until a few days ago. I was on trail maintenance with another ranger, Lauren. She'd been working as a ranger for almost 10 years, so I generally followed her lead. We were about 15 miles into the back country, checking on some primitive campsites for campers. We were currently at campsite three. There's eight total, and they form a large U over almost 90 miles surrounding one of the larger mountains in the region. It was getting into fall, so it was supposed to be empty while we worked our way through, checking up on site quality. All afternoon, I had been cutting out a new trail from the campsite, up to a spring that had changed course recently. The shadows were beginning to grow long, but I was close to finishing, so I kept cutting away. About a half hour later, 
I broke through and walked onto a boulder the ground slanted into and watched the head of the spring just inside up the mountain. It looked like a deer path meandered its way up the spring head, so I started up. When I got there, I almost threw up. The spring flowed clearly enough, but just to the right of it, a section of the ground turned into weathered stone. In the middle, a skinned deer, with spatters and other pools of red scattered everywhere in the nearby vicinity. I've seen plenty of dead animals before, but this was messed up. Something had skinned a deer, and very cleanly, and I couldn't find any other signs of damage, but its actual hide was nowhere to be seen. Flies were starting to circle the meat. It did not look like it had been there long. I quickly hiked back down the several hundred yards I cut out and found Lauren, who was back from working and making dinner. I paused to catch my breath and told her I had to show her something. She looked concerned, so we went back up to the spring. When we got there, the deer was gone, and I couldn't find a drop of anything. I had been gone maybe an hour at most. It didn't seem possible. Lauren assumed I was just messing with her, so I played it off and tried to forget about it. But I haven't forgotten about it. And apparently, Lauren told my supervisor, Jonathan. He asked me to come back to the forest station, so tomorrow I'm driving out of the back country. He sounded different though, almost like he didn't really want to call me in. I guess I'll see how this goes and update this when I can. Part 2 I don't think I should be alive. I met with my supervisor yesterday, and at first, it seemed like it might be just a formality. He didn't say anything about the deer. We made small talk for a while, but finally, he broke the safety of our conversation by pausing and saying, You're probably wondering why I called you back a few days early this rotation. I nodded slowly, and he continued, Well, we've all been really impressed by your performance. And I finally got approval from HQ, so congratulations. You passed your three-month performance review and are now a permanent ranger with us. This caught me off guard, but I quickly masked my relief and thanked him. We talked a bit more about the increased responsibility, and he gave me my next assignment with the team. I was feeling pretty good, shook his hand, and was on my way out. Before I shut the door behind me, he said, before you leave, you mentioned you saw some oddly skinned deer out there. Something scare you? My face went pale, and I thought about telling him the truth, but I instead muttered something about it being a dumb joke. Jonathan nodded his head thoughtfully, and though he didn't look satisfied with my answer, he didn't press me. He just said, that would be an unusual thing to find, measuring each word out carefully while looking past me distantly. That felt like the end of our conversation, so I shut the door behind me, walking away as quickly as I could without seeming weird. Something was off, and for some reason, I got the feeling the whole meeting had been to ask me that last question. I should have driven out of the mountains and back home after that meeting, but something held me back. On the drive back into the mountains, I got caught up in the beauty of the rising slopes, twisting valleys, and graceful, swaying pine trees. My whole life, I've come to the mountains with problems and ideas I need to think over, and they somehow make everything simple. In the shadow of the mountains, I've always been able to realize how small my worries are and find content. I briefly thought about driving home, but once I got a few miles in, I was never going back. I still had to do work here, and by the time I got my assignment location, I wasn't worried at all anymore. I had met up with the other rangers at the campsite, They'd set up near the trailhead and found that they decided to celebrate my pseudo-promotion. At first, I didn't think I was in the mood to party, but the atmosphere was so nice. I only had a few beers, and a few hours later, I was pretty drunk. I got to talking with Ryan, another ranger who had been on the job about as long as Lauren, on the tailgate of his truck away from the rest of the team. We were overlooking the valley that ran for miles north, where we'd be working for the next few weeks. There's a lot of different types of rangers, but I've always found the quiet ones to have the best stories. Ryan was normally one of the quiet rangers, but he chose this time to open up to me. I'd been telling him about the rhombus fire from a few weeks ago, and he was nodding at different points in my story. 
When I mentioned I was walking off the trail and losing track of time, he looked alert. I laughed it off as a dumb mistake, but he took it seriously. I've heard of losing time like that before, but never so close to the forest station. I've always heard it happening deep in the forest, like a hundred plus miles out, and you weren't that far. This seemed to discern him. He took a sip of his beer. There's more too. I've heard it goes way back, to Native Americans even, but they called it wandering. They say that the people who become wanderers first wander through the woods from camp to camp, never staying anywhere overnight, preferring to keep to the caves and hollows throughout the pines. They eventually accomplish what they seek in a way, becoming a part of the wild. They adopt animalistic qualities and disappear from society, reappearing here and there in stories and folk tales, separate from time. He shook his head. Those are just old myths. But I do believe there's something off about these woods. And I don't know. I wanted to bring up the deer, but I didn't quite know how to bring up the subject. Ryan ended up talking about something more interesting, so I kept listening. The thing with the fires is weird though, he said. Don't let yourself be convinced it's not. Those backpackers said they saw multiple fires with people around them. So why would they lie about something like that? Ryan had also been there while we searched through the ashes and knew that it wasn't really resolved, though it was filed away as a natural wildfire. Whole thing sorta of reminds me about this woman that went missing out here, maybe five, six years ago. Some backpacking trek turned around after 40 miles when one of their people got sick. Well, it wasn't until they returned to the trailhead that they realized they were missing one of their party. A young woman vanished at some point on the way back, and no one remembered seeing her leave or when she disappeared. She was just gone. Somehow, no one noticed. An SAR team came in to look for her, and even they admitted it was bizarre. We all wondered if foul play might be involved. How does someone disappear without being noticed over a 40-day return trek? He shrugged and said, We found her a few weeks later and not where we expected to. Normally, these types of people show back up around the trailheads and primitive campsites along the trail after a while. Not this girl. We found her way up in the mountains, above the tree line. And honestly, we probably never would have found her on our own. We were only out there looking for anything because someone reported a huge smoke column coming from up behind this peak. We went to check it out and didn't find any fires but we did spot a bright red jacket, one exactly like the backpackers said she'd been wearing. He leaned in. Over the next couple days, we brought more people. Another SAR team eventually found what was left of her. Closing his eyes, he paused for a moment. Someone had filleted her, as it looked like from the scratch marks gouged around her. She was already rotting. She had been there a while. She wandered so far, too almost 70 miles from the trail she had been missing on. Sometimes people go in the wrong direction, but 70 miles wrong? Her group was shocked. Police investigated, but it was obvious none of them had any part in it. I sat speechless. It couldn't be a coincidence. The deer was not the first. A family of owls began hooting down in the valley, and we both listened for a moment. That was a long time ago, though. I try not to think about it too often. Suddenly, he looked nervous, like he'd said too much. Anyways, I'm pretty tired. I'm gonna catch some sleep. He patted my back and walked away. There was no way I was sleeping now, so I decided to walk down into the valley to clear my head. It was late, but the moon was easily bright enough for me to follow the trail down. I walked maybe a half a mile before moving just off the trail to sit on a rock ledge that overlooked a high slope. Watching the stars, the pine tree swaying gently in the wind, I began to relax. I sat there for a while and closed my eyes, trying to empty my mind. But very gradually, an unnerving feeling began to wash over me. It was very slight at first, like the sense of being observed I felt before the forest fire, but it grew stronger until I was almost certain that I was being watched by something intelligent. I was still laying on the rock, scared to move and startle whatever this presence was. 
My science teacher in elementary school told my class about this when I was a young kid, but I never actually experienced the feeling myself. He told us about wild cats, apex predators, that stalk their prey so efficiently, you can't see them, but you instinctively know they're there. Your brain subconsciously observes very small details that, on their own, are meaningless, but together are unsettling, because they only mean one thing. Something is watching you, and you don't know what or why. I remember thinking it was cool at the time, but now it was terrifying. I tried to remain calm while I thought about what to do, but I realized I only had one option. I stood up and started sprinting back to the trail towards the trailhead. As soon as I hit the trail, I heard a distant thumping of some sort of running gait behind me that sent me up the trail faster. Adrenaline allowing me to ignore my lungs, which were beginning to burn. I glanced over my shoulder once and saw some sort of semi-humanoid shaped figure running after me. It looked like it had the skin of a deer, but it seemed to conform to a different contour than that of any animal I've ever seen. Its back was painfully twisted forward, its skin ragged and pulled down to the hoofs, which it used to move unnaturally quick over the trail. I couldn't see its face in the moonlight but I could see elegant antlers arching on both sides of its head. I ran harder and finally saw the campsite ahead. I burst into the clearing and crashed into someone in front of me. A high-pitched, breathless gasp told me it was Lauren. I'm so sorry, I said, getting to my feet and giving her a hand. There's a... Her jaw dropped and she pushed past me to look down the trail into the valley. I followed her gaze and looked over my shoulder. A huge wall of fire cut the forest in half. The forest was burning. Part 3 Strange trails have appeared in the back country in areas that are supposed to be completely undeveloped. I first noticed one a few days ago, following them when they cropped up here and there, only identifiable by the cleared vegetation and worn topsoil paths. But these aren't normal trails, they loop around run uphill and distort sense of direction by winding back and forth through these steep valleys. I must have explored 20 plus miles of these trails over a couple of days, but at times, I'd go back through an area and it would be different. At first, I thought it was just my memory failing, but then I started paying attention. Curves and other points of interest shifted in certain ways. They weren't completely different, just enough for me to notice. Yesterday, I swore a path had run on the other side of a stream I was going down. Then on my way back, I couldn't even remember which side it had been on to begin with. It was just to my right now. I'm scared to mention this, but I have to. Deer carcasses have become a normal sight out here. I see them almost daily. Sometimes they're days later, rotting away, but sometimes they disappear without any trace. After several days of finding deer carcasses, I had enough and pulled out of the valley the trails were in and hiked back to the start of the back country. I'm not sure I even want to report these to HQ, but I've been on an extended solo trek surveying and monitoring wildfire risk in the remote forest to the north. So I really could just say nothing, and I'd probably be the only person to ever find them before they become overgrown again. However the trails got here, I haven't seen anyone around to maintain them, so soon enough they'll be impassable and slip back into the wilderness and fade away with time. To quickly address my last post, the forest we were going to work in had some sort of spontaneous combustion event that rapidly lit a huge fire across the valley. Our team quickly moved out above the tree line and called it in. Over the next few hours and into the late morning, aerial teams dropped fire suppressants and eventually contained it in the valley. We walked through later that evening when just the smoldering ashes remained. This had also been an intense, total mortality fire. We never found the cause either. Beyond, natural circumstances created the perfect conditions for a fire. I didn't mention anything to anyone about the thing I saw the night before, but I kept an eye out for any charred, disfigured bodies. The other rangers and I were pretty shaken up after the whole ordeal, but our supervisor didn't seem to sympathize. He told us there'd been an unannounced control burn, and due to some critical error, we got sent out to the wrong place. This seemed totally out of the norm to me, 
but no one openly questioned him. He gave everyone the next day off, but when we returned, he split everyone up to separate assignments across the forest. I ended up on a solo trek in the north. Other than the trails, it's been a quiet assignment. I wish I could talk to Ryan about the thing I saw, but I haven't gotten a chance. It almost seemed like he avoided me after the fire. The more I thought about it, I think whatever I saw out there was the dark tricking my eyes. It doesn't seem that unlikely that some deer got spooked when the fire went off and ran up the trail and I mistook it for something else in the moonlight as I glanced over my shoulder. But I have become a little paranoid since seeing the deer thing. It validated my concerns from the first fire. Something is out here and I won't let it scare me away from being here. I'm just more careful, always carrying overnight gear, rations for a few days, plenty of water, and even a rifle. We're not really supposed to carry guns, but if I get crap for it, I'll just say it's for bears. Better to look foolhardy than let them know what it's really for. I guess that brings me to the realization that I don't trust my supervisor at all. I've got a strong gut feeling that something's up with him. I just don't know what yet. I'm not sure how much I trust the other rangers either. They seem to readily accept Jonathan's explanation about the fire that almost killed us. If there is some sort of cover-up or conspiracy going on, there's no one telling how high up it goes or who all is involved. Anyone could be in on it and have an incentive to keep quiet. I should also tell you, I'm probably going to get pulled from my post in the north in the next couple of days unless something changes. A young girl went missing yesterday in the southern part of the forest. They've kept it quiet so far, but if they don't find her soon, they're going to have to pull us all in to help look for her. Normally, they leave this kind of thing to search and rescue, but I heard from one of the rangers who works closely with Jonathan that some big people in administration aren't happy with another missing person, so we're getting looped into this too. Whatever is going on between the dead deer bizarre fires, strange trails, and the missing girls. It all feels connected. As much as I want to, I can't leave now. Whatever is going on, it's messed up and I don't want to stop until I get to the bottom of it. I spent all last night downloading low-res satellite and topographic maps of the forest where the girl went missing, since I haven't worked there that much. Whatever people were even doing down there is beyond me. It's a mostly forested, mountainous region with an incredibly rapid elevation increase of several thousand feet. And I spent a lot of time looking this up because I couldn't believe it. But the area this girl went missing in is also supposed to be mostly undeveloped. Besides an old mining outpost that was forcibly closed in the 30s after environmental concerns. The Forest Service is normally pretty relaxed as far as conservation goes. But from the old news reports I've found, this place was responsible for killing off large amounts of game, polluting the entire watershed, and spreading horrible illnesses amongst the miners. The search effort isn't coming within miles of this place for whatever reason, but the nature of its closing makes me wonder if there's something more to it. Most of the old mines around here closed during the 60s, after it became apparent that there wasn't an abundant amount of gold in the mountains. None of these mines were particularly careful about conservation, and like I said, the Forest Service doesn't normally stick their nose in. So how this one closed struck me as odd. Ryan's story about the Native American wanderers got me curious about other folklore from this area, but I haven't been able to find anything. States in the West, and really most federal nature preserves, do a pretty good job of documenting Native American culture and view it as a responsibility due to their tragic treatment. But I couldn't find much besides a list of a few tribes that may have passed through here in the initial land migration thousands of years ago. I dug a little deeper and stumbled across an old nature-themed internet forum talking about weird stuff in the woods that mentioned strange tales. The poster was someone homesteading off cheap government land in the mountains who discovered a huge system of trails. They were a little larger than deer paths and led off the poster's property and through the forest for over 40 miles. These didn't sound like the trails I found, but they were similar enough to keep me interested. They specifically mentioned that these weren't documented in any map, so how could such an extensive system of trails remain undiscovered? 
I wanted to message the poster, but the account was deleted years ago, and this was written back when the internet was all anonymous, so they made sure there weren't any identifying details in the post that led back to them. The rest of the thread seemed like mostly speculation. One guy asked if there was a sizable deer population, claiming large herds break into smaller families that sometimes inadvertently create these types of trail systems. The original poster didn't think this was the case though, as they hadn't found any evidence of recent activity or a large deer population, both of which would have been necessary for something this extensive. The same went for the trails I found. Another user suggested that they stay as far away from these trails as possible, saying they've seen the same thing and that they're time holes. If you go in, the trails may twist beyond you, trapping you in, and no matter how far you wander off the trail, you'll end up back on the same trail. Eventually, a trail will open with a pathway out again, but you may come out at a different place in time than you entered. I'm aware it's the internet, and there's no reason to take anything on here as truth, but this sounded eerily familiar, and the forest is just weird in that way. Truth is often stranger than fiction out here, Stories around the campfire are usually based on some distant truth, sometimes more disturbing. I promise not to tell too many campfire stories. I'm sure you've heard enough, but this one is my personal favorite and my biggest fear. It goes something like this. You're backpacking in the mountains one day, which are notorious for unpredictable weather. High-speed winds, storms, sleet, and rain can form around the peaks without any warning all backpackers know this if they're even remotely experienced, so everyone always carries gear and equipment to safely survive any type of weather you might experience. This isn't such a big deal on a day hike, but if you're going on a multiple day trek, it's essential. Today, you're backpacking on a familiar trail off the main path through the backcountry winding up the crest of the mountain. You didn't see it marked on the map anywhere, but you were curious, and it didn't look too intensive so you decide to check it out for a few miles. After a while, you spot another backpacker in the distance. He's by himself, coming down the mountain towards you while you're hiking up. Nothing is alarming at first, but then he gets closer. He's wearing a white hat and a green rain jacket and rain pants covering black hiking boots. You wave at him when he's about 100 yards away, but he doesn't seem to notice. He gets closer, and you realize that other than his clothes, he has no gear at all. No backpack, or even a water bottle. He walks by you with his head down, not saying anything, and speeds up once he passes you, almost trotting down the mountain. You briefly wonder if he's camped out somewhere, but you don't remember seeing a tent or supplies anywhere. You walk another mile, thinking his camp must be somewhere up ahead, but you find nothing. Then, movement catches your eye, and you spot him crossing over the hill in front of you, coming down ahead of you again. Suddenly, everything about him feels wrong, and you take off down the trail back to the main path. You see him again an hour later, but this time, halfway up the steep valley the trail crosses the top of. He's struggling to climb the rocky mountainside. You hear him loudly moaning, incoherent noises filling the valley, and you call out to him. But he stops making noise and goes quiet. Unnerved, you get back to the path and hike the rest of the trek faster than ever before, sleeping very little. You don't see him again. When you get back to civilization a few days later, you talk to local rangers about what you saw and the unmarked trail, but they have no record of any trail ever existing there, or anyone else who registered to hike in that particular backcountry trek, though it was a self-registration system. They tell you they'll send someone to check in on it, but you never hear back from them, and that's fine with you. That's pretty much it. There's a lot of variations of the story. Everyone who's been in the wilderness is afraid of meeting the impossible man. He shouldn't be there, but he is. The forest is overflowing with stories like that. Practically half the time rangers spend socializing. We just tell each other stories. In many cases outside the forest, I'd be inclined to say that word of mouth is unreliable, but spend some considerable time in the woods, and being alone will change your mind. People's experiences and gut feelings are different in nature. You trust stories.
because the farther you get into the mountains and the forest, the less relevant time and truth become. What exists out there just is, and what you think should, or what is supposed to, doesn't pertain to the reality. Some of us like stories with conclusive endings, but I've always preferred the more ambiguous ones. However, somehow, they feel more plausible, especially lately. I can't make sense of anything. Put back to what I do know. There are unusual things going on in the forest, and they're tied together. Hopefully, this girl shows up alive soon, but I somehow doubt it. Once I get reassigned down there, I'm going to see if I can sneak away and check out the old mining outposts. It seems like a good start. If you don't receive another update, assume the worst, and stay away from the strange trails in the forest. A few years ago, I was running my own company from home, and I took on more work than I could handle. I did graphic design for several companies and a handful of larger corporations, which put me under a lot of pressure to deliver. Long story short, too many deadlines and not enough time for me to rest. I decided I needed a break, or I would certainly suffer a burnout soon enough. Lucky for me, I had quite a bit of money saved up, so I could afford it. I took a couple months off to clear my head. After a few days of me trying to relax and failing to do so, I realized that I needed to get away from my house. Essentially, I was spending my vacation in an office, feeling guilty I didn't do any work. I decided to get away from the city and spend a few weeks at my family's old summer cabin instead. I packed my bags and headed out of town early the next morning. While driving, I was a bit nervous. Nobody had been in the cabin for at least a year, and there had been a few severe storms during that time, so who knew if the cabin was still standing? Well, in any case, I was about to find out. When I arrived, I was relieved to see that the cabin looked exactly like when we left it last year, and so did the shed. The lawn was a bit overgrown, but that was okay. I really needed some physical work after months and months of sitting in front of a screen. Then I would chop some firewood for the grill, stuff my face with steak and sandwiches, and fall asleep. Perfect. Said and done, some time later, I was chilling in the hammock I set up on the porch, satisfied and drowsy. I could feel myself drifting off, so I set an alarm on my phone to make sure I woke up before dark. As far as I know, there hadn't been any animal attacks or anything, but I wanted to be safe anyway. I put my phone on the porch railing and fell asleep seconds later. I woke up before the alarm could go off to the sound of rain hitting the metal roof on the porch. I rubbed the sleep out of my eyes and immediately thought of making another sandwich when I noticed an odd shape, maybe 50 yards away in the woods. There, sticking out of the brush, I saw a gray, almost purple human looking head staring right at me, completely still. I was too far away to make out any distinct details, but I could definitely see large dark eyes in its almost skull-like head. I don't know how to describe the mouth or snout, though. Imagine a dog's snout, but make it shorter and wider, more akin to the jaws of a lizard, with no visible nose. It was just so weird looking. The head looked so human, but at the same time, it didn't. I wasn't even sure if it was a living thing because it was so still. A drop of rain must have hit its eye or something because it flinched or twitched. I was freaking out. This was definitely a living thing staring at me. I slowly got out of the hammock, trying not to fall or stumble, as to not give this potentially hostile creature any chance to charge at me. I backed to the door, fumbling with the handle, and as soon as I got it open, I turned and ran inside as fast as I could, slamming the door behind me. I immediately looked out the window and saw the thing was still there, sitting in the same place. I think it noticed me peeking out the window, moving its head just a little bit, staring at me again. I was freaking out, wondering what that thing was. Surely it was just some sickly animal that picked up the smell of food, right? Our staring contest continued a minute or two before I drew the curtains. 
I jumped to the sound of my alarm going off. My phone was still outside. I thought about it for a moment before I slowly opened the door, thinking that I would be able to grab it and get back inside before that thing could get into the house. My eyes fell on the spot I had last seen the creature, and to my horror, it wasn't there anymore. I immediately regretted my decision and shut the door again without getting my phone. I was about to look out my window again when I heard something step onto the porch. My heart was thumping and I made an effort to hide my heavy breathing and listened as hard as I could. I heard ropes creaking, then a snap and a heavy thud. This thing had just tore down my hammock. I heard the steps approaching the door and the handle started moving slowly. At that moment, I felt sick and wanted to scream, but I couldn't. The thing was carefully trying to open the door and get inside. Then, it stopped. The door handle stopped moving, and soon thereafter, I heard the thing stepping away from the door and off the porch. Did it give up? I stood there with my back against the door for several minutes before I even moved an inch. I slowly made my way to the window and drew the curtains. And I will never forget what was waiting for me on the other side of the window. The last thing I remember before blacking out was the largest, emptiest black eyes I had ever seen on any living thing. A pale face riddled with purple veins, and a huge smile lined with abnormally large, dull teeth. I have no idea if I fainted, or if some sort of primal part of my consciousness took over, and my brain went into some sort of suppression mode. Because when I woke up the next day, I was in the shed with a bunch of tools propped up against the door. I couldn't remember anything after I saw the face, and I have no idea what happened. After hours of making sure nothing was outside, I ran to the porch, got my phone and jacket, and ran to the car as fast as I could. On my way home, I think I had a full-blown panic attack, but kept driving because I didn't want to stop. I drove straight to my parents' house and broke down crying in front of them probably scaring the crap out of them. My therapist says that this was me not being able to differentiate between a nightmare and real life due to high levels of work-related stress at the time. As for me waking up in the shed, most likely stress-induced sleepwalking, according to her. Maybe I had some sort of breakdown and was in worse shape than I thought, but I don't know about that. The thing is, though, my dad drove to get my stuff from the cabin. He noticed the hammock rope was indeed snapped. And when he checked the shed, the door was broken in, as if something came back to get me after I already left. I don't know if what I saw was real or not, and quite frankly, I'm not sure I want to know. I have no idea how large it was, what its body looked like, or anything like that. I just remember its head from far away, and its face. The eyes, the veins, the pale color, the mouth. I've come to call it the Blackout Man. The outdoors isn't something I would consider myself acquainted with. The potent air from the moist soil, the non-stop chirps of life in every nook and cranny, and the ambiguous emptiness I feel when I'm among the trees are things that do not suit my daily life, nor my personality. Exchange the damp soil, chirping life, and emptiness for the smell of carbon exhaust from a passing bus, the sound of commuters whistling through their morning walk, and the clear, overcrowded sight of a city street. And there, you have my paradise. Growing up in the city injects thrill into every aspect of daily life, danger, adventure, and plain adrenaline can lurk around every city block. The natural world simply cannot produce that same aspect of thrill in life. Not enough happens, not enough lurks in the corners of the thickets. That being said, I try staying away from nature as much as possible, remaining in the shadows of skyscrapers rather than the shadows of oak. However, being 17 and living with my recently retired, high-ranked naval father who has more than enough experience and memories with the woods. My paradise couldn't be present at all times. This realization dawned on me when my father approached me to tell me we were spending a week in the cabin in the North Woods. Are you serious? 
My emotionally accurate thought was interrupted when my dad handed me an oversized suitcase to toss in the back of the car. You might want to grab a pillow for the ride. We have a long way to go, he said, smirking. This must be punishment for how late I'd came home from Stephanie's house last week, I thought to myself. Little did my father know, my tardiness was due to the curious nature I was born with. I was simply walking around the dark streets, exploring. Albeit, that may have been a rather dangerous and unintelligent venture, but no less filled with entertainment for myself. Punishment fits the not-so-crime-adjacent action, I guess. Nonetheless, we piled into the car and set off north. The drive was seemingly endless. After about seven hours, there was nothing but dense forests surrounding us. It wasn't long before we spent the rest of the drive on Gravel Road, tossing and shaking in the car in such a way that no fisherman would be able to resist motion sickness. Upon arrival, the sight of a very underkept, not-so-sturdy-looking log cabin lay before us. Best home we could ask for out in these parts, huh, bud? My father said in a slightly teasing tone. Oh, you bet. I'm thinking it took a fortune to build her, I said, rolling my eyes in resentment. After quickly unpacking the car and moving into our temporary home, my dad suggested we take a walk in the sea of surrounding pine and oak, with nothing to do other than staring at some truly talentless art hanging from the cabin walls. I accepted his request willingly, but not happily. As we plummeted into an endless abyss of trees, my comfort hastily left my being. Gone were the skyscrapers, the commuters whistling on their way to work, and the crowded, comforting city streets, only replaced with thick bark and oddly, silence. There was no chirping, no singing of any life around us. In addition, I never truly felt empty or alone amongst the trees. Yes, my father was beside me, but there seemed to be something else present in the air. I couldn't quite put words to it. I pushed that to the far reaches of my mind. As we continued, I began to hear strange sounds from around us. They reminded me of the whistling commuters I encountered every day, but something was off. What is that? I asked my dad. That is just the wind in the trees, the leaves rustling, and the wood creaking. Almost sounds alive, doesn't it? He said. Uh, sure, I said, trying to push back the paranoid feeling growing inside me. Our walk was short, only about an hour. I tried not to think about the sinister feeling I received from the trees, but every now and again, it would tiptoe into my conscious mind. I sat lying beside the fire in the dusty family room when my dad approached me saying he had to run into town to grab a few things. How long will you be? I asked. Oh, about a few hours or so. Unfortunately, the nearest town is about 50 miles from here, he said, sighing. And with that, he drove off to who knows whatever town would be in this barren wasteland. I sat watching the dancing flames of the family room fire for several minutes before boredom pulsed through every vein in my body. For some reason, my natural curiosity pushed into my mind and triggered my exploratory being. Why not go for a little midnight stroll? As I stepped down the stairs of the rear patio, I noticed that the forest was filled with the sounds of crickets, frogs, and basically anything that dwells in the mud. This was a pleasant surprise, but the empty, lonely aura surrounding me was not. What? You're going to be lonely no matter what until Dad gets back. Might as well explore. And with that thought, I set off for a little moonlight adventure. I never noticed how beautiful the natural world was, honestly. Everything was just so primal. The chirps of the crickets, the croaks of the frogs, the light of the fireflies briefly illuminating the area, and the wind in the trees. Wait, where was the whistling noise that accompanied the breeze earlier today? As if whatever higher power was out there was playing a sick joke on me, the orchestra of nature ceased. There was nothing, nothing but silence. Even the wind came to a halt, causing the leaves of the tree to sit motionless, hanging from their branches as if they were in the gallows. The only thing that remained were the fireflies, still blessing their surroundings with short bursts of light from their posterior. With the retreat of the sounds from the natural world came the approach of something more sinister. 
the approach of being accompanied by things that I simply could not lay my eyes on. As that feeling coursed through my body, the familiar sound of whistling filled my ears. I didn't know whether to act on my fight-or-flight instinct, so I merely stood still, waiting. The whistling grew louder and louder, coming from all directions, as it felt as if something was whistling directly into my ear. The fireflies shined on something. It was only for a second or two, but I could have sworn it was a person. Relief filled my body as I felt more safe with another person being around, but that ignorant feeling quickly faded. What would another person be doing so far out here, and why would they be following me? That thought died as soon as the fireflies illuminated once more. It was not a person. Whatever was standing a few feet away from me, in the shadows, didn't look like something God would have created. It had the figure of a humanoid being, but its limbs were elongated and bent at unnatural angles. Atop its disfigured, human-like body was a round head that housed two sunken, pale eyes, and a gaping maw filled with needle-pointed teeth. However, that was the only one that stood directly before me. There were others. I couldn't see them fully, but their awful silhouettes sickened me to the point where I desired no further physical details of their appearance. Still frozen in some sort of shock, the closest being crept closer and closer. As it got a few inches away from my body, it let out a loud, familiar whistle through its open, grinning mouth. As if some sort of electrical shock pulsed through my body, I suddenly threw myself into an all-out sprint towards the cabin, with the whistlers in close proximity. I hadn't realized how far I walked out into these woods, but the approximately 15-minute sprint gave me an idea. As the cabin lights filled my vision, I looked back to see my pursuers were about 50 feet behind me, and there were too many of them to count. They ran in such unnatural ways that the mere sight of it made me nauseous. I practically broke down the back door of the cabin. After bursting through, I managed to close the door and lock it behind me. I quickly did so with each door and window throughout the cabin, then barricaded myself in the upstairs closet, waiting for my dad to get home, and hopefully get me out of this hell he put me into. All I could do is sit and try to keep quiet. I heard thumps and scratches coming from the ceiling, most likely from those things crawling on the roof. The whistling never stopped. It was a constant reminder of the creature's presence. I sat in fear for what felt like an eternity until the whistlers erupted into what sounded like crackling, maybe laughter. Shortly after they began their unnatural course of laughter, silence tore through the place, leaving a stale, sinister sense in my ears. Maybe it's safe to come out. Maybe they got bored or just simply couldn't get into the house. As I was about to open the closet door, a familiar sound echoed from the back of my closet. I wasn't in the city, so that whistling wasn't coming from a commuter. My family has owned a log cabin on the edge of a lake for generations. Well, I shouldn't say they own the log cabin, since the actual building has been torn down and rebuilt from scratch several times since the original owners built it, well over a century ago. No, my family has owned a large, beautiful plot of land in one of the only clearings around the lake, would be a more appropriate way to put it. The current iteration of the family cabin was built from the ground up in the 80s by my father, who left it vacant for a while after its completion, for reasons I've never actually learned. When he started the moving process into the rather small building, about 15 years after I moved out on my own, and about three decades after he'd actually built it, he told me he had no reason to stay in his current house, seeing as I was long gone and my mother had passed away several months before. He said he could manage the move by himself and that I shouldn't worry about him. I felt bad about leaving all the work to him, but given his persistence, I knew that I wouldn't have a choice in the matter. That was roughly nine years ago, and I hadn't heard from my father at all since he moved away. I won't delve into specifics about my life, so as to keep it as anonymous as possible, but I'll tell you what I can about my family and myself. At the time of writing this, I am in my 40s, with two children, both of which live on their own, one in a dorm and one in an apartment with his girlfriend. 
Earlier this year, I lost my wife when she was on her way home from work, after hitting a patch of black ice and going off the road into a tree. The first paramedics to arrive told me she died on impact, the only solace I'd been able to receive for the whole event. After the funeral, my sons and I became more distant, and I haven't heard a word from them in over five months. I can hardly blame them. They loved her very much, and they were still more than likely recovering. I was living alone in our house for about a month after the accident, still struggling to cope with her loss, when I received a letter telling me that my father had also passed away a few weeks before, and that he'd left me several things in his will. The two standout items had been a sum of money that I could easily live comfortably on for the rest of my life and never have to work again, and the deed to the land on the edge of the lake. Not having any reason to do otherwise, I decided to pack up what few things I thought I would need, and within a week, I was on my way to my new cabin. When I first arrived, I wasn't sure of what to make of the location. A small cabin, comprised of a kitchen, master bedroom, living room, and bathroom that was only accessible through a 10-minute drive down a dirt path didn't seem all that appealing, and had me considering turning around and heading home almost immediately. However, despite my initial feelings, I decided to give it a shot, at least spend a night there to give the place a fair chance. After settling in, I decided to cook up a simple meal with some groceries I'd picked up on the way, grabbed a book from the rather generously stocked bookshelf, and sat in an old recliner by the window with a perfect view of the lake. Time flew by, and before I knew it, I looked at the wall-mounted clock, only to find out it was 11 at night. Surprised, I placed the bookmarker between two pages, set the book down on a nearby table, and went to bed for the night. The sound of nature at night proved to be a fantastic lullaby, and I ended up having the best night's sleep I've ever had. Officially sold on the idea of calling this place my own home when I woke up the following morning. The next month or so went by peacefully. I spent most of my time either reading or fishing down at the handmade dock at the edge of the property. While deviating every now and again for a canoe ride around the lake or a walk through the woods, I was only just getting used to my new, pleasant life when suddenly, things started to happen around the property that I thought were only my imagination at first. Late at night, when falling asleep to the gentle breeze pushing through the trees and the sound of crickets that proved to be a lull for me, I began to hear what sounded like faint humming mixed with the unusual nightly sounds. It was faint at first, making me think it was only my mind playing tricks on me. But over the course of several weeks, the sound had become more pervasive, becoming louder than simply a quiet instrument of the night's orchestra, but not so loud as to sound more than a whisper. The hums did not come every night. In fact, there wasn't much consistency when it came to most of the chilling things that I'd experienced in my time there. Shortly after the humming began at night, things started to happen during my daily routines that I couldn't explain. On my occasional trips around the lake in the canoe, I'd look over the tree line and swear that I saw something that looked like a person. And even though at first I tried calling out to them, only to be met with silence, I assumed it was my mind playing tricks on me for spending most of my time away from civilization, except for my occasional grocery run. On my walks around the woods, I would hear twigs snapping as well as crunching leaves from pretty much everywhere that wasn't in line of sight. On one venture, I even came across a rabbit that looked like it had snapped its neck, which seemed almost impossible for it to do, seeing it was in a small, flat clearing. After that encounter, I stopped my walks through the woods, sticking only to the property and never venturing into the trees. It was around the end of my third month there, where I found myself hardly able to tolerate all the strange things happening around the cabin and thought about leaving it until the night that put all of the other oddities to shame. I noticed when I went to bed that night that the woods around me were alarmingly quiet. Not a single insect made a noise. No wind blew at all. And the only sound that kept me company was my slow breathing as I attempted to sleep. Right when I was about to nod off, however, 
I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard the screen door to the cabin start to be widely opened and slam shut, as though someone was trying to tear it off its hinges. Terrified, I still had to figure out what was going on. So cautiously, I got out of bed and tiptoed to my bedroom's doorway, with a clear sight on the cabin's door. The blinds on the windows on either side of the door were pulled shut, only allowing the bright moonlight to shine through the crack at the bottom, and the door was still being slammed shut with brutal force. Despite everything, I couldn't help but thank myself internally for never getting over my need to lock the doors at night, even though nobody lived around me anymore. After about 10 minutes of slamming, as quickly as it started, it subsided, leaving me shaken as I stood there in silence anticipating for whatever was about to come next. It was only when the humming began again, filling the silent air, that I felt the need to further investigate. As I got closer to the door, the humming grew louder. Despite my skin crawling, however, it was far enough away that I felt opening the door was a safe move. Unbolting the door and pulling it open, the first thing that came into sight was the screen door, now bent and hanging from its hinges. It was only when I looked over the field surrounding the cabin, illuminated by the nearly blinding light of the full moon, that I saw somebody standing by the docks. This figure not only appeared to be a slender woman, but also looked like the same person I'd seen around the lake on my canoe outings. Pushing past the remnants of the screen door, I stepped into the moon's light and started my cautious approach. With every step, the hum grew louder, even more eerie. What was first a soothing sound to fall asleep to, now felt like the soundtrack to my nightmares. When I reached the tree line, only a couple dozen feet in front of the woman at most, the humming paused as she started to turn towards me. I was terrified at first, expecting to see something out of a horror movie staring back at me. But my dread was replaced with confusion, and the feeling of a knot in the pit of my stomach as her face came into the moon's light. Standing in front of me, roughly four months since her funeral, was my wife. Looking just as she always had, my heart sank as I watched her pale lips form a smile, only starting to hum again once I'd seen her. I called out to her, only to be met with the same haunting melody as she began to take slow steps away from me. As she neared the end of the dock, I found the shock wear off, just enough for me to burst into a sprint towards her. Before I could reach her though, she fell backwards into the water, but made no sound as she fell in, not even causing much of a ripple in the otherwise still lake. I knelt down on the edge of the dock and reached into the water with one hand, calling her name frantically as I searched for her. It wasn't a deep section of water, she would have been able to grab my hand, only when something finally did, it wasn't her. I felt a tremendous grip on my forearm as something tried pulling me into the water. I anchored myself to the dock on one of the wooden supports as I fought, struggling and enduring a harsh pain to stop myself from falling in. After what felt like an hour of struggling, my arm was freed from the grasp of whatever was luring me into the water, and I wasted no time as I bolted back into the cabin. I didn't even look back. Even when the humming started again, I slammed the door shut, bolted it before sliding the old recliner in front of it, and ran to the corner of the room where I waited through the rest of the night for sunrise to arrive. As the sun rose above the trees and cast a light on the cabin, I gathered my belongings and ran to my car, making record time as I packed everything inside and jumped in, tearing down the dirt road with no comprehension of how fast I was actually going. With the money left in my inheritance, I was able to stay at a hotel until a nearby apartment freed up for me. Once I was settled in, I decided to do a little research on the cabin and the lake itself. It was only then I found out that every one of the previous owners had lost their spouses shortly before moving into the cabin, and every one of them had drowned in the lake several months after taking up the residence, including my father. I didn't want to know any more than that. I had all the answers I needed. Several days after that discovery, I looked up a company willing to demolish the cabin and another that would be willing to plant trees in the area to fill the gap caused by the sudden absence of any structures. I've given it thought, and despite everything that happened, I'm choosing to hold on to the deed to the property. 
I won't let whatever killed my family members by making poor replicas of their spouses have any opportunity to strike again. The knowledge of that cursed plot of land and the wretched cabin that once sat upon it now lives and dies with me. Here in central Michigan, almost everyone hunts, whether it's deer, rabbit, squirrel, turkey, or quail. We all hunt, so it's pretty common while I'm hunting on state land to run into a few other hunters. Normally, it's just frustrating. You pick your spot, settle in quietly for an hour, only to have some idiot go wandering 20 yards in front of your tree stand, right at prime time. This evening was one of those times when my hunt was interrupted. Only instead of getting angry at first, I was concerned, followed quickly by being terrified out of my mind. I got out to my stand around 4.30 p.m., got all settled in, sat freezing for the next hour and a half, just watching the snow come down. It was starting to get dark pretty quickly. When to my left, I heard the sound every hunter loves hearing, footsteps. My heart immediately started to pump faster as my adrenaline started to kick in. Very slowly, I turned my head to the left so I wouldn't alert the animal coming in that I was waiting 20 feet up in a tree. Instead of seeing a deer walking up though, it was a man. Instantly, my adrenaline turned into anger as yet again, my hunt was ruined. I stared him down, hoping he would back up and notice me in the tree, then turn around and go back the way he came. That way, there'd be a slight chance I could still see some deer. Once he got about 20 feet away from my stand, I noticed something was off about him. His body was completely stiff, his arms glued to his side, and he stared straight forward with a stone expression on his face. His legs, however, were taking these huge, high knee steps, like he was sort of marching or exercising. I was a little creeped out at his odd behavior, but not really scared yet. After a few seconds of watching him, I figured he was some idiot intentionally ruining my hunt. I was just about to shout out to the weirdo and ask what he was doing when a twig snapped a little ways off to my right. The guy froze and his head snapped in the direction of where the noise came from. He stared for a few seconds, then out of nowhere took off running impossibly fast to whatever had caused the twig to snap. I stared surprised at how fast this thing was running. I kid you not, he had been running well over 30 miles per hour as he closed 60 to 70 yards in about 4 seconds. As he got to a tree, he scaled that tree faster than a squirrel could. My heart was hammering so loud at this point, I actually feared he would hear it and come for me next. The sounds of an animal screeching as it was being torn about rang through the woods. Whatever it was, he caught it, and was, what I'm guessing, eating it alive. After a couple seconds of screeching, the woods fell completely silent, other than my frantic breathing. I closed my eyes and took three deep, slow breaths to settle my nerves. When I opened my eyes back up, my heart took another leap, as the guy was standing 20 feet away, looking down in the snow at something. My footprints in the snow. Oh, please no, I thought to myself. I'm not ashamed to admit I was in tears at this point. I was so afraid. I slowly reached to my side and put my hand on my pistol I always carried with me in case it came down to it. I watched in terror as he slowly followed my footsteps. He crept along until he stood directly under my tree. Then he slowly lifted his head up until he looked directly at me. We stared at each other for a good couple of seconds until he put his hand on the ladder leading to my stand, getting ready to climb up. I was completely paralyzed in fear as I watched him slowly pull himself up the first step. Then, by the grace of God, I heard a voice somewhere in the distance. The creepy guy heard it too, and he hopped back down onto the ground. Jim, I got one. I heard the guy in the distance shout to someone, probably his buddy. The guy under my stand took off running as fast as before, towards the other hunter's voice. I saw my only chance to get out of there, so I undid my harness in record time and practically jumped out of the tree and started running back to my truck. Thankfully, I wasn't too far in and soon made it over the small hill. 
I looked back to see if he was chasing me, but I was in the clear. I got to my truck and threw my bow in and jumped in, starting it and pulling away as fast as I could. With snow, I wasn't able to drive as quickly as I wanted, but after an intense 10 minutes, I was back on the main road. I don't know what that was, but I know one thing. I'm not hunting in state land ever again. Once, my uncle told me of a story about how he had seen skinwalkers by Shiprock, New Mexico. My uncle was a long haul truck driver. He was coming back from Colorado and had pulled over by the Shiprock to stretch his legs and let his dog pee. We are Navajo, so he knew better than to be walking around after sundown, but he was always mischievous and curious. His dog Moose got out and peed right away and wanted right back in the truck. No matter what my uncle did, he couldn't convince Moose to take a walk with him, even though they'd been in the truck for over 10 hours. So, my uncle takes a walk toward the actual ship rock, and it's almost sundown. He continues to climb the rock. See, his friend told him a story about a secret cave up on top, and he wanted to see if it was true. He continued to climb and circle the mountain, Soon, he felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. He felt wrong in the pit of his stomach, but he had to see what was going on up there. Soon, he began to feel a weird vibration in his feet, but before he could process what was happening, he heard chanting. He began to climb again. The higher he went, the louder the chants got. It was almost as if they were calling to him. Soon, he began to see a glow on the rocks. The closer he got, the more he could see the fire dancing against the rock walls. He carefully slid up a rock, and he was shocked to see four men dancing in animal skins. They circled the fire, always dancing, always chanting. Soon they began to change right before my uncle's eyes. My uncle was hidden low, but unable to move. The men's legs began to change as they danced. They were throwing some sort of herb into the fire and danced round and round. My uncle watched as their hands began to turn into paws, but they still danced. Soon, their faces began to morph and blur. My uncle felt a sickness take place in his chest and stomach, but what could he do now? He had to stay hidden. Their coyote faces still chanting, and their long coyote legs still danced. Soon, their melodic chanting turned into howling. They danced with two legs. The night was dark. There was no moon. No light except the light that came from the fire. My uncle wanted to run, but he knew if he ran, it would be sure death. While he was thinking, all of the sudden the skinwalkers took off in a blink of an eye. They ran down the mountain as if it was nothing. My uncle watched as they all went in different directions. He knew this was his only chance to escape. He tore down the mountain like he had a rocket strapped to his back. He finally made it to his truck. His hair was still standing on his arms. He jumped up to open the door, and there by the handle was a giant coyote print. It was red. He dared not to touch it. He opened up the door and started up his truck and got out of there as fast as he could. He started to head towards Gallup, New Mexico. He was doing 70 down the highway, trying to get as far away as he could. When he looked out his passenger side window, he saw a giant coyote keeping pace with him. My uncle said it was almost like it smiled at him. It then ran off into the desert, and he never saw it again. He got the courage to go back up the mountain in the daytime a couple years later. He couldn't find the cave, and there was no evidence anything had ever happened there. He was sure some sort of bad medicine made it possible for them to do what they did. He also told me that he was wearing his cedar berry necklace my grandma had made him. It had shielded and protected him. He died about a decade later, having bad luck the rest of his life. Respect the old ways. Don't be going out at night looking for evil, because it just might find you. This experience happened to me a long time ago, and I forgot about it for the most part. But one day, I was watching a video about different old beliefs and things. 
and somewhere they mention skinwalkers and about how somebody saw their friend with dead eyes or a loved one's voice. But I'm not sure if this thing qualified. When I was in the fifth grade, I went camping with my cousins, uncle, aunt, and her boyfriend. I remember this day specifically because it was the first time I ever went camping. We stayed at a lake in upstate New York. I'm not sure exactly where in upstate New York, but I can ask my aunt if she remembers. Because of how long ago this is, I can only faintly remember some details. When we first got there, the first thing I did was sit in the car and text my mom I was safe. Unbeknownst to me, that was a lie. It was evening, so we decided to unpack some things. There was a wooden platform for tents, and we set up our tent surprisingly easily. Quickly, the day turned to night, so we ate some sandwiches that were pre-packed, and my uncle tried to teach us how to make a campfire. After making a circle of stones, putting wood and sticks in the form that he told us to, and ripping pieces of paper and tissue up, lighting the fire came next. Given my experience with matches, it only took me a few tries to light up the first paper, but marshmallows quickly came after. We were all getting tired, so we stopped feeding the fire until it got low enough to put it out with water and feet. After this, I sat in the car again and texted my mom I was going to sleep. My mother was very overprotective, and this was necessary for her to sleep soundly back in my apartment. I didn't own a sleeping bag, so I wrapped myself in a quilt and shared the tent with one of my cousins. The other slept with her dad in the bigger tent, three tents total. My cousin, who was staying in the tent with me, let's call her Jess, told me to put my shoes right next to hers, so I did. She fell asleep quicker than I did, but eventually, we both fell asleep. My aunt is big on no technology, so we had to leave our phones in the car. I woke up to Jess calling me from outside the tent. When I looked over, all I saw was a lump of quilt and a pillow. So I walked out of the tent to see her walking towards the woods. It was very, very dark. Normally, in the city, there's no stars because of light pollution. Upstate, however, the stars were beautiful. She said, come look at the stars. And I of course followed her into the woods. But every time I walked to her, she walked farther away from me. She kept repeating over and over again, isn't this so much prettier than the city? And walking away farther and farther. At this point, I started to get worried we would get lost, and she was still a good 10 to 15 feet away from me as she spoke. I told her, we might get lost. Why don't we stick together or turn back soon? At this point, she started to sound a little angry, no, just follow me, we're almost there. She started to sound a little fishy, so I asked, where exactly are we going? Her voice became almost robotically angry. Why don't you just trust me? It sounded like something my mom would say whenever I would ask something too many times. Almost like she could read my mind, she started walking more, expecting me to follow her. I did for a few steps, but the more I tried to trust her, the more worried I got. Here was the first why question. Why are we even doing this? I said. And there was no response, except for a grunt of some sort, like an annoyed grunt. Jess? And that's when I knew something was wrong. Because I said so, she said. But it sounded like my mother, exactly like my mother. So extremely like my mother that for a millisecond I was relieved. But then I remembered my mother was not with us on this camping trip. Mom? I said, confused and scared now. I started backing away, and that thing started coming closer. Hello? Who are you? I said, starting to back away. You know me, it said. It was switching between my mother and my cousin as I backed away. I have the worst sense of direction, so at this point, I had forgotten which way was back, but I ran. I ran in the opposite direction of the thing. I've never been an exceptional runner. In track, I always finished last. I never liked running, but here, I felt I was running faster than the fastest runner I knew. Nonetheless, I kept running. I heard a faint, come back, wait, behind me, but I didn't hesitate. 
I was like a scared dog, eyes ahead, full speed. The run back felt a lot longer than the walk to wherever we were. But soon, I saw some trees that I pulled dried leaves and sticks from earlier. I ran so fast to my tent and looked behind me. There was what either looked like two yellow eyes, or a tiny car's headlights is the best I could describe it. It seemed to be standing still though. Almost tripping on the wooden platform, I went straight back into the tent and kicked off my shoes faster than ever before. When I looked back at what I previously mistook to be a lump of quilt, Jess was sleeping there the entire time. I was breathing extremely heavy, but I laid down closer to Jess than before, shivering. I remembered we were told strictly to not go outside our tents during the night, so I didn't tell her about what happened to avoid getting into trouble. Multiple times during the night, I heard different noises. At one point, I heard our car driving away, and even faintly, running somewhere in the distance. I chose not to pay attention to those noises though. In the morning, I was the last one to wake up. I woke up not thinking about the night prior, but thinking it was a nightmare or something. When I walked outside the tent though, my cousin's flashlight was on the floor near where I had entered the woods. Also, my thrown shoes were not next to my cousin's, but where I threw them. I can't think of other proof that this wasn't a nightmare, but there was a dead squirrel near the car for some reason. Besides the horrible adventure that had happened throughout the night, the day went on as normal. I heard no noises or voices, but I did ask my cousin if she got up during the night. She said no, but I did wake her up a bit when I moved a bit close to her. She tried to forget about what happened, and soon, my thoughts were mostly about the lake we were swimming in. There was nothing sketchy about the lake. It was meant to be swam in, with beaches and lifeguards. After the beach, we got ice cream, ate at the picnic bench, and my other cousin taught me how to play a card game. Another strange thing though, my phone mysteriously disappeared during the night. It was not in the car when I checked, and it wasn't in the trunk after we pulled everything out. I was in fifth grade though, and it was just a small free phone my mother gave me to contact her. She wasn't too upset about the loss of this phone. After arriving back to the city, I didn't tell anybody about the experience until school started again. I told a friend or two in my class, but it wasn't mentioned again. The surreal, horrific experience was truly scary. My wife and I decided to go camping this past weekend. It was the first time we both had time off together in months and wanted to spend it unplugged from the rest of the world just the two of us. We chose a scenic spot in the North Georgia mountains, about a two and a half hour drive from where we live in Atlanta. It wasn't too far out, but we'd heard from friends that once you get up into those hills, you feel completely isolated from the modern world. We both have been camping before, but it had been a while. I was in Boy Scouts, but I wouldn't call myself a natural in the wilderness. Despite our lack of survival skills, we ended up booking one of the park's backcountry sites. For those that may not know, that means you're more separated from the rest of the campers. There is no electricity or water, and you have to hike a fair bit to get there. You feel like you're really on your own that way. Our site, in particular, was very wooded and felt particularly isolating, in a good way. Or at least, that's what we thought at first. We got there early in the day because we wanted to make sure we had plenty of time to unpack and set up camp. We also wanted to get in some good hiking while there was plenty of daylight out. After several hours of hiking, we got back to our campsite around 7 p.m. It was really starting to get dark at this point, so we lit a campfire and made dinner. This is all sounding pretty normal, right? You're probably thinking, this is a pretty basic camping trip. Why did this guy post this here? Well, it wasn't until we turned in for the night that things started getting weird. It wasn't late when we went to bed, mainly because we were exhausted from the day, but also had an early start planned for the next. After a few uncomfortable hours trying to sleep in a small tent, not designed for my 6 foot 3 frame, and my wife huddled next to me, I was awoken around 1 or 2 AM. I don't know for sure because I was honestly too scared to check my phone for the time. There was a weird, sudden noise outside the tent. 
At first, I sort of just wrote it off as just some random animal running through the site. The initial high-pitched sound was far enough that I felt like I didn't need to worry. But then I noticed the sounds weren't leaving, and they weren't getting farther away. Suddenly, startling squeals interrupted by the sound of leaves being trampled, like something was running between our stuff, broke the sharp silence of the woods. So at this point, I'm pretty awake. I laid there, still, wanting to make sure that whatever it was didn't get into any of our stuff, but also worried just enough to not dare reach for the zipper on our tent door. I started listening more closely and began to notice different variations in sounds. Like all of the sudden, all the movement would stop. I could hear light, slow sniffing, like it was trying to memorize our scent. I was getting used to the faint sniffing sound, only to be surprised by the sound of rushing, determined footsteps barreling toward the tent. They stopped just short of the spot where the top of my head grazed the tent wall. It started to sniff again. I could now feel something, its nose probably, pressing against the thin wall. Now that it was closer, I could sort of make out its size, about that of a large dog, like a German Shepherd, maybe bigger. Maybe someone's dog got out and was running between campsites. Hard to tell while you're holding your breath and keeping one eye shut. When the sniffing stopped, I heard feet shuffle back quickly away from the tent, as if it had gotten a whiff of something it didn't like. Possibly me. That's when it started growling. The growl is sort of hard to explain. It wasn't a dog, that's for sure. The best way I can describe it is like a cat who is pissed off, but much lower pitch. Too low, maybe for a cat. Almost like a guttural sounds of a wild hog. But even that wasn't quite right. Over and over it growled, at me. It felt like forever. Now my mind was racing. I didn't know what to do. Should I try and scare it? Make lots of noise? Maybe there's something in my tent I can grab and use as a weapon. I thought about everything within reach. My flashlight was within my finger's length, and my backpack against the wall by my feet. I knew I had a pocket knife in there, but I didn't think I'd be able to get it without making a lot of noise. Probably too much noise. The next few moments I think I will remember for the rest of my life. The creature started moving again, only this time, slowly. It circled the tent like a lion stalking its prey, stopping every once in a while to get a sniff here and there. I think it was getting its bearings, you know, trying to figure out where the smell was strongest. It made a full circle right back to where my head was pressed up against the wall. The growling sounded even more irritated, even more guttural. I knew my wife was awake now. I feel her hand working down my arm before wrapping her finger around my wrist in a death grip. It was then I realized the creature outside was now pressing against the wall. I could make out a shallow hole and points through the thin fabric. Teeth? Lots of them. It began to lick the tent wall, grazing its teeth on the fabric like it just wanted a taste. The next thing that happened is the real reason I had to post here. After what felt like forever, the creature stopped. It stopped growling, stopped moving. For all I knew, it was just standing there outside the tent, thinking about its next move. I braced for something. I wasn't sure what, but I just continued lying there, waiting. Was it about to pounce? Was it done? As the seconds ticked on, my fear dissolved into anger. I was sick of lying there, simply wanting for something to happen to us. In a moment of dumb bravery, I grabbed my light and my backpack, thinking maybe I could use it as a shield, and ripped open the tent door. I stepped out and waved my light around the campsite. I saw nothing, not even a rustling of leaves in the distance, as if something was running away. I suddenly felt stupid. It had to have been some random animal I tricked myself into thinking was some sort of wilderness monster rearing to eat me and my wife. I took one last look between the trees before turning around to get back in my tent. That's when I saw it, right outside, right where my head had been resting against the wall, were footprints, unmistakably human.